CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. What you see and what you believe are not always the same. Take the mysterious cults of mysticism, occultism, or spiritualism. Some people think such things are what they look like. Others say there is more to it. Some are drawn to it, others repulsed by it. The tale we're about to unfold concerns a man who thought belief in the unnatural showed a weakness of will, and it tells what happened to make him change his mind. Charlie, my boy, there is no such thing as a house that is haunted. I have stood at night below the cliffs on the beach, and I've seen all the windows suddenly light up uh, as though a a ghost had lit a candle in each room. (laughs) Well, Charlie, maybe someday I'll go have a look at it. Well, why not now? You're not afraid, are you? mystery drama, The Haunted Mill, taken from that classic tale of the unseen world by Richard Donovan, was adapted especially for mystery theater by James Agate, Jr., and stars Ralph Bell and Russell Horton. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Doctors, by nature, are careful, cautious, scientific, and have inquiring minds. Alexis Carell, the Nobel Prize doctor, once said, A few observations and much reasoning leads to error. Many observations and a little reasoning leads to truth. Meet Dr. James Patmore, a man of reason who could not believe his senses when faced with the truth. What I am about to relate is so weird and startling, especially for a man trained in science as I am, that I can only let the facts speak for themselves and have you who hear my voice reject my tale or accept it. I am a member of the Royal College of Physicians, author of a number of medical books, but it was my decision to take up practice in the small town of Brinton that changed my life and almost everything I believed in. One night at exactly midnight, there was a knock at my cottage door. Come in, come in. Oh, good Lord, man. You're bleeding. Here, let me help you to the chair. Uh, I, I don't know what happened. I, I saw your light. I just managed to call here. Uh, you're the doctor, aren't you? Now, don't talk. Yes, uh, yes, yes, I'm the doctor. Here, now, press this against your forehead. Mm. Just a second now. I want to move this kerosene lamp a little closer to see. Aha. Aha. That doesn't look too bad. You were fortunate, young man. I'm, uh, I'm Charles Royce. Uh, we haven't met. I... Ow! Oh, uh, well, just, just swabbing the cut. Cleaning it out. Oh. I've got some wood in there. 
What did you do? Run into a tree? Oh, uh, I'm Dr. Padmore. Oh, you're not a native, so I should say welcome. When I left Brenton three years ago, we didn't have a doctor for 50 miles. I've been away at sea all that time, doctor. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes, that looks cleaner. Well, I've only taken up practice here last year. Charles Royce. Yes, sir. Are you the, um... Is that your uh, father and mother on Gorse Hill Farm, about uh, two miles south of town? Oh. You know? Oh, yes, very well. I've been treating your father's lumbago. And your mother's arthritis. Yes, indeed. They told me about their wild son. And I expect that you are here. Uh, <laughs> not as wild as they like to make out. It's uh, just their way of explaining why I was shipped off to sea. <laughs> but not that I'm sorry. I liked it. Uh, there we are. I'll try to keep that bandage around your head. Would you like some tea? Oh, I certainly would. Uh, you don't mind if I shed my boots and my jacket? They are so... Put them over by the fire. Oh, ah. Thank you, I will. Uh, it was really amazing. What happened to me? I was on my horse, I know that. It's a... Well, it's the mystery of the whole thing. I really don't know. I... Here we are. Drink this wine, this honey. I was on my way to see Hannah. Oh, that's the girl I was hoping to marry, and I used to see a lot of her before. Well, I was riding along up by the haunted mill, and suddenly something seemed to lean down at me out of a tree branch over my head, and that's all I remember. I was knocked right off my horse onto the ground, and when I came to, my horse had bolted. There was this blood streaming down over my eyes. Somehow I saw your cottage, the light, and managed to get here. That's all I remember. Now, you didn't see anything when it happened? Stars. That's about all. Oh, boy. This tea hits the spot. Is there someone in town who doesn't like you? Yes, I guess there is. Well, <laughs> you think this person would have... Well, uh... I think he could have ambushed me in the dark, yes, but... Well, frankly, I don't think he has enough guts. It's like this, Dr. Patmore. Well, why don't you I... call me Jim? I'll call you Charlie, if I may. Oh, glad to. Well, uh... Three years ago, I wanted to marry Hannah Bliss, and I still want to marry her, but three years ago, I was 17, and I listened to my father and mother, and they said, you're too young, you wait. So, I went to sea. Well, actually, my father arranged that I was sent, and I got back last week, three years almost to the day. My folks were glad to have me back, but all I really cared about was that they said, all right, you still want to marry Hannah? And I said, yes. And they said, that's too bad. She's met up with Silas Hart, and she's going to marry him. Doctor, I didn't even unpack my bag. I went right out the door to see her. Charlie, uh, it's not you. you. You're here. Hello, Hannah. You didn't change much. You have, Charlie. You look... Taller and stronger, I almost wouldn't know you. You got prettier. I'm... Uh, I can't believe it's you. Three years, Hannah. I was only a boy then. Um, is it... Is it true about you and Silas? Who told you? Mom and Dad. In fact, the moment I walked in the door, you... You're going to marry him? Y yes. I don't understand it. I went away believing you would wait. You told me you would. Three years is a long time. I would have waited ten years for you. Well, how would I know when you'd come back, Charlie? If he'd come back. What are you talking about? I I wrote you from every single port we hit. I told you my plans. What, Charlie? I didn't get any letters. Oh, no. Not one letter. That's the truth. Not one? So I, I, I gave up on you. Why would they do that? What are you saying? You know what I'm saying. Your folks were just as much against our marrying as my folks. They took my letters. They must have. Oh, Charlie. For three years, not a day passed, but I was thinking of you. About the life we'd have together. And all along, I, I, I thought you felt the same way. Yes. I know I did, but what can, what can I do? Do? About Silas? We've posted the bands. We're getting married in three weeks. Hannah, do you love him? I thought so. Oh, Charlie, listen, that was before. That was 
when I thought I'd never see you again. And now that you see me again? I don't want you to go away. I don't want to go away either, Hannah. But what will we do? Never mind. It'll, it'll work out. Like the old saying goes, love will find a way. And did love find a way, Charles? Well, I guess it did, Doctor. I, I mean, uh, Jim. Anne and I have been seeing each other every day, every evening, that is, for the whole week. And tonight she was going to tell Silas she couldn't go through with the wedding. So now Silas knows, eh? Well, I think so, if he showed up there. He was supposed to see her at 8. I was on my way over about 10 to find out what happened, and that's when I got hit by whatever it was. Yeah, that's right. It was just as I was passing the haunted mill. I wonder... What is it? You uh, wonder what? Maybe because I was so near the haunted mill, maybe that had something to do with it. How could it? You're new in town, Jim. That mill, everyone here, we all know that place is haunted. Charlie, you were knocked down by something solid, something made of wood, not by a ghost. Shouldn't have taken that mill road. Oh, come now, come. There's no such thing as a house that is haunted. Have you ever been there, Doctor? <laughs> Hardly. I wouldn't waste my time. I don't know. Sometimes I've seen, well, not lately, but when I was a boy. What have you seen? Oh, I have stood at night on the beach below the cliffs, and I have seen the windows suddenly all light up like a... like a ghost had lit a candle in each room. All right. Well, maybe someday I'll have a look at it. Well, why not now? Now? It's past midnight. You're not... afraid, are you? What are you talking about? I've talked to people like you before. Now, maybe I haven't had the education, but I like to find out and see things for myself. You don't want to see for yourself. You get your learning from books. All right. All right, I'll go. But does it have to be right now, this minute, in the dead of night? Yes, I want to take you right now, Jim. Now, when it's dark. Now, when there's been a storm. Now, when all the elements have been riled up. And I think maybe there's some learning you have in store. Morning, Hannah. Well, you're up early feeding the chickens. Charlie, where were you last night? I, I waited. Your head, what's happened to you? Oh, don't worry, it's a big bandage over a small cut. Oh, you had me so worried. Silas so left at 9 o'clock and I waited and waited and there was that terrible storm and you never came. Oh, not from choice, darling. I was riding by the haunted mill and... Well, something attacked me. I, I was on my way over to see you. What do you mean, something attacked you? Knocked me right off my horse. This is Dr. Pat Marthal. He has two. I borrowed it till he could round up mine. It bolted and ran away. Are you all right? Well, of course I am. It's, it's just a big bruise. Charlie, it's Silas. Oh. That's what I came to find out. Uh, how did he take it? What did you tell him? Oh, he was so fierce. I told him it was all a mistake, that I'd become engaged to him because I thought you were never coming back. He was like a... A hunted animal, backing away. I said that you and I were going to get married. And he cursed you and said how he wished you'd never come back. How he wished your ship had been sunk at sea. I, I made him stop. I, I couldn't listen anymore. Now, don't worry. Silas won't do anything. Oh, it's not me I'm worried about. His eyes went so funny. And I remember when he said goodbye, he said, If I can't marry you, Hannah, nobody else will. An idle threat by a rejected suitor? A strange little town, Brinton by the sea. Strange inhabitants. The town and the town's people are almost as though they hadn't been touched by the 20th century. And it is here that a modern doctor, James Patmore, has come to practice. How could he fit into a community that appeared to be in the grip of fear, fate, and fantasy. We shall learn more when I return shortly with Act Two. For centuries, astrologists, psychics, numerologists, and others 
have tried to probe into the unexplainable mysteries. This is what Dr. Jim Patmore is faced with. Reconciling scientific fact with forbidden knowledge. That dead-of-night visit to the haunted mill with Charlie Royce turned out to be impossible for him to forget or dismiss. The haunted mill was forlorn and mournful looking. And in the clearing skies and moonlight, singularly weird. But I could see it for what it was. And I knew it was merely a disused, abandoned building. What I did not know was that this would be the last time I would see Charlie Royce alive. How about we go inside? I'm just standing here waiting for the windows to light up. You are a disbelieving, stubborn man, aren't you? Now, come on, I'll, I'll push open this wooden bolt that fastens the door. What? What's that? Bats. They nest here. Well, how do you like it? Homey? Oh, it doesn't fight me. Shine your lantern higher, Jim. Did you ever see such large spiders making webs? Well, what else could you expect in an abandoned building? All right, Charlie, where's your ghost? I'm here. I'm waiting for some manifestation. Just settle down. Wait and see. Look up there. Well, all I can see is flying bats. No, I, I mean, the roof has fallen in. I can see the moon. Charlie, I have seen roofs fallen in before. What I came here for are your apparitions. If there is nothing to see but bats and spiders... What was that? Something closed the front door. I can't get it open. Let me bring the lantern over. You see, there's no knob on this side. Uh, uh, Jim, hold it a little lower. I want to take a look through the crack between the jam and the door. Jim, the bolt is closed. The wooden bolt has been drawn across the door, locking us in here. See for yourself. Oh, great heavens, you're right. It's been bolted shut. Well, someone's playing games with us. Or something. Oh, this is ridiculous. All right, whoever is out there, open up this door. Open it up, I say, at once. What? Is that somebody? It isn't a person, Jim. I've heard that crazy laughter since the first time I came up here when I was ten. Oh, nonsense. That's just the wind. All right, you out there. Open this door. Now open it. Jim, the door will open in its own time. <laughs> Believe me, I just... Just wait. Here, take your lantern back and, and have a good look around. I do hope, Charlie, that this isn't some practical joke of yours to impress me. I'll tell you right now, whatever is going on is not the work of any supernatural demons. And nothing will make me believe it is. Jim, Jim, look out! Get out of the way! was a close call. Oh, it's a miracle you weren't crushed. It just missed you by a hair. All right, I... Uh, I've had enough. I think it's time to go. Do you hear that? The bolt outside is opening itself. Oh, stop, stop now. Do you see anyone out there? It opened of its own accord. What did I tell you? Those that haunt the mill are letting us go now. Well, you can believe that if you want to. Uh... Jim... I'll tell you something... Something else that's strange, at least to me. This is the very first time I've been in the mill when I wasn't deathly afraid. Everything that's happened tonight, I... I can almost foresee it. It didn't frighten me. Do you think that finally I've been accepted by the spirits who live here? Spirits? <sighs> Frankly, Charlie, I don't know what to make of it, and I'm not going to pretend I do, but I can tell you this. I am sure there are physical reasons for everything that has happened here tonight. Physical, not metaphysical. A few days went by and I heard no more from Charlie Royce. I was a little concerned over his head injury, so one night after office hours, I went over to Gorse Hill Farm. 
It was about nine o'clock after dinner. Oh, I'm glad you stopped by, Doctor. Mr. Ross, good evening. I was going to come see you about my back. How is that uh, muscle tenderness? Yeah. On the whole, you've improved a great deal since last year, oh. you know. I have, I have still. Uh... I'll prescribe some new exercises for you to do. How's your son, Charlie, and uh, Mrs. Royce? We haven't seen Charlie since the night before last. Or was it the night before that? I don't know what that boy is up to. I really came by to see how that cut was mending. I'll tell you this. His mother's taken it pretty hard. He's away three years, back one day, and then out every day with that girl. I'll bet she knows where he is. You haven't seen him? He hasn't been here for two nights? Three. And his mother's crying her eyes out. You know what I think? Of course, I haven't been over to Hannah's folks to ask them. But I think those two young'uns ran away. I haven't mentioned that to Mrs. Royce, but that's what I think. But why would Charlie do a thing like that? There are lots of reasons. Maybe Mr. and Mrs. Bliss weren't uh, so all fired happy about Charlie showing up. They were kind of keen on her marrying Silas, you know. The hearts have got more money than the rest of the town put together. His brother Ezra has the Burton Inn, one in Axminster. He runs a fleet of fishing boats. Silas, his mother and father, well, I'd say they own half the town. He'd be a darn good catch. What sort of work does Silas do? He does nothing. He doesn't have to. If you were going to come into property stretching from the seacoast clear over to the mill and back, you wouldn't have to work it. I'm sorry Charlie is not here. I'd better start for home or I'll get blown off the road. You tell Charlie I stopped by and I'll be seeing you, Mr. Royce, with those exercises for your back. Now, don't worry about Charlie. He'll be back. Goodbye, now. Uh, doctor, w will you close that front door? It's blown out every candle in the room. Either go out and close the door or come back in. I... I can't budge this door. It won't move. It, it, it's stuck open. Doctor? Doctor? I can't see a darn thing in the dark. Doctor, are you still there? I'm still here, Mr. Rice. Uh, can you uh, strike a match? A match? Say, what happened to the fire? There was a fire in that fireplace. Why didn't you close that door? I couldn't, Mr. Ross. I pushed it with all my might. It wouldn't give. Here, maybe I've got a match. What's that, Tonya? Isn't there someone standing at the door? There is someone. Charlie. Charlie, is that, is that you? Charlie. It is you. You still got that bandage on. Here, let me have a look. I'm not ready yet. Not yet. Not yet. Where have you been, boy? Your mother's been frantic. Tell mother that I love her. And I always will. Come on over to the fire. We were just going to light it. All the candles went out. Come on, sit down, boy. I have a long way to go. But I'm not ready yet. You're going away again? Charlie! I can't see you, Charlie. I think he's gone, Mr. Royce. What do you mean he's gone? He, he, he was just here. We were talking to him. Charlie! Where is that boy? I didn't see him go out the door, did you? No. Ah, oh, here I found some matches. I light this candle. You're right. He isn't here anymore. I... I... I could see him. You know, because... Did you notice he had a kind of... greenish light all around him? Yes, I noticed that. L like when we fish at night. Phosphorescence, they call it. He didn't pass me to go upstairs. We didn't see the front door open. Maybe he got out somehow and he's standing outside. I'll have a look. Charlie... Charlie! Hannah! What are you doing here? Come inside, child. Hannah! Did, did you see Charlie out there? No, I, I didn't, Mr. Royce. 
It's Charlie that I've come here about. Look, here, take off your wet things, dear. I, I can't stay. I, I promised Mother I'd be back as soon as I could. Oh, Dr. Patmore, this is Hannah Bliss. How do you do? What is it, Hannah? What about Charlie? Did you two decide to come back? I, I, I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Royce. Charlie and I didn't go anywhere. Is he here? Can I talk to him, please? Charlie's not here. I mean... I mean, I thought he was just now. It, well, it's so hard to explain. I, I thought he was with you. Uh, Hannah, these past few days, you mean to say that you have not seen Charlie? No. Not, not for three days. Well, what's the matter? What, what do you mean? He was here just now? Why won't he come to see me? What, what, uh, what have I done? Are you saying that you haven't seen him for three days? I haven't, no. The last time was the morning after I told Silas we couldn't get married. Charlie had an accident, his, his head. That afternoon, we were going to the church, change the old bands and ask the priest to post new ones. I'd been waiting and waiting and nearly going crazy. And then I thought maybe he'd decided he didn't want to marry me after all. So I put my pride in my pocket and came over here to find out. But you say he's not here. When will he be back? We don't know. Hannah, it's all right. I'm sure it's just a misunderstanding. He'll show up. Do you think he's all right? Oh, of course he is. Now, uh, you trot back home, dear, before more parents get worried about their children. All right? Yes, sir, I will. And thank you, Dr. Patmore. And you, Mr. Royce. I I'm sorry if I caused any trouble. I, I didn't mean to. I'll, I'll make Charlie a really good wife. I promise I will. Oh, of course you will. Now, go on home. Good night, Mr. Royce. Good night, Dr. Patmore. Good night. Hannah hasn't seen my boy in all these days either. But we saw him, Doctor, didn't we? I mean, I'm not, I'm not going crazy. We saw him and we heard him. One possibility. A blow like he'd received could have caused temporary amnesia. Charlie may be wandering around not knowing who he is or where he is. Well, if that's really him we saw... What did he mean? He wasn't ready yet. Oh, Lord. What am I going to tell his mother? That you saw him and he's all right and he'll be back. Do you honestly believe that, Doctor? It, it, it just isn't ordinary what happened. Do you know what I think, Doctor? No. I think Charlie is dead. And that wasn't Charlie who came here. It was his spirit. Oh, now, nonsense. You can't believe that. Oh, yes, I do. I feel it in my bones. I know it. Maybe we'll find Charlie somewhere. His body. But we'll never find him alive. Could they have seen the ghost of Charlie Royce and not his living body to appear like that and disappear? What human can do that? Or were both the doctor and the boy's father hypnotized somehow? But why was Charlie's father so positive he would never again see his son alive? If there are answers to these mysterious happenings, let's hope we find them when I return shortly with Act Three. Patmore, M.D., was being shaken. The science of cause and effect seemed no explanation of the mysterious occurrences in the little town of Brinton-by-the-Sea. And if scientific deduction failed Dr. Patmore, his destiny was somewhat less than controllable. That concerned him deeply. He knew he could not let himself be frightened or feel fated. He had to find out. I had to find out. Where had Charlie Royce gone? Was he alive or dead? Hiding or killed? Days passed and still no sign of him. Yet simply vanished. Some suspected Charlie's rival Silas, who said nothing. And said he knew nothing. 
One day, Silas's brother Ezra Hart, who ran the Brenton Inn, asked me to come see his wife, who was ill. I examined her and then joined him downstairs, where he was working at the bar. How is she, Doc? It's a touch of flu, Ezra. There's nothing more. A lot of it going around. Uh, how long will she be laid up? It's hard to say. Two weeks, about. Now, you keep her warm and quiet. Two weeks? Well, what am I going to do about the inn? You can't get any help these days. Oh, surely there's someone you can call on to help you out. What about your brother Silas? Oh, you must be joking, Doctor. Silas? The worst thing my father ever did was to leave him money. He hasn't lifted a finger to do an honest day's work since he was 15. He's not ambitious like Charlie Royce was. Was? Well, I mean, is. For all I know. I just haven't seen him lately. Did Charlie Royce come to the inn, Ezra? The chief of police asked me the same question. Once about time they started asking questions. And my guess is that Charlie went back to sea. Anyway, I told him Charlie was here the day after the big storm. He had a bandage around his head. Said he was going to see a priest later, but he was still kind of groggy from falling off his horse the night before. About, about six it was. He, he sat right where you are, Doctor, right there. Drank a pint of ale and started to get dark fast, real black outside. Another big storm blowing in off the sea. I turned around and suddenly it was gone. Was he walking or riding, Ezra? He was walking. His horse had bolted the night before and he still hadn't found it. I said to the police chief that... You have to cross the common to get to the rectory. There are several pools and treacherous hollers on the common. You ought to search there. So I suppose they're looking there, eh? Well, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, how much do I owe you for visiting Mrs. Hart? Oh, I'll send you a bill, Ezra. Don't worry. Oh, Charlie will turn up, I'm sure. Like a bad penny. <laughs> you know, I can understand you saying that. After all, Silas is your brother. Well, even if he weren't. It was wrong of Charlie to come back and turn that girl's head. That wasn't right. No, sir. Charlie knew Hannah was spoken for. Why, even the bands had been posted. Them running around made Silas the joke of the town. You'll find lots of folks here, but not too old fired sorry that Charlie's gone. Charlie's disappearance lengthened into weeks, then months. Everyone for miles around had some theory. Finally, the police gave up their search. No one seemed to care anymore except his father and Hannah Bliss. Winter was upon us, roads almost impassable. But I had one patient I always managed to see, sick from disappointment and anxiety. A rather difficult illness to cure. The fourth time this week, Doctor. You're spoiling me. Oh, I had to pass this way anyway, Hannah. I had a visitor this morning. Someone I hadn't seen in a long time. Do you remember Silas Hart? Oh, yes, I certainly do. Where was your mother? Well, she was out at the market and Silas walked in the door. I hope he didn't upset you. I'm afraid he did. I've never seen him looking like that. Rings around his eyes, as if he hadn't slept for weeks. He said, I've kept from seeing you as long as I could. I know you aren't well. What did he want, Hannah? He said, Charlie's been gone a long time now. What about us? And I said, Charlie was gone for three years and I didn't wait for him. This time I'm going to. And how long did he stay? About an hour. He said... Couldn't we try to make it like it was before Charlie came back? And I said to him, No, Silas, I'm going to wait for him. And then he got up and went to the door and said, Well, that may be, Hannah. But if it's Charlie you want, I think you're going to have to wait a long, long time. <laughs> Hannah down. It was the uncertainty as much as the anxiety that made her ill. If only she could know what had happened to her fiancé, I felt that she could recover, even if the news was the worst. 
On the way home, late as it was, I could see the old mill. For some reason, I took the cliff road, the sea churning below me. Doctor! Doctor, pay it more! Hello, Ezra. Doctor! What are you doing out there? Doctor, quick! Come and help me! What's the matter? Can you climb down these rocks to the beach with me? There's trouble. What is it? It's Silas. He came to the inn an hour ago and he handed me the keys to his house and he said, here, I won't be needing these anymore. Then he walked out. I ran out and asked people and they said, try the cliff road. When I got here, Silas was standing out there on one of them rocks. I called to him. He didn't hear me. Then I saw you coming, Doctor, so I ran up to the road to get you. I don't see him. I don't see anybody. Silas! Silas! Where are you? Silas! Silas! Oh, it's that girl. I know it is. Silas! Come back! There's nobody out there, is there? Not a soul. The sea, the rocks, seagulls. Now, come along. There's nothing we can do here. Uh, I bet when you went up the road to get me, Silas went on home. Come on, now. Uh, stupid fool. Over a girl to do that. Well, now, why are you so convinced that he's taken his life? There was something very wrong, but I could not believe, as did Ezra, that it was Hannah's doing. If Silas had drowned himself, only a very guilty conscience could have driven him to it. We climbed back up the cliff road, and as I mounted my horse, it suddenly reared and almost threw me. For up on the hill stood the old mill, every single window ablaze with light. It was there, I felt, that the key to unlock this mystery lay. The only one person I could trust was Charlie Royce's father, John. So I went to see him and persuaded him to hitch up his cart with his favorite horse, Princess, and... Accompany me to the haunted mill. I thought you said it was all superstition, Doctor. You didn't believe in all that. Mr. Royce, if your journey should result in nothing, will you keep the matter a secret? Certainly. But why? All my adult life I have taken with a great grain of salt the possibility of anything unnatural happening in our very natural world. Well, then why are you going to the mill? One can always be wrong. Mm. Princess! Princess! What's gotten into you? She absolutely refuses to go on. Stop that! Go on there! Come on! Come on! Come on. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I see what it is. Up in the road ahead. You see it, Mr. Royce? Good Lord. A body. A corpse. As if I can see right through it. It's got... Blood streaming out of its head. Lying there like that, Mr. Royce. Mr. Royce, we're neither of us imagining this thing. Are we? Is it really there? I... I think it's Charlie. It glows, that, that greenish light, the same way Charlie was when he came to see us. It's gone. Well, I'm afraid Princess won't move a step. All right, tell your mayor, Mr. Royce. <sighs> The mill is hardly half a mile away. We'll each take a lantern. You mean walk it? Yes, yes, now. The red door is booted shut. All I have to do is pull the wooden bolt back. And the door will open. How did you know it could be opened? I've been here before with Charlie. Now, don't be frightened. The bats won't harm you. It's only this old mill laughing at us. Where do those steps lead? I've got to go up there. I have the same feeling, Mr. Royce, as if... As if we were drawn up there. We have to go. All right. One step at a time. I'll go first. Hold your lantern high. Uh, You see, there's a uh, closed trap door at the top there. I can't explain it, but... I can't wait to get up these steps. John Royce was one step right behind me, 
I reached the top and slowly pushed open a trap door. As I did, I am absolutely certain that I heard a sigh. Uh, They must have kept the grain for thrashing up here. There's still a sack of it over there in the corner. Yes. Well, let's have a look. Oh. Oh, no. What is it? I touched it just now with my foot, and, uh, uh, Mr. Royce, there is neither corn nor chaff in this sack. It's tied up at the top with a cord. I, uh, I have a knife done. Do you really want to open this sack? We have to, Doctor. You know we have to. All right, then. Let me cut the cord. verdict was murder by person or persons unknown. Whoever hid Charlie's body in the old mill knew that no one in this town would look there. I may have been wrong to doubt the spirit of that poor boy trying to tell us where to find his body. But was I wrong about Silas? Was it not guilt that impelled Silas to seek his own watery death? Who else had the motive? The very next day, the old mill collapsed into a pile of wood. It had given up its last ghost. To Dr. Jim Patmore, the greatest mystery of all was that he should have been selected by some supernatural power to bring this crime to light. I shall return shortly. who make a study of the occult believe that anyone who has suffered a violent death cannot rest until that death has been avenged. That the spirit will keep reliving its final agony like a phonograph needle stuck in the last groove of a record. We trust fate will be kinder to you and that you may never meet up with a homeless, tortured, wandering spirit. Our cast included Ralph Bell, Russell Horton, Patricia Elliott, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Stories of possession are the fashion nowadays... The invasion by the devil of a person's body and soul in order to control his actions. But possession has an insidious sister as demanding and disastrous. 
obsession. The occupation of the mind by an idea or desire so dominating that one can easily find oneself equally at the mercy of the devil. This is one such story. I kept thinking, what kind of trip am I on? Of course, it couldn't be you, Susan. Nobody can talk underwater. Come to me where I lie. But keep my secret. The time is not yet. Remember, not yet. Nobody could talk underwater. But somebody did. <laughs> mystery drama, The Sea Nymph, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Norman Rose and Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. must all have heard of Morgan Childs. His wealth, of course, is legendary. His many and varied interests, equally so. Bicon Rubber Company, which spans the world. His coffee and sugar cartels. The Machine Tool Company. Two airlines. Homes in England, Palm Springs, New York, Greece, and Zurich. The Childs Foundation and its offshoots. The Medical Center. The Institute for Research. The Think Tank at Berkeley. His many wives... His florid lifestyle, his art collection, definitely a name to be conjured with. A man of many obsessions. One of them to be his undoing. A man with all the strings of life in his hands. Save one. The one on which his own life depended. Your name? Uh, Scott Fallon, sir. I don't like, sir. Call me Mr. Childs. Yes, sir. <laughs> I mean, uh, Mr. Childs. Better. Age, 25. Height, 6'1". Weight, 185. Uh Uh-huh. You look in prime condition. Uh, You can check my Navy discharge papers for that. How many hitches did you do? Two. Why did you get out of the Navy? Not enough money. I didn't want to be a frog man all my life. How do you propose to make enough now that you're out? Start my own marine diving and salvage company. As soon as I get enough money to swing it. Mm -hmm. You go to work for me and you'll have more than enough. Oh, what's more than enough? $500 a day, seven days a week, and I want all 24 hours. Guaranteed six months, full option on your services up to two years. That's more than enough. How many bodies do I have to bury? How many fathoms deep? Nothing like that. Hmm. Is it inside the law? A shade either side, perhaps. But I guarantee that you will not suffer if the law intervenes. I think you could be my man. So I'll tell you what I'm after and see if you'll join me. Well, it don't hurt to listen. No. Uh, come with me. Where are we going? You'll see. Hey, secret panels. Whew. That's quite some safe. It has to be. It is the entrance to a vault very few people have ever entered. Uh, just one thing before you do. I want to guarantee that everything you see or hear from now on is top secret. What guarantee can I give but my word? I'll take it. How can you be sure? I can. You have been a marked man ever since you walked into my house for this interview. One false step and you won't be marked anymore. You'll be erased. Hey, just a minute. Now, just a minute before you open that damn door. Now, I don't like blackmail, mister, and I may not want your job. Well, that's up to you. Now, shall I open or not? Well, I guess I'm hungry enough. Okay, open your door, Mr. Childs. Very well. After you, Scott. Holy cow. It's like a pharaoh's tomb. No sarcophagi or corpses. Uh, Oh, you mean that it's sumptuous. Yeah, that's a good word. Hey, why would you want to hide all these treasures away from every... Ho, ho, ho. Stolen, huh? Oh, really, Scott. Do I need to be a thief? Most assuredly not stolen. Each of them, either treasure trove or bought and paid for. From whom? My dear boy, I don't ask questions when I have the opportunity to purchase a Rubens or a Rembrandt or an El Greco or a statue. 
statue like this, which almost certainly must have been sculpted by Michelangelo. Can you imagine? No private collector in the world since Lord Elgin has been able to claim such a treasure. In private? In private, of course. Governments today are most high-handed about proprietary rights. I prefer the old adage, finders, keepers. And you think you've found something else you want to keep? Correct. Something under the sea. Splendid. You are very astute. I wonder. Now, let me open this cabinet. I don't want you just to see this through the glass. I want you to touch it. What is it? What does it look like? Part of an arm? With a hand? A couple of fingers eaten away by long exposure to the sea? and huh, Something that looks like an arrow that it's holding. Exactly. It is a fragment of a bronze casting made in the 4th century B.C. The subject, a sea nymph named Palacia. The sculptor, the immortal Praxiteles. That's good? Good. Oh, my dear boy. If I were to tell you in millions what this statue might be worth, and here it is, right at my own back door. Here in New York? No, no, no. On the island of Kidius in the Aegean Sea. I'll explain all about it on the flight over. The island was named after a King Kidius, said to have been a grandson of Poseidon and guardian of the sea nymph Thalassia. There is a very pretty legend about her which helped me to recognize the tremendous value of the broken arm I found. Well, what was that, sir? I, I mean, Mr. Chuck. Oh, call me what you will. I don't feel old anymore since we're off on this venture. Well, I didn't mean to suggest that you were. Just a whim of mine, an idiosyncrasy, no matter. About uh, Tallahassee, uh, whatever her name is. Thalassia. Oh, yes, Thalassia. You see, she was surpassingly beautiful and not equipped with a mermaid's tail. There really was no reason why the boy, Adrianos, did not return her love. Except, perhaps, that Kidius had marked her for his own when she came of age. <laughs> the old goat. He wasn't old. That's about my age. Uh-huh. But that's beside the point. One day, so the legend goes, the god Eros. He, of course, was the Greek god of love. A little chubby guy the Romans call Cupid with bow and arrow. Arrows, Scott. Arrows. No, pardon me, pardon me. One day, flying over the island, Cupid, seeing Thalassia sunning herself on a rock, flew low over the water to look at her. This kid was sex man. He flew so low, his wing inadvertently brushed a wave, and in no time he was floundering helpless as any land bird in the water. Thalassia rescued him and bore him ashore. As a reward, he drew an arrow from his quiver, giving it to her and telling her it would win for her any man she desired. The arrow in the statue's hand. Correct. Correct. Well, what happened? Didn't she get to use it? Yes, she waited her time until one day her guardian was returning to the island by boat with Adrianus aboard. Just as dusk was falling, she swam under the boat, coming up on the other side, so that those aboard the boat who were watching the sunset had their backs turned toward her. She rose from the sea, plunging the arrow into Adrianus's heart. Well, the whole thing backfired and she killed him. No, no, not quite. But it backfired all right. A chance shift in the wind twisted the boat off course. And the arrow, instead of reaching its intended target, went through the back of Kidius to lodge in his heart. And he didn't need it since he already wanted it. Yes. So how did it turn out? Tragically. In horror, seeing her fate sealed, rather than give herself to Kidius, she sank into the sea and was drowned. But she was a sea nymph. In the moment of giving her love, she became mortal. The sea was no longer her home, but her grave. Oh, oh. So this old-time sculptor made a bronze statue of her. Yes. It was commissioned by Kidius and placed in a temple overlooking the sea. Well, what happened to uh, Adrianus? I don't know that anyone knows. Oh, hey, we're, we're coming down. Oh, ears are popping. <laughs> yes, we're very nearly into Athens. And from there? My private yacht is moored in Paris. It's being specially outfitted with diving equipment. The most modern, obtainable. And then we sail to uh, Kidius, huh? Correct. And more underneath that temple? More or less. The temple is no longer there, of course. Well, then how did you stumble on, uh, well, you know, the uh, the piece of the statue? Two years ago, my, my ward fell in love with the island. She wanted to stay there, so I bought a villa. Last year, while diving off the rocks, I... 
I found the arm. You died? Well, I used to. A slight heart condition has ended that activity. Well, that's too bad. But then, I mean, before that heart thing, you, you didn't look for the rest of it? Even at my best, I couldn't. The piece I found was only in 60 feet of water at the edge of a drop-off. As if in one last attempt, the Lassia had tried to keep from slipping to the bottom of the ocean. Any idea how deep? I had soundings taken. And? 200 feet. Hey, man, you don't want scuba. You need a deep sea diver. No, no. Not enough mobility. And they'd attract too much attention. Are you going to back out? I might just think about it. A little late. The landing gear just came down. But in spite of the implied threat, I was going to think about it. That's a hell of a depth to work at. Then I saw the girl. She was waiting for us with a chauffeur and a limousine. And if she'd been as plain as a freckle, she would have stood out. But with that tawny mass of brushed gold hair, the sea gray eyes, and that figure, (laughs) she would have stood out at a Miss America pageant. I took one look at her, and I was hooked. Uh, Scott, this is my, uh, this is, uh, Susan Gentry. Susan, Scott Fallon. Hi, Scott. Miss, uh, Gentry? I didn't expect to see you here in Athens. Oh, I bummed a plane hop over with Theo. I wanted to sail back with you on the sea nymph. Are they finished refitting her? It's the word I got from Captain Mollis this morning. Mm-hmm. Were you aboard? No. Chorgos is usually an old lamb, but he pulled rank on me. Pretty high security around there, Uncle. What's going on? <laughs> We all piled in the limo for the short ride to Piraeus. Susan and Morgan Childs were busy with small talk in the back while I sat up front with a chauffeur, frustrated. I could hear, but that didn't interest me as much as seeing. I had to wait till we got to the dock. As we headed out the jetty, Morgan Childs' hand was on my arm, holding me back so that Susan went ahead of us toward the big 48-foot twin diesel catch that was moored there. She's beautiful, isn't she? Terrific. Out of sight. I'm talking about the boat. Oh, yeah, of course, sir. Uh-huh. She's all yours. <clears throat> the ship, I mean. My ward is something else. She sure is. I want to point out one thing, and I will point it out only once. I'm Susan's guardian. She's the daughter of an old friend. He left her in my keeping. Uh, yes, sir. I intend to keep her. His eyes were steely blue. I was so mad that I kind of blacked out. Suddenly, there was this voice. No, dear one. No. Remember me. Remember the last year. I'm waiting. Waiting for my time. What the devil was that? (laughs) And then suddenly my mind was clear. And strangely, I found myself understanding that old legend. Why Adrianus wouldn't give the nymph a tumble. He'd been warned off by old Kittius just the way I'd been. I was in way over my head. What is this? Ancient history repeating itself after 2,500 years? But so far, Susan has shown no particular interest in Scott. So that leg of the triangle is left open. If it should be closed, will the pattern still be the same? We'll know more about that when I return shortly with Act Two. The Aegean Sea, since it is a part of the Mediterranean is the same breathless blue. In the summer months, the sky reflects the color of the ocean, a great arching bowl, cloudless and infinite, unchanged and unchanging since three millennia ago when Ulysses lost his way among these ancient islands on his long journey home from the Trojan Wars. Somewhere among the scattered hundreds of dots of gray-white rock that dapple the dark mantle of the water is Chidios. And standing off to sea from the headland where the temple with the statue of the sea nymph stood so long ago is the catch 
that bears her legend on the transom. Well, why can't I go with you, Scott? Forget it, Susan. This is over your head. Oh, come on. I've been diving with you the last three weeks. It's getting too deep. Now, even I don't like going down this far myself. Then don't. I got to, Susan. I got to find that lady. Why? Boss man says so. And when he calls the tune, you dance? Well, that's what I get paid for. Now, hand me that hood, Susan. It's cold down there. Here. You're going to wear mittens, too? Uh-huh. Hey, what's the hold-up? I thought you'd be overboard by now. Well, it takes a little longer to be ready to dive this deep. Here, let me give you a hand with the tanks. I'll help him, Uncle Morgan. I asked you not to call me that. Did uh, Captain Malice position the boat right for you? That far edge of the grid. This is as far out as I'll be diving. In this gear, anyway. 200 feet? Check. How many dives <sighs> at this depth to complete the sweep? Oh, eight to ten. And uh, if you don't find her? Well, you'll need a bigger tender and a whale of a lot more equipment. It's no good. You, uh, see that? What? Uh-oh, government? It's too far to make identification. But I wouldn't be surprised. They've overflown us a couple of times in the last few weeks while you were below. So far, they've accepted us as just a pleasure craft. The woman's influence. With me aboard, what else could we be? I'm very well aware of your value to me, Susan. Now, be a good girl and go aft and tell Jorgis to break out the fishing gear so we can continue the illusion. But I want to go with Scott. No, no, I told you, Miss Gentry, no go. Hurry, my dear, that plane is getting too close for comfort. Oh, try and have anything nice. <laughs> She's something else. And I urge you to keep reminding yourself someone's else you haven't forgotten. No, Mr. Childs, I have not. And I'm sure you wouldn't let me. Yes, you're perfectly correct. Well, tank's secure? Yep, all set. Want a hand going over? No, I can manage. Here, let me check the standoff on the ladder. Okay. How long will you be under? Oh, a couple of hours. That'll give me 60 minutes on the bottom. What happened to the plane? It uh, veered off to the south. I don't think it was a patrol plane. Now, take it easy on the bottom. Uh -huh. Give yourself plenty of time for the ascent. I wouldn't want to lose you. Not at least till you've finished the job. Oh, thanks. Uh -huh. You're welcome. Je sais bien la femme. Yeah, I've always had an eye for the ladies. I know. From your dossier. That's why I warned you to be careful to keep your eye on the right one. I heard you the first time. You don't have to keep... The... Hey, what the... Hell? Susan, what happened? Hey, you know... Listen, you lame brain. I told you this, this dive was out for you. Yes, teacher, but I didn't listen. And don't bear your fangs at me, shark. I'm only going to be your pilot fish for the first leg. See you at the hundred foot mark. You get after her and send her back to the surface, Scott. Now, don't worry, sir. Leave her to me. Leave her to you, young man. Oh, no. Only for the moment. So, she is infatuated with you. That becomes more and more obvious. I suppose I should have foreseen the possibility. But I really gave you more credit, Susan. I thought you had matured enough by now to realize you could be no one's but mine. Ah, patience. Patience. She'll accept it in time. The habit of being rich is very hard to shake. Even for someone as romantic as our underwater demigod. Fortunately, the boy seems to know his place. But I think... Yes, I'm quite sure of it. I must have a little talk with Susan. I'm quite all right, thank you. Just extending a helping hand. I don't feed one. I'm a big girl now. Oh, I quite agree. But that was really a foolish thing to do. Why? I'm perfectly at home in the water. I know that, my little water nymph. Oh, I'm not your water nymph. He's down about 150 fathoms down there. Ah, that one. Yes, I hope. Now, let me get your tanks. Uh, oh, yeah, that's there. It. Uh, I have them. Uh, I, uh... I take it when you left him, Scott continued on down. Yes. Uh-huh. Well, he should be on the bottom by now. Oh, long ago. He was using the line to climb down. I wonder if... Oh, here, I'll, I'll take the flippers. It's okay. I'll just toss them in the tank box. You were going to say you wonder if he'll find your grubby statue today. Yeah, something like that. What are you going to do if he does? Get her on board. Oh, pretty heavy, wouldn't she be, with only three men aboard? No, not with a block and tackle. From the piece I have found already, we know she must be hollow cast. 
She shouldn't weigh over 250 to 300 pounds. <laughs> she doesn't sound quite your type. Well, I have very Catholic tastes. Just an idle thought, but supposing the Greek Navy should show up anywhere along the line and find you in the process of smuggling out a national treasure, what would happen to you? I don't really like to think. Greek prisons are not noted for their hospitality or uh, comfort. What? You mean Daddy Warbucks would be up against a wrap all his money couldn't fix? I hate to admit it, but it's one gamble I hope never to make. The Greeks take an exceedingly dim view of despoilers of their culture or their historical heritage. Then why risk it? You see, it's an obsession, Susan, to own whatever I conceive to be priceless or unique which falls into my path. No matter what the cost, I... What is it now? Nothing. Oh, it's just the buckle on my weight belt. It's foul. Uh, Let me get it for you. No, I... I said, let me get it for you. I can manage. Like I said, I'm a big... You... You don't have to tell me that you're a big girl. I've been aware of it longer than you think. (sighs) Susan, I've waited as long as I can. I want you, not as my ward, a surrogate daughter, but as a woman. You have to be kidding, Uncle. I I mean, Morgan... I assure you that I am serious. Dead serious. But I'm less than half your age. And totally dependent upon me. I don't have to be. I I can go away. Where? How? With what? I'm not penniless. Oh, but you are, my dear, you are. But my father left you money. Your father left me nothing but you, my dear. And a mountain of debts which I cleared for him so that he could rest in peace. Oh, no. Morgan, please... Don't make it sound the way you do. Please. Daddy couldn't have. He didn't mean me to. No, no, no. It won't wash, Susan. You're much too smart a woman. You must have known for some time, or if not known, guessed how things really stand. And don't blame your father. He was thinking of you. I think you must be mad. Possibly a little. I told you that I'm a man of obsessions, but also a man of patience. I can wait a little longer. But I warn you, once the obsession is there, I never stop till I get what I want. I blame myself, naturally. I was too eager. I should have been content to bide my time a little longer. But I've been having a few bouts with angina lately. I told myself it was just nervous tension because both my treasures were so near but not yet attained. Still, it did remind me that with one heart attack behind me, I no longer, particularly at my age, could count time an ally. Sooner or later, I would not have the patience to wait. How soon, I realized only two nights later. Susan. Oh, how about a hand, partner? The girl is poof. Hold it down, hold it down. What did you do, swim all the way out from the house? Oh, Oh, I didn't fly. Hey, you must be out of your head. Oh, let's say desperate. I wanted to talk to you without Uncle Morgan around. Or any of my other jailers. Keep your voice down. Jorgus won't hear us. I can hear him snoring. Oh, but your uncle might. Morgan? But he's back at No, the... no, he's not. He came out here to the boat about an hour ago in, in the dinghy. Where is he now? Asleep, I hope. What? What did he want? A showdown. About us? Us? He knows, Scott. Knows? What what the devil is there to know about us? He knows how I feel about you. And I've heard him warn you off what he considers his personal property often enough. Now, wait a minute. Hold up. Have you got some notion that, that I got a thing for you? You know you have. Just as I do for you. Susan, I... It's true, isn't it? Yeah. Heaven help us. It's true. Oh, I love you, Scott. So do I. But I gotta get you off the boat before he before he knows you're here. I can swim back. Oh, no, not a chance. No, I'll row you back. We shouldn't risk it. If he finds us together. We'll take that chance. If he does, then it will be showdown time. You know he's mad, don't you? 
He might even have us killed. No, I don't think so. I've got one ace in the hole I've been holding out, trying to figure how to use. What? I found his damn statue. I found it a couple of weeks ago. I'm the only one who knows where it is. Maybe I can trade him one ancient Greek maiden for one certified American beauty. I heard it all. I could have killed him right there, but it was better to wait. I still wanted both women, and Scott was the key to them. To find one, and to use it to get the other. Then, he could die. I do introduce you to the nicest people, don't I? But then, what would a mystery be without suspense? And what better suspense than a bona fide threat of death to people you care for? Or don't you care what happens to Scott and Susan? If you do, I hope you'll be waiting when I return shortly with Act Three. A full red moon hangs low in the sky, its beams sparkling on the barely heaving bosom of Homer's wine-dark sea. The small boat and its two occupants are silhouetted boldly on the water. As nearing the shore, Scott rests on his oars, allowing the dinghy to float silently. Damn moon. Don't. It's a lover's moon. Yeah, and the losers if we get spotted. I don't want to risk getting any closer inshore till it sets. I can swim for it. Oh, tide's running out. Current's against you. <laughs> Why risk it? Hey, you guarded at the villa? Not openly. But the servants are all his people. There's never less than two security guards. That's what they're called. Gunful. No uniforms. Shoulder pistols. And they look like everybody thinks the mafia ought to look. How did you get away? They just patrol the fence and monitor the gates. They figure there's no way out by water. I wish I could see a way out by land or sea. Why did you hold back when you found Thalassia? I don't know. Maybe I was just greedy. For what? The money he's paying you? Oh, that. And maybe I wanted to be around you a little longer. That's sweet. <laughs> Only it had to go and turn sour. I don't know. Uh, maybe it didn't. Maybe she was right. She? Who's she? Oh, uh, forget it. I just slipped out. I can't forget it. You sounded so strange. Well, I was that day. The last dive. I was on three a day. Remember how woozy I was the last time up? I sure do. Even Morgan made me cut you down after that. You scared me out of my head. Remember, I came down after you. You acted just like you had narcosis. Well, I figured it for raptures of the deep myself. Only, after what happened down there, or what I thought happened... Tell me. Well, it, it was my third trip down. Uh, I was I was about 180 feet just below the edge of the cliff, sweeping out to the western end of the grid we boxed out, when suddenly I heard it. At first, I thought it was your voice. I mean, it sounded just like you. But then it had said Adriana, so it couldn't be you. And then I thought, what kind of a trip am I on? Of course, it couldn't be you. Nobody can talk underwater. Come to me where I lie. But keep my secret. The time is not yet. Remember. Nobody could talk underwater, but somebody did. 
I swam towards the sound of the voice. And there she was, half buried in the sea floor on the side where the arm had broken off, the other one reaching out as if to say, Here is my hand. Take it. Take it. But not yet. I shook it off and I started up, decompressing. And on the way, I decided to play a gut hunch and I buttoned up. I didn't say I'd found a sea nymph. Tell the truth, I wasn't sure the whole thing wasn't some kind of... kind of mirage. You suppose it was? Uh Uh-uh. I double-checked the next day. And there she was. Did she... uh, Well, I know it sounds silly, but... Did she speak again? (laughs) No. She was just a 2,500-years-old statue worth millions who... Who, for my money, can rest in peace right where she is. Hey, there goes the moon behind the cloud. It's dark enough now for me to get you ashore. I'm not going. (laughs) It's our only chance. I know what you're planning to do. Offer him a deal to let me go. That's the general notion. It won't work. He'll kill you and hunt me down. Oh, no, he won't. Not if I have to kill him first. God, he's armed. Uh, Who's the captain? uh, They're both old. I'm young. And I still have the trump cards. What? I know where the statue is buried. And I'm the only one can get to it. I'll see you have enough head start and I'll meet you after. We'll make a rendezvous. We still don't stand a chance. Not right now. But play our cards as they lie. And I have a hunch, a real strong one, that we'll pull it out. It was a tough job convincing Susan. But finally, quite suddenly, she gave in. And I landed her and headed back for the catch. I held back one thing from her. My hunch. (laughs) That was too screwy to admit, even to myself. It haunted me. That somehow, some way, the last year was a lady who was going to bring us luck. But it sure didn't look that way as I got back to the scene. Uh, ah! Forgive me if a sudden light blinds you, Mr. Fallon. But better to see you with no sudden moves, please. Both the captain and I have guns. All right, no moves. Just get that damn light out of my eyes. In good time. First. What did you do with uh, my ward? I took Miss Gentry back to the shore. Good. That saves me the trouble of having to arrange for her return. How did you know she was here? As it happens, I wasn't asleep when she arrived. I overheard everything that was said between you. Everything. Good. Saves a lot of time. Now get rid of your stooge here and we go up to the bridge and deal. I admire your effrontery. Deal for what? Your lady or mine? No, no, give her everything she needs. Car, money, whatever she wants, and let her go. No, 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 don't follow her. She's to be absolutely free. Uh, One minute. Are you satisfied, Scott? Not quite. Put Susan on the phone. Let me talk to her. Very well. Uh, Nikos, put Miss Gentry on the phone. Scott? Uh, Thanks. Susan? Susan? Uh, You all right? Yeah, 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 darling. Everything's all right at my end. No? No, no, it's going to work out. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, as soon as you get to America, call me and let me know. When I know you're safe, I'll take Morgan to his 2,000-year-old date. (laughs) She's a bit nearer his speed than you are. No, no, my darling. Not shipped ashore. We'll be waiting at the villa for your call. Uh Uh-huh. Yes, I love you, too. Now what? We wait for Susan's call. a couple of degrees. Aye, aye, sir. Uh, that'll do it. Hold her. Hold her there. Steady as she goes. Now, just thread the needle between those twin rocks. Uh, yes, sir. Now, you can drop her to idle. Let her have her way. Neutral it is. Now, I'll go forward now to run out the anchor. When I give you the signal, hard stern. Aye, aye, Captain. <laughs> oh, Captain, my Captain. Your fearful trip is... Almost done. Harder stern. How long will you be down? Our first dive will be a good three hours. 
take me that to get her dug out and the rope cradled around her. Second dive, well, it'll be a short one just to attach the winch rope. But I'll need time to decompress coming up. Yes, but can we raise her by sundown? All things being equal, it'll be a long, lonely day for you. Well, I'm sure I can find ways to pass the time. Yeah, it had better not include having a surprise party for me when I come up. Now, remember the deal. This is just between us two. Yes, I remember. You're sure that we can get her on board? We'll right? manage. It'll be better. We will. Then we sail under power to Piraeus, and you drop me there free and clear. You will be free and clear, my friend. Count on that. Okay. Here goes nothing. I can't believe I'm really going to see her at last. Uh, she's a little the worse for wear. You said she was intact. Nothing could dim her beauty. Uh, you can judge for yourself any minute. Uh, she's about to break water. Yep, there she comes. All right, slow down the wind. Slow down. We'll swing her aboard. Okay, easy now. Hold it. Yeah, we'll leave her like that just for a minute, standing almost tiptoe on the deck. Oh, Lord. Is she magnificent? Uh, to each his own. Yes, we'll, we'll just try the arm now to make sure not too much has been lost. Ah. Uh. Oh, look at that. Almost a perfect fit. Well, so long as you're happy. Oh, my dear Scott, I couldn't be more delighted. Everything has turned out quite perfectly. Okay, now you live up to your part of the bargain. <laughs> you should know better. I never make bargains, or if I do, I feel no need to live up to them. This is a double cross? Of course. You didn't think I'd let Susan get away from me? She already has. <laughs> With my resources, how long do you think it'll take to track her down? You forget what happens if you do. I blow the whistle on your affair with this lady and that secret room back home. Are you going to give up all your priceless treasure for, for two little people like us? Oh, you just aced me. Well, you knew the turn. I also knew that I still held a trump. What? Dead men tell no tales. Shoot him, boys. What? <laughs> Forgive me, Felicia, but yours was the weapon which came to hand. Well, Mr. Fallon, you really are a dead weight. Huh? Well, it's a good uh, thing I took the precaution of tying your hands. Uh, I thought that you had left us. What are you trying to do? I'm committing you for burial, suitably weighted down. No. I'm sorry you made the mistake of remaining alive. Wait, Morgan, no use. Greek ship around, headland. You're caught red-handed. Don't, don't, don't make it worse. I don't believe you. You're all I have to fear. So die, Mr. Frogman, die. I the seen him. This is the Greek Navy. You are ordered to remain at anchor. We are coming aboard. No. You're not going to take her from me. If I can't have her, no one shall. So where was the Greek scuba team? We'd arranged the whole thing. Darling, navies are navies. They wanted to wait until the statue was dropped to the deck to make the full case against Morgan. They were hanging in at five feet using sound equipment to monitor. Oh, great. So that's how I almost bought it, huh? Darling, it was just a miracle the way it happened. Yeah, who fished me out? Well, what do you mean? You know you had no air, so I kept you buddy breathing till I could get you back to the surface. You were there? Sure. I had proprietary rights. Besides, I didn't trust that other dame you've been tripping with. Who? Oh. The Lassia. <laughs> Did they get her up again? Brought her up this morning. And, and Morgan's body with her. Clue me in on that. What happened? He was trying to get rid of the evidence, I guess. He was swinging her out over the sea when the winch let go. And somehow his foot got fouled in the winch chain. She took him right to the bottom. How about that? 2,500 years she waited for her revenge. What do you mean? Well, maybe I'm still a little scrambled in the brains department. But didn't the three of us live out a legend that first happened about 500 B.C.? 
I guess in a way we did. Yeah. Only this time the twist has a happy ending. Yes, darling. My buddy. My breath is your breath. My time is your time. My house is yours. Let's go home. I said at the beginning that obsession was possession's insidious sister. And that it could put one equally at the mercy of the devil. What a happy thought that this time it was the devil who was obsessed. And who sowed the seeds of his own disaster. I'll be back shortly. The great archaeological museum in Athens houses such superb examples of the unparalleled sculpture of Greece's golden age as the boy on the horse, the statue of Poseidon, the beautiful young man who may be Paris, all in bronze, at least one of them dug from the sea. But the temple on the island of Chidios takes no back seat. The statue of Thalassia, the sea nymph, which has been restored to a pedestal near where it originally must have stood, would be the show place of the island, if it existed. But of course, it doesn't. You must allow us storytellers some poetic license. Our cast included Norman Rose, Paul Hecht, and Jada Rowland. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Exlax and True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The year 1892 provided some history-making events such as the completion of the Cape Johannesburg Railroad, the introduction of the first automatic telephone switchboard, the granting of patent rights for the internal combustion engine. Gladstone was chosen prime minister. And last but not least, a genius by the name of Sherlock Holmes took up residence at 221B Baker Street, offering his services as a consulting detective. And very shortly thereafter, he was called upon to solve the mysterious affair of the barrel coronet. Arthur, what are you doing in my room at this time of night? And why have you taken the coronet from the bureau? Father, I... I... You've dropped it. You've destroyed it, you thief. What did you do with the jewels you stole? Father, if you believe me a thief, I'll leave your house in the morning. If you leave, you'll leave in the hands of the police. The fact that I'm your father will not stop me from prosecuting you to the limit of the law for this vicious crime. Our mystery drama, The Adventure of the Barrel Coronet, was adapted from the Conan Doyle classic, especially for the Mystery Theater, by Murray Burnett, and stars Kevin McCarthy. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. A star is born 
is a theatrical statement of unarguable clarity. However, the truth of the statement doesn't apply only in the theater, but in the fashion, the arts, and literature. And so it was with Sherlock Holmes, who gained instant immortality as the world's foremost detective when he was first created by A. Conan Doyle more than 100 years ago. And now, we pick up Holmes and his famous friend, Dr. Watson, cozy by the fireplace in their Baker Street flat on a winter morning. I was standing at our bow window overlooking Baker Street one February morning when I observed a most unusual sight. A well-dressed man in his fifties running down the street oblivious of the stares of passers-by with his hands jerking up and down and his head waggling on his body. And I called to my friend, Holmes, uh, look at this madman. Doesn't it appear rather sad that his relatives allow him to come out alone? I think, Watson, I recognize the symptoms. They portray not madness, but a desire to consult me professionally. Mm. Ah, did I not tell you? The door, Watson, before he pulls the bell out of its socket. No doubt you think me mad. Oh, I see that you've had some great trouble. Well, heaven knows I have. A devilish combination of public disgrace and private affliction. Besides, it's not my trouble alone. The very noblest in the land may suffer unless a way is found out of this frightful affair. Pray you compose yourself, sir, and try to give me a clear account of who you are and this trouble that has befallen you. I'm probably known to you by name. I'm Alexander Holder, senior partner in the banking firm of Holder and Stevenson on Threadneedle Street. We have indeed heard of you, sir, and your firm. Oh, then you will understand what it means to me to have my son arrested and jailed for theft. Hmm. Who brought these charges against him? I did, Mr. Holmes. My son left me no choice. There's no doubt about his guilt. None at all. Well, then, what brings you to me? Desperation. I confess it. Complete desperation. Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard gave me your name. Ah. Although neither of us have much hope there's anything you can do. If that's true, I think you should hear it from me. But I can make no judgment until I have all the facts before me. It would help if you would start from the beginning. Uh, yes, of course, of course. Well, as you must know, one of our largest sources of income comes from confidential, very discreet loans to some of England's noblest families mm -hmm. who leave with us unimpeachable security. Your reputation in that field is well known. Yes, yes, yes. Well, yesterday morning, I advanced the sum of 50,000 pounds to... Well, the name really should remain confidential. As you wish, as you wish. And the security for this large sum? You have heard of the Beryl Coronet? Mm. One of the most precious public possessions of the Empire. And I respect your desire for discretion with the name of the owner, which is well known to the world. Well, I suppose it was inevitable you'd know the owner's name. I am surprised that this august gentleman would allow the coronet out of his possession. I brought that point up. But he assured me that he needed the money for only four days. Mm. And he was certain the coronet would be safe in my hands for that short length of time. And from what I gather, you took it home with you. Wasn't that an unusual procedure? Well, decidedly. But the coronet was so precious, I, I, I felt it would be imprudent to leave it behind me. Mm. Bankers' safes have been forced before. And if it should happen to me, <laughs> what a disaster. And therefore, I resolved that for the next few days I would carry the case containing the coronet back and forth with me, never leaving it out of my position. And your son, of course, knew about the coronet. Alas, yes. <laughs> Arthur's a good boy, Mr. Holmes. Uh, I must seem like an old fool telling you that while he's sitting in jail. You you see, Mr. Holmes, I've spoiled Arthur. Well, I don't deny it. I've granted his every wish, including allowing him to become a member of an aristocratic club where he fell in with men with long purses and expensive habits. Uh -huh. 
He gambled and lost and came to me again and again, imploring me for advances on his allowance to settle his debts. I take it, then, that he's more or less a gentleman of leisure. I wanted him very much to, to succeed me in my business. But to tell the truth, I was afraid to trust him with the handling of large sums of money. In fact, it was the conversation I had with him yesterday evening in my study. That is the most damning piece of evidence. I'll try to lay it before you just as it happened. I don't suppose you're going to look upon what I had to say very kindly, but I've left myself no choice. Was it money again, Arthur? I'm afraid so. Can you let me have 200 pounds? No, I cannot. I'm sorry. That's not true. I, I will not. I've been much too generous with you in money matters. I won't deny you've been very kind to me, Father, but... But this is truly an emergency. I must have the money or I can never show my face inside the club again. Well, a very good thing if you don't. You, you mean you'd have me leave the club a dishonored man? Now that's something of your own doing. I couldn't bear the disgrace. My patience has run out. You won't get a farthing from me. Very well. If you won't let me have it, then I must try whatever other means I can find. <laughs> Those were his last words before he left the room. Damning, aren't they? Mm -hmm, they can be. I'll withhold judgment until I have more to go on. Now, you've told me your son knew the coronet was in the house. Did he also know where? Uh, I see you're trying to do your best for him, Mr. Holmes, but it's no use. Arthur not only knew it was in the house, but also the exact location. How did that come about? Well, when I told him and my niece Mary about the coronet, they were both desperately anxious to get a close look at the famous crown. I thought it was wiser to leave it undisturbed. Well, then how? Arthur asked me where I'd put it. And when I told him it was in my bureau, he remarked that he hoped the house wouldn't be burgled during the night. I responded that my bureau was locked, and he told me that any old key would fit my bureau. In fact, he went so far as to say he'd open it himself as a child with the key of a of a box room cupboard. A most singular statement. Don't you think, sir? That's not the way I'd characterize it. It seemed to me absolute proof to his guilt. I still have reached no conclusion on that point, Mr. Holder. You have yet to hear the worst. After he left, I started around the house to see that all was secure. Is that your usual habit? No, no, not at all. I usually leave that to my niece, Mary. But last night, in view of the circumstances, I thought it best that I check myself. Understandable. And? Well, you must understand that my niece had lived with us for the past 15 years, and our relationship is more than that of father and daughter and of uncle and niece. As I came down the stairs, I saw Mary... Closing and fastening a window in the hall. Upon seeing me, she said immediately... Dad, did you give Lucy the maid permission to go out tonight? No, certainly not. She came in just now by the rear door. I don't doubt that she only went to the side gate to see her young man. But I think it could be dangerous if she makes a habit of it. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. One of us must speak to her in the morning. I'll do it. You have enough on your mind. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Good night, dear. Dad, it, is it the coronet or is there something else bothering you? Oh, dear, dear. How well you know me, dear Mary. Yes, yes, there is something. I know how I wish you could have found it in your heart to marry Arthur. It's my fondest wish. I know. <laughs> So I left her, went up to my bedroom, checked that the coronet was still where I'd placed it, and went to bed and fell asleep. I'm not a very heavy sleeper. About two in the morning, I was awakened by some sound in the house. I lay listening. Suddenly, to my horror, there was a distinct sound of footsteps moving softly in the next room. Well, I slipped fearfully out of bed and peered around the corner of my dressing room door. I'd left the gas half up, and by its light, 
I saw my son, dressed only in his shirt and trousers, standing beside the light, holding the coronet in his hands. He appeared to be wrenching at it with all his strength. I shouted at him, asking what he was doing in my room at this time of night. At my cry, he turned pale as death and dropped the coronet. (gasps) Father, no wonder you shake, you blackguard. Where are the jewels you've stolen from the coronet? Stolen? Yes, you thief. There are no jewels missing. There there can't be any missing. There are three missing. And you know where they are. Must I call you a liar as well as a thief? You've called me names enough. I shall leave your house in the morning. If you don't tell me what you've done with the jewels, you'll leave in the hands of the police. If you choose to call the police, then let them find what they can. Father... I won't raise a finger to help you. Today there's a good deal of talk about the breakdown of communications between parents and children. It certainly seems that there's a lack of communication between Arthur Holder and his father, and with good reason. What is the good reason? We'll find out in Act Two when I return shortly. Every father wants his son to grow up to be somebody. No matter that child experts claim this wish is, in reality, an expression of the father's own frustrations. One of the last things in the world a father would want is for his son to be a thief. So it's not difficult to imagine the staggering shock Alexander Holder underwent when he caught his only son, Arthur, in the act of stealing a priceless jeweled coronet. There's more to that miserable night than I've related, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> but I, I, can't, I can't go on. Oh, what shall I do? In one night, I've lost my honor, my gems, and my son. What shall I do? Face the facts. Pull yourself together and continue with the story. I'm not convinced that your son is a thief. But I saw him with a coronet in his hand. I hardly consider that conclusive. Was the remainder of the coronet at all injured? Yes, it was twisted. Mm-hmm. Isn't it possible that he was trying to straighten it? Uh, heaven bless you, but I'm afraid you're undertaking too heavy a task. What was he doing there in the first place? If he were innocent, why didn't he say so? Precisely. And if he were guilty, why didn't he invent a lie? His silence appears to cut both ways. But uh, pray continue. You've told me you were shouting. Now, what about the rest of the household? Oh, the whole house was astir. Mary was the first to rush into my room. At the sight of the coronet and Arthur's face, she screamed and fainted dead away. Mm. And when did the police enter the case? An inspector and a constable were there within an hour. And here again, Arthur's behavior pointed only to his guilt. If you'll allow me to recount the scene to you. Father, I'm asking whether it's your intention to charge me with theft. This is no longer a private matter. That coronet is national property. The law must take its course. You might at least do me one favor. And that is? Don't have me arrested at once. I implore you to let me leave the house for just five minutes. Believe me, it would be to your advantage as well as mine. So that you can run away? I give you my word I shall return if you let me leave. I'm afraid your word is something that holds no value in this situation. If you don't intend to run away, perhaps you wish to leave in order to conceal the stones you've stolen? When you take that attitude, I see it's useless for me to try to help you. Help me? Why don't you help yourself? There were 39 perfectly matched barrels in that coronet. Three are missing. You can still avert a national scandal. I beg you to tell me where the missing stones are, and I promise you that all will be forgiven and and forgotten. Keep your forgiveness for those who ask for it. When I heard those words, Mr. Holmes, I realized that anything further was useless. I called the inspector and gave Arthur into custody. Mm -hmm. 
Did the police make any attempt to locate the missing gems? Oh, they're still sounding the planking and probing the furniture in the hope of finding them. How about outside the house? Uh, they've shown extraordinary energy. The whole garden has already been minutely examined. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, my head is spinning. What do you make of it? Well, let's first look at what you make of it, Mr. Holder. It's your opinion that your son came down from his bedroom, went at great risk to your dressing room, opened your bureau, took out the coronet, broke a small portion of it off by main force, went off to some other place, concealed three gems out of some 39 with such skill that nobody can find them, then returned with the other 36 into the room in which he exposed himself to the greatest danger of discovery. Now, I ask you, sir, is such a theory tenable? Uh, certainly not the way you put it. But I ask you, what other is there? If his motives were innocent, why doesn't he explain them? It's my task to find out. Holmes, myself, and a thoroughly confused but slightly more hopeful Alexander Holder set off for Fairbank, a modest residence of the great financier. Holmes left us standing at the door and walked slowly around the house. He was so long that Mr. Holder and I went into the dining room and waited by the fire for his return. Now, as we sat there, a slim, dark, pale-faced woman entered the room. You've given orders that Arthur should be freed, haven't you, Dad? No, my dearest. The matter must be probed to the very bottom. But I'm sure he's innocent. Perhaps he refuses to talk because he's angry that you should suspect him. Would any sane man have acted otherwise? I, I saw what I saw. Trust a woman's instinct, Dad. Take my word for it that he's innocent. Let the matter drop and say no more. Uh, far from letting the matter drop, I brought a gentleman down from London to inquire more deeply into it. This gentleman? No, his friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. He's round in the stable lane now. The stable lane? What on earth can he hope to find there? Oh, this, I suppose, is he. I sincerely trust, sir, you will succeed in proving that my cousin Arthur is innocent of this crime. I hope I may prove it. I believe I have the honor of dressing Miss Mary Holder. May I ask you a question or two? Anything. Anything that will help clear up this horrible affair. Last night, you heard nothing yourself? Not until I was wakened by my uncle's voice and the shouting coming from his room. Mm -hmm. Your uncle has told me that you usually lock up at night. That's so. Did you fasten all the windows last night? Yes. And were they all fastened this morning? Yes. Now, you have a maid who has a sweetheart. I think that you remarked to your uncle last night that she had been out to see the sweetheart? Yes. She's also the girl who waited in the drawing room. And she may have heard Uncle's words about the coronet. Mm hmm I see. You infer, then, that she may have gone out to tell her sweetheart and that the two of them may have planned the robbery. Well, what's the use of all this? I saw Arthur with the coronet in his hands. These theories... Please, please, Mr. Holder, I must ask you to allow me to pursue the investigation in my own fashion. <laughs> Holmes wanted to see the dressing room and the coronet, and we, we all trooped upstairs. On the way, Holmes continued to question Mary Holder. Now, about the servant girl, Miss Holder. Last night, you saw her return to the house by the kitchen door, I presume. It was when I went to see that the door was fastened for the night. I met her slipping in. Mm -hmm. I saw the man, too, in the half-light. Do you know him? Oh, yes. He's the greengrocer who delivers our vegetables. His name is Francis Proper. He stood to the left of the door, did he not? Why, why, yes, he did. Then he's a man with a wooden leg. Why, you're like a magician. How did you know that? Since we've reached what's obviously your dressing room, Mr. Holder, I'd like now to have a look at the coronet. Uh, if you'll wait just a moment till I get the case in the bureau. Uh, there it is. Now, here... Here's the coronet. Thank you. I see this corner here corresponds to that which was so unfortunately lost. Might I ask you to break it off? You might not. I shouldn't dream of trying. Then if you'll allow me... I will. No. 
No, no chance. I feel it give a little. But although I have exceptional strength in my fingers, I cannot do it. Now, Mr. Holder, what do you think would happen if someone should succeed in breaking this off? I have no idea. There would be a noise like a pistol shot. And if you tell me that all this happened within a few yards of your bed and you heard nothing, then I say I do not believe it. Well, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, has my father succeeded in convincing you of my guilt? Are you here to get my confession? Quite the contrary, young man. I know that you are innocent. All I ask is that you confirm some deductions that I've made as to what happened in the house the night that the coronet was mutilated and the jewels stolen. Why well, should think it's your task to find the jewels? So it is, so it is. But you can make that task easier and at the same time clear yourself and ease your father's anguish. He's brought it on himself. Mm. Is your father also to blame for your gambling debts? Of course not. I've been a fool, but I'm through with all that. Once I pay this lost debt, I'll never touch a card again. And what about the club? I'll resign. Ah. And I won't miss it. I'll be glad never to walk through those doors again. And how about the friends you've made there? Sir George Burnwell, for instance. Won't you miss his company? I rather think it will be the other way around. Indeed. From what your father told me, I thought Sir George was your mentor and your ideal. Oh, you think you're very clever. Perhaps you are, but you'll get nothing from me. No more answers, nothing. If I am tried and convicted, so be it. And that is my last word. Well, I, I can't understand why you're looking so content, considering how little progress we made with that young man. My dear Watson, if you think back on the conversation, I'm sure you'll see we made gigantic strides. Huh? For one thing, he told us that he's equally angry with his father and Sir George Burnwell. Well, so he did, but well, how, how that helps is beyond me. Look at the facts. Up until the incident of the coronet, Sir George Burnwell, according to his father, was Arthur's constant companion and dazzling friend. Oh, well, and he was also in good terms with his father. Precisely. Now it stands to reason he has cause to turn against the father who accuses him of theft. But why does he also change his feelings about Sir George? Huh. I've no idea. Uh, and I don't see how it has anything to do with the matter we're looking into. Only this, Watson. That the sudden breaking off of this friendship comes at exactly the time of the theft of the coronet. Well, couldn't it be coincidence? Mm, exactly what I'm going to find out. This note is to a friend of mine who's a member of the same club, and I'm asking for an invitation. Huh. Well, what do you intend to do when you get there? Why gamble? Of course. Ah, Watson, you shouldn't have waited up for me. Oh. I might have been out all night. As a matter of fact, I should have been, but I felt that losing 150 pounds was more than enough. You lost 150 pounds? Mm -hmm. Naturally. I was cheated. Cheated? Mm -hmm. oh, by whom? Sir George Burnwell. Oh, but, but surely you unmasked the scoundrel. No, I did nothing of the sort. I paid my losses and walked away. Burnwell is a devilishly charming man. Well, I, I, I don't care how charming he may be. He's a cheat, and he should be blackballed. No doubt. Now, here. Look at this deck of cards. Huh? Mm -hmm. Observe how I'm holding it. In gambling circles, this is known as the mechanic's grip. Oh, sir. And should you ever sit down in a game with a man who holds the deck in this fashion, I urge you, Watson, to get up and walk away. Huh. Uh, and Sir George held the deck this way? Most certainly. And it enabled him to deal what gamblers call seconds. Oh. Well, it's too much for me. Let me illustrate. Uh -huh. Now, observe, Watson. I turn the top card face over. Uh -huh. What is it? Well, it's the Ace of Clubs. Exactly. And now watch as I deal you four cards and deal myself four cards. Now, since the Ace of Clubs was on top, it should be the first card I dealt to you. Isn't that so? Oh, yes, yes mm -hmm. certainly. All right. Turn your cards face up and show me the Ace. What? What isn't here? Where is it, Holmes? Exactly where it was before I dealt, Watson. On the top. I oh, see. I dealt you always the second card, just as Burnwell did when he dealt thus reserving the ace for him when he needed it. Well, it's amazing, Holmes. But I, I don't see how that explains the theft of the coronet. It supports the only logical deduction as to how the crime was committed and who stole the gems. 
You, you mean that the whole thing was, was some sleight of hand trick? I mean only that after a brief return to Fairbank, I will be able to tell Inspector Lestrade who the criminal is and where to look for the gems. Magic and sleight of hand are practiced by many. And some of the magicians of the world have performed tricks which border on the incredible. But so far, no one had been able to duplicate the feats of detection registered by the unique Sherlock Holmes. We'll be back shortly with the solution of the affair of the barrel coronet. ironic that the incomparable solver of mysteries, Sherlock Holmes, should himself be the source of a puzzle whose answer has eluded all the experts. The puzzle is, what accounts for his undiminished popularity? The hold that he has exerted over four generations of readers. My personal belief is that the Holmes stories satisfy a deep-seated longing for a well-ordered existence where justice always triumphs. That may be an oversimplification, but let us put that speculation aside and visit with him and Dr. Watson as they bring yet another case to a triumphant conclusion. Holmes returned early in the afternoon with that glint in his eyes which told me things had gone well. Watson, they're doing the Symphony Fantastique at Covent Garden tomorrow evening. And by that time, we'll have completed the investigation of this little affair of the Bell Coronet. Ah, you know the culprit. Oh, I knew that yesterday. But there's an interesting development. Here, read this note from Mary Holder to her uncle. Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, my dearest uncle, I feel that I've brought trouble upon you and that if I'd acted differently, this terrible misfortune might never have occurred. I cannot, with this thought in mind... Never again be happy under your roof. And I feel I, I must leave you forever. Oh, dear. Do not worry about my future, for that is provided for. In life or in death, I am ever your loving Mary. Holmes, do you think this is a suicide note? No, 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 no. Nothing of the kind. It is perhaps the best possible solution. Well, what can this note possibly mean? Now bring it along with us while we visit with young Arthur Holder and everything will become perfectly clear. Before you start with any questions, I want you to know I haven't changed my mind. No questions, I promise. We bring you some news. Your cousin Mary has left the house. Oh, I don't believe you. It's a trick. Show him the note, Doctor. See, my dearest uncle, I feel it must leave you. Oh, the fool. The poor little fool. You cannot blame her too much. You were also taken in by the rogue, were you not? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about Sir George Burnwell. I believe she's with him now. You're wrong. You must be wrong. Mary couldn't... Why not? She'd led an extremely sheltered existence. And you have personal knowledge of what a charming, plausible villain the man is. When Sir George undoubtedly told her of his undying love, she believed him and became his his willing tool. It's a lie. Mm -hmm. You, above all, should know it's true. How else do you explain her action on the night your father accused you of taking the coronet? You don't know anything about that on night. On the contrary, I know everything. And I shall prove it to you. You went to bed, but you slept badly after the argument with your father. Well, what has that got to do with Mary? Because you had difficulty sleeping, you were curious when you heard a soft step. Pass your door. You looked out and were astonished to see your cousin walking stealthily along the passage leading to your father's room. Mary doesn't have it. She didn't... Didn't what? Keep it, you mean? Uh, I don't want to listen to any more. I am going to plead guilty and get it over with. Well, that won't help anyone since I shall have your father engage a solicitor and pass on all the information I've gathered and the whole world will then know about it. If you know so much, you don't need me. I would not be here if I didn't. Oh... Very well, I'll, I'll listen to what else you have to say and then make my decision. Although I understand the depth of your feeling for your cousin, you shouldn't be blind to the fact that she acted ignobly. Mr. Holmes, 
if all you're going to do is criticize Mary... I am referring to her attempt to cast suspicion in your uncle's mind upon the maidservant. But it's perfectly true that Lucy saw her young man that night. I'm aware of that. But I also know that the maid had nothing to do with the coronet, as you yourself know. Because you saw Mary disappear into your father's dressing room. Huh. You were so amazed by her actions that you slipped on a shirt and trousers and waited. When she came out of the room, you saw, to your horror, that she carried the barrel coronet in her hands. You also saw her pass it through an open window to some person standing outside the house. Poor Mary. You make it sound almost as if you were there. For a moment, you were undecided. You wouldn't risk exposing Mary for anything in the world. But the instant she went back to her room, you ran out of the house and overtook Sir George Burnwell. I didn't know it was he until I caught up with mm-hmm. you. And then you struggled with him. Each of you had a hold of the coronet, and then something suddenly snapped. You, finding the coronet in your hands, rushed back, closed the window, went to your father's room, and observing that the coronet was twisted, was trying to straighten it out when your father discovered you. Yes. Yes, you you could see why I couldn't tell him. I see what difficulties love can lead a man into. But it was obvious that the reason for your cousin's fainting was that she saw you with the coronet and realized that you had the power to reveal her as the thief. Oh, she should have known I'd never do that. But how in the world did you know what happened outside the house? That's simplicity itself. When I first arrived at Fairbank, I looked around the house for traces in the snow. When I reached the stable lane, there was a very long and complex story written there for all to see. I don't understand. There was a double line of tracks of a booted man and a second double line belonging to a man with naked feet. Though the man with the boots had walked both ways, I saw that a struggle had taken place near the road. When I examined the hall window with my lens, I could make out faint markings where a wet foot had been placed coming in. Your father had told me that you were dressed only in shirt and trousers. When I learned further that you wanted five minutes outside the house, it was obvious you hoped to find the missing jewels where the struggle had taken place. Hmm. Well, since you have it all down just the way it happened, why do you need me? Because of Sir George Burnwell. You know what an astute villain he is. He knows because of the nature of the theft, our hands will be tied in the matter of prosecution. Also, now he has an extra ally in May. Your father won't want to involve her and his home in that sort of scandal. I still don't see how I can help. Simply tell me that you will testify against Sir George Burnwell in court if it should come to that. Mr. Holmes, I give you my word. Holmes sent me off after that interview with instructions to fetch Alexander Holder to Baker Street and wait there for his return. He was off to see Sir George Burnwell at the club. Ah, good morning, Mr. Holmes. Back. For revenge, I fancy. I don't mind confessing that you deserve it. My good luck was outrageous. Uh, Shall we go to the card room? I think a small private room would be more suitable for the matter I wish to discuss. (laughs) There's a small room off the bar which would prove just the thing. Ah, here we are. Now, what exactly is it you wish, Mr. Holmes? The three gems you stole from the barrel coronet. I really don't believe I heard you correctly. Let's not waste each other's time. I know you for what you are. Gamesman, cheat, corrupter, and seducer of women. And now thief. So if you please, the gems. Dear chap, I suggest you see a physician. I can recommend an excellent man, by the way. He's in Harley Street, name of Langley. Now, I wish you good day. Before you open this door again... I've just come from the prison cell of Arthur Holder. I explained the evidence I have gathered to him, and he has agreed to testify against you in court. No, I can't see this thing being brought up in court, old chap. You know, a national scandal. One of the realm's oldest and most honored families putting up national treasure for a loan. It would be distasteful, surely. But remember that Alexander Holder was willing to bring his son to court and let him stand trial when he believed the boy to be guilty. Do you think he'll show any mercy towards you? Ah. Yes, well, that does put things in a rather different... Uh... I shouldn't if I were you. As you see, I came armed. 
No offense, old chap. I just thought I'd... Add murder to your list. Not a chance. Never. Just mean to bash you over the head and get out of the country. <laughs> I'm prepared to offer you a deal. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, that's more the kind of talk I like to hear. And what did you have in mind? No prosecution. You can get clear of the country... Just return the stones. Mm, I'm afraid I can't do that, old chap. I'm prepared to pay. How much? One thousand pounds apiece. Why, dash it all, I only got six hundred for the three. From whom? Look here, I think I can do my own bargaining. Do I have to restate my position? You will let me have the name of the man who has the stones, or... I think you're bluffing. I may just call it, but... Mr. Holmes, what are you doing with those cards? Going to demonstrate the art of dealing seconds, which I shall be glad to demonstrate to your foolish club members. Your fellow club members whom you've cheated over the years, unless you give me the man's name. Ah. Oh, very well. Six hundred for the three. Just goes to show that a gentleman should never try to do a business deal. No. They should stick to cheating at cards. I brought Alexander Holder to our headquarters in Baker Street, and while we waited for Holmes, I told him as much as I could of the story clearing his son of the theft, and he was saddened to learn of his niece Mary's weakness, but still most anxious about the recovery of the stones. Finally, Holmes arrived. He looked fatigued. Ah, thank you, Watson, for having Mr. Holder here. There you are, Mr. Holder. The missing stones, still intact in their settings. Uh, I'm saved. Saved. How can I ever repay you, Mr. Holmes? With a check for £4,150. Uh, no, I, I, I shall make it ten. No need. No need. I paid 3000 for the stones, 150 for expenses, and 1000 for the fee. But there is one other thing you owe, Mr. Holder. Name the sum, sir. Name it. The debt is not to me. You owe a very humble apology to your son, who acted most gallantly throughout the whole affair. Oh, he shall have it as soon as I can deliver it in person. And what of poor Mary? Can your skill help me there? She, sir, is wherever Sir George Burnwell is, and that should be sufficient punishment for her sins, whatever they may be. moralist, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, consigns Mary to her just punishment. He evidently wasn't a believer in the romantic notion of the world well lost for love. Romance wasn't Doyle's strong suit. Mystery, adventure, and deductive reasoning were his specialties. And they were enough to gain him a place among the immortals of literature. I'll be back shortly. several railroad stations in London, but one of the unanswered puzzles that has tormented aficionados of Sherlock Holmes' tales is that Holmes always took a train from either Waterloo Station, Charing Cross, or Paddington. There's really no satisfactory explanation ever been offered why he never left from Euston, King's Cross, or Liverpool Street, all perfectly good stations but not for Sherlock Holmes. Our cast included Kevin McCarthy, Court Benson, Russell Horton, and Catherine Byers. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. My father, who had a great deal of wisdom used to say that the friendship of the over-friendly man is too often like a fire in the grate, exceedingly bright to look at, but not reliable, should you wish to keep warm on a really cold day. The tale we're about to unfold for you, written by the incomparable Edgar Allan Poe, is not about a friendship that cooled off, but rather about one that became too hot to handle. Well, what are you and Noah talking about, Edgar? The disappearance of Horace Kramer, Charlie. Yes, it is puzzling. I can't for the life of me understand what's keeping Horace this long in Boston. Do you think he's still there? Edgar thinks he never got there. What makes you say that, Noah? Edgar suspects foul play. And so do I. Our mystery drama... The Case of the Chateau Margot was adapted from a story by Edgar Allan Poe, especially for Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr., and stars Jackson Beck and Robert Dryden. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. you ever thought what a lonely old world this would be? Were there no one you could call a friend? A good friend? Someone who thinks as you do? Likes what you like? And even more than that, likes to spend time with you? With whom you could share any confidence, any time? So I suppose it's no wonder that in the small, isolated New England town of Mystic Falls, rich old Horace Kramer was delighted when a man his own age moved next door and became Horace's friend. The time is 1910. But let someone who actually lived through those curious and perplexing days tell us what happened. My name is Ed Edgar. My full name is... Yeah, Edgar, Edgar. I grew up with that awful handicap, but... Finally, after years of kidding here in my hometown, Mystic Falls, Massachusetts, now everyone has settled for Edgar, Ed, or Mr. Edgar. I write, print, and publish the Mystic Gazette, our local town newspaper. And we've never missed a weekly appearance since my father started the Gazette 75 years ago. One day, I had a visit from Nor Greeley, the town magistrate. Have you heard the latest, Edgar? About what, Noah? Horace Kramer has disappeared. Couldn't be. I saw him the day before yesterday. Well, so did everyone else in Mystic Falls, but I haven't seen hide and a hair of him all day, yesterday or today. Noah, if you think it news that the richest man in town has gone off somewhere by himself and told nobody where he was going, I can't print that. Oh, hold your horses, Ed. It looks like foul play. Oh, please, now. You know old Horace doesn't have an enemy in the world. He doesn't have a friend in the world, which is far worse. Well, you're forgetting Charlie Nash. I can't talk to you while that press is operating. I'll come back later. No, no, no. Stay, stay. I'll stop this run. Tell me what you know. All right. Day before yesterday, very early in the morning, Horace saddled up. Told his servants he was going to Boston for the day and that he'd be back that night. That's 15 miles. 30, there and back. No one I've talked to since has laid eyes on him. Have you just been sitting on this and doing nothing? (laughs) What could I do? I only just got the news myself. No, really. You're the magistrate. I checked Horace's servants, of course, uh, just this morning. I asked, why didn't you tell somebody your master disappeared? What did they say? They told Charlie, they said. He told them... 
Oh, it'll be all right. Let's wait and see who wants to alarm everybody. Well, maybe you're right. Something could have happened to him. I wonder why Charlie said... Oh, yeah, speak of the devil. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How fortunate to find two of Mystic Falls' most prominent citizens together. Morning, Charlie. What are you two gentlemen cooking up? The disappearance of Horace Kramer. Yes, it is puzzling. I cannot for the life of me understand what is keeping Horace this long in Boston. Oh, you think he's still there? Edgar and I think he never got there. Whatever makes you say that? Uh, it's possible he met with foul play. I think you're both alarmists. Horace can take care of himself. He wouldn't put up with any nonsense from any highwayman. For one thing, he's too good a shot. Unless he was ambushed. Not only that, gentlemen. I happen to know he was well armed when he set out for Boston. Was carrying quite a bit of money with him to deposit. No, oh, if you ask me... I'd say Horace is probably staying on in Boston. Then he, one of these days, he'll be waltzing back into town, wondering what all the fuss was about. I first met Charlie Nash six months ago. He pulled into town, not knowing a soul. In two weeks, he was on buddy-buddy terms with rich, retired Horace Kramer. Charlie never let a day pass but that he wasn't over at Horace's house. Sometimes for breakfast, always for dinner. No question Charlie was good company, and the last time I had knocked on Horace's door, the two old codgers were carrying on like kids. Uh, I hope I'm not intruding, Mr. Kramer. Charlie, are you fellas celebrating something? Shall, shall we tell him? Why not? Maybe news for the Gazette. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on now, Charlie. Do you think our little jollification is worth a headline? I'd rather be a headline than a footnote any day, wouldn't you? <laughs> Edgar, we're just having a good time. Uh, now, what is it, Edgar? What brings you here? Well, I understand your nephew, Philip, will be arriving soon, and... <laughs> it was six months since this man, Charlie, and I met, and it's a six-month anniversary we're celebrating with some good wine. I'd say some excellent wine. Hey, have a glass, Edgar. Chateau Margot. No, thanks, Horace. I never drink while I'm working. Well, that's the difference between us. I never work while I'm drinking. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Well, even if you didn't, my boy, you can never be able to catch up with Charlie here. He downs this Chateau Margot like water. Does my heart good. Yeah, Mr. Kramer. Yeah, no, no. Call me Horace, Eddie Edgar. You always have. No, I won't stay but a moment. I... Just want to verify... You're more of a party pooper than your father was, Eddie, my boy. Come on now, have some wine. No, 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 thanks, really. You know, Charlie, I knew this boy's father very well. Wilbur Edgar. He was a great parlor magician. Ventriloquist. Oh, yes. Wilbur Edgar was quite a practical joker. I mean, who else with the last name of Edgar would have given his son the identical first name? <laughs> Edgar, Edgar. Well, the boy's father used imagination, and I approve of imagination. Uh, shall we remove the offending cork from another bottle? Uh, <laughs> uh, Edgar, let me tell you, when a man gets to be my age, all his old friends have either taken to their beds or died off. That pretty well leaves an older man friendless. Yeah, but I was fortunate... Along comes Charlie Nash here, drifting into town. Correction, I never drift. Yeah, uh, moves in right next door. And I'll say his friendship has given me a brand new lease on life. Horace, I can say in all sincerity, you have done the same for me. Congratulations to the both of you. Uh, Charlie, you are by odds the hardiest old fella I have come across in all my born days. And since you love to savor the wine in that fashion, I'll be darned if I don't have to make you a present of a great big box of that very same Chateau Marco. Now, don't say a word. It'll be coming your way one of these days when you least expect it. Aris, Aris, what can I say but thank you? Uh, what I did come to ask you, Horace, was about your nephew. 
I just got word over at Sam's general store that your nephew is arriving from Boston. He's going to be staying with you. It'd uh, make a nice piece in our social column. Hmm. You mean Philip. Uh, I don't want to talk about him. He's a no-good, high-living son of my dear departed sister. And he's staying with me because he has no place else to go. Uh, Horace, can you tell me a little about him? What he does? How old and so on? I said I don't wish to talk about him. I don't approve of him or his way of life. And I don't particularly want him here. And that was the last time I saw Horace Kramer. His nephew, Philip, arrived in Mystic Falls the following day. He seemed quiet enough. By talking with him or playing an occasional game of checkers over at Sam's general store, I couldn't determine whether he was of bad character or dissipated habits. One day, Charlie Nash came in while Philip and I were playing. Edgar, I'd move the red in the back row one square over to block his double jump. Hey, Charlie, will you please go away? Philip and I are having a dandy game without your help. Well, I just don't want to see you taken advantage of. Advantage? What are you talking about? We're playing on a board with everything in sight. Now, just, just go and sit down, Mr. Nash, and leave us be. Now, Master Philip, is that a way to talk to your elders? Well, you may be somebody's elder, but not mine. Mr. Nash, I've seen your type before. And frankly, the way you're sponging off my uncle is disgusting. Well, coming from a young man of your reputation, I consider that a compliment. Uh, <laughs> l- let's forget the game, Philip. Uh, I've had enough of this. Oh, Edgar. Edgar, I've been looking for you everywhere. Have you heard the latest? Not yet, Noah, but I will. Go on. Horace's horse just wandered into town with no saddle and no saddlebags. Without Horace? His horse. You sure? Well, come on, see for yourself. Poor animal showed up behind Horace's house in terrible shape. Bleeding. It's been shot in the chest, it looks like. It's a wonder it can still walk. No sign of my uncle? No, and as I said, everything's been taken from the animal's back. I know Uncle Horace was carrying two saddlebags when he left for Boston. I know that. Excuse me. I don't think... No, no, I just can't stand here like this. I have to see that horse. Now, maybe there's a hopeful explanation to it all. Hopeful explanation, you stupid tub of lard. Hopeful. Obviously, my uncle has been robbed and probably killed, and you talk about hopeful? Now, young man, I can understand your distress. It's no greater than my own, I assure you. We can do without the funny names, too. Now, gentlemen, first things first. Let's go see this horse. My point is the wound on the horse could have been an accident. A hunter somewhere out there could have missed his target, hit Horace's horse, and it bolted. But that hardly explains Horace's disappearance. I haven't finished. The horse bolts, runs through the underbrush, saddlebags are torn off. My dearest old friend is thrown off. So where is he now, three days later? You all know how stubborn he is. If he got thrown from his horse, probably made him so darn mad he took his saddlebags. I thought you said they were torn off. If they weren't torn off, took them, picked up some other means of transportation, went on to Boston. I say, let's calm down, everybody. I refuse to calm down. Mr. Greeley, you are the magistrate of Mystic Falls, aren't you? Yes, I am. I charge you to make an immediate search of this entire area. I want you to organize a hunt for the body of my murdered uncle. Murdered? A singular expression, young man. Noah, Edgar, Sam, you're all witnesses to this extraordinary remark of Philip Kramer. What private knowledge does he have to assert that his uncle has been murdered? Could it be because he had something to gain from the death of a rich uncle? You take that back. I am merely offering a You theory. lying, fat, conniving... Oh, 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 now, 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 here, Philip, Philip, stop it, stop that. No, no, it's Sam. You kill old John. Let go, let go of me. Uh, look at him lying there, covering his face with his uh, hands. No, you stop that. He's an old man. What have we here? A young man, not liked by his wealthy uncle, suddenly appears in town. Shortly thereafter, the uncle disappears. What else do we know? That the uncle may have been robbed or murdered? Certainly Charlie, who claims to be the uncle's best friend, is suspicious of the young nephew. Does he know more than he is saying? Well, we shall know either more or less of this Edgar Allan Poe story when I return shortly 
with Act Two. Who was it who said, Murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ? Before today's mystery is solved, we shall give you the answer, and you'll be no little surprised how much this saying applies to our tale by Edgar Allan Poe. But to return to where we are, Noah Greeley, the town magistrate, organized practically everyone to search for the missing Horace Kramer. But at the town hall meeting, not everyone agreed how to go about it. Order! Order! We, uh, we're trying to conduct this town hall meeting in the proper way. Mr. Chairman, Noah, may I have the floor? Uh, go ahead, Charlie. I think we're all making darn fools of ourselves. One of these days, old Horace will show up in his own time and at his own pleasure. Talk, talk, talk. Who's going to take action? That's what I'd like to know. All of you make me sick. My uncle is lying out there somewhere. Philip. Time passes. You all talk. Philip Kramer, you are out of order. Well, I don't care if I am. We have to act and act fast. My uncle is out there somewhere. Who knows if he's still alive? Maybe sick, injured, needing help. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going out this very minute and look for him. I was crazy not to have done it before. Goodbye. Well, I'm... uh... Sorry about that young man. As to those of you who haven't met him, that was Horace's nephew, Philip. A bit headstrong. Noah, I wonder if you could get some reaction, pro or con, for or against searching bodies. Well, uh, what do you say, Edgar? It was your proposal. Well, could we have a show of hands? All those who feel well qualified to lead a search party in, let us say, a five-mile radius... Will they raise their hands? No one? Oh, oh, yes, I see one hand. Oh, 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 it's your hand, Charlie. Well, as you know, folks, I'm retired. So I've had plenty of time in the six months I've lived in Mystic Falls to explore. But I would say I've covered every inch around here. So I have had that advantage over most of you who are Farming, uh, horseshoeing, or minding stores. Well, I propose that as many as would care to join us at the Village Green at 2 o'clock so that we can set forth under Charlie Nash's guidance. Charlie turned out an excellent guide. The bunch of us, at least 20, followed him through all kinds of -of out-of-the-way paths, finding places none of us knew existed. The first day, we searched till it got dark, about six. But then for almost a week, from morning till night. Not a trace of Horace Kramer. Until the day Charlie led us to a pond, four miles from Mystic Falls. Has anybody seen Philip Kramer? Philip? Hey, is Philip back there? I'm here. Edgar, I'd like to show you something. Look down there at those horseshoe tracks. See that little depression on the heel of each shoe? I... Yes, I do. That's Uncle Horace's horse. And look here. Where the brambles are broken off. It's as if something heavier than a man was dragged through here. Oh, you're right. So it does. I'd look in that pond. Heavier than a man, eh? I suggest we have this pond drained. There are enough of this with spades. We could... I'll dig some runoffs. We'll fall, too. Excellent idea. How's the digging going, Edgar? Well, they got three trenches dug, and the pond's running off pretty quickly. Isn't that something lying down there on the bottom? Huh? Sure, I can see the back of something. Oh, you're right, Charlie. There is something. Now, what is it? Well, look, look. Down, down there. Uh, let me see if I can... Fish it out with my shovel. Yeah. You got it. Now, what is it? Black silk whiskey, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, so it is. Or was. Fairly ruined now. Torn. Where have I seen this whiskey before? Those dark stains around the collar and the front. Could be blood. Philip, 
You ever seen this waistcoat before? I, uh, I think it's mine. Yours? Yes, I think it is. Looks like it. Philip Kramer, you realize this is very serious. You admit this blood-stained waistcoat is yours? Oh, I didn't say that. It's very like one of mine. Surely, Noah, you're not actually making an accusation because this bloody torn waistcoat, which may belong to Horace's nephew, was discovered here. Now, hold on there. We don't know that is blood. Precisely. We don't know it's blood. Or, if it is, then it's Horace Kramer's blood. Or Philip's. Then, too, one must think in terms of a motive. Just because this young rapscallion happens to be Horace Kramer's sole heir and would inherit everything, does that mean he is a suspect? Well, it uh, doesn't rule him out, Charlie. Just a moment. We don't know, first of all, whether Horace is dead. We've found no body. Secondly, as far as inheritance is concerned... I remember a year ago, Horace telling me he was planning to disinherit him. All we have to do is locate a will. And if indeed Philip is cut off without a penny, what does that do to your motive, huh? Well, I've never heard such nonsense in all my life. I'm not giving up hope that Uncle Horace isn't still alive. But frankly, this search, led by this fat fool, is too comic for me. For a week now, we've been traipsing through brush and bramble, and all we've got to show for it is a muddy waistcoat and no sign of my uncle. Well, I'm heading back to Mystic Falls. I've had enough. Uh, Philip, until I give you the word, I charge you not to leave Mystic Falls. Charlie! Charlie! Where are you going? Just thought I saw something lying in the road up ahead. Ah, man. Well, what is it? What are you putting in your pocket? It's a Spanish knife. Yes. There appears to be blood on the open blade. Now that I look at it more closely. Now, does anybody know to whom this knife belongs? Oh, my goodness. Charlie, do you know to whom it belongs? Yeah, yes, I, I, I might. But uh, I am not the one to identify it. Is Philip still here? Yes, of course I'm still here. What is it? Is uh, this knife, this Spanish knife yours? I... I... Philip, is this knife yours? I'm afraid there are initials on it, too. Oh, yes, so there are. P.C. Philip Kramer. Those your initials? Y yes. So this is your knife? Yes, it is. Philip... Can you explain why your knife is lying out here on the road? No, no, I can't. Philip Kramer, I arrest you on suspicion of the murder of your uncle, Horace Kramer. Now, the purpose of this interrogation is to clear up certain allegations in view of certain evidence. Uh, I understand that you, Philip Kramer do have something to add with regard to the identification of the waistcoat found at the bottom of the pond. It is mine. It must be mine. I've examined it more closely, and I noticed one button is missing at the bottom, which is proof to me that it is my waistcoat. Ah, so noted. Would you like to tell us, Philip, where you were the morning your Uncle Horace left for Boston? Glad to. I was out with my rifle deer stalking. Were you anywhere in the vicinity of the pond in which your waistcoat was found? I'd like to correct a misapprehension. Uh -huh. I said that waistcoat was mine. Not that I was wearing it. Ah. Uh -huh. oh, yes. Yes, I was in that vicinity because I clearly remember noticing the tracks made by my uncle's horse. The same ones I showed you. Do you uh, realize, Mr. Kramer, what you are telling us? The waistcoat is yours? A knife that was found nearby is also yours. You were in that vicinity, and moreover, you now admit to carrying a rifle for the purpose of deer stalking. So? Yes, that's so. May I ask the indulgence of the magistrate for a moment? Uh, yes, Charlie, by all means. I, uh, I had not wished to further complicate matters by divulging the information I have. 
But now I do feel it my duty to bring it to your attention. Let me tell you what I know. The evening before Horace left for Boston, he and I were playing a game of checkers. And his nephew, Philip, appeared. Jump, 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 jump. Ha! <laughs> what do you think of that, Charlie? <laughs> nice going, Horace. Caught me completely by surprise. <laughs> it did, it didn't it? Yep. I can say it in two words. Completely. <laughs> ah, Philip. Well, to what do we have the pleasure of your company this evening? It's the shank, the very shank of the evening. I'd expect you to be out dancing, carousing, gambling, or whatever it is you're so noted for. What are you doing home? You don't think much of me, Uncle, do you? You know, I never asked more of you than a place to sleep. Believe me, I don't enjoy being dependent on your favors. Well, just in case you're harboring the hope that because you are my only living relative, Philip, let me, uh, let me assure you, I am planning to revise my will, and your name will not be mentioned in it. I'm sorry to hear that, Uncle. I, I bet you are. Yeah, I've threatened such action before, but now, knowing you better... Tomorrow I shall actually take steps. Yes. Tomorrow morning I'm off to Boston with two tasks. One, to make a cash deposit at the Farmers and Mechanics Bank. And two, to sign my new will. Now, if you'll be so good, kindly leave Charlie and me alone. So that we can continue our check again. Philip Kramer, you've just heard Charlie Nash here recount an event that... Happened the night before your uncle set off for Boston. Eh, is this the truth or not? Is what the truth? Did you know your uncle was going to Boston in the morning to deposit money? Did he tell you he was about to change his will to disinherit you? Yes. Would you repeat your answer clearly, please? Yes, Uncle Horace did say that. But I still say I know nothing of his disappearance and I did not kill him. <laughs> I'm sorry we must leave this tale of suspicion and mystery at this very moment. Does it strike you as strange that Philip Kramer, the only person suspected of having had a hand in his uncle's disappearance, seems so very self-assured? Is he feigning innocence? Hiding guilt? Or is someone else the actual guilty party? We'll be back with some of the answers shortly. Edgar Allan Poe taken us thus far. A rich man has disappeared. Evidence has been uncovered pointing in only one direction to a wasteful nephew now suspected of murder. But knowing Edgar Allan Poe, I would caution you not to believe there is an easy, straightforward answer to the question of what happened to Horace Kramer. There will be many a twist and turn before our tale is completed. <laughs> When Philip Kramer admitted he knew the purpose of his uncle's trip to Boston, nor really deputized me and the owner of the general store, Sam, to make a thorough search of Philip's room. When we returned to the town jail, Noah and Charlie were still there, as was the suspect. Well, it didn't take you two very long. It's not a large room. The broom closet is bigger. We found this pocketbook empty in Philip's room. It's Horace's. I recognized it right away. And these uh, bedclothes, the shirt, the neck handkerchief. Uh... Stuffed under Philip's bed. Yeah. That, that, look carefully. Huh? That may be blood on them. Goodness. Blood. That poor man. To die like that. I cannot believe it. Blood. Well, I think we have a fairly open and shut case here, don't you? Well, I'm not defending Philip, but I do say a man is innocent till proved guilty. All this dreadful, dreadful evidence. I mean, no, I, you have no corpus delecti, no body. Well, I may not have Horace's body yet, but I do have his horses. What do you mean? Well, while you and Sam were out, I got word Horace's horse died in the stable. 
from the wound he's got. I think a post-mortem of that horse should be made immediately. You know, if it weren't for the fact that my uncle is missing, that there is some mystery there, I would say the lot of you are behaving like a comic opera, like a stupid bunch of incompetent bumpkins. Such a statement does not endear yourself to those who live here. Look at the facts. My waistcoat is found. Supposedly blood on it. Anyone could have put it there, smeared it with anything, ketchup. Then my knife turns up, also supposedly covered with my uncle's blood. Then sheets and shirts under my bed. You don't know if it's blood or red paint. Where do you suppose all this mysterious evidence came from, dear boy? I haven't the faintest idea. And if it were true that I did away with Uncle Horace... Why would I leave evidence lying around or under my own bed? Perhaps you thought the bumpkins in Mystic Falls would never find it. Oh, a very poor joke and very poor taste, if you ask me. I'd say it's a good thing we don't ask you. Mr. Nash, I've had a feeling about you all along. I've been wondering if you really are all that concerned about Uncle Horace, or if your so-called helpfulness is an act. Are you gentlemen going to stand here... And see me maligned by a man accused of murder, Sam Noah? Hold on, Charlie. Philip is being held in custody on suspicion of murder. Nothing more. There's a lot of evidence, admittedly, still unproven. Oh, go do your post-mortem on a dead horse. It might interest you to know, my young city-bred friend, that should I discover the actual bullet that killed Horace's horse, it could inevitably lead us to the gun. First the bullet, and then... Sure, she ain't weapon. Oh, I see. Now, this renowned checker player wine drinker is also a horse doctor. Oh, no, no. We'll have Dr. Corwin, the town veterinarian, actually perform the autopsy. The events moved swiftly. Charlie Nash found a bullet in the horse's chest cavity which had somehow escaped Dr. Corwin's eye. Philip identified the bullet recognizing it as one of a special set he had made for his hunting rifle. At the very next criminal session, Philip was brought to trial. He still treated the matter lightly, not even seeking legal advice. The town appointed a lawyer to defend him. But confronted with this unbreakable chain of circumstantial evidence, the jury returned an immediate verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree. Edgar, Edgar, I have news for you. Look at this letter, my fine friend. It's what I came to show you. Go ahead, read it. Uh-oh, uh, 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 Charles Nash, Esquire. Dear sir, in conformity with an order transmitted to our firm two months ago by Mr. Horace Kramer... We have the honor of forwarding this morning to your address a double case of Chateau Margot, half a gross, six dozen bottles, antelope brand. We remain, sir, your most obedient servants, and, and so forth. Well, that is news. Read what it says on the bottom. Uh, the box will reach you by wagon the Monday following the receipt of this letter. Yours... Mill Bracken and Company. Isn't that like dear, sweet, thoughtful little Horace? You know, we used to drink Shadow Margot together by the quart. It was the seal of our friendship, as it were. He did once say he was going to send me a case or so. I forgot all about it. I seem to remember that. What I would like you to do, Edgar, is to put in the weekend edition of the Gazette. The news that I am extending an invitation, uh, let us call it a, a kind of open house, to all who would like to call themselves my friends. And when the case of Chateau Margot arrives from the Millbracken people, then we'll open the pièce de résistance. Pretty close to half the town was at Charlie's on Monday. There was lots of food and drink. The case of wine didn't arrive till early evening. By that time, everyone was in a very happy mood. <laughs> that is the biggest wooden crate I've ever seen. Lifted right up onto the table facing me. <laughs> All right, everybody. Let's open up the case and see how far 72 bottles of Chateau Margot will go. <laughs> I can recommend it to you all. 
Come on, come on, somebody. Get a crowbar. Well, wait a minute. I brought a big hammer, Charlie. I can pry the box open. Good thinking for the state. Always prepared to be printworthy. <laughs> open it from the end that faces me, Edgar. Now, a respectful silence as Mr. Edgar disinters the treasure. <laughs> Made Charlie happy to give orders to be the center of all attention. This moment was his dream come true. Charlie surrounded by friends and neighbors, all waiting for what Charlie would give them. Suddenly, the top of the huge box flew open. And from inside, there sprang up into a sitting position, facing Charlie, the bruised, bloody, nearly putrid corpse of old dead Horace Kramer. He seemed to look right at Charlie with his sightless eyes. Then, suddenly, slowly, the corpse spoke. Charlie, old friend, how could you do this to me? (laughs) Having said that, the decaying corpse of Horace Kramer fell over the side of the crate, his arms sort of reaching for Charlie. Men fainted. Some ran for the doors, but slowly, as if magnetized, everyone came back to watch Charlie. How did you get back, Horace? No, you were dead. Were you watching me all the time? Did you see me following you down the road when you got near the pool? Were you alive or dead? I left you for dead. Is it bad luck with your horse? I shot him. He wouldn't die. Would you believe it, Horace? I pushed him clean into the pool to drown. And the next day, he walked right back into town wasn't easy to cover my tracks. I had to plant all kinds of evidence so my friends would think it was your nephew. Horace, it wasn't easy at all. Horace, as you just said, I say, how could you do this to me? Oh, my heart. Charlie. He's falling on the table. Charlie! My Lord. Charlie is dead. As dead as Horace. Philip, you're free. The body of your uncle was delivered to Charlie's house in a crate of wine. And he, your uncle, accused Charlie of killing him. What, what, in what way, Drake? Not so fast. Anyway, Charlie confessed. Uh... I'm afraid I had a hand in this. Oh, I thought you might have, Edgar. You were the only one who never believed the evidence. I wasn't that positive Philip wasn't guilty, but I was pretty sure Charlie wasn't that innocent. From the beginning? Yeah. He was too helpful. That made me suspicious. And didn't you think it was strange, Noah, that it was always Charlie who discovered things? Where was I with my eyes closed? First of all, Philip was an outsider. Secondly, almost everyone in town liked Charlie, so why should you suspect him? Well, for me, he went just one step too far. What did he do? The autopsy of Horace's horse. Even with Dr. Corwin right there, it was Charlie who found the bullet. But he palmed that bullet... That bullet never went near the horse. There was a bullet hole where a shot had gone in, but another where it had gone out. No. It couldn't have been Philip's gun that killed the animal. Why didn't you tell me? We could have held up the trial. No, I I couldn't stop you. Besides, I had to find the body. Now, you remember how it was Charlie who led the search party? So I searched myself. And wherever he had gone, I went in the opposite direction. Well, eventually, I found an old dry well. Very well concealed. And Horace was down there. At the bottom. Neck broken. Terrible sight. 
I wrote that letter from the wine merchants and put him in the crate. Ingenious. But horrible. Well, how in the world did you get Horace to speak? That's a talent I've had since I was a boy. My father taught me voice throwing, ventriloquism. Charlie, old friend, how could you do this to me? So ends one of the great horror stories from the prolific pen of that master of the macabre, Edgar Allan Poe. I think it is almost as though Poe took and dramatized that one famous sentence of William Shakespeare's, Murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll be back shortly. said that Edgar Allan Poe is the founder of the modern detective story, but I think he goes far beyond that, bringing together the strangely imaginative and the grotesque, a torn waistcoat, a bloody knife, a bullet. On these few objects, Poe hangs an entire plot of villainy and bizarre retribution. Man has always been fascinated by objects. Writing about their criminal use is called detective work. Studying and analyzing objects is called science. But one doesn't have to be a scientist or a Ph.D. to enjoy a good mystery. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Jackson Beck, William Griffiths, and Lloyd Batista. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant came peeping in at morn. Well, that's what the poet, Mr. Thomas Hood, can remember, which shows a pretty good memory, until you consider Mr. Marcel Proust, who not only remembered when and where he was born, but just about everything that happened to him since. However, both of these memory specialists shall be overshadowed by the hero of our story, who can remember what happened to him before he was born. Regina, do you see that man? Hmm? Which? Which man? The one sitting at the corner table. The one with the dark hair and the gray suit? Yes. What about him? I think... I shall have to kill him. Our mystery drama, The People of Sisora, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Ralph Bell. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. They make up the names of ancient history. Goths, Scythians, Hebrews, Hittites, Assyrians, Phoenicians, Achaeans, so many others. Do we ever consider that we are the descendants of those people, that their blood 
flows in our veins. It was our ancestors who built the pyramids, sacked the city of Troy, wandered in the wilderness with Moses, crossed the Rubicon with Julius Caesar, and conquered India for Alexander the Great. And before that, long, long before that, as the ancient storyteller might say, thereby hangs a tale indeed. Martin Struve and his wife are dining out. What should we have for dessert? I know what we should have for dessert. We should have nothing for dessert. Martin? Hmm? What are you going to have? Although I had potatoes. Well, they were boiled, not fried. Oh, I saved some calories there. Martin? Yes, yes, what is it? Can't, can't you pay attention to me? What are you looking at? I don't know. That blonde at the corner table. Oh, don't be silly. You're being silly. It's out of a bottle. In this light, she looks 30. Get her outside, she's 45. Regina, I don't look at any women. You should. It'll make you appreciate what you have. We've got two kids over 20, and you know who I ran into last week? Jerry. Jerry Martin. He was a stage manager when I was in the specials. He's uh, producing the show now. Shows you how much brains you need. (laughs) Anyhow, he said to me... Kid, you still have the figure to go on stage. Now, Martin, don't tell me you're not staring. My, uh... All right, you're not staring at the dame. What's there about the guy? He looks familiar. You know him? No, he just looks familiar. I've seen him somewhere. I just can't seem to remember. Oh, I guess I'm becoming the old absent-minded professor. Oh, you're not old. You're not absent-minded. But you are a professor. Why is the guy familiar? I don't know. I've seen him somewhere. Oh, there's a lot of people you think you've seen someplace. Maybe you have. So what? I think he's someone I once knew very well. Excuse me. Where are you going? I have to talk to that man. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes? Do we know each other? Do we what? I'm sorry to interrupt you at dinner. My name is Struve, Martin Struve. That doesn't make matters clearer. Uh, Dr. Martin Struve, I'm a professor of archaeology at the State University here. Well, what is it you want from me, Professor? Well, it's just that you look so familiar. (laughs) Professor, I'm sure I never saw you before in my life. Now, if you'll be good enough to excuse us. Yes, yes, of course, I'm... I'm sorry, my apologies. Good evening, sir. Good evening. No, what are you staring at? Me? Oh, uh, that pin in your lapel. That uh, scarab. Yes? It looks very familiar. Doctor, or professor, whatever your name is. That's true. I don't want to have a scene... But what must I do to get you to stop annoying my dinner companion and me? I have no intention. Do I have to call the waiter or the maitre d'? Uh, that won't be necessary. Then once again, sir, good evening. What got into you? I don't know. What did you want to go bother a perfect stranger for? Something's the matter with me. I would say so. I made a perfect fool of myself. I would agree. But I've seen him somewhere. Okay, let's accept that. And let's let it lay there. I wish I could. Well, why can't you? Because there's something ominous about him. Ominous? Frightening. You have to be kidding. I'm convinced of it. He's a perfectly normal-looking guy. Regina... The fact is, you had no call bothering Mr. Simpkins like that. Mr. Who? Simpkins. That's the guy's name. How do you know? Look, there's a head waiter standing over by his table now. And the head waiter is asking him, is everything in order, Mr. Simpkins? And he is saying, yes. And the head waiter is asking... Uh, just wait a minute, Regina. They're too far away. You you can't possibly overhear what they're saying. I have perfect hearing. The head I waiter is asking, was that gentleman annoying you, Mr. Simpkins? And now, Mr. Simpkins is saying, just a case of mistaken identity. But... How can you know that? I'm reading their lips. Your what? I know how to read lips. I didn't know you could read lips. <laughs> I found it better if most people don't know. 
Even your husband? Especially your husband. When did you learn? Oh, before I met you. When I wanted to go into show business. But uh, why would you want to read lips? It was for auditions. Auditions? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you, you'd do your number and there'd be the producer and the director and the writers and everybody else that was hanging around. And when you were through, they'd talk about you. Oh, but they were, they were there way back in the theater and you couldn't hear them. So I said to myself, I'd like to know what those guys are saying. So, I got a book on lip reading. This Mr. Simpkins, what's he saying now? I don't... You don't want... I don't want to look at him. But why? This is the first time I read anyone's lips in over 20 years. What do you mean? I found out that it can cause more trouble than it's worth. Trouble? Martin, many years ago, you brought me home to meet your family. There was a little party. They were all there. They all tried to be very nice to me. And all of them were. Some of them were. You and your father were standing at the other end of the room. You were having a very quiet conversation. Now, do you remember what that was about? Well, I'm not sure. Well, I could read that conversation very well. He said to you, Martin, you're a scholar. How could you even think of marrying a chorus girl? Oh, Dad didn't say that. Yes, yes, he did. He, he, he said, you see how out of place she is, how she's dressed, how she talks? So common, so vulgar, so cheap. But he was mistaken. Was he? Well, he certainly changed his mind about you after we were married. Oh, did he? Well, he was crazy about you. No, he wasn't. He decided he didn't want to lose his son. And when the boys came along, oh, he wanted his grandchildren. But I was still the cheap little chorus girl. No matter how warmly he smiled at me and said how wonderful I was. That's why I won't read that man's lips. What does one thing have to do with it? If I hadn't really known what your father thought of me, I would have believed he loved me. And I would have been better off and happier for it. I I understand all that, Regina, and I know how you must feel about this gift of yours. It's not a gift. Anyone can study it and learn it. I won't rest until I know who he is. Martin, you're not feeling well. What is that man saying? Oh, all right. He and the blonde, they're, they're just talking. I can see that. What are they talking about? What we were talking about. What to have for dessert. What else? She's going to have the baked Alaska. That's how you can tell they're not married. Would I stick you three bucks for baked Alaska? Uh, never mind her. What is he saying? He'll have fruit and cheese and... Now, who could that be? What? He... He's saying a word... I must be reading it wrong. What does it sound like? Well, something like... Cesora. That's right. Cesora. Hey, Marty, are you holding out on me? How'd you know? Because... Sure. See what he's doing? Well, I... He's touching the scarab. The what? That pin he's got in his lapel. That uh, black and gold beetle. It's not like any beetle you've ever seen on Earth. Now, Marty... It's the Cesora. And you must touch it after every meal. Do you understand? Do I understand? Why, sure, Marty, if you say so. I knew it. Please tell me, what are you talking about? That man. Yes? He... Well, tell me, Marty, please. Regina, I see fire and death and destruction. Please, please, don't talk like that. I don't know what to do. About what? About everything. It shouldn't... Shouldn't you go see a doctor? Regina, I have to save the world. But I don't know how. Let's see what we have here. A comfortable married couple with grown kids. He's a sober, serious professor of archaeology. Suddenly, he seems to have developed a deadly dread of a complete stranger in a rather expensive restaurant. And he talks desperately of having to save the world. Now, is this what you got out of our first act? Good. That's exactly what we put in there. Wait till you hear what we put in act two. You came to me from out of nowhere. 
sang the popular love song of a generation back. However, things do not really emerge full-blown from nothingness, nor do they arrive on the scene from nowhere. Everything that is develops slowly, surely, taking its own time to gather form and substance, nourishing itself on the forgotten thoughts of our subconscious. And then one day, they burst upon us in full bloom. Martin? What is it? Oh, I guess you're not asleep. No. How long have you been up? A while. What is it? Nothing. When did we go out to dinner? Tuesday night? Oh, something's been bothering you ever since. It's nothing. You keep saying that. You still refuse to tell me who this fellow Simpkins is. There's nothing to tell. Or maybe I don't know how to tell it. Tell it any way you can. There's this word, Sisora. That was the word the Simpkins man was saying. And you knew he was saying it. How'd you know? I just knew. What does it mean? It means a scarab. A beetle. Hmm. Only there has never been a beetle like this one. Down here. What do you mean by here? Here, this world. Are you telling me there's another world? Yes. And it's called Sisora. Okay. And where is it? Where? Hmm? It's very far from here. What's very far? It's uh, light years away. What's a light year? A light year is a unit of astronomical measurement. Mm-hmm. It would be equal to the distance that light travels in a year. Or about six trillion miles. Give or take a couple of hundred million miles. Oh, sure. What's a couple of hundred million miles? Out there in the uncharted infinity of space, nothing. Okay. So, we have this place called uh, Sisora. Way, way out there. And what does this have to do with you? I don't know. I just don't know. I'm aware of it. In what way? In what way? Mm Mm-hmm. Are you aware of the United States? Oh, come on. What kind of a question is that? Sure. How? Well, it's here. It's my home. And What are you trying to tell me? I'm aware of Sisora in that same way. Hmm? Uh-huh. Fire. Great shells. No, no, no. Not shells. Discs. Discs of some sort. Uh, like flying saucers? Maybe. Hmm. These are round and very large. They glow because of the Astratrix Major. Ast... What's that? It's a space warp. Oh, no. Now, you have to get some sleep. It enables us to surpass the speed of light, and therefore we can travel anywhere in this or any other galaxy. Time is no factor. Us? Uh, we? Yes. I come from that world. That world called Sisora. That's so far from here. But that isn't true. You come from Indiana. Terre Haute. That's where you were born. I know. So what are you, what are you giving me this nonsense? I was born in Terre Haute. So was my father. My grandfather was born in Philadelphia. The family goes back there six generations to a Lionel Strew who came from London. Hmm. You mean uh, we're going through all this at three o'clock in the morning? And there are parish records dating back to the 12th century. Before that, I guess my ancestors came there as Normans, or were there already as Saxons and Danes, or going back, way back, as Romans. And earlier, earlier... Marty, something is bothering you. I seem to remember something. Something you're not supposed to remember because it happened so long ago. So far away. Do you want something warm to drink? No, I'll be all right. Try to get some sleep. Oh, sure. Hello? Regina? Martin, are you okay? Oh, sure, I'm fine. Uh, dear, about dinner. Uh, what about it? 
I'm going to be late. Uh, we, uh, we're having a faculty committee meeting. Oh. It's a nuisance, but I was foolish enough to accept the so-called honor. We'll probably work right through dinner. I, uh, I won't be too late. All right, Martin. Uh, you, you're sure you're okay? Of course, Regina, darling. Of course. <laughs> Yes? Oh. Oh, it's you. Yes, Mr. Simpkins. Uh, may I come in? Now, look here. Mr. Simpkins, I'm... I'm a respectable person. Actually, my brother-in-law is captain on the police force here. He could vouch for what me. What do you want? I, uh... Well, I'm not sure I know. Well, I know what you want. A doctor. Mr. Simpkins, there is something between us, and we're going to have to find out what it is. All right, Mr... Struve. Uh, Martin Struve. Oh, yes. Professor Struve. Well, you might just as well come in, I suppose. Uh, sit down, won't you? I, I won't apologize for the looks of the place. It isn't mine. I'm just renting it for my stay in town. But that's not the point. What uh, is the point, Professor? Cesora. Cesora. Uh, what is Cesora? You should know. You spoke the word in the restaurant that night. And as you did so, you touched the scarab as the ritual prescribes. I don't have the faintest notion of what you're talking about. Why would I make this up? The world is called Cesora. And its emblem is the scarab, the beetle that you wear in your lapel. The golden black beetle. No, wait, wait. Yes. No, wait, wait, wait. It's... It's coming back to me. The beetle is always gold. The gold scarab of Cesora. It's the color used around the border. That, 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 that... Yes? That what? That denotes the branch of service. The black... It stands for space reconnaissance. Yeah, would you mind getting to the point of all this? I have an engagement. Cesora, the space patrols are always out to find a new world for the overcrowded billions who live on Cesora. Now look, Professor Struve, this is just about as far as I care to but go. But in all the incredibly vast reaches of space, how many worlds are there fit for habitation? If it's a joke, it's... Too long getting to the punchline, and I've lost all interest. I remember the ship. The great fire disc. We, we landed here. Are we? Yes, we. But we landed badly. The ship was destroyed. We were lost. Who was lost? The crew. And so we stayed here. Here on this primitive earth. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It was a wilderness then. That was so long ago. Fifty, hundred thousand years. I... I I don't remember. Look, uh, whatever your game is, I, I don't know. It's uh, no game. I'm serious. I, I don't even know why I humor you. You force yourself in here. You give me a fantastic story about uh, shipwrecked space explorers thousands and thousands of years ago, and you were one of them. <laughs> it's very interesting. Uh, how old does that make you? I'm saying I have a memory of being one of them, a racial memory. And it doesn't get better. But the more I speak to you, the more it clarifies itself. You're... you're from Sisora, too. I think this definitely has to end it. You're here to study this planet, and then you report back on its suitability for colonization. Let me show you to the door. Uh, just a minute. I don't have to humor every nut that walks in off the street. You are a reconnaissance scout. That does it. Take your hands off me, sir. Don't say... You're going to listen. Oh. Mr. Simpkins. Oh, Mr. Simpkins, I... I didn't mean to hit you so hard. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry. I, I, I never did get that out before. Get out. If I ever see you again, I'm going to call the police. Martin, may I come in? Oh, Doctor, this is an honor. Are you busy? Oh, no, 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 please sit. Uh, what are you doing so far from the medical school? Oh, I like to walk over to this side of the campus and see how the other half lives. Why? Right. Well, what is your problem? The psychiatrist is supposed to ask that question. Yes, I know. I just thought I'd steal your thunder. Regina came to see me. Oh? Mm -hmm. 
she said, since you wouldn't come to see me... And, I... uh, what is it about? You know what it's about. It started a week or so ago in a restaurant. You saw a man who you think comes from another world. It's called Sisora. And it has a beetle emblem. You say you come from there, too. I didn't tell her all that. Well, you told her some. The rest you muttered in your sleep. Is it true? Oh, yes. And you believe it? Yes. Hmm. Regina has a theory. I'd like you to hear it. She says you feel your life has been a failure. Oh, now, just a minute. Oh, I'm only telling you what she said. It's because you were held back by her. Now, how could she have held me back? She's convinced you could have gone higher, farther, with a more cultured wife. That isn't really true. The world is filled with snobs. Now, who cares about them? Mm, Unfortunately, too many of them decide on promotions and honors. What does all this have to do with... She doesn't know. Except that, well, obviously, there's been a very strong physical attraction between you and Regina. It's been much more than that. Well, anyhow, she feels she's getting older. And you're going to regret your marriage more and more. Oh, that's ridiculous. You're saying that because of my wife, I've lost out on success? Well, look, I'm not exactly a failure. I'm known. I have a reputation. I've been published. You don't have that great, overwhelming success that would have made you a star. In the field? That was never important to me. Don't make a snap judgment about that either. And so you're saying I'm having these uh, delusions, eh? Oh, I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying you should relax. And try to analyze in your own mind just why you're having these delusions. Ah, uh-huh, ah, uh-huh. ah, But you just made a very definite statement. Doctor, you said I was having delusions. Aren't you? Why do you insist on calling them delusions? How do you know that they aren't real? Regina. What? Regina. What? Regina. What? 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 what did you wake me up for? What? What's the matter? You all right? Regina, listen to me. Huh? I've just seen it all. Uh, don't you mean you dreamed it? No, I didn't dream it. I know everything. I know how it worked out the last time. How what worked out the last the time? The flight. The patrol. Oh, what's what? the difference? It doesn't matter anymore. Well, if it doesn't matter, just forget it. We won't be able to forget it unless we... Unless we what? Unless we can first ensure the safety of the world. The safety of the world? Oh, sure, sure. Oh, my darling Regina, don't humor me. Martin, you're going to have to get some rest. Rest? No, not till the job is done. What job? It's a job that falls to me. I'm the only one who knows about it. I have to accept the responsibility. I have to save the world. Oh, sure, honey, sure. We'll we'll talk about it in a moment. But there isn't anything to talk about. That's even better. Saving the world requires no lengthy, complicated planning. The thing can be accomplished simply and swiftly. All I have to do is kill Mr. Simpkins. If by murdering one man, You could save the world. Would you agree to do it? Ethics, here we are again. Constantly we keep raising this complicated issue of morality. It certainly does get in the way of a great many things we'd like to accomplish. Still, Martin knows something we do not. I promise you that in Act Three, everybody will know as much as the next fellow. Sometimes in the middle of a hot day, do you see cool water? It could be the blue Nile. Do you smell jasmine? It's the aroma of ancient Persia. Do you hear the crowds shouting in the Roman Forum? Do you hear the clash of sword against shield at the Battle of Hastings? So many great events took place in our history. Don't you remember any of them? That is, from personal participation. You're going to... Kill Mr. Simpson? I have to kill him. It's his life or ours. But why? How is Mr. Simpson threatening you or me? It has nothing to do with us personally. But why? Because when they land here, when the main force arrives from Sisora, 
They will have to kill every man, woman, and child on this planet. Martin, I... I know the mind reels from just the implications of such a holocaust. Martin, I, I want you to go to the hospital just, just for a few days. A, a routine checkup. Oh, that's how things go. If someone says something that's off the beaten track naturally, he's a candidate for a psychiatrist. But this particular story you're, you're telling me... Why is it, it crazy? It, I, I never said that. Then why must I go to the hospital? Darling, I'm worried. And you have cause to be... If this Mr. Simpkins gets back to Sasori, it'll mean the end of our world. That's why he has to be killed. You're... You're not a murderer. Oh, Regina, I'm afraid you simply do not understand. I do. I do. Oh, okay. Okay, Martin. You're right. He he, he does come from wherever it is he comes from, and he, he does mean to bring back the invasion, and we'll all be dead, okay? Regina, don't humor me. I'm on your side. Do it. Do it right. Go to Charlie. Charlie? Y- yes, my, my brother, Charlie. Let the police handle the it. The police? I know Charlie. He'd never believe me. That's the problem, Marty. I- if you shoot this guy, you'll be arrested and tried for murder. Would a jury believe you? But the future of the world is at stake. I know I'm right. Everybody is innocent until they prove he's guilty. Now, give this guy the benefit of the doubt. Let Charlie find out who he is. <laughs> And the name of this place is, uh, Sisori, you say? How, how do you spell it, Mike? S-I-S-S-O-R-A. Uh-huh. Charlie, what are you doing? Oh, Marty, this is official. I'm entering it down as a report. But I didn't come here so that you could make a joke out of it. Oh, it's no joke, Marty. Now it becomes a part of the official business of my department. Now, uh, he's a recon scout from this place, Sisori. Okay. Now. Authentication, if any, of the charge. How do you know? How do I know? Uh, Charlie, Charlie, where did your folks come from? Well, years and years ago, uh, I guess it was France. Uh, two, three thousand years ago. What were they doing? <laughs> you got me there, Marty. They were Gauls. They lived in the forests of Europe. Okay, I buy that. And before that, before that, you ever think about it? No, why should I? Doesn't anything ever come to you sometimes... In a dream or as a random thought. Oh, what, what do you mean? Is all the memory gone, Charlie? Do you ever hear a sound in the night that couldn't be made today? Or sometimes is there a few notes of a melody that you can't quite seem to place? Well, I don't know, Marty. I don't really know. Suddenly, suddenly I began to see it and hear it, Charlie. I saw myself. Well, it, it may not have been me. It, it, it could have been some vaguely, deeply remote ancestor. I remember another place. What other place? Sisora. Oh, yeah. I know you don't believe me. Oh, it doesn't make any difference if I do or not. You, you just give me the facts. It's crowded. There are so many of us. We must find more room. Never enough. We have the weapons... The great weapons of fire. We can conquer wherever we go, but where can we go? Space is so vast, and the places in which we can live so few, so remote, so hidden. And I remember. Yeah, you remember. The ship. The great fire disk. It came down here. But something went wrong. What? I don't know. I wasn't the pilot. He was killed in the crash. The rest of us, we stepped out into this new world. And it was beautiful. It was also terrible. Because we had found a place, the right place, the place we had been looking for always. And now... Now we had no way of getting back home to tell about it. Okay, I got that. And then what happened? I don't know. We probably became part of this world, blended and melted into the life of the earth, and... And then one night I saw this man. This man Simpkins in the restaurant. And all this came back to me. Mm -hmm. Now, the gist of the thing is, Simpkins is a scout for an enemy invasion of the earth. That's what you're saying, huh? Yes, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, well... 
Sometimes the biggest part of police work is to run down all kinds of nutty-sounding claims. I was afraid you'd think I was a nut. I didn't say you were a nut. No, I, I just said you were making a nutty-sounding claim. Uh, do I have all the information? I think so. Yeah, Frank? A uh, fellow named Arthur Simpkins. Yeah. Lives at uh, 233 Boulder Place. It's an apartment. Let's, uh... Find out all about him, huh? Martin? Good evening, dear. Uh, Charlie called while you were out. Oh? Was it about Simpkins? Uh, he left a message. Here, I, I wrote it down. Let me see. Yes. Mr. Arthur Simpkins comes from Los Angeles, California. Is employed by Fletcher McGowan Data Processing... As a sales engineer. Oh, I guess that settles Mr. Simpkins. I don't believe it. Why? He's wearing the scarab. The sacred scarab. But Charlie found out. He works for this company on the West Coast. How did Charlie find out? I don't know. Maybe they checked with his landlord. No, what, what, what are you doing? Operator, I would like to uh, find out the number of a company named uh, Fletcher McGowan in Los Angeles. Oh. And uh, uh, then um, I would like to uh, put through a person-to-person -person call to a Mr. Arthur Simpkins. Oh. That's right, thank you. What, what are you doing that for? I know I'm right. But uh, Charlie just handed you the fact. Maybe Charlie's satisfied. I'm not. Marty, I love you. Maybe I haven't been everything you needed and deserved. You were everything I ever needed and more than I deserved. <laughs> uh, yes. Thank you, Operator. Uh, would you please ring them? But, Marty, what is the matter? It has to be something. It is. It's a Sora. I remember it. How and why, don't ask, but I remember. What? What's that, operator? Oh, no, there... There should be an Arthur Simpkins at that number. Well, are you sure we've reached Fletcher McGowan? All right, operator. Thank you. This message from Charlie, mm -hmm. it isn't true. What? I don't think Charlie's taking me seriously enough. I'll be back, Regina. Well, where, where are you going? I have to do some of Charlie's work for him. Marty. Yes, it's Martin. Marty, where were you? Regina called me. She said you ran out of the house earlier with a look on your face as if you'd commit murder. Now, what have you been up to? I guess you'd call it break and entry. A little burglary. Marty, please, be careful what you say. Here's a drinking glass. Huh? I was careful to wrap it in a handkerchief. And got his fingerprints. You mean you stole... Yes, and this. The beetle. The sacred beetle, the scarab of Sisora. See? The colors are black and gold. I remember those colors. You realize you could be in a jam? Check these fingerprints. I already found out about the scarab. What did you find out? I had Wilson look at it. He's head of metallurgy at the School of Mines. This emblem? You know what he said? He doesn't know what the metal is. He doesn't? No. He said this thing is made of a metal, all metals, unknown on this earth. He said that? All right, now, you check those fingerprints. You'll find that there is no record of them anywhere. There can't be. He's not from this world. <laughs> Arrest him, Charlie. Arrest him? On what charge? The man has no fingerprint records. How do you account for that? Oh, there are plenty of people whose fingerprints aren't on file. But you yourself say there's no record of him anywhere. No social security, no credit rating, nothing. Yeah, that's true. Isn't that suspicious? Well, it may be suspicious, but it's not illegal. The man has no visible means of support. Isn't that a fact? Yeah. All right, then arrest him for vagueness. Well, you can only do that if he's liable to become a public charge. But surely, Charlie, you can do something. Marty! I'm an officer of the law. The law. My mission in life is to uphold the law. Now, this man, whoever and whatever you say he is, he's not breaking any law. This man is an advanced scout for a race that will destroy every living person on this planet. All right, granted for the sake of argument. Where's your evidence? Evidence? How do you know? Because I can remember. I know, I know. I'm a member of that race myself. Then why shouldn't you be on his side? Because it was too long ago. My 
my true roots, my important racial memories. They're here. Marty, I, I wish I could do something to help. You don't really believe this man is an alien enemy, do you? No, I don't. Despite the evidence I've given you. You haven't given me any evidence. Now, listen, Marty, uh, why don't you and Regina go away for a vacation? Relax, huh? That's a good idea. More coffee? No. I think I'll go out for a walk. Do you want me to come along? I'm uh, trying to think out a new approach to, uh, to my book. Oh. All right. It's a little windy. Dress warm. You mean warmly. <laughs> One day I'll learn the difference. Well, really doesn't matter. I'll be right back. No, Marty. Uh, about that symptom. Oh, thing. uh, you can forget about it. Oh, I, I hope so. It will work itself out. What do you mean? Oh, it's nothing, Regina. It's nothing, dear. I'll be back soon. Hello? Charlie? I, I'm scared. What's the matter? It's Martin. He left the house, and I'm afraid... He, well, he, he seemed about to do something. Well, just tell me. This business was Simpkins. He, he said he was going for a walk. On a hunch, I looked in the drawer where he keeps his target pistol. It's gone. <laughs> What are you doing here? I've been waiting for you to get back, Mr. Simpkins. I've had enough of this. I'm going to call the police. Don't move. You wouldn't use that gun. Wouldn't I? As your wife said, it isn't your style. How do you know what my wife said? Oh, we have that capability back on Sisora, don't we? Here you call it ESP. It's old stuff with us. Or have you forgotten... You're not a killer. You never know what you are until you find yourself in the unexpected place. Why kill me? Because of your plans for this earth? Oh, forget it. Those plans can't become operational for more than 500 years. You won't be affected. But this is my world. Once you're dead, you have no world. Consider, if you kill me, it's murder. You can't justify it. You've already tried. The police think you're crazy. It doesn't matter. It does. To you, you'll spend the rest of your life in prison. Or in the sanitarium. <laughs> what for? I can't let you destroy the world. Go ahead. Stop me. Well, why don't you pull that trigger? <laughs> you can't. <laughs> it isn't in you. I am everything you say I am. Now kill me. What are you waiting for? Marty! Marty, what did you do that for? I had to, Charlie. I had to. Is everything all right today, darling? Oh, yes, yes. They're being very nice to me. I may feel like digging in the garden later. You do that. The doctor says it's good for you. They didn't believe me. Nobody believed me. <laughs> they think I'm crazy. No, it's all right, dear. What's all right? That they think I'm crazy? Don't you understand? I saved the world. I saved the world. Oh, yes. Now, how about a nice cup of hot tea? A wife is a wife. I'll bet the day Columbus said, Honey, I'm leaving today to discover America. She smiled at him and said, mm, Yes, dear. So, did Martin Struve really save us? Who knows? I know two things. A... He will spend the rest of his life in the sanatorium. And B, I shall return in just a few moments.
inventor, the visionary, the discoverer, the creator. He, and I should say she, is always the loneliest of people. For so many things simply cannot be shared, even with those who truly love us. Let a man march to a different drum and, unfortunately, the world will destroy him. Well, we try to make an interesting world for you around here. Our cast included Ralph Bell, E.V. Juster, and William Griffiths. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... In our lives, we all travel to many places where we will be the stranger. The unknown waits for us in other countries, other towns, even new roads, a different turn on an unfamiliar street. And are we really any different from the traveler of ancient times? Aren't we still dependent on the kindness and goodwill of others? Even the most suspicious of people must ultimately be confronted with a situation where he must trust his money, his possessions, or even his life to a stranger. You're mistaken, Orville. I can leave here any time I want to. Stop pretending, Pamela. You know you can never leave Silver Tree Island. Yes, I can. No one ever leaves Silver Tree Island. And you know why. It isn't true. It's impossible. You know why now, don't you, Pamela? Don't you? mystery drama, The Island on Silver Tree Lake, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Victoria Dan and stars Patricia Elliott. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. say has gotten smaller. It grows smaller every day. This incredible shrinking process has to do with our advanced technology. There is scarcely a patch of ocean or earth anywhere that has not been duly accounted for on some vast atlas. The previous frontiers of mystery are rapidly losing their magic. The once untamable Amazon is falling victim to the bulldozer. Enchanted islands in the South Pacific are used for atomic bomb experiments. Still, with it all, there are places, even in this country, that remain relatively untouched by the mass of civilization. Places that we call the back roads of America. Officer, I, I don't understand why you pulled me over. I, I uh, good evening, ma'am. My name is Trooper Leroy LaRue, Jr. Your name, ma'am? Allen. Uh, Pamela Allen. Mm -hmm. My license is in my purse. Is your car, Miss Allen? Uh, no, I, I rented it at the airport uh, in Memphis. Where are you from, Miss Allen? Uh, it is Miss, isn't it? Uh, yes, I, I'm from New York. Miss Allen, are you aware there's a posted speed limit here? Officer, I wasn't speeding. The posted limit is 45. I was doing 45. <laughs> you... Can't give me a ticket just for that, <laughs> Miss Allen. Now, have I said one word about a ticket? Now, you obviously been seeing too many of those movies about cigar smoking southern policemen picking on poor Yankee motorists. Uh, I only now learned... listen. The limit means forty-five miles an hour. Conditions permit. Now, you know what that means? Now, it's just been a rainfall. Now, this is the lake road, and it's bad enough when it's dry. It curves and snakes, and then you know, if you aren't familiar with it, well. It can be pretty dangerous. Oh, I see. Oh, thank you for the warning, officer. Hey, you ain't going to a wedding, aren't you? Uh, how did you know... Over in Weaverville, right? Hmm? Right, but... Well, that fancy package with the bows on the seat next to you. Now, what else could that be but wedding present? And who else is getting married tomorrow except Sally Lynn Wilkie? You, you know Sally? <laughs> know her? 
Listen, you're talking about the love of my cousin Earl's life. Now, it broke his heart when she went up north to that college. Now, he waited and waited for her to come home after that, but, oh, no, she said she had to find herself. <laughs> Got herself a couple of interesting degrees. She's back home for good now. Finally caught up with her. Catches up with everybody sooner or later. Uh... Uh, marriage, that is. No, I tell you, they're dropping like flies around me. Officer, I... Uh, but, uh, well, I see I'm being a bit of an annoyance. No, no, it's just that well, I... the truth is, Miss Allen, you know, you got me just a bit flustered. But you be careful now. It's nearly dark and you have to be extra mindful of those sudden twists and turns. I appreciate your advice, Officer uh, LaRue. Hmm? I- I'll be as careful as I can. Oh, we have had some terrible accidents on this part of the lake road. You know, cars skidding right in the embankment. Well, I'll certainly try to get to Weaverville in one piece. Okay, bye now. <laughs> bye. <laughs> Sally Lynn. No college roommate. <laughs> I wouldn't make this trip for anybody except you. Whew. This really is a boondock. Middle of nowhere. Oh, I'd hate to run out of gas here. Oh, oh, that was close. Oh, this road really is dreadful. The way it twists. Oh, that curve. I, I, I'm going into a skid. I, I can't stop. I'm going to go right off. I must have blacked out. I. Oh no! <gasps> Look at the car, the windshield, everything. What a mess! A mess! Or, or at least I. I think to be in one piece. Now what am I? What am I supposed to do? I'm in the middle of nowhere. No phone, no, no houses. I, I guess I'd better start walking. I must have walked halfway around the lake by now. There's nobody. There's nothing. Oh, oh, it's a chicken. Oh, up there, ahead. A dock. I, I think I see a boat. Oh, it is someone. Hey. Hey. Hey, hello there. What? Well, who's there? Oh, oh, am I glad to see you, sir. I didn't think there was anyone around here for miles. Oh, I'm here. Always here. I just ran my car into a ditch a few miles back, and I... I, I would really appreciate some help. Oh, had an automobile accident, you say? Yes, where, where would the nearest gas station be? There ain't none, except in town. Oh, that's over five miles in the dark. Well, but is there a house nearby? Nope. Not that I know of. Well, but what's that out, out there? Out where? Uh, well, I, th- I think I see some lights out, out in the center of the lake. Oh, oh, don't you know what that is? No. Should I? Well, that's the Silver Tree Lake Resort. Resort? <laughs> Out here in the middle of nowhere. Well, not many people have heard of it. It's it's very, uh, how do you say, exclusive? W- w- would they have a telephone there? You mean you'd want to go there? Well, yes, yeah, just to use their phone. Mm. Oh, I don't know. You make it sound as if they've got guard dogs or something. Oh, they do. A big brood of a German shepherd. Um, but he don't bark at me. I mean, in my boat. He knows me. I make deliveries at the island. Drop off guests a couple times a week. Supplies, the, the Sunday paper. Well, m- might you be able to give me a lift over in your uh, in your launch here? Oh, I'd be happy to oblige you, miss, uh, for a fee. Yeah, the going rate is half a buck. Well, all right. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'd take you for nothing, but it's been a slow week, and, well, the price of gasoline these days... <laughs> never mind, never mind. Here's your money, Mr. Oh, no, uh... just call me Charlie. Hey, come on, hop in now. Watch your step. Here we are. Silver Tree Lake Resort. Oh, 
beautiful, what I can see of it. Oh, hey, hey, does, does he bite? Lucy, no, not me, doesn't. Yeah. Good boy. Good boy, Bertie. Well, follow me. I'll take you to meet the manager and his wife. They'll be up in the main lobby just ahead. Hey, anybody home? Well, Charlie, how are you? Who's this young lady? Oh, Miss Pamela Allen. I'd like you to meet the owner and manager of Silver Tree Lake Resort, Mr. T.J. Harrison. Well, how do you do, sir? I, I, I was hoping that perhaps I might use your phone. Oh, I just badly ruined my car. Yes, yeah, you had an accident. Uh, yes, yes, so you have, Miss Allen. I, I can see you. I can see you hurt yourself. No, no, n- not really. I, I would just like to use the phone. Oh well, I'm afraid it's impossible. They switch boards out of order till the morning. Hey, that storm we had early this afternoon knocks the wires down. Oh, I see. You know, the best thing you can do now is to get some rest. You know, we can put you up one of the guest rooms. There's plenty of space. Well, well I, I don't know. Uh, uh, what credit cards do you accept? <laughs> credit cards. Oh, uh, Miss Allen, you don't really think we charge you for our hospitality. I mean, to a traveler in distress. Well, this may be a hotel, but you're a guest of management. Now, haven't you ever heard of Southern Hospitality? Well, I... I appreciate it, Mr. Harris. Uh, Vonnie. Oh, Vonnie. Come on out here, honey. Uh, Vonnie, here's my wife. What is it, T.J.? I was just sitting down to dinner. Uh, honey, this is Miss Pamela Allen. She's uh, she had an accident with her car. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So I insist that she stay the night, you know, rest up. Of course. But I, I don't want to put you to any trouble. No, no, no trouble at all. Now, is it, Vonnie? No, no, of course not. I'll show you to your room. <laughs> It's a lovely room, Mrs. Harrison. Please call me Vani. And I wish you'd call me Pamela. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your kindness. We're kind of a simple place here, but I think you'll find everything you need. Try to get some rest. You must have had quite an ordeal. Well, good morning, Miss Allen. Did you sleep well? Yes, I did. Thank you very much. Again, I was wondering about the telephone. I understand you didn't have supper last night. Now, I insist you sit right down this instant and have a nice big country breakfast. Oh, thank you, but but I never have much of an appetite in the morning. I really wanted to call the gas station about my car. Look, this buffet. Now, what would you like? Hmm? Ham, sausage, hash browns, fresh root cup. Hey. Do you like sweet rolls? Just a cup of tea. Well, now you just sit right down at that table over there, and I'll have Orville bring you a tray. Good morning, Pamela. Did you sleep all right? Great. I, I want to thank you. Really. Uh, listen, Bonnie, I-, I-, I don't mean to appear anxious, but are the phones still out of order? What? The telephones. Are they repaired yet? What telephones? You know, the ones that that connect you to the mainland. We don't have any telephones here. What? But your husband told me last night... You must be mistaken. There have never been any telephones here at Silver Tree Island Resort. And here you thought the plot was never going to, as they say, thicken... Was T.J. Harrison so embarrassed about not having telephones at his little island resort that he'd actually lie about something so petty? Or is it really so petty? What ulterior motives could anyone possibly have for something like that? He must have lied for a reason. In any event, he'll have a chance to explain himself when I come back with Act Two. Two thousand years ago, a Greek writer said, What is pleasanter than the tie of a host and guest? Things haven't changed much since then. Hosts still like to entertain, and guests still worry about overstaying their welcome. Pamela Allen, en route to the wedding of an old friend in the back country of Mississippi, has just spent the night at a hotel in the middle of a lake. Following the promise of the hotel manager that the phones 
would be working in the morning. Now it seems her very gracious host neglected to tell her that there aren't any phones on the island. No phone? No, of course not. But why would your husband tell me there were phones if there really weren't? You were in such a state he probably didn't want to upset you. What kind of a place doesn't have telephones? Pam, you have to understand, Silver Tree Island is a place where people come to escape the pressures of the outside world. They leave their cares behind. No television, no radio, no telephones. The people prefer it that way, and we cater to our clientele. I guess that makes sense, but still, I... Sure it makes sense. TJ is the perfect host. Oh, hey, here comes Orville with your breakfast. Thank you, but I'm really not very oh, hungry. nonsense. You've got to eat something. You went to sleep on an empty stomach. Uh, Orville, uh, this here is Miss Pamela Allen. Here's your tray. Orville is the resort social director. Entertains nightly in the Starlight Lounge. How nice. But we all help out in the dining room. Gives the place a homey touch, wouldn't you say? Ronnie, I, I don't want to seem ungrateful. But, you see, I'm expected at a wedding this evening. I really have to get someone to tow the car. It's rented. I've got a lot to do. I was wondering if after breakfast... Hey, now, don't worry about a thing. Just be down at the dock in half an hour. Charlie comes with deliveries about then. He'll give you a ride back. Oh, that's a load off my mind, thank you. I, uh... I've already had my breakfast, but you shouldn't be eating by yourself. Say, Orville, why don't you sit here with Miss Pamela Allen? All right. Won't you excuse me? I think I see T.J. You're not eating anything. I never eat in the morning. Orville, how long have you been working here at Silver Tree Island? Work? Well, that's what you do, isn't it? You're a resident social director? I don't call it work. I call it music. But you'll hear me tonight after dinner. I won't be here. Sure. That's what they all say. What all who say? The guests. Oh, I'm not a regular guest. Well, they all say that, too. What are you talking about? Don't you know by now? They're not going to let you get away so fast. Uh, do you mean to say that... that they're going to try to get me to stay longer? As a regular guest? Well, you could put it that way, yes. That's ridiculous. Charlie's taking me back in his boat as soon as he drops off some supplies. Mm-hmm. Why do you sound so skeptical? Skeptical? Heck, I'm not skeptical. <laughs> in fact, I'll walk you down to the landing myself. There's Charlie now, right on schedule. Oh, I wish I could have found the Harrisons before I left. I wanted to thank them for their hospitality. Hey, Brucey. Here, boy. Come on. Come on. Has to be the gentlest breed I've ever seen. Don't let this pussy cat of a dog deceive you. He's a German shepherd, and he can be fierce if provoked. Uh, you, you'd better get back off the land. What's he growling at me for? That dock is his personal property. Get back. Get back off. It. What's the matter? I told you. Brucey doesn't like people trespassing on his dock. But you didn't growl at me last night. Well, that was different. But why? Because I was with Charlie? No. Because you were arriving. Not leaving. Brucey doesn't like to see visitors go. Oh, that's just wonderful. Oh, here's Charlie. I'm, uh... Sure, he'll be happy to escort you. Hi, Charlie. Uh, what are you two doing at the dock this morning? I hope you don't mind, Charlie, but I was hoping to hitch a ride back to the mainland with you. Oh, you did, did you? Yes. Does she really think I'm going to take her back? What do you say? Well, after what you've seen. After what I've seen? What do you mean? Well, it's out of the question. Out of the question now. Now, if you'll just excuse me. Oh, I understand now. You you want me to pay you, right? <laughs> now, you are a smart young lady. Is it still 50 cents? Uh, let me just... Uh, here. Uh, do you have change for a $5 bill? Nope. Oh, could, could I trouble you? Sorry, I never carry money. Well, <laughs> here then. Take the whole five. Are you kidding? It's worth it for me to get going. Well, not to me. 
I don't deal in paper money. It's 50 cents clear or no ride. But that's $5. Perfectly good U.S. currency. Well, I'm not interested. The fee is 50 cents. Exact change only. You're the most unbelievable person I've ever met. Now, see what you've done. You've upset Brucey. You better come back to the hotel, Tom. How could anybody be so mercenary? Young lady, you can always complain to the management. I'm afraid my hands are tied, Miss Allen. Charlie is an independent operator. But surely, Mr. Harris... Now, over the years, he's developed what might appear to outsiders as somewhat eccentric ways. Now, one of them is a 50-cent charge. In fact, he charges 50 cents for just about everything. It certainly is eccentric. Hmm. Well, Mr. Harrison, I'm sure then you won't mind if I trouble you for the change of a... Change? Why, you don't understand, Miss Allen. I thought I explained to you last night. <laughs> We're a hospitality house. We never accept money. But you're a hotel, surely. No, have... no, no. And you have the wrong idea about us, Miss Allen. We never charge our guests anything. What? Do you, do you think I run this place for the money? Well, uh, why else? No, no, no. This is not the kind of business you think. Charge our guests money. No. Our people are here to get away from the world. Now, money is the root of all anxiety and all frustration. Mr. Harrison, if you don't believe in charging money, it's no affair of mine. But I've got to be in Weaverville by early this afternoon. Now, first, you told me some story about there being phones on the island, which there aren't. And then your wife told me I'd be sure to get a ride back with Charlie, except... Now it appears I can't do that unless I come up with exactly 50 cents, which you say you don't have. Now, what is going on here, Mr. Harrison? Don't you know? No, I'm quite confused. Well, then I'll clear things up for you. We like you very much and would like to invite you to stay. Stay? Here? That's right. You see, well, I I wouldn't normally be so pushy, but Vani really likes you. And Vani doesn't often take to people. I mean, she really seems to get along with you. I'm very glad, but still... Uh, Vani, Vani has been ill recently. I am sorry to hear that. And uh, already you sort of, you know, brought, brought her spirit back into her face, the shine back in her eyes. Oh, there is nothing like the companionship of young people, especially when her husband is a... Uh, <laughs> Such an old fogey like me. Oh, you're not old, Mr. Harris. <laughs> well, thank you, but the truth is, I'm I am twice as old as Vani, and sometimes there's that unavoidable what what is it they used to say uh, generation gap. Well, at least, well, couldn't you stay the weekend? I told you I have to be in Weaverville by this afternoon. Well, why don't we discuss this after lunch? After lunch. We just had breakfast. Oh, uh, will you excuse me, Miss Allen? I'm wanted at the desk. A new guest. Mr. Harrison, I... Uh, after lunch, Miss Allen. Uh, talk to me after lunch. I don't know what you're so worked up about. Although I seem to be getting the runaround here. Do you? Really? Uh, what is this, some sort of inquisition? No, I just meant... Well, you seem to enjoy it here. A person has to be a fool to want to leave a place like this. Listen. <laughs> That's a very rare nightingale. Stay, Pamela. I can't. I, I've got things to do. It would be so much better if you wanted to stay. You make it sound as if I have no choice. But you... You don't. What did you say? You're here to stay. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. You can't go back. You know you can't go back. Nobody can ever go back. What? Nobody ever leaves Silver Tree Island. Oh, well, really? I... Ever. That's the price you pay instead of money. You never leave. I don't believe it. It's true, and you know it. Oh, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Oh, quit joking around. It isn't funny anymore. I'm not joking. Look, I've got to get out of here. I, I mean, I left a $35 wedding present in an unlocked car, a rented car with a smashed windshield. I know. 
A 76 blue sedan. Needs a new windshield and some work on the front grill. How, how, how did you know what kind of car I was driving? Why shouldn't I know? P.J. told me. Mr. Harrison, but uh, how does he know? He knows everything. He always knows the circumstances of the death. The, the what? The death. You know, like your death. M- my death. What is it? He said it was uh, some kind of a head injury, I think. You're... <laughs> You're telling me that I'm dead. What do you think I'm doing? I don't like your sense of humor, Orville. It's very sick. Pamela, why don't you face facts? You had an accident. You died. It happens to the best of us. <laughs> and you're out of your mind. I'm alive. No. No, you're just a soul, like the rest of us. You know you're dead, and you know where you are. Oh, and where am I supposed to be? Where all souls go. The island of the dead. The island of the... what? Of the dead. Otherwise known as... Hades. Hades, the island of the dead? Is it possible that Pamela is actually dead? Is progress so universal a concept that the afterlife also changes with the times? The island of Hades becomes a homey resort surrounded by a pleasant lake? Or rather, do people see only what they want to see? We'll see what lies ahead when I return with Act Three. For thousands of years, Western civilization has held on to its belief of some kind of afterlife. Greeks and Romans had legends of an underworld called Hades, run by a gloomy Olympian god and his young, pretty wife. The dead reached Hades by ferrying across the dark river Styx and were greeted at the gates by a huge three-headed dog named Cerebrus. Now, in our story, we have a pleasant southern resort island, the owner and his younger wife, and an ominous German shepherd guarding the boat dock. If there are any parallels, well, they really aren't intentional. Hades. You're telling me that this place is Hades. It is. This whole thing is ridiculous. You skidded off the road. All right. You say you blacked out? Yes. But you weren't in the car when you regained consciousness? No, I was on the grass somewhere. Somewhere. Don't you remember? Um, Actually, it's... Oh, hazy now. Uh, anyway, it's not important. Oh, but it is. You regained consciousness outside your car, a distance from your car. You were thrown from your car. I, I, don't, I don't remember. I, 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 I don't know. Thrown from a car, and you don't have a scratch on you. Going over 45 miles an hour. Don't you see? You're beginning to forget already. That's part of it. What kind of car were you driving? Um... Uh, I can't seem to recall. Mm-hmm. What color was it? Uh, I don't remember. You see, the wind of forgetfulness. Well, you're just trying to frighten me. I'm just trying to make you see the truth. I, I, I've got to get moving. I, I, I'll be late. Late for what? Do you remember where you have to be? Of course, I, I've got to. Uh, I, I've got to um, go over to the. Uh, <laughs> strange. I, I, I can't seem. You remember? I told you. Face facts. You're a resident. A permanent resident of Silver Tree Resort. No. No. No, there there, there must be some explanation. Pamela. Pamela, wait. You can't go. There's no way off the island, don't you see? Come on, Brucie. Let me go, Pat. Come on, boy. Come on, boy. I'm not going to steal the boat. He'll bite. 
he'll bite, you know. So if I'm that, I won't feel it. Oh, you'll feel it, all right. I don't understand this. I, I don't understand any of it. Why won't anyone let me leave? Hello. How are you feeling? Oh, Pamela, answer me. What have I done to make you angry? I want to leave. Nobody will let me leave. Is this such a bad place? No. Not really. Has anyone treated you unkindly, made you feel unwelcome? No. Then what's the problem? Bonnie, is this place really... Really... Yes, it is. And am I supposed to be... Everyone here is dead. That's what makes Silver Tree Island Resort so uh, exclusive. The ultimate in exclusiveness, if that's the appropriate word. I'm really... dead. Hey, it's not so bad. I'm... 27 years old. What, what, what did I ever do to Pamela? I was a lot younger than you when I came here. I cried and I wanted to go home, but... Well, what's done is done. I'm here. And it really isn't that unpleasant. We can be friends. Orville seems to like you and he usually doesn't bother with people. I'd be very flattered if I were you. 27 years old. I never really... I never really loved someone. You might as well face facts. Why? Because that's the way things are. Why do I have to accept that? Because you have to. That's why. Bonnie, I don't have to accept anything. But you do have to. Some people, most people, almost all people, but not me. And what do you intend to do about it? Bonnie... When I go into a store and they sell me something and I decide I don't want it, I go right back and I return it. Even if the store has a strict no-return policy, I return it and I get my money back. Do you know why? No. Because that's how I was raised. My mother told me, Pamela, never let anyone sell you something you don't want to buy and I never have. But this is different. How is it different? You're talking about a non-returnable item. That's where you're wrong, Bonnie. Everything is returnable. T.J., honey, Pamela here wants to talk to you. That's right, sure. Is uh, everything all right, Miss Allen? No, everything is not all right. Oh, no? Well, what's wrong? I'll take care of it right away. I am not pleased with the services of this establishment. What? How can that be? I find the quality not to my satisfaction. Well, uh, what exactly don't you like? Is it the food? You call that food? I've eaten sandwiches out of vending machines that tasted better. Oh, you can't mean that. I insist you provide transportation for me back to the mainland. Well, now, I will oblige you in any way a good host can, Miss Allen. And I'll improve your meals. I'll do anything a good host should. But the successful host is one who's made his guests feel uh, so welcome that they never wish to leave. And I fear I have not succeeded with you. But never mind. I am working on it. <laughs> You play very beautifully, Orville. I don't understand it, Pamela. What exactly do you want to get back to? I... I don't know. And why are you so anxious to get back? It doesn't make much sense. All I know is... I'm not ready for... For this yet. No one ever is. I've got to leave while I still have this resistance. It'll pass with time. How long... Have you been here, Orville? How long? <laughs> oh, I don't know. An eternity, maybe. No, really. H how long? So long, I can't remember. But I know you can't ever leave here. I know someone who tried once. 
Who? Oh. There was this musician. He was at some kind of a concert, and his wife was at home. Alone. There was this terrible accident, and the wife was dead. The man went out of his mind. He couldn't believe what had happened. I think I know that story. Do you? Yes, it's the story of... Let me tell you how it ended. The man knew where she'd gone. So he came here. Charlie took him across in his rowboat. There weren't powerboats in those days. And he went before the king of the underworld to beg for the return of his wife. At first, the king refused. But then the musician started to play his lyre. He played a song... A song so sweet and sad about a young girl painting flowers in an open field. A girl that the king had loved at first sight and brought down to the underworld to be his queen. And the king was moved to tears, told the musician he could have his wife. He could return with her to the world of the living if only he didn't turn around and look behind him on the journey homeward. But he did look behind, didn't he? Yes. And Eurydice, the wife, vanished into dust, didn't she? Yes. Into dust. It was your wife, wasn't it? Yes. It was my wife. Times change. Names change. You're Orpheus, aren't you? It was so long ago. Sometimes I've almost completely forgotten about it. I'm sorry. Oh, about what? Listen, I never fool myself. I'm a musician first. A performer. That's what's the most important to me. That's my first and real love. The other kinds of love... Uh, they become gentle memories that become part of my music. But it's the music. That's what's important. The music. That's it. The music. What is it? Oval, you're going to help me get out of here. No, no, no. I, I don't want you to go. If you call yourself my friend, you'll help me. But what can I do? I used to be quite a mythology buff, Orville. I remember some more details about the story of Orpheus and Eurydice... He was the greatest musician the world has ever known. I know that. Isn't it also legend that he played music so moving, so exquisitely touching, that he caused all who heard it to lay down and weep? How did he get past the gates of Hades, Orville? How did he get past that ferocious three-headed monster, Cerebrus? I, I don't... You know how. He played a song so sweet and gentle, the huge animal wept. It became a lullaby. And soon Cerebus was fast asleep. Then, he just walked right on past the sentinel and into Hades. And that is how I'm going to walk right out of here. Or swim, if that's what it comes down to. I I can't do it this time. Why not? I don't want to. I, I like you. I want you to stay. Didn't you tell me that you were an artist first? I am. So, let's see how much of an artist you really are. Can you... Create another legend now, or do you really have doubts that you've lost the old touch? Is that what it really is, No. No, I still have it. Then, show me. Show me, Orville. Play more sweetly than you've ever played before. Oh, that's beautiful. Just lovely, Orville. Oh, I'm a boy again. I'm on the high seas, cresting those waves, those oars. My muscles are rippling. I'm cutting those oars through the waves like a knife through butter. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, 
trouble. Now do something about him. Charlie's all taken care of. Now get rid of this dog. Here, Brucey. Here, boy. Now go ahead. Hurry. I don't know how long I can hold them. Thank you, Orville. Thank you. Hurry. Hurry. I'll never forget you for this, Orville. Miss Allen, are you all right? Officer, officer. Uh, yeah, Leroy LaRue Jr., you remember me, don't you? It's still nighttime. How, how can it still be nighttime? Oh, boy, you, you've gone into one heck of a skid, miss. Oh, look at this car. For a minute, I thought you were dead. Now, you really look dead. I'm... I'm all right. I, I, I feel fine now. I, I, I don't understand it. I, I could have sworn you were dead. But the dead don't come back to life, do they? No. No. They don't, Officer LaRue. Of course. They don't. Or do they? After all, anything is possible in this day and age. Anyhow, who is to say whether or not this wasn't all some dream? Maybe there really isn't some actual life and death struggle that has gone on since the beginning of time. Maybe there is really no place called the Isle of the Dead. In any event, one thing we do know for sure is that this is the place right here where you'll be when I return shortly. lesson. Don't always feel you have to pay for something you don't want at the moment. Some people can be mighty persuasive salesmen, but the fault, dear Brutus, is truly with the customers who so readily purchase whatever is foisted upon them. With most of us, we are so ready to accept our fates because someone tells us that is the way it is to be. But is it? Our cast included Patricia Elliott, Lloyd Batista, Terry Keene, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Radio Mystery Theater presents... Are you ever overcome these days by a kind of helpless feeling that you are hopelessly trapped in a plastic world? That your life is invaded, even ruled, by that faceless, inhuman monster, the computer? This is the story of a man, such as you and me, and of the lengths to which we, too, might be driven. Water, look out! Young fool, he, he could have killed us. It wasn't his fault. I didn't see him. Oh, but darling, you must have seen him coming out of the side road. No, I didn't see him. Oh, look, if, if you're planning to kill yourself, Walt, please don't do it with me in the car. Our mystery drama, Sorry to Let You Go was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Mandel Kramer. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division.
I'll be back shortly with Act One. If the human being ever loses out to the machine, what will have defeated man is the machine's impersonality. You can't come to grips with a machine, let alone fight it. It's like all the mythic terror figures who grew a fresh arm or head as fast as you lopped it off, or drew new strength from the ground every time they were knocked down, or who were impervious to any fear of defeat, and so never suffered it. The machine suffers no reverses because it cannot feel. So in the contest, man must always be the loser. Or must he? Is this my final resting place? Defeated? Pinned beneath the wheel of my car? Walter Hayes, born August 20th, 1932, died September 14th, 1977. Requiescat in pace. Well, maybe. No more running away from that faceless ghost I was afraid to face. That modern-day specter that stalked my heels into the oblivion I was consigned to three months ago with five short words. Sorry to let you go. Sorry to let you go. Sorry to let you go. Files of records. Miss Thompson speaking. Well, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Portman. Walter Hayes is out of the office at the moment. Yes, that's right. Today is the 14th of July. Oh, I see. Well, it's not on his calendar, but... I'll be sure to remind him. Oh, Mr. Hayes, you just had a phone call. Oh, who was it? Mr. Portman, he wanted Forget to... it, Sandy. But, Mr. Hayes, it was business. All the more reason to file and forget it. I won't be taking any more calls, business or otherwise. Oh. What is it, Mr. Hayes? Can I help you? Yeah, I wish you could, but it's too late for that. Oh. Well, what are you doing? Cleaning out my desk. Why? Because I just got my walking paper, Sandra. I'm leaving. The actual words were a little kinder than that. Sorry to let you go. You mean just like that with no warning? Just like that. Oh. The decision was made the way everything else around here is these days, by computer. But that's... that's inhuman. <laughs> Isn't it just? It's not fair. Well, I'll have time to look around. I get three months severance pay. Oh, I didn't mean that, sir. I meant you've been with this company for, well, how many years? Mm-hmm. I'd hate to count. Ever since I came out of college. All my business life. And you suddenly get dumped. It, it's a disgrace. I mean, a person could lose out maybe to another person who did the job better, but to get dumped by a machine. Well, it's a mechanical age. The new computer makes my job unnecessary. But it's scary. It could happen to all of us. Let me see. Pictures of my wife, Louise. Son, Buzz. Daughter, Susan. Desk pen, fondly awarded with suitable inscription from a grateful company on my 10th anniversary. Engraved ashtray, ditto my 15th year. <laughs> the good old days, B.C. B.C.? Hmm, before computers. Now, let's see what's in here. Half a pack of tissues, shirt button, World Almanac 1963. Well, I'll take the pictures, the mementos, the almanac can go in the wastebasket. Oh, that's that. Uh, are you leaving now? Why not? I'm all packed. Not much to show for over 20 years' occupancy. I seem to have become quite a machine myself. Oh, that isn't true. You've been kind and patient and generous and... I, I don't know a nicer man. Well, thank you, Sandra. I hope my wife feels the same way when she gets the news. Oh, Mr. Hayes. Oh, come on now. Come on, Sandy. It isn't that bad. 
I'll tell you what. Why don't I blow you to a farewell lunch and a drink? Oh, I, I, I'd better not. Oh, sure, of course, I, I forgot. You have to stick around uh, and find a foxhole. I can't protect you anymore. Oh, it isn't that. It's what I was trying to tell you about the phone call. You've already got a lunch date. Mr. Portman is expecting you at Mario's. Ed? That's right. I'd forgotten about him. I don't know. I don't think I want to see any old friends. Wait a minute. He's just the guy I ought to see. You know, it's funny. Just a few months ago, he was talking to me about a position with his firm. Oh. Yep. I think lunch with Ed and a couple of strong martinis may be just what I need. Mr. Hayes? Yes, Sandy? I know you'll find something. Yeah. But walking through the office, watching how everyone averted glances and became suddenly busy, I wasn't quite so sure of myself. The first numbness was wearing off. Ah, don't be ridiculous, Walt, allowing these worms of doubt to nibble at your self-confidence. You'll find another job. No problem for crying out loud. Friend Ed, sitting at Mario's, just, just waiting to offer you one. Now, what you need, Walt, is another drink. No, no thanks. You must have something on your mind. Now, what is it? <laughs> Dame trouble. No, 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 nothing like that. I, uh, I've been kicking around the idea of maybe making a change in jobs, Ed. No? <laughs> Why'd you want to do a thing like that? No. Just a notion. Thinking back to something that you happened to mention a few months ago. Me? Mm, don't you remember? You were all revved up about me coming over to your shop. Oh, oh forget it, Walt. Pipe dreams. We got in a new efficiency expert who blew the whole picture. We're not looking for warm bodies anymore. We're putting in the uh, mechanical marvel. Computers? Yeah. <laughs> you shove a lousy card in the slot, and now comes the answer to everything. Look, Ed, I'm not joking. I'm asking you about that job you mentioned in your department in, in sales. No, 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 that's way below you, Walt. I mean, those guys start at 6500 in commission. If they rouse their bustles off, they're lucky to clear twelve to 15000 a year. And without the know-how, <laughs> even a guy like you couldn't climb back to his own salary in ten years. Walt, you're sitting in a catbird seat. <laughs> what do you want to change jobs for anyway? Ed... I just got fired. Hmm? I'm looking for a job. Oh, well, uh, no, no problem for you to find one, old buddy. I hope. Sure, sure. Oh, uh, hey, Walt, I meant to tell you when I came in that we, uh, we kind of blew the lunch. I mean, it's a little late and I'm going to have to duck out. Well, don't let me keep you. Oh, you understand. Oh, sure, sure I do, Ed. Uh, Anton. Uh, no, 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 this is on me. What the heck? I'm the working still. No, no, I'll get it. I'm not on the ropes yet. No, no, my invite. I'll pick up the check. And, uh, well, uh, I'll do you one more favor, Walt. What's that? Free advice from an old salesman. Don't tell anyone else you're out of a job. Why? It's no disgrace? Maybe, but, uh, take a tip and play it smart. Never carry your hat in your hand. Let him come to you. It's the way you can hold out for the dough. And at our time of life, the family load we carry, dough is the name of the game. What we gotta have, old buddy. And don't you ever forget it. So that's what my sometime friend, Ed Portman, left me with. Not the queasy seed of fear that was already there, but the fertilizer to nourish it and make it grow. Suddenly, a ghastly parade of all the things my paycheck went to sustain was unreeling in my mind. The payments on the house, the cars, the furniture. Well, that, that was only the beginning. It was taxes and uh, school fees, the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting that had seemed such a necessity. Light, heat, water, uh, commutation. And nothing of insurance. Insurance on the house, the cars, hospitalization. Furniture, the floater on personal items and jewelry. Most important of all, the company life insurance. That ends, too, with my job. The first thing I have to do is convert. No point in rushing to convert, Mr. Hayes. You're fully covered till the end of your severance. Well, I don't want to let it go. Oh, of course not. But at your age, conversion would be very expensive. Let's hope it can be avoided. Yes, let's do that. Wait a few weeks as soon as you're employed again. 
Undoubtedly, there'll be a new group policy. And uh, if I'm not employed? Well, automatically, we'll convert to term life for you. Uh, <clears throat> would you want to carry as much as your firm has been carrying? Well, of course. Why not? Well, without the advantage of a group rate... Well, I mean, as an individual, it would be rather costly. Well, there'll be one comfort. At least I'll know I'm worth something, even if it's dead. Oh, you'll be employed again in no time. No wonder. You better write up that policy just in case. Well, I'll send you a binder as soon as your present coverage runs out. All right. Uh, how much will it cost, by the way? At your present coverage, something between two and 3000 a year. But it won't be necessary. I'm sure you'll be back on some group plan any day. Any day. Mr. Swanson. Uh, yes? One more favor. E yes. If you should call or have to get in touch with me at home, I'd appreciate it if you, uh, if you don't mention anything about, uh, well, my wife uh, doesn't know about me, of course, and I'm not sure that she should yet. Why, Mr. Hayes, of course. That's your business, not mine. When I left Swanson's office, I could have gotten the 305 home, but I didn't. My regular train was the 605, so I waited for that. It's been a long wait with nowhere to go and some extra drinks to pass the time. Maybe that accounted for my depression and my panic. I dreaded meeting Louise at the station. What was I going to tell her? The truth? Or play it close to my vest till I found a new job? If I found a new job. That, as Hamlet said, was the rub. Well, thank heaven for some extra drinks and the monotonous motion of the train. For the moment, I can go to sleep and forget it. Still, as I drifted under, the terrible thought that was hammering in my head in time to the clacking wheels was, don't worry, Walt. You're worth more dead. Don't worry, Walt. You're worth more dead. Neurotic? Walter Hayes? Mr. Ordinary Commuter, Middle-Level Executive, secure in the high upper percentile of any job profile study in America? But now, suddenly unemployed in a computerized society and joining a shockingly large army of his fellow citizens. Are his fears justified? Is it true that he is worth more dead than alive? I shall return shortly with Act Two. On the 602 out of Grand Central, Walter Hayes is dying Shakespeare's little death. He is sound asleep, blissfully unaware of passing time. In a moment, he will wake to reality, that special shocking reality that he is a man without a job. A temporary situation, of course. Or is it? That's what we're about to find out. And just how desperate a man in Walter Hayes' position can become. I suppose the trainman must have called out Barry Stone, the station before mine, or maybe it was the jolt of the train stopping and starting again, but suddenly, even with my eyes closed, I was awake and realizing that any moment now, after the drive from the station, I'd have to face my wife. What was I going to tell her? Walter, over here. Oh, hi, Louise. Well, how'd you get my car? Oh, darling... I'm sorry to greet you with disaster, Walt, but the generator went on the station wagon. Oh? I had to have it towed to the service station, and then I caught a maxi-taxi down to the parking lot to pick up your car. Oh, you poor darling. Sounds as though it's been a bad day. Oh, horrendous. I hope yours was better. Mine? Yes. Darling, do me a favor. Of course. Don't give me any office cliffhangers. I don't think I could stand it. I'm just barely coping. I won't. No, don't go around. I'll... I'll slide over. You drive. All right. Kids okay? At last report. About all that is. 
What's that mean? Oh, I don't know. The washing machine is making those ominous sounds again, and the septic tank man says we've got to have new fields. How much? Well, we won't even estimate the way prices are. Well, cheer up, darling. It's only money. Yeah, which we never seem to have enough of. Oh, well, never mind me. How was your day? And if anything went wrong, don't tell me. I might dissolve in helpless tears. Oh, it was just a run-of-the-mill day. Nothing special. So that settled that. I wasn't going to tell Louise. I wasn't going to tell anyone that I'd lost my job. Not till I found a new one. Suddenly that cold wrenching was back in my stomach. Supposing I didn't. Involuntarily, I shut my eyes against the prospect. Walter, look out! That young fool, he could have killed us. It wasn't his fault. I didn't see him. Oh, you must have seen him coming out of the side road. No, I didn't see him. Oh, look, if, if you're planning to kill yourself, Walt, please don't do it with me in the car. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. You know I didn't mean that. Oh, my nerves are just shot today. Come on. Let's get home. I knew now for sure one thing I could always do if I had the courage. I'd even said it openly to the insurance man. As long as the policy was in force, I was worth a lot more dead than alive. Maybe that was the answer. Uh, didn't your mother have a checkup today? She did. Well, what's the news? Oh, medically, healthy as a horse. Physically, I should say. Well, what else? Oh, well, let's not drag through it. My mother is a horror, and we both know it, but we're stuck with it. Come on, darling. Let's get a move on. I'd like to get home. Doctors, don't any of them know what they're doing? What is it you're sorry they didn't find, Bertie? What does that mean? Mother, you don't have some major disaster to report. Well, you don't have to sound as if you're sorry, I don't, Louise. I was only trying to help out. Who thought the doctors know? <laughs> you can say that again. What? I mean, you already said it once. Just, just a kind of a joke. I don't see anything funny about the state of my health. Neither do I, Bertie. What did you say? Oh, it's not worth repeating. Cheer up, Bertie. From the medical report, you're going to be around a long time. How do you know? Oh, I've got my troubles, but I just don't talk about them. Some of us know how to bear our crosses silently. Mother, will you stop being such a hypocrite? Hypocrite? That's what I said. To talk to a sick old woman You're like no that. more sick than I am. Or maybe I don't even mean that because I am sick. Sick? Of what? Of hearing you go on and on complaining. Louise, honey. No, Walter. Don't try to stop me. I, I've had a bad day, and Mother is the capper, and I can't take it. I've had her up to here. Well, I never. I suppose you wanted me to go to the doctor's and come back and tell you I was dying. Oh, for pity's sake, I That's couldn't... That's what you want, most of you, isn't it? You'd like to have me dead and out of the way. Oh, Bertie, I never even suggested, and I'm sure Lou didn't if mean anything. If I put my mind to it, I'll outlive you all. No matter how much you'd like to see me gone. Of course, the whole thing was ridiculous. She was an impossible woman. But suddenly, what she was accidentally implying made a huge amount of sense. One thing Bertie had, in addition to a small trust fund, was a whopper of an insurance policy her ex-husband had taken out and which was all paid up. I suddenly looked at her in stark, horrible realization that if anyone had to die, it was better her than me. up my miserable masquerade. Every morning I left on my regular train as if going to work. Exchanged the same stupid pleasantries with my supposed fellow laborers, and every night I returned on my regular 605, the same process in reverse. At first, the deception wasn't too difficult, because Sandra Thompson, my former secretary, was there to take messages and cover for me. Then came the moment of decision. Morning, Sandy. Oh, morning, Mr. Hayes. Uh, any messages for me? Uh, Sorry, no. Well, that figures. You haven't found anything yet? Nope. Only bright spot is that I have you to cover for me in case something does turn up. I'll check back with you around noon. Um, Mr. Hayes? Yeah? I'm not going to be able to cover for you any longer. 
Oh? You see, I got my walking papers now. Not even the pool. Just two weeks to try to get located. Oh, that's a shame, Sandy. But you'll find something else. Will I? You haven't found it so easy, have you? Well, it's 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 different for me, Sandy. I mean, I can't type or take dictation. I I just execute. I'm learning by bitter experience that I don't know how to do anything else but run an efficient records and file system. And it seems a machine can do that better in the last analysis. It's machines for everything nowadays. Nobody seems to want people anymore. I hate that that computer in there. You know, I've got so I dream about it at night. I have nightmares that it grows arms and legs and joins up with all the other computers to trample everyone to death. Like that big old machine. I, I can't think of the name of it. The juggernaut? That's it. A steamroller that crushes everyone to death that stands in its way. I tell you, I'm, I'm scared, Mr. Hayes. I know just how you feel, Sandra. Because so am I. So am I. So the masquerade became more and more difficult. The long hours in town more and more impossible to fill. I'd exhausted all avenues looking for work. It was getting too cold to sit in the park, and I could neither stand nor afford any more day-long movies. Better to spend the time in a bar nursing a drink. At least that ate away the cold edges of the icy terror that kept growing in me like a tumor. I should have had the courage to tell Louise the truth, but I didn't. Or to tell anyone the truth. Instead, more and more, I began to fantasize. And the main fantasy, more and more, became Bertie. Because if I couldn't support my family, she was the only possible means left. Walter. Walter. Huh? What's that? Who, who's there? I know. Don't make a fuss, Sandra. It's Bertie. What are you doing here on the train? Now, Bertie. Now, don't you now, Bertie me. You know you can't stand me. You want to get rid of me. Particularly now. That's a terrible thing to say. It would be a terrible thing to do. But it would solve a lot of problems, wouldn't it, Walt? It isn't a matter of what you want, but just how to go about it. Isn't that it? No, no, please. Now, who's the hypocrite in the family? Face up, Walt. How about a fire? Not a bad idea, is it? All my insurance? And we all know I smoke too much and get careless with cigarettes. Bertie, have a heart. Louise and the kids are going up to visit your folks. I'll be alone in the house. And you're supposed to be driving straight up to join them. Why don't you just burn up the whole house and me with it? And have a chance to make a fresh start. Where do you think you're going? I've got to get in there. That's my house. Hey, wait. Now, 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 just take it easy, mister. No house is worth your life. It's not the house I'm worried about. That's all there is. Your neighbors just told us your whole family packed up in the station wagon and left a couple of hours ago. The house is empty. Nobody's in there. It was as though time stood still. There it was. The perfect opportunity. The perfect out. Laid right in my lap. Nobody but me knew that Bertie was in that house. How much weight would I carry on my conscience? Since Bertie herself, with her eternal falling asleep while smoking, must have started the fire herself. All I had to do was sit tight and leave Bertie to the fate she'd brought on herself. circumstances. No, I shouldn't say do. I should say, what would cross your mind? The temptation might be there, wouldn't you say? But of course, you or I would resist it. Or would we? Let's find out anyway what Walter Hayes did. 
when I return shortly with Act Three. It wasn't a very big fire, but the danger was. It was a foam rubber fire. Ever seen or experienced what foam rubber does when it burns? It creates a thick, black, acrid smoke that clogs the lungs and can smother you in moments. This fire is mainly confined to the chair where Birdie had been sitting when she fell asleep and the lit cigarette dropped from her fingers. Now, a few pitiful, staggering steps from it, she lies, a frail little heap on the floor overcome by the greasy, suffocating smoke. One small step in time from eternity. What do you mean there's nobody? My mother-in-law's in there. Holy maloney. Jim, Fred, get some oxygen and follow me in. And get a pool motor on standby. There's an old lady dressed inside. A wave of relief swept over me. I couldn't stand, Bertie. The accidental death would have been a blessing to me and my family. If I'd kept quiet, the fireman would have been too late to save her. But I couldn't have her death on my conscience. For the first time in weeks, I felt like a man again. But my relief was short-lived. The next two weeks were murdered, living in a motel while the house was cleaned and restored. Oh, poor darling, you look a wreck. Couldn't you take some time off from the office? No, no, I can't, Lou. The bills are piling up. Yes, but the insurance company pays for everything, doesn't it? Well, the home insurance, up to a point. I mean, there's an allowance, but it doesn't quite cover it. Oh, thank the Lord for it, though. You know, it's a wonderful thing, insurance. I don't know what we'd be doing without it. Now, it's one thing I'll make sure you never have to do without. What'd you say? Nothing, honey, nothing. There's my train. I better get going. Yeah, see you tonight. Hmm? Oh, yeah, sure. Walt? What, dear? Just, I love you very much, and... And what? (laughs) Nothing. Only that I'm always sorry to let you go. All the way in on the train, that damn phrase kept running around in my mind like a hamster on a wheel. Sorry to let you go. Sorry to let you go. The way all this had started. The way more and more it seemed it must inevitably end. Poor Lou. She had no idea how near she was to losing me. Oh, how I longed to tell her the way things really were, to have her put her arms around me and comfort me. Hi, Lou. Oh, darling. How was your day? Oh, the usual. Oh, you look so tired. Come on, climb in. I'll drive. Yeah, I could stand that. Yeah. How was your day? Oh, don't mention it. We're not going to get back in the house for at least a week. The kids are griping about the motel. My hairdresser just retired to get married. And the vacuum hose is busted again. Two days of birdie home is enough to drive anyone up the wall and... Oh, did you bring home your check? Hmm? Oh, no, I forgot to pick it up. Why? Oh, it was just a... Well, I had a call from the bank. They said we're overdrawn. Overdrawn? That's Mm. ridiculous. I'll straighten that out with Charlie Northup first thing in the morning. Well, he seemed sort of upset as if... Well, there isn't anything wrong, is there? Wrong? What could be wrong? I don't know. You just... No, you just haven't seen yourself lately. Well, it's a fire and all. Nobody has. I meant even before that. Look, Lou, it's just that I've been working too hard, that's all. it's about time they paid you properly for it. Aren't you due for a raise? Not this year. Look, Lou, I... I don't know why. The very least I hope you expect is a thundering good bonus. We can use it. I don't understand how with all the money you make, we're in debt up to our ears. Funny. I was ready to tell Lou just before she brought up the debts. But, I don't know, that kind of knocked the pins out from under me. I was ashamed to tell her what we were about to face. I felt inadequate, ashamed. I couldn't admit it, that I was a failure. I mean, Luke could have married any one of a dozen guys who'd all become big success stories. Most of them are still our friends. 
I didn't want them to know about me. So now I was no longer just afraid. I was desperate. That's why when I bumped into Ed Portman the next day, even though I knew he'd been avoiding me, I was ready to swallow my pride. Hi, Ed. Well, hey, Walt. Where have you been hiding yourself? Oh, I've been around. I just haven't run into you. Yeah, well, I've been on the road quite a bit. Say, how's it going, fella? Well, uh, I'm still out of a job. Hey, that's tough. Say, I wish I'd run into you sooner. We could have shot the breeze some. But you just caught me on the way to a board meeting. Well, look, maybe that's a good time. Yeah. Maybe you could put me up for a job. Hey, now, we talked about that, remember? Ed, you... You, uh... Once couldn't wait to have me come over with you. You said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah but the, uh, the boat sailed on Look, that. Ed, I'm desperate. Get me anything, Ed. Take me on as a salesman. Oh, now that's for kids fresh out of college. It's expensive training, Walden. And you can't expect a company to lay out like that for a man your age. Ed, I've got to get something. What am I going to do? Oh, well, something will turn up. Hey, look, 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 Ed. Take this card. Try these people. Who, who are they? Uh, just what the doctor ordered for you. A real live wire agency for placing people in executive positions. Where you belong, Walt. If anyone can find you a spot, they can. Oh, well, I, I gotta run, I'll, uh, I'll be seeing you. He waddled away. Even his back expressing relief that he'd gotten away from the leper. I was so mad for a moment that I was looking at him through a red haze. My hands gripped so tightly that the nails dug into my palms. As my hand stopped shaking, I read the card. Executives Unlimited, it said. For the chance of a lifetime. And the last chance may be of mine. I decided to follow it up. I don't know how I got through the next days waiting to hear from the agency. I'd left my dossier with them and they'd promised to be in touch. Then this morning, today, the letter setting the appointment was there. Along with another one from the insurance company. It was a new policy for term life. And the premium was $2,740. It might as well have been $27 million. I had one check left on my severance pay still coming, and the old insurance was still in force until the end of the month. I went by the office to pick up my last check, and on the way out, I stopped in the computer room. I watched it clicking away, impersonally doing my job. It was all I could do not to tear it apart, to smash it, destroy it as it had destroyed me. And feeling a little ridiculous, I headed for my interview. I have read your background, Mr. Hayes. It's very impressive, but I'm afraid we can't help you. Why not? We couldn't hope to find you anything at your price level. Well, uh, I'm willing to take a little less than I was making. That wouldn't help. Well, you don't question my ability. It isn't a matter of that, sir. It's your age. My age? Look, I'm only 48. In today's corporate setup, the fringe benefits make you, I'm afraid, virtually unemployable. What do you mean? Pension, insurance, welfare, major medical. It's just a statistical matter, of course, but for a company to employ you at the cost rates for your age bracket would be ruinously expensive. The rates would be prohibitive. Well, look. Suppose I wanted to waive the fringe benefits. Isn't that possible? In certain special and isolated cases, yes. But not with the companies we deal with, or most companies today. It's hopelessly inefficient for them to make personal deals at the middle level. They look for someone to fit the machine. The machine? Yes, sir. You're telling me that I'm not employable? Not quite, sir. What I say What kind of a world that... is this that's run by machines? No matter what my background or intelligence or ability, you're telling me that because I've reached a certain age, I don't punch up the right holes in a card so I don't fit the machine? That the mistake I make in being a, is being a human being and not a mechanical robot designed to fit the right blueprint and specifications? Isn't there any room in the world for people anymore? I don't remember getting home. I just remember too many drinks while waiting for the regular train and the dull, throbbing knowledge that it was over, really all over. I was going to have to be dead to be worth a damn. I drove home from the station parking lot. Louise opened the door for me. Walter, what's the matter with you? What's the difference? Take your voice down. The difference is there's a living room full of friends waiting for you. 
Darling, don't you remember? It's our anniversary no, party. No. Look, I don't... I, I, I can't see anyone. Walter, you've been drinking. Oh, my darling, what is it? What's changed you? You, you push me aside. You avoid your friends. Darling, what's happened? You, you're not ill, are you? Yes, I'm sick. I'm sick to death, Lou. If you want to know what happened... I can't face any of you because I'm a failure. I lost my job three months ago and I can't get another. And I found out today I never will. The only way I'll be of any use anymore is to be dead. Walter! Walter! Sally! Please! Don't! Don't! Lou's voice was gone, drowned by the roar of the engine. And I was off to that last rendezvous made for me three months ago. The only voice sounding in my ear, the echo of my sentence. Sorry to let you go. Sorry to let you go. I came back to pain. Pain in every bone of my body. And that smell, which only means a hospital. When I opened my eyes, Louise was bending over me. Hello, darling. Hello, Lou. I guess I'm going to live. Oh, yes. Thank God. I even failed at this. Oh, all right. That's enough self-pity. Ah. Self-loathing. It's more like it. Not that I was the one really screwed up this time. I had it in my mind, Lou, but I didn't really try to commit suicide. I know, dear. You know, I've pieced a lot together during the four days the doctors have been putting you back together. Am I back together? Oh, well, it'll take time, but you'll be as good as new. Uh, No way. There wasn't any use before I cracked up. Not going to be any use after. Oh, now, just knock it off. What was the matter with you, anyway? Honey, why didn't you tell me? What was the big secret? Lou, the big secret is it's a machine age. There's no room for people anymore. Oh, come off it. The only thing that counts is people. The right ones. Don't ever sell them short. Lou, I couldn't find a job. Because you didn't ask people. Why, Jack Snow and Hank Jessup both have jobs waiting for you as soon as you're on your feet. If they'd known you were out of work, they'd have grabbed you in a minute. It's not that easy, Lou. Today it's all machines. Oh, that's silly. Nothing but computers. If I were you, I wouldn't sell computers short. Why? What do you mean? But, darling, if it weren't for a computer, we wouldn't be sitting pretty financially till you're back on your feet and ready to go to work. What? Well, that's how they found the guy who drove you off the road and didn't stop. What do you mean, how they found... Uh, there were tire tracks. Smudges of his paint on your car, some chrome ripped off his car, and a piece of the license plate. A very smart police sergeant programmed all the clues and fed them into a computer. The computer put the finger on the hit-and-run driver. Ah, you see? The computer. You can't win. Oh, darling, yes, you can. No matter how complicated it is or how efficient, the machine still has to be run by someone People are the only thing that really count. Walt? Yeah, honey? Uh, Buzz is all ready to cut the grass, but the darn machine won't start. (laughs) Would you mind? (laughs) Of course not, darling. My pleasure. I feel very confident as I kiss my wife. It's the last day of my convalescence, and tomorrow... I go to work. Ironically, I'll be programming systems for a computer. But I'm top dog, you see. Because the machine is only as good as the man that runs it. People are what really count. So next time the electric bill is wrong... Or a credit card company is still irritatingly tacking on that finance charge you don't owe. Don't feel too bad about the computer. It's only as good or bad as the person that runs it. I'll be back shortly.
suddenly, in leaving you, I feel a small twinge of guilt. Perhaps in this conflict of today between man and machine, I'm a little too optimistic. Day by day, the machine becomes more sophisticated. Perhaps someday, we may lose out. It was Satchel Page who said, Never look back. Something might be gaining on you. Our motto might be, Don't look too far into the future. We may find that it has. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Bryna Rayburn, Leon Janney, Arnold Moss, and Joan Shea. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Hmm. Something so mysterious about those men. Oh, yes, mysterious. That's the word. Oh, I'll, I'll never forget their faces. I, I can tell you that. Yes, especially the second man. You know... You know the phrase that comes to my mind? You know what the phrase is? The walking death. Yes. His face was more transparent than white. Like a face of impure wax. Oh, ooh. what a strange feeling has come over me. Like like a chill. Yes, I think a breath of air is what we need now. Oh, yes, yes. I'll, I'll second that. Those two men down there have knocked the stuffing out of me. I... I can't imagine why. What did you call the second man? The, the one who was chasing the first? You mean the way he looked? Uh, yeah, I remember. The walking death. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. A mystery is something of which we know that it is, but we do not know how it is, what it is, or how it came to be. This intrigued Charles Dickens and Charles Collins, his son-in-law, who were fascinated by a true story of a man accused of murder. And they set it down for us to tell you today. Whether it's a tale of the supernatural or the unnatural, I shall leave to you. Black man! That man. Who? The man who has just come into the witness box. You have some objection to our selecting him as one of your jurors? At all hazards, challenge him. But why? Don't ask. Challenge him, I say. My life may depend on it. <laughs> mystery drama, Trial for Murder, was originally written by Charles Dickens and Charles Collins, and adapted especially for Mystery Theater by James Agate, Jr., and stars Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, The Sinus Medicines, and Exlax. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Before we proceed, this is the only mystery story of its kind ever written by that extraordinary author, Charles Dickens. Literary history has it he wrote it with his son-in-law, Charles Collins, for a Christmas magazine over a hundred years ago. It is a tale that has never been explained and that has become a classic of mystery. Let the principal character, a writer called Charles, tell it. Mm -hmm. 
I suppose you might say it all began with that rope, a gift to me from an admirer. It was the rope from which Dick Turpin, the famous highwayman, was hanged until he was dead. I had it in my hand that evening and was turning it over, thinking of the life it had snuffed out, wondering if it would inspire me to begin work on the new novel. I slept badly that night, and when I awoke, I was horrified to find I had knotted the rope tightly in my hands as if I had, during the night, strangled someone. Derek, will you see who's at the door? Oh, where is that man? Derek, there's someone at the front door. Oh, last I'll have to get it myself. Well, good morning, Ah, Charles. Good morning, William. What time is it? It, uh, It's just ten. Well, you don't look too well. Uh, William, I detest to hear how badly I look in the morning, especially from an old friend like you. Oh, well, forgive me. Well, our plan was well taken. Which plan? I have just come from Everton Sons, and they are delighted with our idea for the mystery novel. Especially our working together. They like that short outline? Well, this morning's newspaper made our idea incredibly topical. Have you seen it? You mean our idea of the murder victim having his throat slit by a razor? What? That really happened? Ear to ear. When I showed the headline to Arthur Everett, he was astounded that fact and fiction could come that close. Here, have a look, Charles. Read it. Yes, yes. I will, I will. Hmm. Well, I am pleased that Everett wishes us to begin writing, but if you don't mind... Not today. Oh, perfectly understandable. Uh, Suppose I stop by tomorrow at the same time. Oh, keep the newspaper. You'll be quite amazed at how close our inventiveness and the truth happen to be. I read the news story of the murder twice, three times. The deceased had been discovered in a bedroom, lying halfway between the end of the bed and the bathroom... Like the character in our proposed mystery novel, he had money, an inheritance, didn't work for a living, and lived below. A razor or a very sharp knife had taken his life. Accident while shaving? Suicide? (laughs) Not likely, according to the police, for no weapon had been found. Scotland Yard had been called in, and they said it was... Murder. No doubt whatsoever. Uh, Inspector, I've been asked to lend whatever assistance you need. Oh, yes, they they told me you'd be here. Harker, Metropolitan Police. I found the body. Uh, Harker, I'd like you to make inquiries as to the friends, acquaintances, etc., of the deceased. Does he have a place of work? What tradesmen does he deal with? Does he have a bank account and so forth? Well, it should be done, Inspector. And then report back to me at the yard. I'll... I lay odds, Harker, this is a simple, open and shut case of robbery. What makes you say that, sir? Mm, the experience of years. Either the victim or the murderer knew one another, or they did not. If they knew one another, there could be many motives. Jealousy, imagined wrong, actual wrong, revenge, that kind of thing. It's that area I'm asking you to explore. All right, sir. On the other hand, had they known one another, why would the apartment of the victim be in such disarray? Is it likely that after slitting the throat of the deceased, that the murderer would take the time to ransack the place, knowing that at any moment he might be discovered? Oh, yes, yes. You have a point there, sir. Oh, no. Much more likely is it that the perpetrator was intent upon robbery. His victim entered unexpectedly, the murderer took a razor, killed, and left. And uh, the suicide theory? Mm, The kind of nonsense the press would print. What month is this, Harker? Uh, November. Exactly. The victim was wearing an overcoat. I'd say he'd just returned from outside. One does not shave in an overcoat. One does not entertain friends in an overcoat. So be good enough to get me whatever information you can, Harker, so that we can narrow down one aspect of the case. For my part, there are several clues worth following, and I shall be on the trail of that scent. Uh, Do you feel like working today, Charles? Uh, In a moment, William. Will you come away from that window? William. William, there's something out there. Come come here. Quickly, come to the window. Well, what is it out there? Do do you see those two men on the opposite side of Piccadilly going going from west to east? Where? What two men? William, there. One man just passing the lamppost. Uh, And about 15 feet behind him, another man. Following him, see? Look, the man in front is looking back over his shoulder. He knows he's being followed. But there's such a crowd. I... No, I don't see your two men, Charles. William, the man behind, the second man, has raised his right hand menacingly. Look, 
Oh, yes. Yes, I see him now. The one with the... He's got a very white face, hasn't he? Oh, thank heaven you see him. I thought I was having delusions. Now, do you see the man he's following? Well, I, I, I'll tell you what strikes me peculiar, Charles. Nobody in Piccadilly is paying the slightest attention to those two. It's as if nobody sees them. The man in front crosses in front of the people around them. He, he, he started to run now. Yes, and the, the other one right after it. There they go, around the corner. Hmm. Something so mysterious about those men. Oh, yes, mysterious. That's the word. Oh, I'll, I'll never forget their faces. I, I can tell you that. Yes, especially the second man. You know, you know the phrase that comes to my mind? You know what the phrase is? The walking death. Yes. His face was more transparent than white. Like a face of impure wax. Oh, ooh. what a strange feeling has come over me. Like... Like a chill. Yes, I think a breath of air is what we need now. Oh, yes, yes, I'll, I'll second that. Those two men down there have knocked the stuffing out of me. I, I can't imagine why. What did you call the second man? The, the one who was chasing the first? You mean the way he looked? Uh, yeah, I remember. The walking death. The next day passed smoothly. William and I started our book, each doing half a dozen pages, then exchanging what we had written. Thursday and Friday also went well. The book was gathering momentum. Saturday, William generally spends the morning with his son in Hyde Park. He didn't come to the house until three o'clock. I had slept late and badly. Uh, it, it must be your diet, Charles. You're eating the wrong food. I saw the room where the murder was committed last night, William. You did what? I saw the room. Every detail of which is imprinted indelibly on my mind. You mean the murder case of the man whose throat was cut with a razor? Yes, yes. The bed, the chest of drawers, the door to the bathroom, the carpet, all very, very clearly. I can even tell you the colors. You mean you dreamt all this? Yes. Oh, look, look, old man. There's been a fair bit of reporting in the newspaper. William, that since that first day when you showed me the headlines, I've purposely not read one word about the case. But... But our novel, you, now you can't discard that. It takes off from the same premise, almost the same victim. Your subconscious took over, so you dreamt. I, I can't explain it. it. It was more than a dream. The colors of everything were so vivid. Well, was the body of the victim lying there? Oh, thank heavens, no. The room was empty, but oh, there was blood, red blood. And uh, you, you're sure... It was that bedroom. As if I'd been actually transported to the spot. Oh, well, well, you are in a state. No, I, uh, I, I don't think we'll get much writing done this afternoon. You're not going to leave, are you? Oh, no, 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 of course not. I, I don't like to see you so disturbed. Oh, I almost forgot. I uh, received a summons last night to serve in a jury at a forthcoming session of the Central Criminal Court. Oh, have you done jury duty before? Uh, no, no, I haven't. I suppose I could get off because uh, I, I don't like the idea of interrupting our work now that we've gotten off to such a good start. Well, on the other hand, Charles, to, to be right on the spot during some trial or other might be a, a very good way to get first-hand impression. First-hand of, of, of what? Oh, of how the wheels of justice grind away. At... <sighs> oh... What's this? What's what? Well, don't you open your letters, old chap? Oh, well, frankly, I was so disturbed that when my man brought up my lunch tray, I didn't touch the food and, and I didn't look at them. I... Well, this envelope has a, a familiar look to it. What? Here, I'll open it. That's right. Uh, well, this, this is incredible. It's also a request to appear for jury duty at the Central Criminal Court. Talk about coincidence. But you and I live two miles apart at quite different addresses. Yet, within days, both of us receive a summons for jury duty. Yes, I, I know, but... Wait, I... I haven't finished. The very time you and I are starting on a crime novel which ends in a trial at a criminal court. Well, uh, now, I'd call that a coincidence. Well, according to the poet Schiller, there is no such thing. It's all preordained. He says what seems to us the merest accident springs from the deepest source of destiny. Well, uh, if... Ex Accepting this demand to serve on a jury is going to make you unhappy. You're right. Don't do it. But I'd like to be there purely as a matter of research. That's out of the question, William. No, not now. You may go, of course. Charles, you seem to fear something, and I don't know what it is. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's not fear. Oh, it's 
just an accident of faith we're both called to serve at the same time. Why make so much of it? Well, call it a presentiment. A feeling I have. <gasps> Good Lord. Good Lord, William. Look. Look behind you. We were in my study. The door to my bedroom opened and a man looked in. Very earnestly and mysteriously, he beckoned to me. I recognized the man immediately. He was the second man of the two we had seen from my window, walking along Piccadilly. The man with the upraised arm. The man with the face of wax. What is it, Charles? Oh, your bedroom door is closing. <laughs> that's, that's all I see. It's a, probably a draft catcher. Stay here, William. I'm going in there. We'll see. Well? Uh, I, I, I thought, William, I... I thought I saw him. No, no. It, it's true. I, I I did see him. Steady now. Don't you believe me? Charles, I... Oh, no. Oh, I know exactly what you saw. It was... It was that dead man. The murdered man. Why did he come here? Why? <laughs> In the language of the supernatural, a word meaning not against nature, but above it, unexplainable happenings are conveyed to the rest of us by people called mediums. They have the ability to stand between two worlds, our world as we know it, and the world of the unknown. So it is entirely possible that our two writers, Charles and William, by the very sensitivity of their talent, are both mediums. What they see and how they will deal with it, we shall learn in greater detail when I return with Act Two. A word about Charles Dickens before we continue. It's a mistake to think of him only as the benign reporter of the social evils of his England. Not only ghosts of Christmas Eve came from his pen, but time and again, he'll bring us a haunted man. A man of guilty conscience. A man battling evil. A man under a curse. Now, our tale moves forward, and so do the investigators at Scotland Yard. We have our man. And as I told you, Harker, robbery was the motive. One doesn't approach ransacked rooms, drawers open, contents thrown about, and expect it to be anything else. Uh, what is the main evidence, Inspector? What do you suppose? Various articles of the victims which he had acquired? Matter of fact, no. One article only which he claims to have found in the hall. The murder weapon. Oh. The knife? The razor? The razor. Found it in the perpetrator's bathroom. He claims, of course, it's his own. Well, it's been tested. No or... traces of either blood or fingerprints. Everything washed clean, but but two facts make his guilt certain. One, he had two razors, one with a metal handle, and the other, which he claimed also was his, with an ivory handle. However, it happens the razor with the ivory handle matches exactly other shaving implements in the victim's bath. Ivory shaving mug, brush, and comb. <laughs> we have him all right. Uh, you said two facts, Inspector. But the man we have arrested lived upstairs. In the same house? In the same house. Well, you'll, you'll forgive me for saying so, Inspector, but I don't think I, I'd call this quite an open and shut case. Well, perhaps so, Harker. It may still be somewhat open, but we shall see what develops at the trial to shut it. The morning I was due to make an appearance at the Central Criminal Court, I awoke with a sensation of ominous dread. I was still uncertain whether I would volunteer myself for the jury or not. I couldn't get the incredible picture of the man in my bedroom beckoning me out of my mind. What did it mean? As I got out of bed, I reached underneath, and there, curled about my slippers, was the hanging rope. The rope that had put an end to the life of Dick Turpin, the highwayman. I pulled back my hand as if it had been a rattlesnake. Now, <coughs> hello, Charles. 
<laughs> you decided to meet me here outside of Old Bailey after all. Oh, this fog is miserable, isn't it? <coughs> yes, 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 it really is. Now, won't you tell me what prompted you to accept the invitation to sit in the jury? The reason? <coughs> the reason, I'll tell you why I'm here. We're writing a crime novel about a murder which has recently happened in real life. So a few days in court can only help. Good. What I've been saying all along. Ah. <coughs> <coughs> Ah, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> there goes the signal for us to enter. <laughs> this London fog is too horrible. Gentlemen, you are here for jury selection? Uh, yes, we are. Right, follow me. Uh, glad to. Yes. Pretty bad out there this morning, isn't it? Yes, can hardly see your hand in front of your face. Ah, it's better. <laughs> At least the fog cannot follow us into the law courts. <laughs> Well, uh, what do we do now? Uh, will you gentlemen kindly be seated upon the bench against the wall? When your name is called, you'll step forward and be assigned to one of today's trials. We don't seem to be the only ones called for these sessions. I wonder what cases are being heard. I brought along a notebook to jot down my impressions firsthand. And I must say, one would have hoped that English jurisprudence could be carried out in a, a cleaner, healthier atmosphere. Well, silence, please. I will ask all prospective jurors to refrain from talking. Uh, you, sir, the gentleman with the notebook, no writing, no reading, I beg you. Your complete silent attention while awaiting the pleasure of the court. An hour passed. William and I and the other gentlemen called for jury duty sat like mute tailor's dummies on the bench. William was called, given a direction, and he disappeared down a hallway. Presently, I was assigned a courtroom. And when I entered, imagine my great surprise to find myself called to the very case that had haunted my dreams and my waking hours. The man murdered with a razor. Charles, you here too? Yes, I pray I shan't be selected for this jury. But why not? For our book, this very case would be invaluable. I have a terrible premonition about it, that's all. Look... Look, they've put a man to the bar. Yes, I know, the murderer. Well, do, well how do you know? I recognize him. But don't you? Good Lord, I do. It's the first man we saw going down Piccadilly, followed by the other with the waxen face. Is this man the murderer? The accused will please stand before the bar, and as each juror is called, his attorney will signal yea or nay, approval or disapproval of that juror, until the selection of the 12 jurors has been accomplished. Bailiff, you may begin to call the names. William was called and accepted. When my name was given, I stepped into the box. The prisoner, who had been looking at each prospective juror with no sign of concern, suddenly became violently agitated and signaled his attorney. That man! That man! Who? That man, Charles, somebody who's just come into the witness box. You have some objection to our selecting him? At all hazards, challenge him. But why? Don't ask, don't ask. Well, do you know him? Challenge him, I say. My life may depend on it. Nonsense. I've investigated his background. He's exactly the kind of man who will listen with understanding to our defense. No, no, I say no. But if you wish me to conduct your defense, you must be guided by my opinion. This man is a writer, broad-minded, imaginative. And in my opinion, the most sympathetic juror from your point of view. The prisoner will stand before the bar. The accused has been charged with murder by willfully and maliciously giving the deceased with a razor knife one mortal wound on the throat on the 4th of November, of which wound he instantly died. I was in court the day the charge was read. For not only was I selected for that jury, but I was chosen foreman. William, as it happened, was seated beside me. On the second morning of the trial, after evidence had been taken for two hours, I turned to him. You must what is not it, be swayed by... I've been counting the members of the jury. Yes, yes, I saw it several times, slowly and evidence? carefully. You should so Charles, the charge whatever is like. the matter with you? One too many, that's what's the matter. I make it one too many. I counted 13. No, oh, Charles, I, I don't know what to make of you. Will you oblige me, please, William, by counting us? And doubt to cast upon veracity and conclusions. Yes, why, we are 13. No, 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 it's not possible. 
No, at 12. Yes, so are you sure? But I'm quite sure. Strong and evident. Strange. When first you look Not about, it does seem like 13 jurors. Yet, when I count off one by one, I can only find 12. As in all murder trials, the jury was sequestered. We were housed at the London Tavern and ate and slept in one large room under the eye of an officer of the law. His name was Mr. Harker. His bed was drawn against the door. And on the second night, after the lights had been put out, seeing he was still awake and sitting on the edge of his bed, I went to him. Uh, not sleepy, eh, sir? Well, it's my first experience at a murder trial, Mr. Harker. I, I am a bit unnerved. Uh, I've worked on many a murder and attended many a trial. And I can tell you this, sir. You never get used to it. Yes. Well, one of our jurors happens to be a friend of mine, a fellow writer, so I, I don't feel quite so alone and strange. Really? Well, that is a coincidence. <laughs> yes, isn't it? He's, he's taking us more in his stride than I am. Uh, For him, this trial is merely basic research. Well, if you don't mind my saying so, if we keep talking, we may disturb the other gentlemen of the jury who wish to sleep. Lord in heaven. What is it, Mr. Harker? You're shaking. <laughs> Uh, over there, by the window. Who is that? Oh, oh yes. Oh, why do you say yes? Do you see someone? No, there, there, there's no one there now. Oh, uh, just, I, I, I thought for a moment we had a 13th juryman without a bed. <laughs> uh, but I see now, it's, it, it, it's the moonlight. William. Mm -hmm. What? Oh, Charles, haven't you gone to bed yet? Let me talk to you for a moment. <clears throat> All right. William, Mr. Harker saw our old friend. Not yes. yes, the second man going down Piccadilly. The man who appeared in my flat. Harker saw him here. Just now, a few minutes ago. Well, what does it mean? It means the ghost of the murdered man will not let us alone. He's here. Well... Yes, I, I certainly shan't be able to go to sleep now. Well, the rest of the jurors are managing quite well. The ten of them are fast asleep. Well, William, do you see him? Uh, yes. Oh, yes, I see him. Oh, or it. I, I prefer to, to think of it as an it. Look at it. Standing over there beside the pillow of that jury. But, and now it's moving to the next bed. And just standing there, staring down. I'm certainly glad I'm not alone seeing that apparition. Every juror. It's stopping by the bed of every single juror. Yes, but, but not Harker's. Or mine or yours. Look. It's gone. It's disappeared. Did you see where it went? Well, as though up some invisible stairs. Right out of that high window where the moonlight's coming in. If, if it is the spirit of the murdered man, Charles, what in heaven's name is it trying to tell us? next morning at breakfast, it seems that every single one of the jurors, except Harker, William, and myself, had dreamed of the murdered man. On the fifth day of the trial, as the case for the prosecution was drawing to a close, there came a new development. A miniature portrait of the murdered man had been found on the person of the prisoner when he was arrested. It was put into evidence. Since the miniature purporting to be that of the deceased has been placed into evidence. Found it in his pocket. Identified pockets. by the housekeeper in What do you say to that, Charles? Pretty conclusive, I would say. Hand it up here to the bed. Good Lord, will you? Look over there. That figure walking forward from the back of the courtroom. Our murdered spirit. Yes, but no, no one sees it. Not a soul but us. Look. It's taken the miniature right out of the hands of the bailiff. The dead man is walking over here towards you, Charles. Good foreman of the jury, take this locket, this miniature of myself, and examine it well. I was younger then, and my face was not so drained of blood as you see me now. Unquestionably, only a Charles Dickens could have conjured up such a diabolic end to Act Two. 
a flame spirit possessing the minds of our two jurors. The accusing presence of the murdered man haunting the foreman of the jury. For what reason? To unbalance his mind or to balance his judgment? Very shortly, I shall return with answers to these extraordinary mystery in Act Three. Two well-known authors commissioned to write a murder mystery have an actual vision of the murderer and his victim. The victim pursuing the murderer down a wide London street. Almost before the writers have begun their work, they are called as jurors to a case strikingly similar to their planned book. The spirit of the victim will not leave them alone. Appears every day in court and every night when they go to bed. The murder trial affected William and me quite differently. Surreptitiously, he spent a good part of every evening making notes about what we had seen and heard, completely objectively, as though he were only an observer, not a participant. I couldn't take this murder case so casually. When I did not see the apparition at night, my dreams would be filled with knives, razors, and often as not that rope that had been given me, that hanging rope. Then came the seventh day of the trial, and before us stood the attorney for the defense. Much has been made by the prosecution of an ivory-handled razor in the possession of the defendant. And yet, not one shred of evidence has been offered to prove it was that instrument that inflicted the fatal wound. Our contention is that the wound was self-inflicted. The deceased, not yet dead, had a change of heart, crawled to the open window, tried to call for help, gave signal by tossing the blade out the window, and then, suffering much loss of blood, expired. Expired, we say, by his own hand. Anyone could have picked up the blade in the street, and no one has yet come forth with it. I pass this photograph of the deceased among the jurors for their study, asking you to notice the angle of the wound straight across. It's the same man. I can hardly look at this photograph. And it's here. The apparition has just walked over to where the defense attorney is standing. Yes, I see it. William, can you turn your head without too many noticing? Can you see? Do, do, do any of the other jurors see it standing there? Uh, none that I can tell. All right, here, William. Pass this photograph along. Oh, I really don't feel well at all. What's the ghost of the deceased doing now? It is standing right at the defense attorney's elbow. And now it's moving its right hand across the windpipe. Now it's moving its left hand in a kind of sawing motion. What do you suppose it means? Oh, I think it is demonstrating how virtually impossible it is to have killed oneself that way, producing a straight cut across the throat. Hmm. The pity of it is that you and I are the only ones who can see this demonstration. Uh, no, not at all. I have no doubt that the victim is transmitting at this moment actual thoughts or ideas to the jurors as they study the photograph. What we can see, I'm sure they can sense. The following day, the apparition began to make its presence known more strongly. Whenever it stood beside those giving evidence, suddenly they would falter. One of them, a street sweeper who said it was possible he had cleaned the street in front of the victim's house and tossed a knife into the refuse, that witness stopped and cried out he had had the most extraordinary cold chill. In the afternoon, the attorney for the defense continued to make his case for suicide. As his lordship admonished us all at the beginning of the trial, the chain of circumstantial evidence is as weak as its weakest link. The locket with the miniature found in the defendant's possession does not mean he was a robber or murderer. He tells us he found it on the stairs and did not know to whom it belonged. The defendant owns two razors, one metal-handled, one ivory-handled, 
does that make him a murderer? William, look. The apparition has just put a hand on the defense attorney's shoulder. Uh, are they, or, or, or that a murder was, was committed? However, <laughs> excuse me, my lord, but the heat in the courtroom is a little oppressive. You, uh, you may pause, counsel, for a moment. The uh, intense fog outside, the crowd of spectators in the court, it, it does produce. Yes, I, 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 I should be all right. We just quite moment. understand, yes. Yes, proceed when you feel the cover. <clears throat> oh, dear, I, I seem to have mislaid my, my handkerchief. The specter is handing the attorney the handkerchief. Ah, here it is. <clears throat> yes, but I, I do regret the interruption. Now, where was I? Ah, oh, yes. If anyone in London, any gentleman of any means might own more than one razor, surely it did. Oh, dear. My lord, if you will forgive me for a moment, I, I should like to be seated and compose myself. There will be a recess of ten minutes. Court adjourned. This occurred twice again, later in the day, when witnesses for the character of the defendant were called into the box. Each suddenly stammered, contradicted himself, and finally had to be excused. It was the doing of the apparition. The night of the ninth day of the trial, we were again locked up in the one large room of the London Tavern. It has been entirely worthwhile, Charles. I've been able to make a note of practically every word spoken in court, as well as what's been said privately among the jurors. It'll give us a great advantage when we get back to writing our book. I don't know, William. I'm very tempted when this trial is over to tell the publishers that I cannot deliver the book. What? Tell Everett and Sons it's all off? <laughs> They've already sent us the advance. So we'll send it back. We can write a different book, just... just not this one. Charles, I won't let you even consider that. Oh, you take this apparition much too seriously. You don't think it's in incredible and, and bizarre? Well, I've, uh, I've taken quite a liking to the old thing, hovering about the court every day. Oh. <laughs> so I must say, if it were suddenly to disappear, then I think I should miss it. How can you joke about this? It, it's, it's beyond me. Ah, there is our friend. Well, it hardly ever comes over to us anymore. Look, there, across the room. Bending over those four jurymen talking amongst themselves. Yes, of course. It makes absolute sense. Uh, well, why do you say that? But those four. William, haven't you noticed those four are inclined to acquit the accused? I've heard them argue about insufficient evidence. It, it's motioning for you, Charles. I believe it wants you to go over and join those four men. Excuse me, William. Well, I say, you're not going, are you? I must. Don't you see? I must do as it asks me. The ghost of the murdered man wanted me to argue with the four jurors, to make them see the light of the evidence, to convince them that acquittal was wrong. I cannot explain why I felt compelled to do this, but as soon as I would join my brother jurymen, the apparition would disappear. Silence in the court. His lordship, the Lord Chief Justice with the Crown, is about to make his charge to the jury. <coughs> Gentlemen of the jury... The last two stages of this case have now arrived. The stage of my discharging my duty, directing you on the facts and on the law. And yours to consider what your verdict should be when you retire to consider the case. But uh, before I do, there are one or two observations I wish to make. When a jury is summoned to try a case for murder, he, he, uh, he, uh, he, uh, uh, as I was saying... Is it there? Ah, yes, yes. He's standing right behind the judge, looking over his shoulder, helping him turn the pages of his notes. It is uh, always an anxious time. As anxious for the judge as it is for the jury. Whether it be a case of murder, whether it be a case of petty theft, your your duty is the, is the same. It's all becoming too horrible to watch, William. I, I cannot bear it. That supernatural creature is making a mockery of this trial. It infects everything, everyone. <coughs> Excuse me, gentlemen. For a few moments, I... I am somewhat oppressed by the closeness of the courtroom. Charles! Where are you going? Let me be. Let me alone. Is there uh, some disturbance in the jury box? Come back here, Charles! It does no good to run off. It's, it's so hard to go on. 
poor, poor man. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's the matter, sir? I believe the form of the jury has also been affected by the closeness of the atmosphere. Uh, uh, Charles, do sit down at your place, I beg of you. Are you all right now, sir? Yes, yes, I... I suppose so. All right, William, I shall remain and see this to the end. I must now. Now, so what was the trouble? Uh, the foreman, your lordship. But he's recovered. All right. To continue, you sometimes hear the phrase, malice of forethought. It does not mean premeditated murder. All it means is, was it intentional? The law is clear. If a person takes a deadly weapon to injure anybody else, then he is responsible for murder. For more than an hour, the judge charged us. I didn't feel well at all. The monotony of those ten days, the same judge, the accused in the dock, the choking fog outside the windows. It seemed as though I'd been foreman forever. And the spirit of the murdered man everywhere. Gentlemen of the jury... I shall leave you now and lock this door behind me. Should you have any questions which prevent you from reaching a verdict, will the foreman please come to the door and I shall open it. Uh, yes, Mr. Hucker, there may be some points we need clarified. Uh, I hope not many. But take all the time you need. Thank you. Gentlemen, I shall pass among you slips of paper. I wish each of you to write your personal verdict upon it and then we shall count the result and decide how to proceed from there. <clears throat> I ask that the court will please come to order. Gentlemen, have you agreed upon your verdict? We have, my lord. And do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty of willful murder? Lord, we find the prisoner guilty of willful murder. Is that the verdict of you all? It is, my lord. Prisoner at the bar? You stand convicted of the crime of willful murder. Have you anything to say why the court should not give you judgment of death according to the law? Well, I, uh, I, your, your lordship, uh, Do you wish to say anything? Well, I knew I was a doomed man when the foreman of the jury came into the box. The foreman? How so? My lord, I knew he would never let me off. I knew from the first day of the trial. Uh, uh, go on, go on, you may speak. Uh, well, the night before I was arrested, as I lay in my bed in my rooms, somehow the foreman appeared to me in my bedside in the night and put a rope around my neck. I could make nothing more of what the prisoner said then than I can now. I do know, at the moment we entered the courtroom, the nightmare presence of the murdered man stood beside the accused. As soon as I gave the verdict of guilty, it disappeared. And I have never seen it since. There it is. Charles Dickens and Charles Collins' strange tale of a trial for murder. The famous rope from which the highwayman Dick Turpin swung to his death, no longer exists. It is missing from the collection of infamous instruments of death at New Scotland Yard. But for a time, it played an extraordinary part in an extraordinary story of how a dead man avenged his own death. I shall return shortly. writer in the English language has left us a more complete record of 19th century life than Charles Dickens. But his genius lies in an ability to weave fantasy and fact, reality and artifice, into a combination that rings true, that is completely believable. Pick up any one of his countless stories or his 15 novels and you will be transported into a world that lives and breathes as does your world today. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Earl Hammond, Court Benson, and Robert Maxwell. Radio Mystery Theater presents... Welcome. 
I'm E.G. Marshall. I'm sure you know by now that the door you have just entered leads to a strange world, a land of forbidden fancies, peopled by giants and pygmies, kings and cobblers, saints and sinners. Happy children play in its streets while just behind lurk iniquitous monsters. Unspeakable crimes are committed here and acts of breathtaking valor. You are the sovereign in this place. It is the realm of your own imagination. Our story this time searches one of its deep recesses, the hidden place of fear. Well, let's have a look at the one I bring you now and see if it fits the definition. Oh, how nice. A lovely orchid in a lovely box. I wonder if it could be from Jacques. Let's see. Oh, here's a pin, but no card. Perhaps I spoke too soon. Air of Vatva. 22 caliber. Recently fired. Now, there's a strange birthday present. Our mystery drama... The House by the Seine was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Marion Seldes. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Exlax. I'll be back shortly with Act One. There is a house in Paris beside the Seine which might have been designed by Palladio. Perhaps it was, for all I know. Who was Palladio? Perhaps the greatest architect of all time. And who lives in this house? Well, if you ask the cognoscenti and the cosmopolitan across the world, kings and lovers, the famous and the infamous, they would tell you the world's most desirable woman, the incomparable and unique Marianne Duvier. Friend and lover to half the world. Actress and singer. Mistress and mother. The toast of Paris. Excusez-moi, monsieur le gendarme. Uh, bonsoir, les children. Eleven o'clock, eh? You are on the streets late, riding your bicycle. You will observe, I work. I have this box of flowers to deliver to. La maison d'abord de la Seine. Rue des Anges. Mademoiselle. Ah, the house beside the Seine. You do not need to tell me the street. All Paris knows where that is. I do not know. Should I? Oh, but of course. Because Mammy lives there. Your sweetheart? How should I know her? Oh, you're younger than I thought. Everybody, of course, knows Mammy. She is the sweetheart of Paris, of France, of the world. Why? Because she is the best actress in France, the best singer in Europe, the most beautiful woman of all ages. <laughs> so, once again I say it. Her given name may be Marianne Duvier, but every man dreams of her only as Mammy. She is not my sweetheart. <laughs> she is the sweetheart of all the world. Is this the residence of Mademoiselle Marianne Duvier? Yes. Voila, for Mami. And the person who hired me to bring this said to wish her happy birthday. Uh, what is the person's name? Oh, he did not tell me. Uh, perhaps there is a card. Perhaps. All right, you can run along. What are you waiting for? A tip? No, I... Uh, well, come on, what? All these automobiles that are parked outside... Mercedes, Daimler, Rolls Royce, even American Cadillacs. So many important people. Next to Bastille Day, nothing is more important than Mademoiselle's birthday. And some even put Bastille Day second. Is she? Could I? Could I see her? Uh, Mommy? Oh, not tonight. Mommy is just returned from the theater and is dressing. For her party? Shh, shh, shh. That is a surprise. She does not know about it. Allez-vous-en, petit. I thought 
thought that was more just. Who was it, Etienne? A boy on a bicycle uh, delivering these. <laughs> more flowers. <laughs> there is not only flowers in this box. What else? Feel too heavy. What do you think? A bomb? Oh, don't be silly. Not heavy enough. No. It does not tick. No. And who would send Mammy a bomb? She has no enemies. Except women. Women don't traffic in bombs. Poisons, yes. Bombs, no. The wisdom of the ages stated succinctly. But then who knows more than a butler? A French maid, <laughs> ma <Marcelline. laughs> No time for that now. What do you suppose is in this box besides flowers? Could be anything. I shall leave it here for her on the table. I don't know if I like that look. Is she nearly ready? Just putting on her perfume when I came down. Then I'd better warn the guests. Go. I'll see if there's enough champagne on ice. Annette, the wine is my province. Everything is checked. I'm sorry. Etienne. Uh, Mami. Mami. What is all this whispering going on with you two? Uh -uh. Something special about tonight. Some secret? I have no secrets but my kitchen. I will go see about supper. I am sure I am needed there. Etienne, you have a strange look about you. Something to say to me, perhaps? Just that Mademoiselle has never looked lovelier. Thank you. That's a pretty compliment. But older, don't you think? Uh Uh-uh. The rest of the world grows older, mademoiselle. You grow only younger. You are nicely said, but it can't change the facts. Today especially I have grown older. And shall I tell you why? You have only to speak and I listen. Always the perfect answer. Well, today is my birthday, Etienne, and I'm all dressed up. But nobody has asked me to the ball. Apparently I shall have to spend it alone, (laughs) since no one seems to know about it. I wished you happy birthday this morning. So you did. Oh, what is this on the table? A box uh, with some flowers which just came for you. Happy birthday, Mammy. I hope these will ensure your future. <laughs> Someone else to remember not to forget. Oh, will you get the car, please, so I can begin to enjoy my evening as planned? I shall be happy to make sure that Mademoiselle enjoys the evening as planned. Oh, how nice a lovely orchid. I wonder if it could be from Jacques. Let's see. Oh, a pin but no card. Perhaps I spoke too soon. A revolver. Twenty-two caliber. And recently fired. Now there's a strange birthday present. Why would anyone be... Excuse me, Ambassador, for just one moment. I shall be right back. Annette. Yes, Mademoiselle. Where is Etienne? In the wine cellar. Shall I get No, him? I don't want to leave my guests too long. But I am concerned about Monsieur Jacques Baron. He must be waiting for me at Maxime's and... <laughs> oh, no. He knows all about this party. He and Etienne were the ones who planned it. <laughs> but he's not here yet. That's so strange. What could be keeping him? Mademoiselle, fils a draft? Yes, but... Not a real one, just a, <laughs> a cold shudder as if a ghost walked by. I'm worried about Jacques. Why should you worry? He had another appointment to keep before. I want you to go and get it here for me, right away. Uh, oui, mademoiselle. Shall I answer the front door? No, I'll get that myself. Bring it here back. Oui, mademoiselle. Je veux de ma pardon. Est-ce que c'est la maison de... Oh, but I see it is... Hello, Minette. Minette? Nobody knows that name, but... Oh, Armand! Armand Claudette! <laughs> My real oh. name. And oh. now, after all these years, I know yours. Marianne Duvier. Oh, that everybody, my friends, call me Mammy. Come in, come in. Oh, thank you. What brings you to my house? Out of the past. Tonight. Well, I have been away, out of the country for many, many years. I am just returned to Paris, and tonight I go to the theater to see the fabulous actress Marianne Duvier. And what do I find out? 
She is my little compagnon de la guerre from the underground, whose real name I never knew. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried to come backstage, but they would not let me, so I followed you home. But why didn't you come in sooner? Oh, at first I thought, uh, no, she will be tired. I must not trouble her tonight. So I am about to leave when suddenly... All the windows light up, and I can hear this big party. <laughs> so I think, well, if it is that big, what can one more matter? So I gather heart and ring the bell. Oh, I'm so <laughs> glad you did. Where have you been all this year, sister? Terrible night. We thought you must be dead. Uh, well, uh, I might as well have been. First the Germans, then the Russians. Prison camp? Oh, nearly 20 years of them. Then ten years in America to bring back my strength. Oh, but this is not a night for that. What is the celebration? My birthday. Oh! oh but I must get back to my guests. They're waiting for me to blow out the candles on my cake. How many candles? Oh, 21. <laughs> I must be sure to blow them all out. <laughs> to have your wish. Oh, oh, Armand. If I had my wish, it would really be oh. 21. <laughs> In the heart of everyone who knows you, I am sure that is what you remain. You do in mine. Oh, dear Armand. Oh, good, you're back again. Just at the right moment. I have a feeling, a, a strange feeling. Why? I, I, I don't know, but there are too many... Ghosts dancing tonight and old memories that whisper to me of death. <gasps> Come on, Armand. Take me back to my party. I do not want to look back. Something from the grave is yapping at my heels. Excuse me, mademoiselle. What? Oh, Etienne, yes. I have sent for you because I'm worried about Monsieur Baron. Have you heard from him? No, mademoiselle. Well, I asked Annette to send you to me. But I don't know why. I, I have a strange presentiment. Oh, well, never mind. Etienne, you'd better go about your duties. Uh, pardon, mademoiselle, but I do have a message for you. From Jacques? No, mademoiselle. From an inspector of police. Where? Here? Yes, and he insists on seeing you. I tried to it's explain right, that... Etienne. I have been half expecting something like this, I suppose. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Inspector Thierry, Paris Police. Uh, Inspector, I'm having a birthday party. I don't suppose this could wait. I am afraid not. I am not here on pleasure. I uh, do not have to ask you if you are Marianne Dubier, except as a formality. I am she. And you are starring in the play The Changing Heart at the Theatre Elysee. I am. And the name of your leading man is Jacques Baron. Yes? You will prepare yourself for a shock, Manzer. Monsieur Baron is dead. Shot? How did you know? I didn't, I guessed. Am I right? Yes. He was found half an hour ago in your dressing room with a bullet through his head. I must warn you that anything you say from now on can be held in evidence against you. <laughs> Marianne Duvier, named fondly by an adoring public and all the men in her life, Mamie, sweetheart. But apparently, she is that to all men, save only one. Is the gun that nestled under the special flowers that were sent to her a murder weapon? I shall return shortly with Act Two. In the distance, muffled and forgotten now in the face of the news Inspector Tiro has brought, the celebration of Mami's birthday party continues. But the news of her leading man's death doesn't seem to have been a total surprise to Marianne Duvier. As indeed, neither did her surprising birthday present, the gun whose cordite fumes were stronger than the perfume of the orchid underneath which it nestled. May I ask, when you saw him last... Yes, Inspector. He came to my dressing room after the show. And then he left? Alive? No, as a matter of fact, he was still there when I left. 
alive. Wasn't it strange for you to leave him in your dressing room? Not under the circumstances. He had been going to see me home so I could change, and then we planned to go to Maxime's. Even though you had a birthday party waiting for you? Uh, no, that was a surprise. I didn't know about it. I see. And why didn't he see you home? He had a message which held him up. It meant he had to make some phone calls, and there is a phone in my dressing room and not in his. So he stayed to make them. Planning to join you later? Yes. Your name and uh, Monsieur Baron's uh, have been mentioned uh, frequently in the papers as... Uh, uh, well, uh, were you lovers? I don't think I'll answer that question. That, you see, is my business. As long as both of you were alive, but now that he is dead... Uh... You can have your answer. Yes, I love Jacques Baron. And I am not surprised at his death. Perhaps not even shocked. Because he was a man who was very careless of his life. It was a suicide? At the first, one must think so. The gun was fired from very close. So close, the powder marks were clear. The hair was singed. But uh, no, it was not suicide. Why not? Because, mademoiselle, there was no gun. Someone might have removed the gun after. Do you think it was suicide? No. I am afraid I'll have to ask you to accompany me to the police station, Mansara. Am I under arrest? Of course not, uh, for the moment. There are certain formalities. I will try to make them as quick as possible. Very well. But uh, I, too, must face certain formalities. I have a house full of guests who deserve at least my... Mammy, are you all right? Who is it? Amma. Amma Claude. May I enter? Oh, yes. Come in. Forgive me if I am intruding. No, it's quite all right. You could be just the man I need. Are you still a lawyer, Amma? Oh, yes, of course. Oh, close the door, please. This is Inspector Thiro of the Paris police. He is here because Jacques Baron has just been found dead in my dressing room. What? You mean murdered? That seems to be what the inspector would like to take me to headquarters to discuss. Oh, well, I am going with you. It's not that serious, monsieur. Merely preliminary question. Uh, you're not going without a lawyer. Oh, very well, Amor. If you will volunteer. I'll be in my car and follow you to the station. Oh, I uh, forgot. I came looking for you to give you this. Your evening purse. I'll put it on the table. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize there was anything so heavy. No, that's all right. Just give it to me. I think, please, I will take the purse. It is your purse, Mademoiselle Duvier. Uh, yes, but... Uh, Do well, you always carry a gun in it? Hmm, that has been fired recently. And just the right caliber. I am afraid now, Mami, you are under arrest. <laughs> I am sorry we had to detain you, Mademoiselle Dubier. I won't pretend I found your accommodations deluxe, Inspector. Pardon, but uh, there is the evidence. Inspector, look at me. Do you truly believe me guilty? Mademoiselle, when I look at you, I can believe anything you want me to believe. But when I look at the evidence, then I must believe what I don't want to believe. I must tell you, as I have explained to your lawyer... That we kept you here to check fingerprints. Only yours are on the gun. And I must warn you that since you opened in this last play, all Paris has been buzzing about your romance with the man who died. And equally, all Paris knows the man and his reputation. His reputation? Uh, what shall I say? Uh, he was a notorious ladies' man. You must have known or suspected. Are you trying to tell me Jacques was taking advantage of me? No, no, not exactly. Still, if he was looking in another direction, if there had been another woman, well, under the circumstances, it would seem incredible, but... Uh... Don't be ridiculous. I don't try to be. I only say you were in love with him. Yes. I have already said. Am I still under arrest? Technically, yes. Actually, no. 
I am going to release you in the custody of your lawyer, Monsieur Claudet. How you trust me that much? I don't know. I am, do you see, a gambler. I am, how would you say it, uh, playing the odds. This thing is serious, Marianne. No matter what you may think, the police have a strong case. Oh, nonsense, Armand. Once I tell the authorities the truth, I am in no danger. The truth? What truth? What I'm about to tell you. It goes back to those days of the underground. Do you remember your cover name? Oh, could I ever forget? Right now, the fox. I was Minette. The kitten. And the chevalier? You could not forget him. Our leader? Oh, never. His real name was Jacques Bagon. The actor. But we never knew each other's real names. Except for me. One by one, you all insisted on telling me your real names and who you were in real life. <gasps> Mon dear, what a prize I could have been if the Germans had caught me. We should have been ashamed of ourselves to put you in such a position. You of all of us. The one we most wanted to protect. Oh, <laughs> imagine. I never dreamed that the Chevalier could have been an actor. Oh, but lucky for me he was. He started me in the theater. But Jacques was more than uh, what? A patriot. Still, all these past 30 years, he has crisscrossed Europe and behind the Iron Curtain, gathering invaluable information. He was most useful in East Europe. They trusted him, and they thought he was one of theirs. Is that why he died? Well, I only know he has had a list of names which someone had promised to verify as the number one terrorist cell in France. He was carrying a great deal of money, and he had an appointment at 12.20. He uh, didn't say with whom? No. He said it was someone I might know, but that I had carried enough dangerous secrets in the past. Have you any idea what happened to the list you said he had? I think Jacques was murdered for it. Uh, and the list will be gone forever. No, not quite. It isn't gone. I have it. You? Where? With you now? Well, of course not. I have it safely hidden. Why? Because sooner or later, the murderer is going to try to get it from me. Unless... Unless what? Unless I am arrested for murder. Then you could give the names to the police. Oh, but what use would it serve? A list of names with the most important name missing? Who? The contact Jacques never made. The head man. The triple traitor. Ah... Uh... We're almost home to the house on the Seine. Come in with me, Arma. I think I know how, if the mysterious traitor doesn't get to me, just how I might get to him. Mansell. Etienne, what are you doing? Oh. I was concerned about you, Mansell. After all, it is not uh, every day one is arrested. Oh, thank you, Etienne. Fortunately, one is not arrested any longer. <laughs> oh, you too, Anne. Oh, my pauvre petite chère, mademoiselle. I was so worried. No, 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 it is all right. Oh, Etienne, would you please take Monsieur Claudet to the study and bring some whiskey and soda? Mm. And Annette, you must do something besides crying over milk that is not yet spilled. You have only to ask. All right, then. You bring me the Paris telephone directory. Mm. Armand, I will join you in a moment. Is Annette all right now? I hope so. Etienne has taken her to their quarters. Oh, yeah. Poor Annette. I'm her baby, but sometimes I don't realize she loves me that much. Who are you calling? Pierre Marchand. The florist. At this time of night? Oh, he's a friend. Oh, he may not be if you wake him. Hello? Oh, Pierre. C'est ici, mamie. Yes, it is very important or I would not disturb you. Ah, you are sweet. Pierre, did you send me flowers tonight? No. Or did anyone from your shop? Oh, I see. But would you and uh, other stores have records of who bought orchids from you yesterday and where they were delivered? You would. I see. Oh, but not until then. No, no. That would be fine. Or at the theater, since I have a matinee tomorrow. Thank you. No, 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 no. I will send someone over for the list. <laughs> Merci. Mille fois, bientôt. Uh, what was that all about? 
As soon as he gets to his shop tomorrow, he will check with the flower shops in this area who sold orchids, and then he will give me the list. Well, it is liable to be a long one. Friday is a night for orchids. Ah, but you underestimate my knowledge of who buys orchids for who in Paris. I can cut it down to size. Well, perhaps. <laughs> Are you really going to play the show tomorrow? Of course, why not? Well, because of you and Jacques. Uh, I, I thought perhaps... Uh, well, I mean... You were in love, no? Come with me to the edge of the balcony, Armand. No, look. Paris dreams by night. How lovely. How serene. Yes, I was in love with Jacques, but we were not in love with each other. We were a cause. A dream of freedom. Just as you and I were once in love, bound by the same dream. Or have you forgotten? No, I have not forgotten. All these years I have been in love too. But not with a cause. With you, Mummy. I could not speak of it in those days because everything had to wait for tomorrow. And my particular tomorrow never came. Now at last we are together. And this time... This time. This time I don't want to wait for tomorrow. Ah, well, I, I am afraid we still must. Till the riddle of the present and the past is solved. Good night, Armand. Good night, Mummy. Until to... Oh, that's that impossible word again. You won't have to say it again, Armand. It isn't tomorrow. It is already today. I wonder what this one holds for us. I'm a little puzzled. Oh, I don't think Mommy really murdered Jacques Baron. It is obvious that someone is trying to frame her. But who? And then there is always this consideration. If Mommy had been responsible and perhaps hoped the death would look like suicide, maybe someone made sure she wouldn't get away with it. I'll return shortly with Act Three. Have you been thinking about the murder of Jacques Ballon during the intermission? I have. First, let's consider that from the facts, we still don't know it is a murder. It might have been suicide. After all, how much do we really know about Jacques or Armand or Annette and Etienne? The only one about whom we seem to know almost all is Marianne Duguay, called Mami. And she seems to know about everyone. So let's see what she comes up with. Come in. Ah, your performance was wonderful. Did you think so? Oh, ah, good. Matinees are very important for me to be at my best. I must not disappoint my ladies and the audience. Or myself. Oh, I doubt if you ever disappoint either. Where is Jeanette? She was exhausted after last night. I sent her home. Ah. Well, did you get the names from Pierre Marchand, the florist? Of your orchid fanciers? Here. It's a long list. I don't care about the orchid fanciers. I want to know only who might have a fancy for a gun. Valjean, Fromoui, Bréger, Fragonard. Oh, we can cross him off. Why? He's a French senator who buys an orchid every Friday night for a different girl in the Folie Berger. <laughs> oh, he sounds suspicious to me. No, no, he's not above reproach, but certainly above suspicion. <laughs> now, let me see. Here is a Monsieur Deschamps. Deschamps. Friday was the 17th, no? Yes. Mm, then we can count him out. He's my postman. And every year he saves to buy an orchid for his wife on the anniversary. Then... <gasps> um, um, uh, what is it? You see here? Yeah. M. Dupin, 1220 Rue Panine. Troisième arrondissement. Do you notice that address? Well, it is not too chic, but... But a number. Hmm? Of course. There he is, our man. Why? Oh, don't you see, Jacques told me he had an appointment at 12.20. Well, of course, I thought he meant the time. But now, 
I must call the police. Uh, no. Why not? Uh, because uh, I have a better idea. This Dupont. <laughs> he can't be the head man. Why not? Because he would never have been foolish enough to use his real name when he bought the orchid. Oh, no, no, no. He is only an informer. But he can lead us to the real murderer. How? The list. You still have it? Yes. Ah, then we can make a trade. The list for the murderer's name? Why not? Dupont's name is probably on it. Or at least he can put us in touch with Jacques' killer. He has the list enough to kill for it. It's dangerous. No, no. Give me the list. I'll go. No. I want to come too. Do you have a gun? Yes, I have one in the car. I am parked by the stage door. All right, good. Give me time to change. I'll meet you there. Nearly 45 minutes. I thought you'd change your mind. No, only my clothes. But so long. Well, wasn't it worth it? Look at me. <laughs> you are too much. What can I say? Oh, I don't say anything. I have to be back for the evening performance. We've wasted enough time as it is. Let's go. Well, this is it. 12.20, rue Penning. And we are about to meet Monsieur Dupont. Just a moment. You brought the gun? Just in case. Now, uh, shall I knock? Yes, Is there a bell? No. I'll knock again. Very well. There are lights on inside. Yes, but no one home. I wonder... Wait. Let me see. It's open. Let's go in. Let me lead the way. Stay behind me. Hello? Hello? Anybody here? I mean, maybe we shouldn't... Oh, the lights, they went out. What caused that? I don't know. Overloaded wires, perhaps. Better get out of here. These old buildings are fire traps. They're not just plain traps. What does that mean? Oh, why don't you just reach for the switch and turn the lights back on? You know where it is. I know? Certainly. This is your headquarters, isn't it? So, you know. That you are Monsieur Dupont? And the murderer. And Mr. Head Spy? Of course. How long have you known? I've suspected from the beginning. Known when you made your first major slip. What slip? You recognized me from the theater, but not Jacques. Well, of course, he had changed. You hadn't. Ah, but you made a bigger mistake. What? You should have removed your name and address from the list you brought me from Pierre Marchand de Flores. My name? Yes. Your new cover name, Henri Dupont. And this is your headquarters. You knew that before you came? Yes. And now that you are unmasked, do you think we might have some light? Well, yeah, that's better. <laughs> you are an amazing woman. If you knew I was the one who sent you the orchid and the gun, why, why did you let me bring you here? To kill me. What? Oh, isn't that what you planned? Oh, I have no doubt you intend to make it look like a suicide. Actress kills herself in remorse over lover slaying. Something like that? Oh, don't be silly. All I want from you is that other list. The names of the members of your terrorist cell? The names of my fellow patriots. Oh, really? Don't be silly, Amar. You are no patriot. You are not in this for glory, but for the sheer thrill of it and the money. You would sell that list in a moment to the highest bidder. And the moment you got it, you would have killed me. Only you won't. I wouldn't be too sure of that. I am quite sure. You've no intention of making the same mistake as you did with poor Jacques. You didn't bring it with you. That's right, Alma. You are a fool, Mami. Now, I have to kill you. No, Alma. Don't you see that I am on your side? <laughs> Why would I have risked my life by coming here unless it was to prove that? We need each other. We make a wonderful team. Not only as lovers, but in business as well. In business? Of course. Jacques was not in it for my reasons, for excitement, for danger, for money, as you are. That is why we should be good for each other. We are both without morals. We love danger, and we must have money. You, Mummy? Mm -hmm. You have all the money in the world. I am in debt up to my ears. 
Can you imagine what it costs to run the house beside the Seine? Salons, suppers, galas constantly. It is the crossroads of the world. And no matter whether they are kings or commoners, my guests dine on champagne and caviar. I make a fortune as an actress, and I spend several times that fortune to remain who I am. A mummy, ageless, beautiful, unique. Every man's sweetheart, his secret desire, adored by all, possessed by none. <laughs> Don't you understand that I would beg, borrow, steal? Yes, even kill to maintain that position. <laughs> Mon Dieu, mami, you are magnificent. And so are you. You have done what I have never done yet. The ultimate, the most dangerous, the bravest. Oh, Hamad is incredible. <laughs> we grew up together, you and I and Jacques, in a whole different society. The jungle of the resistance. The fundamental law of nature, kill or be killed. Primitive, simple, real. We were brought up on it. We can never get it out of our blood. And you and I, the strong ones, not the weak, blooding ones like Jacques who babbled of patriotism. A sentimentalist and a fool with no place in our world. I applaud you for getting rid of him. <laughs> How did you manage it? Oh, well, it was simple enough. You helped me. I had been following him, and that night I slipped into the theater. When you left him alone in the dressing room, he made a phone call. It was to your house to tell them you were on your way back. I learned about the surprise party then. <laughs> I knew from your conversation that he hadn't revealed me yet. I moved quietly behind him as he talked. And when he hung up and turned, I shot him through the head. I intended to make it look like suicide. Magnificent. Resourceful. Ah, oh, what courage. Well, what changed your mind about the suicide? Well, I needed some hold over you, some lever to get the names. I was on my way to your party to renew old acquaintances, and I had the orchid I had bought with me. I slipped the gun under it, walked out of the theater when I couldn't find the list, and found a boy on a bicycle to deliver my flower. I didn't expect Rock's body to be discovered so fast. The police got to you before I could. But you did kill him in cold blood. <laughs> yes. Yes, I killed him. And you don't mind admitting... Oh, no, not to you. The knowledge won't help you. What? Oh, you have given a magnificent performance. I would expect no less of you. But I cannot take chances. I trust no one. Goodbye, Mami. Ah. Don't move, Monsieur. There are twelve other guns covering you. Drop your gun. George, Michel, hold him safely. Are you all right, Mademoiselle? Quite. Is he... No, no. Just wounded in the arm. You... You did this, Mami. I'm afraid I did. But how? When I had Mademoiselle in jail, she suggested I have a little chat with the Deuxième Bureau. That is our intelligence department. As you may know, they cleared her completely. Then she suggested this little trap for it you. so thoughtful of you and Armand to provide us with this theater for our melodrama. Do you have all you need, Inspector? More than enough. Then perhaps you can give me a police escort to my real theater. I have just time to make the evening curtain. But, but when... When did you have time to set all this up? When you left me to get dressed. You are quite uncomplimentary, Armand. You don't really suppose it takes Mami 45 minutes to make a simple change. Home. Yes, mademoiselle. Let me take your cloak. Thank you, Etienne. Yeah. Just to hang it there. Yes, mademoiselle. Annette has supper for you whenever you are ready. No, I don't think I'll eat tonight, Etienne. <laughs> Three performances in one day, and one of them exhausted me. I'm getting too old, I suppose. I think I will just sit out here on the terrace and look at the moon. <sighs> Mademoiselle is tired. Uh, tired and sad. 
It's been a long day. The play missed Jacques tonight. And so did I. You really were in love with Monsieur Jacques. I am. Mommy, I love all men. As all men love Mansell. How could you ever choose? Perhaps that was the whole trouble. What? It's already a little too late, isn't it? I'm a little too old to be everything to one man anymore. So I shall just have to settle for being... Mommy. A remarkable woman in the classic tradition of the world's great actresses. Cleopatra, Lady Hamilton, Marie Antoinette, Mrs. Siddons, not all of whom performed on the stage, you will note, but all of whom were capable of weaving magic off stage, as Mami has proved in this story. I'll be back shortly. The next time you're in Paris... Take a stroll down by the River Seine. Cross the Pont du Carousel and walk back towards the Pont Royal. You won't find the house by the Seine because, of course, it doesn't exist. But think what a lovely spot it would be to have a house. Looking across to the Tuileries, living today in the past. Of course, Mommy is only a legendary figure. But then, remember, legends have a way of outliving reality. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Hetty Galen, Gil Mack, and William Griffiths. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Well, I am glad Mr. Chapin lost his temper. It creates time. Now, the passport pictures, the police were taken in. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I changed them. Huh. On the Chapin's passport is the picture of Mr. Morris. A Chapin cannot prove who he is. Well, not for a day at least. And then he will be too late. And uh, Mr. Morris? Well, by now, perhaps the diamonds have been sold. By tonight, we get our money. And Morris receives half the value. That is right? Yes. And Morris splits his half with us. Why does Morris receive only half? Who is getting the other half? Oh, that I do not know. Morris has a partner? Oh, no, no. He works alone. I have helped him in the past. Who the more... I am in danger. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Down the labyrinth of time, men have worshipped many gods. Among them, the god of fire. Even today, on a small island off the coast of India, fire worshippers walk unharmed through a river of burning coals to honor their fire god. Another god worshipped by men is greed. The love of money, called in the Bible the root of all evil, has tempted men to lie, cheat, steal, kill. In other words, they too walk 
through a kind of fire. And some are hideously burned. Christy, my love, call me King Midas. Because anything I touch turns to gold. You'll be embroidered with diamonds, bedizened with emeralds, garnished with pearls. You'll be festooned with bracelets, anklets, necklaces, rings, earrings, even a nose ring of rubies. If your little heart desires. <laughs> mystery drama, Trial by Fire, was especially written for the Mystery Theater by Nancy Moore and stars Norman Rose and Michael Tolan. It is sponsored in part by x lax and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Webster's Dictionary defines greed as the excessive desire for more possessions than one needs or deserves. Mr. Webster understates the case. Greed is an insatiable appetite for more and more worldly goods. Too much is never enough. A man so afflicted mortgages his morals and barters his soul. Such a man was Brad Stewart. Last year in New York City, no, let a friend of Brad's tell this story. Tom Hendricks lived it. Thankfully, I didn't. Why are the rascals of this world so often such charmers? The answer, of course, is that charm is an absolutely essential characteristic of a con artist. Brad Stewart was so charming, and his girl Christine so blind. Christy was a sweet little thing, gentle and trusting. I never could figure why anyone as nice would attract someone as devious as Brad. Or why she... Well, what naive young girl wouldn't fall for all that charm? How could she resist a man, a handsome, charming man, remember, who courted her with such poetic extravagances? Rings on your fingers, Christy. Bells on your toes. That's not a patch on what you'll wear when my ship comes in. Sweetheart, when that happens, and it will... I'll garland you with diamonds and spangle you with pearls. <laughs> I don't need all those things, darling. I do. You'll be embroidered with amethysts, garnished with sapphires. Oh, yes, you'll be festooned with bracelets, necklaces, rings, earrings, even a nose ring of rubies, if your little heart desires. <laughs> and my girl will make music wherever she goes. A wild talent with words. Another requisite of a con man. Was Christie to take that rhapsodic nonsense seriously? Catch on that no deal was too shady to help Brad beat the system, make the world his oyster with a perfect pearl inside? She never questioned where his windfalls of money came from. Even after he disappeared for days on business, he said. I clinched another big deal, Christy. Everything I touch turns to gold. Call me King Midas, and you're my princess. <laughs> Castles in the air... I'll build a dozen right on the ground. Prince Charming, King Midas, and Christie the princess locked in a tower of love and innocence. An article in a travel magazine was to change all that. Brad read the article, grabbed the phone, and dialed my laboratory. Oh, I'm a research chemist, and that's exactly what Brad needed. Hendricks Laboratory. Tom, Brad, one question. When you were on that trip to Ceylon, you went to a fire walking, didn't you? Sri Lanka. What? Sri Lanka. That's Ceylon's new name. It's really their ancient name, and now I... I don't give a damn about its name. You did see a fire walking, yes? Yeah, what about it? Plenty about it. What I want to know is this. Those natives that, that, that walk on coals, it's a fake, isn't it? Well, I told you, but I saw it. No, I mean they protect their feet with some kind of secret herb, right? Wrong. No tricks, drugs, gimmicks. Oh, I don't believe it. Look, I'm telling you that I saw them walk through a blazing inferno with bare feet and they weren't burned. You sure? No protection at all? None. Hey, Tom, there's got to be an angle. Uh, maybe so, but doctors and scientists who studied the phenomenon haven't found it. You know, I checked out one fire walker myself, before and after. He didn't put anything on his feet before he walked, and those feet weren't any different after they sank in coals nearly up to his ankles. How the devil do they do it? Uh, no one knows. The people who do it know they have to. Not scientifically. 
They're just not telling. But spiritually, they know. What? Well, you see, Brad, firewalking is a religious rite. Several people in Ceylon, walkers and non-walkers, told me that those able to do it have attained some sort of high spiritual development. Yeah, whatever that means. Well, you see, everyone can't do it. Only the ones who okay, are real. Okay, okay, skip all that. Look, here's the important question. Firewalking can be fake, can it? A lot of jokers have tried to fake it, especially fools from this part of the world. They were burned to a crisp for their trouble. Well, I say it can be faked. Listen, I'm coming over there to your lab. What for? I'm busy. Too busy to make a million bucks? What? I'll tell you when I get there, pal. Keep the home fires burning. When Brad got to the laboratory, he was too on fire, shall we say, to explain the fantastic plan he had already dreamed up. He plunged right into ways and means. Tom, I got the principle of this thing all figured out. And you've got the know-how to invent it. Refrigeration. Refrig... I, I invent refrigeration and we make a million. Well, you're a few years too late, genius. All for... All right, all right, I'll explain. I read this article about fire worshippers on the island of Kamala. Their annual firewalk ceremony is next month. I'm going over there and walk on fire. Are you out of your skull? What for? Hey, listen, listen to this part of the article. Wait till I... Uh, yeah. Yeah, here it is. An island legend has long been held as sacred truth. One day, the Kamalans believe a stranger from afar will conquer the holy fire, will walk without blemish through the burning coals. The stranger will be a man of white skin, of pure heart, of pure faith. For centuries, the islanders have awaited this stranger, this favorite of the fire god. When at last he comes, he will be proclaimed high priest and king of the Golden Isle. Well, Tom, old buddy, you get it? And you think that you can be that stranger? I know I can. Walk the coals and not be burned. Not burned, singed, scorched, or toasted. All right, let's assume that you can do it. So you've got the white skin, if not the pure heart. So the brown-skinned islanders make you high priest and king. So what? How does that make us a million bucks? You a million, twice, three times that much for me. Answer the question. How does King Brad Stewart make us millions? Kamala is an island of jewels. More treasure there than in Salon. Oh, fine. You're king. You sit on a gold throne. You're worshipped by a lot of superstitious natives who can't even speak your language. Fun and games. Stuck on an island, what good are jewels and a gold throne? Forget the gold throne, the jewels. Concentrate on the statue of the fire god. Yeah, what about it? Wait, I'll, uh, I'll read you about that, gentlemen. The, uh, the trench of coals through which the chosen ones walk is one yard wide, 20 yards long. At the end of their fiery ordeal, a majestic, fearsome statue of the fire god waits for them. They kneel to him and worship. Uh-huh, so? So listen to this. The life-size idol worth a king's ransom is solid gold studded with unnumbered flawless diamonds, rubies, sapphires, and emeralds. Is that a few million bucks or isn't it? Here, look. A picture of him. I bring that gorgeous hunk back to the States. Wow, oh, take it off the island? How do you get away with that, chum? I'm king. I have absolute power. The dumb heathen worship me, love me, obey me. I say, sorry, uh, beloved subjects, the fire god has ordered me to take the statue to, uh, to other believers across the world. They won't even try to stop me. It's a cinch. Well, sure, a cinch predicated on the assumption that you can waltz over those coals without getting a hot foot. A little modern science, that's your department. A little hocus-pocus for me, and I pull it off. I can even talk to the priestess uh, without an interpreter. Oh, wait a minute. What priestess? <laughs> Where's that part about the... Uh... Yeah, here it is. The island has always been ruled by a woman, a priestess. But the stranger they foretell will be a man. The present ruler of surpassing beauty descends from the royal line that has ruled for centuries. Educated in England... She nevertheless embraces all the island's ancient customs and beliefs. Come on, a beautiful priestess yet. Educated speaks English, but believes all that hogwash about a white-skinned stranger. Well, we in business? 
Brad, if you're asking, can I produce a chemical combination that will see your feet through half a city block of live coals? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. There's a chemical that expands into gas when it's exposed to heat. Now, you combine that with... Never mind how you do it. Just do it. Has it occurred to you that Kamala belongs to India? I mean, even if you get away with the idol, you'll have bad trouble getting a priceless antiquity out of Asia. Bribery does it. After this hustle, I can afford it. Now, let's, uh, let's get to the bottom line. A million dollars is your take if you can air condition my feet. Is it a deal? No. No? <laughs> you want more? Look, I dreamed up this caper. Why should you now, get more minute, than a million? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold your fire. You see, I'm, I'm not as greedy as you are. A million will do nicely. Thank you. Pay for lab equipment I need. Now, there's, uh, there's something else I want. What? To go on this safari with you. <laughs> I, uh, I thought you were about to ask me for the priestess. <laughs> sure you can go. Why not? No, I- I'll take Christy. You take your girl. We'll have a ball. Well, I haven't got a girl. Well, then maybe you, uh, maybe you do want the priestess. It says right here she's a knockout. I could probably pull that off, too. Well, thanks a lot. But I don't think that I'd go for a doll who worships fire. Hey, but what about Christy? What about her? Will she approve of this hoax? <laughs> Little Chrissy approves of anything I do. Does she know what you do? She knows what I choose to tell her. Take her along and you'll have to tell her the truth about this. Look, I can handle Chris. You handle those chemicals. Yeah. But come to think of it, I'm, I'm not so sure that I approve of this caper myself. You don't have to approve. Just invent. And keep in mind, we have to leave by the middle of next month. <laughs> After that. Hallelujah! I'll be a zillionaire. Brad Stewart's avarice blinded him to a clear warning sounded in that travel article. I quote, Through the years, more than one stranger has landed on Kamala claiming to be the anointed one. Not one man could withstand the trial by fire. All were painfully burned. The natives will tell you that the impostors were exposed by the fire god, who then cursed them with fire. Close the quotes. Close this act. Second act, shortly. pursue that magazine article a little further. Quote, The Kamalans believe and seemingly demonstrate that only the pure of heart can walk unharmed. Before the walking begins, a wooden statue of a man is flung on the coals to prove they are alive and cruel. The charred, doomed statue represents the fate of any fraudulent person who would test the fire god's sinister power. End quote. Now, let Tom Hendricks take up the story. Just two weeks before we were to leave, Brad read Christie the article. When he finished, not a word about the swindle we planned. Only a question. Well, Princess, how would you like to see that firewalk? Oh, Brad, do you mean it? I do. I've got some business in those parts. Oh, but you never take me on your trip. I'm taking you on this one. I've already reserved our flight to India, 14th of this month. India, too? Oh, I've always wanted to see India. No, I'm afraid there's no, there's no time for India, Christy. Oh, the, the fire walk is on the 16th. We won't even get to Madras till the 15th. I have to uh, charter a boat of some kind. You see, all sorts of problems. You'll see Madras, but that's all of India you'll get. Well, then, after the fire walk. Oh, Brad, we can't be over there and not see the Taj Mahal and Mount Everest. No, not afterwards either. I'll, I'll have some extra luggage that I can't exactly uh, carry around or check somewhere. What extra luggage? Oh, just some uh, jewels I expect to pick up in Kamala for my girl. Oh, Brad, <laughs> you're so good to me. But jewels don't weigh all that much. Well, they do and they don't. The gems I'll get for you will be bigger than any you've ever dreamed of. How would you like that, that 485-carat sapphire the article talks about? Yeah, value $250,000. Well, but 
That's in the statue of the fire god. Nothing's too good for my princess. Count on it. That sapphire, as big as an egg, is yours. Oh, sure. <laughs> the pretty priestess will sell you a jewel from the sacred idol for $1.95. Sell? She'll give it to me. <laughs> Darling, dearest. You know, you're terribly attractive. But sorry, sweetheart, not that attractive. Want to bet? <laughs> I'm on. telling you that priestess will give me anything I ask. Brad, you really do think she will, don't you? I don't think, sweetheart. I know. It was only a joke to Christy. Charming Brad playing a charming game. Some game. It was about that time, a day or two later, that I soured on the whole deal. I had put together the formula Brad needed and given it to him. I wish I hadn't. I went to his apartment and told him so. Back? You want the formula back? You heard me, Brad. Why? Well, I, I, I've changed my mind about it. I, I don't think that it'll work. What do you mean, won't work? We know it works. We tested the thing. Not on 20 yards of burning coal. Look, last week, you were damn well pleased with that formula, ready to patent it. Now you show up here carping about how it won't do the job. Don't try to con me, Hendricks. I'm a master at that game, and I can smell a con a mile off. Now, what the hell is this all about? All right, I'm... I'm worried about Christy. Christy? Brad, you're tempting Providence... Yes, my formula will do the job. At least I think it will. But what if those natives you swindle catch you out just the same? You know what they'll do? They'll tear you apart. And then what happens to Christy? Look, that stuff for my feet is colorless, odorless, transparent as water. They can't see it or smell it or feel it. How can they catch me out? I don't know how. I do know that the Kamalans walk on fire without a formula. In other words, they have primitive powers that we don't know anything about. Oh, come on, Brad, don't go to Kamala. Or if you must, don't take Christy with you. <laughs> worried about Christy? You're worried about your own hide, not hers, not mine. Then you stay home. Who needs you? Christy might. If she goes, I go. <laughs> Who do you think you're kidding? All this knight in shining armor act. You're in love with my little Chrissy. You think I don't know that? You want me to leave you both behind and you hope the Kamalans will burn me on a spit like a shish kebab so you'll have a clear field. No, I'm sorry, friend. Christy goes. Brad was right. I was in love with Christy. A futile business. I knew that, but there it was. And the only reason I was still going on that trip was to take care of her if she needed me. So, all right, we arrive in India. We charter a sloop to take us to Kamala. An old, beat-up craft with a single sail. Three small, rough cabins. A crew of four. We sailed from Madras the next morning out of the Bay of Bengal into the Indian Ocean. A three- to six-hour journey, depending on the winds. Christy still knew nothing of the real reason we were going. Brad chose an odd, oblique way to tell her. But deviousness was his stock in trade. He struck up a conversation with one of the Indian sailors near where Christy sat in a deck chair within earshot. That, uh, uh, that fire walk tonight on Kamala, the, uh, the walkers, uh, they cheat a little, huh? So? Uh, they protect their feet with some sort of magic, uh, potion, right? No, Sahib. Fire walk is sacred. God of fire punish unbeliever. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. I hear there's a big legend that someday a white stranger from afar will walk through that furnace and not even get a blister. True, sir. When stranger walk, no burn, no pain. He will be king and high priest of Kamala. You, uh, you believe all that? Oh, yes, sir. Then, my friend, you'd better kneel at my feet. You're talking to the man in the legend. Tonight, I walk the sacred fire. Uh, no, Sahib. You'd not believe. Fire God will smite you. <laughs> Who do you think you're kidding? I tell you, I'll walk where angels fear to tread. And I won't feel a thing. The God will know, sir. You will feel. You will burn. Want to bet? <laughs> on your way, sailor. Go on, back to your duty. Yes, sahib. I go. Well, princess, uh, how'd you like that little exchange? Oh, you shouldn't tease him like that, Brad. They take their rituals very seriously. So do I. Sometimes I wonder if you take anything seriously. Sure. The fire walk. I really am walking that primrose path tonight. Oh, you're not. I am. Didn't I promise you that sapphire? They're not about to give it to anyone who isn't the high priest. 
Tom invented some magic stuff to protect my feet. What's the matter? You're serious. Remember I told you I'd have some uh, extra luggage so we couldn't traipse all over India? Jewels, you said. Heavy ones, I said that too. Heavy because they'll be in the statue of the fire god. I'm uh, bringing him back to New York for a souvenir. You are serious. Well, Brad, you can't do that. No, not a thing to worry about, baby. Tom and I tested the stuff from my feet. It works like a breeze. Oh. Cools like a breeze. Oh, Brad, I don't mean the walking. I I mean, you, you, you can't steal their beautiful sacred statue. You can't. <laughs> Worried about a statue, not about me? Oh. Look, I'm not stealing it, Christy. The priestess lady will give it to me. Mine free and clear. No crime committed. But it's theirs. They, they worshipped it for centuries. But I worked this all out just for you, a big romantic adventure. And now listen to you. You did it for me? Who else? Then why didn't you tell me about it before? I wanted it to be a surprise when you got here. And I don't even get a thank you. Well, I... I guess I thank you, but... Oh, please... You can't do it. It's wrong, Brad. I know it's wrong. Now, sweetheart, listen to me. Oh, but Brad... So those ignorant pagans lose a bucket full of precious jewels. Not, not stolen, remember, given. The island is lousy with jewels. They can make another idol, bigger, better. You say they, uh, they've worshipped the old one for centuries? What else have they done for centuries? I don't know what. Waited for, prayed for the coming of that white stranger. You think it won't be a big thrill for the legend to come true? If I get you ten, some of the believers have begun to lose faith. They give me the statue. I give them back their faith. Hail to the high priest. But the high priest isn't staying there. Does the legend say he would? No. Come on, Christy. Where's the harm in this? I'm doing the Kamalans a favor. Christy let Brad persuade her. Well, hadn't I let him do the same thing to me? When we reached the lush tropical island mid-afternoon, Brad had no trouble getting an audience with the priestess. The article had said that she was of surpassing beauty, and she was. She sat on a throne of carved teakwood, and Brad knelt before her. Royal lady, your god of fire has come to me in a vision. Go across the world, he said, for I have chosen you to conquer the sacred fire. I bid you hasten to the Golden Isle. Priestess of the God, I have obeyed. I am here. Describe to me our God of fire that we may know it was in truth he who came to you and not another. He is golden, like fire. Everything about him is like fire. Fiery jewels, Hair like streaming flames. Long fingers like fire reaching toward me. On his face a look that filled me with dread. If I did not obey his command. Oh, stranger from afar. Verily, you have seen our God. If you are a true believer, I and his subjects welcome you. You will see him again at midnight. When we walk the flames in supplication to the God. If you walk without blemish, we shall proclaim you high priest and king of Kamala. If I weren't a true believer, would I dare walk through fire? Others of evil intent have pretended to believe, have braved the fire. Heed this warning, O oh stranger. Anyone of impure heart, the fire god punishes with fire. Royal lady, I revere the god with all my heart. At midnight, I will return and prove I am his chosen one. <laughs> He had to soak his feet in the protective solution until time for us to leave again. Christy was terribly frightened. Brad, terribly amused. Brad, I beg you not to do this. You will be burned. Chrissy, this stuff works. Uh, Here, look, I'll prove it. I've only been soaking about five minutes, but, uh, watch this. 
Presto. Cigarette lighter lights. Lighter flame held under large toe of high priest's left foot. Count to 50, Chris. No, I won't. You, you really can't feel it? It doesn't burn? Stupendous black magic. Courtesy of Tom Hendricks. <laughs> now quit worrying. I can't. It works. I'm proving it. Tom, you tell her. Well, Christy, it, it does work. Don't you believe your own eyes? I believe the priestess. Did you see her eyes when she said, the fire god punishes with fire? That's pagan superstition and mumbo-jumbo. Look here, I'm still holding the lighter under my toe. And keeping my cool. Well, even if you walk and aren't burned, you, you heard what that sailor said. The god will know what you are. Oh, Brad, he'll do something else to you, something too terrible even to imagine. Brad was not persuaded. Five minutes before midnight, the embers in the trench glowed blood red. The heat was so intense it was painful to stand anywhere near. The wooden statue, the one used for a test, was blazing when we came. As if anyone needed proof that that incinerator was murderous. Oh, Brad, please don't do it. Brad, she's right. Give it up. Shut up, both of you. Go wait for me beside the fire guard. Hey, look. He's in place where the walk ends. Wow. What a sight. He looks alive. He looks like a dumb idol. Now, go on. We went. I took Christie's hand. It was cold in all that heat. Natives lined both sides of the trench now. At the other end stood the priestess, arms raised heavenward. Three women and four men clustered around her. They, too, would walk, but pure of heart. And then there was Brad, head piously bowed, hands folded in the position of prayer. And then suddenly... Oh, sacred God of fire, lead the faithful and pure of heart through thy flames. But... Upon any who are evil, visit thy revenge. The priestess stepped down into the coals. There was a most awesome silence. Not a sound from anyone, from anywhere. Night birds, crickets, natives. Silent. How regally the priestess glided down that tortuous path, straight to the fire god. And there knelt. The seven natives came next and knelt. Brad stood waiting. He could have followed the others, but he wanted his moment to be big and dramatic. He wanted and got top billing. Oh, stranger from afar. Walk. That magazine article gave another chilling piece of information. Chilling? Not a word that suits our subject. Again, I quote... The temperature of the firewalk coals, measured with an optical pyrometer, registered 1,330 degrees Fahrenheit. Close quotes. Brad Stewart will walk through that? Or will he? Act three promises the answer. mythology, the name of the god of fire was Vulcan. Ancient Romans greatly feared the destructive deity. Not Brad Stewart. Reluctantly, one has to admire his rash courage, his arrogant indifference to the risk he would take. Apparently not a nerve in his body, he stood there, ready to step into and walk, not run, the gauntlet of twenty yards of searing coals measuring over a thousand degrees of heat. He had tested the insulation on his feet, yes, but not under conditions like this. Would modern technology outwit primitive mysticism? Tom Hendricks will finish the story. Why the devil didn't Brad get on with it? Afraid after all? No. He was relishing the limelight, the suspense, and he wanted more fanfare. He got it. Walk, old stranger. Walk. He walked. 
I watched his face for signs of pain. None. He sauntered down that fiery path as if it were a garden path. The uncanny silence continued, except four words whispered by the priestess standing beside me. He walks. He walks. By the halfway point, the fire worshippers lining both sides of the trench began to kneel. The poor, deluded souls believed they were paying homage to their new high priest. The walk finished. Brad knelt, in his turn paying homage to the god. The priestess placed both hands on his head. Stranger, who has conquered the sacred flame, we rejoice in thy coming. Bow to thy majesty, and I proclaim thee high priest and most high ruler of the golden iron. She repeated that proclamation in the Kamalan language. The long silence ended, and cheers rose to the heavens, a kind of incantation, a litany. Brad came to his feet, faced the crowd, standing there like, yes, like a king. He waited for the caterwauling to stop. When it went on and on, King Brad Stewart shouted his first command to his subjects. Silence! Be silent! They couldn't understand the English words, but his raised, imperious hand announced what he wanted. Instant silence, instant obedience. He spoke then to the priestess. Here was the final test. Would she see through him? Would some occult message reveal him for what he was? Well, give the devil his due. Brad gave a great performance. Even I, who knew him and despised him, was impressed. Royal princess, I am greatly honored, deeply moved. And it is with sorrow and regret that I tell you I am not destined to be ruler of this beautiful isle. I cannot have heard thee correctly. You have indeed heard correctly. It is ordained that you continue to rule. No. It is forbidden. Once it was forbidden. No longer. There has come to pass a new command. But thou art the favored chosen one of the God himself. Pray you listen, madam. I, most high priest of Kamala, have seen another vision. Our god of fire has once again appeared to me, honored me with his presence. Yet again? These were his words, his command. Take my golden image across the world and gather unto me new believers. Sire, take the golden one from us. No, no, no. Go at once, he said. Do not tarry beyond this day. It cannot be. Cannot. It must be. Would you have me disobey the God? Without the beloved golden one, we will sicken and die. Oh, sire, we know this. We have always known. Listen well. The God commands that your subjects make another golden one, which he will doubly bless. You will obey? We will do as the God commands. And all will be well. That is my promise, royal lady, and the promise of the God. I leave you now. Say to your people that they are not to follow. That is an order from their high priest and king. She gave the order. That silence again, uncanny, somehow threatening. No one moved except our threesome. Brad and I picked up the statue. Heavy. All that gold. And started for the sloop. (laughs) How'd I do, kiddies? What a star performance, huh? Yeah. Abracadabra, open sesame. Eye of the newt and toe of the frog. Wool of bat and tongue of dog. Never mind the Shakespeare. Christy, are you all right? No. No. The priestess and all the people looked so sad when you took their statue. No, come off it, Chris. How about a little praise instead of worrying about those pagan fools? I do worry. I hate it all. Why did I ever bring you along? Lay off, Brad. You got what you wanted. You bet your sweet life I did. I'm rich, rich, rich. Oh. Lord, this statue's heavy. Yeah, three times as heavy as gold should make it. Like it's a iron, a marble. It wants to stay. Okay, that'll be enough out of you. It's strange how how heavy it is. 
I don't know how much longer I can... Oh, it's a good thing the sloop is closed. Yeah. Brad, Tom, look behind us! We looked. From the trench of coals, a thick tongue of flame was streaming toward us. The fire god had spoken. Oh! Run! Oh! Run! Drop the statue! Oh! No! Too heavy! Drop it! All right! We ran, 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 pursued by fire by murderous natives. We made the sloop, raced on board, pulled up the gangplank, the anchor. The wind was with us. Set sail! Put to sea! Fire can't cross water. We're safe! Safe! I don't think so. It isn't over yet. I know it is. Will you shut up? Those howling banshees can't get at us. They haven't even got a canoe. Now quit falling, and thank God we weren't burned alive. That streak of fire that followed us. It couldn't happen, but it did. How could it happen? Scientifically impossible. I'll tell you how it could happen. That wench of a priest has hypnotized us. Made us think we saw it wasn't there. It was there. It was there, all right. I could feel the heat. One more minute on shore and we'd be cremated right now. I don't believe it. Because you don't want to. You're afraid to. Afraid me? After what I did? I tell you, if you hadn't panicked, I'd have my statue. And now nothing. Not rich. Tricked out of what I earned. Oh, Chris, damn it. If you hadn't started look, yelling... Look, flame, Chris. That flame was as real as... Hey, look. There it is again on the shore. It is. It is. What's it doing? But it's it's taking the shape of, of a man. No. Not, not a man. It's, it's the real fire god. Formed out of that flame. It's nothing but the idol. They carried it to the shore, stood it up, and... No, it, it isn't the idol. No. No, it's twice as tall. It's enormous. It's growing. It's growing. There's something demonic about this. Oh, rot. Right. It's more of their hypnosis. I wish to heaven it was hypnosis. No, Brad, it's real. That thing on the shore, that that god, it's growing into a giant. I can't bear to look. Look, for Pete's sake, will you both get your heads together? It's hocus pocus. It has to be. It doesn't mean a thing. Don't be too sure, oh stranger from afar. We're at sea. That that thing is on shore. What difference if it? Ah, you both make me sick. I've lost a fortune, and all you can do is snivel about some stupid voodoo. I'm going to my cabin. Christy and I stood there by the ship's rail, watching the islanders and the whatever it was grow smaller and smaller, while we on the deck felt safer and safer. Whatever sorcery those ancient people practiced, it wasn't effective anywhere but on their island. A fixed law of nature prevailed. Fire could not cross water. But Christy still had a sense of foreboding. Tom, tell me it's really over. Oh, honey, it is. Now, stop trembling. About half a minute, Kamala and his outraged citizens will be clean out of sight. Oh, I'm so glad that they have their statue. Yeah, so am I. There. Now you can only see the ocean. Feel better? A little. What happened was punishment, wasn't it? Yeah, well deserved punishment. Brad for the rip off he tried to pull, me for helping him. But not you, Chrissy. You were never part of it. I was. I should have stopped him when I found out. Well, you tried. You couldn't. Nothing and no one could change his course. The islanders worship fire. Brad worships money. I didn't know before. Oh, I hope he's learned his lesson now. I doubt it. I doubt it, too. That ravenous hunger for money gets worse, not better. Tom, listen. What? The thunder? No. It's the drought. Why? Why? Oh, no, honey, take it easy. <laughs> It means something. I know it does. The natives have gone back to their ceremony, that's all. Stopped. There, you see. All's well. Oh. Oh, good Lord. Look, look. That same tongue of fire. It's coming. Fast. You said it couldn't cross water. No, it's above the water. It'll burn the ship. I... No, it's worth oh. It's aiming for Brad's cabin. Let's go. God, the door's locked. Brad. Get out of there! Stand back. I'll, I'll break it down. At the instant, the door splintered. I swear, I saw a streak of fire spiral through the porthole out to sea. The cabin was a furnace of heat. Brad's twisted, charred body lay on the floor, dead. If all that is not strange enough for fanciers of the macabre, hear this postscript. 
Although Brad Stewart burned to death, no other object in that cabin was touched by fire. Nothing else even scorched. How could such a thing be? Only the primitive people on the island of Kamala have the answer. I'll be back shortly. I guess I'm lucky. My family's always been healthy. Oh, a touch of constipation now and then. But we've got X-Lax for that. Today, more American families trust X-Lax than any other brand. When you need a laxative, you can count on X-Lax for relief in the morning. For occasional use only as directed. Why X-Lax? My family trusts it. That's why. Now, you can relieve the misery of itching fast. Bicozine Cream has the fastest anti-itch drug you can buy without a doctor's prescription. Use only as directed. Get Bicozine. Afterthought. Recall, please, this passage in the travel article. Before the fire walking begins, a wooden statue of a man is placed on the coals to prove they are alive and cruel. The charred, doomed statue represents the fate of any fraudulent person who would test the fire god's sinister power. Fraudulent Brad Stewart. Charred. Doomed. Dead. Our cast included Norman Rose, Michael Tolan, and E.B. Juster. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Dr. Actus, you can't keep us here indefinitely. Oh, I have no intention of doing that. I can promise you, Mademoiselle Sherwood, that you would be free to leave here in the morning. And to catch my train. And to catch your train. Me? The way you said that, uh, what about Mr. Hart? Ah, that is quite different. Mr. Hart will be staying a little longer. What for? Shall we say as evidence of your good faith. My good faith in what? In a little scheme which has occurred to me and which, the more I examine it, seems the perfect answer to all our problems. Yes, indeed, I think my little scheme will solve this dilemma for all of us. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Exlax. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. At the end of May this year of our Lord, nineteen seventy seven. Another legend passed into history. The last of the great Orient Expresses, Europe's most famous railroad train, made its last run. This is a tale of two people who planned to be on that last run from Istanbul, Turkey, to Paris, France, and who found out with Robert Burns' mouse that even the best laid plans are at the mercy of fate. Or, even worse, men of no conscience. Put up your hands, please. And don't move. Now, wait a minute. Whoever you are... Shut up. Inside. All right, but... Don't argue with him, Diana. That's a Stalonica 57 he's toting. What's that, Bob? A machine gun. Real bullets, too. Our 
four-hour mystery drama, Last Train Out, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Anne Williams. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the Sinus Medicines, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You must all be familiar with Diana Sherwood. Remember her as the wistful and winning child movie star of the 50s? Then her amazing turn away from success and riches to go to college and take her degree, and later go through a long apprenticeship as a reporter. Finally, the third stage, her return to the public in a new field, in television, as a news reporter and brilliant interviewer. Now, at the peak of her career, she's driving through eastern Turkey on special assignment with Bob Hart, her cameraman producer, an assignment whose wrap-up is planned to take place on the Orient Express. Can't you go a little faster, Bob? Well, what's the hurry, Diana? We're still on vacation. Oh, vacation. <laughs> Three short, glorious days. Oh, I love you. <laughs> all the shows we've done together. All the corners of the world we've poked into. And you wait till here to tell me. Hmm? When in Rome. <laughs> I got here. I learned to talk turkey. <laughs> oh, I'm not even going to notice that. <laughs> Don't. Just concentrate on me. Oh, I intend to. For the rest of my life. Hey, I'm going to hold you to that. I want to kiss you. Not while you're driving. Well, why not? No, Bob, don't. Now you... <laughs> Look out, lame brain. Do you want to kill us? No, ma'am, but uh, what a way to die. You just keep your eye on the road. What road? The one you're driving on. Now, you call this a road? It's a goat track. Well, you were the one who insisted on taking it. <laughs> well, I wanted to be by the water. Very romantic at sundown. And very late. We ought to get back to the main road as soon as possible. I mean, we really should be in Istanbul by now. Why? Because we have a whole section of the documentary to shoot on the Orient Express tomorrow. Remember? Well, of course, darling. Hey, the road's getting better. <laughs> I can give her the gun. Well, you satisfied with what we filmed so far? Oh, yes. And the train footage should just button it up right. Mm. That's sad to think that romantic old train won't be running anymore. Yes. A lot of things sad about Turkey. Not for me. Because of us. Well, that's private and personal. <laughs> Is that me, or No, is... no, no. The oh. sun's gone down. Oh. How long have I been out? Oh, about, about 15 minutes. Mm. Oh, I've been frantic. There, has, there hasn't been a sign of another car or anything. Hey, hey wait a minute. How are you? Oh, I'm all right. You sure? Oh, darling, I hung on to you, and when you rolled over, you took the worst of it. You saved my life. But you, I'm so worried. Oh, honey, ease up. I'm not hurt that bad. Except for the whack on the head and a couple of bruises on my thigh. Oh, I'll do. But you're bleeding. Well, okay, I need a couple of stitches, maybe. But uh, the cut's not deep. Now, look at that. <clears throat> How did I get out of the car? Well, you were still half conscious. You were able to help me just enough to get you out. Oh. How is the car? Oh, pretty much of a wreck. <laughs> Thank heaven I left my cameras and equipment to be shipped from Ankara by air. What are you trying to do? Get up. No. Bob, oh, no. Darling... I'm all right, and I want to take a look at the car. Look, I, I don't want you to move. You might have a concussion. Don't worry, Diana. Oh, oh now, look, if I knew you were okay, you could sit here, and I could walk back to that village we just yeah, had. Yeah, well, let's see if we can ride first. Oh, wow. It is a wipeout. Front axle's gone, radiator's ruptured. Oh, and wait a minute. What is it? Wait, look, look up there at the top of the hill, through the trees. Someone just turned on a light. Oh. There's a house up there. Yes, I see. Look, darling, you wait here, and I'll go up and see if they have a phone. No, no, I'll do better than that. I'll come with you. Oh. This darn place is farther away than I thought. Well, we'll uh, just cut across this terrace here. 
And uh, we'll try the French windows. Oh. Hey, the room inside's lighted. Oh, yes, but they have Austrian blinds. Yeah, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a chink here. Let me have a look. Yeah. Hey, it's crazy. That can't be. What is it? Now keep your voice down. Take a look. Two men. Let's knock. Hold it. Hold. Take a look at the one sitting at the table. Yes. Who is he? Well, I don't... What you mean? Oh, he looks like Sibyakov. Looks like? He's a dead ringer. Oh, good Lord, Bob. We've really stumbled onto something. Yeah. Well, hornet's nest. We're getting out of here. With a story like this? Do you know who this man is? Sure. Number three or four in the police bureau who came here on a little Russian-type lobby trip to Istanbul and mysteriously disappeared day before yesterday. Or defected. Well, whichever it was, he has Russia up in arms and the Western world on atomic pins and needles and the Turks in the blue funk. Now, let's not get mixed up in this, Diana. Come on, it's too big. Right oh. And don't move. Hey, now, now wait a minute. Shut Where up. You? Uh, uh, we, we had an accident and, and we were looking... I be quiet. Inside. All right, but I... Don't argue with him. That's a Stalonica 57 he's toting. A what? A machine gun. Real bullets, too. Move. What is the meaning of this, Sergei? Excuse me, doctor, but I found them outside looking through the window. Doctor? Oh, you're just what we're looking for. My friend is hurt. Uh, yes, so I see. That is a nasty cut. You will need some stitches. No, no, no. All, all we need is, is a phone to get a mechanic and some transportation. First of to... all, I must tend to your wound. Oh, allow me to introduce myself. I am Dr. Bulent Agdus. And you, of course, are Mademoiselle Diana uh, uh, Sherwood, is it not? You know me. What educated man in Turkey does not know you, mademoiselle? Especially since you have honored Turkey by coming here to do one of your fine documentaries about us. Excuse me. Uh, Sergei, put away the gun. But I found them spying on you. Uh, Sergei! As you are, the doctor. You will pardon me, mademoiselle Sherwood, and... Uh, oh, uh, this is my... Uh, uh... My cameraman, Mr. Robert Hart. Ah, yes. Uh, if you will excuse me, this gentleman here with me was just leaving. Sergei, please see uh, my patient to the door. Uh, look, if you just let us make a phone call, you can go ahead with your patient. No, we were all finished. Sergei? Yes, doctor. Good night, Mr. Schumann. Now, just follow my instructions, and I'm sure you'll find your condition will improve uh, uh, rapidly. No, 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 don't say anything. I am more than glad to have been of help. Now then, won't you sit down, Mademoiselle Sherwood, while I have a look at the gentleman's injury? Oh, thank you. But, but while you're treating Bob, couldn't I phone for help? Unfortunately, no. Oh, why not? I have no phone. A doctor? This is my home, not my office. I value my privacy. Well, you, you don't seem to get much of it. Sir. Uh, what about the, uh, the patient who just left? What about him, Mr. Hart? Uh, I think what Bob meant is that if this isn't your office... Shall we uh... say that he is just an old friend who dropped by? Oh, yeah, yeah. okay. Well, sure, we don't, we don't care about him, Dr., uh... Uh, actors. Now, all we want to do is get to Istanbul by the night. I am afraid that would be very difficult. Please, let me offer an alternative. Why don't you allow me to invite you to be my guest for the night? I'm afraid that isn't possible. Oh, no, why not? Well, Mr. Hart and I must leave Istanbul tomorrow on the Orient Express. But the Express does not leave until evening. I really must insist that you be my guest. Uh, well, I, I don't think you understand exactly, Doctor. Uh, Miss Sherwood and I are on an assignment from international broadcasting to deliver a documentary on your country. Oh, I know. I am aware that you have been here already for over two weeks. But the last part of our Turkish coverage is to film the Orange Express and transit. Yeah, and, uh, well, as I guess you know, it makes its last trip tomorrow night. I am aware of that. So, you see, we must get back tonight. Oh, I quite understand. But as a doctor, I must tend to that wound of yours before anything. Yes, Bob, please let him do that. Okay, okay, fine. Uh, as long as while he's patching me up, we make some kind of arrangement to get to Istanbul. Without a car and no phone, I don't really see how it is possible. 
There is also the matter of crossing the Bosporus to the Thracian side. Uh, well, just get us to the ferry. But how? Oh, can't you have your man drive us in? I'm afraid I can't. Well, won't. If you ask me, your invitation to stay sounds more like an order. Perhaps it is. Sergei! Yes, doctor. Cover me, please. Ah, the man behind the gun. Yes, Mr. Hart, I'm afraid after all you are right. My invitation is really an order. You recognized my patient, did you not, Mr. Hart? All right. What if I did? It is absolutely vital that Comrade Serfiakov's whereabouts remain a secret until we get him to safety. So you will stay as my guest, both of you, until I do. But, Dr. Actus, you can't keep us here indefinitely. Oh, I have no intention of doing that. I can promise you, Mademoiselle Sherwood, that you would be free to leave here in the morning. And to catch my train. And to catch your train. Me? The way you said that, uh, what about Mr. Hart? Ah, that is quite different. Uh, Mr. Hart will be staying a little longer. What for? Shall we say as uh, evidence of your good faith? My good faith in what? In a little scheme which has occurred to me and which, the more I examine it, seems the perfect answer to all our problems. Yes, indeed, I think my little scheme will solve this dilemma for all of us. Diana and Bob exchange a glance. What is the smooth and oily Dr. Akdu's up to? One thing has been expressed in the look they have exchanged, a feeling that I'm sure I and you in the audience share, that the insinuating manner of this strange doctor, if indeed he is one, is only a mask that conceals a man who serves no principles except his own. A bad enemy. Perhaps an even worse friend. I shall return shortly with Act Two. The three of them were frozen as we left them. Diana Sherwood and Bob Hart in the moment of exchanging their glance. Dr. Bulant Akdus, his dark, beady eyes glistening wetly as he considers them both, a secret smile curling one side of his mouth. Now, as the film of our tale starts to unwind again, the protagonists move from their still frame to action. I think my little scheme will solve this dilemma for all of us. What dilemma? Oh, come, Mr. Hart. It is useless to deny it. You have recognized that I am hiding under my roof the most wanted man in Turkey. Lavrenti Serpyakov is being hunted by every communist in Europe. I am committed to getting him to safety. Could I possibly allow either of you to leave here freely now that you know my secret? But we'll be beyond Turkey by tomorrow night. Preserving a discreet silence about the biggest news story on the continent at this moment? <laughs> the answer is obvious. Oh, no, no, no. We are sitting, all three of us, on a bombshell. Why? Why all the intrigue and the cloak and dagger stuff? Look, why doesn't Serpiakov turn himself over to the Turkish authorities and ask for sanctuary? The risk is too great. Turkey stands at a crossroads at this moment. Our neighbor to the north, Russia, dominates the Black Sea with her navy. She would demand his return at once, and we are not in any position to refuse. Well, then go to the American consulate. They'd protect him. If we ever got him there alive, perhaps. Another point not to be debated, the risk is also too great. An international situation might be created. No, no, the answer is clear and has been decided. Serpiakov must first be gotten out of Europe to a country where he will be totally safe. Without a passport, without papers, without visas? No, it's crazy. The problem was enormously difficult before. But now, fortunately, it is relatively simple. Thanks to your coming here providentially, as you did. Thanks to us? Yes. Ah, well, actually more directly to you, Mademoiselle Sherwood. You are going to be Serpiakov's safe conduct direct to America. Me? 
me. Oh, I'm afraid you're mistaken. Oh, I doubt it. I'm quite sure you are going to be perfectly agreeable, even anxious to help when I explain. You'd better do that right now. I'm afraid not quite yet. My professional ethics dictate another pursuit for me. You have a nasty cup and quite a few abrasions which need attention. If you would follow me across my hall to my clinic, uh, we would put you in shape. Uh, no, I want to know what you're up to first. I think you will do it my way. Sergei! Uh, now, look, just a minute. No, uh, darling, please. The cut still hasn't stopped bleeding. It's got to be taken care of. She is quite right, you know. The sooner I can suture it, the less scar it will leave in the future. Wait. <laughs> Shall we go and try to get rid of the bad blood between us? Eh? <laughs> there. I think that should do very nicely. No pain? Uh, no, no pain. Now, I want to know what you're trying to get Diana mixed up in. Ah, uh, yes. Well, I would prefer to explain that to both of you at the same time. Why don't we go back and join the lady so I can explain to you both what a blessing in disguise you have turned out to be. So, you would like to know my plan. Very well. Tomorrow evening, Miss Sherwood will leave as planned on the Orient Express. With her will go Sir Pyakov, traveling as Mr. Hart. What do you mean, Sir Pyakov, traveling as Bob? How can he? Very simply. You have just had a quite serious accident in your car. Very good. We will make it appear a good deal more serious. We will say that Mr. Hart has been injured quite severely above the face and the head. I... A doctor living closest to the scene of the accident attended him. And quite naturally, since the damage is extensive, have had to bandage most of his head and face. Oh, can I freshen your drink, Mr. Hart? Yeah, well, maybe you'd better. You see, it occurred to me as soon as I saw you that both you and Serpiakov are approximately the same height and build. Another piece of luck. Uh, this uh, comrade of yours... Does he speak American? Ah, he won't have to. The mouth will be bandaged because some sutures had to be taken. We can even wire the jaws if broken. No, no, no. I, I see no flaws. I think personally it is an excellent plan. Once Sir Pyakov reaches Paris, arrangements already have been made by other interested parties which will clear him out of Europe safely. Now, there is just one major flaw, Dr. Octor. Uh, yes, what is that? What makes you so sure that I'll go along with your little scheme? Oh, I have no doubts about that. I'm sure you can both guess why. You'll be holding me as hostage. Exactly. And besides, as a doctor, I will travel with her to Paris, ostensibly to take care of my patient. But to make doubly sure I uh, behave. Shall we say, cooperate? But what if I refuse? How can you? These are desperate times, Miss Sherwood, and make no mistake, I am a desperate man. I lay my life on the line. And I value it highly enough so that I have no compunction about who dies to protect it. Besides, the end itself is good. Once Serpiakov is safe from reprisal, you will realize that he has information of incalculable value to the, uh, to the democracies. Particularly yours and Mr. Hart's country. All right. Doctor, you win. Do you think perhaps you can send one of your men to get our bags from the car? I will have it taken care of right away. And uh, may I say that I think you have both been very wise. Oh, one other thing. I don't know, of course, how far your... Uh, regard for each other has taken you, but I am sure you will realize under the circumstances that you will be shown to separate rooms. The judgment is not one of moral principle, just mere precaution. Oh. What? Yes? Oh, uh, yeah. Who is it? You have a Oh, just, just a minute. I... Oh, who is it? Open the door. What is it, sir? Oh! Uh, 
Mr. Biakov waits for no one. But I... What are you doing here? Comrade Laurenti, Sir Biakov, at your service. <laughs> the commissar has taken the fancy to you, mademoiselle. Get out, Kulak. You have been paid. Leave us alone. For oh, no sure, comrade. I wish you luck. Get your hands off me. Stay in my arms until we are sure he is gone. What? He's gone? Yeah, don't be too sure of that. And keep your voice low. He may even be watching. Oh. There is at least one keyhole in every door. And every wall has ears. Sergei is a Russian. I do not trust him. You expect me to trust you? Will you please let me go? Uh, I'm sorry. The masquerade was necessary. I had to see you. I have heard of Dr. Akdu's plan. Naturally. Where is the doctor now? Istanbul. He is going to report the accident and set everything in motion. So? So. I have taken this opportunity to bribe the guard to see you. Why would you have to bribe the guard? <laughs> Do you think I am any less prisoner than you or your friend Hart? You? Prisoner? Of whom? Of Dr. Radus, of course. I don't understand. He's the one who's helping you escape. <laughs> escape? <laughs> uh, once I believed in that, but no longer... Because of what you Americans would call the double cross. You have given him the opportunity, you see. I have. Oh, not directly. You are the victims of circumstance, of course. But listen to me. If we go through without this plan, do you think for one moment I would ever get to Paris? I would be lucky to get as far as Tara, Zagora, or Sofia... Wherever the express stopped in Bulgaria, I guarantee the communist authorities will be alerted and ready to arrest me. Who would alert them? Dog those, of course. Do you not see the plan? It is so neat. I will be arrested for traveling under disguise on a false passport so I can be removed from the train quite legally and quietly. Once back in communist hands, I leave it to you imagine what will happen to me. They, they would kill you. No, I doubt it. We are not under Stalin anymore. All I lost in Siberia, as you see, my ring finger. Ah, no, no. Today, we are more civilized. At best, I would simply become a non-person. No job, no means of support. A beggar. At worst, a patient committed to an institution. Both living deaths. Why should Dr. Aktus want to turn you back to the communists? Isn't he helping you escape them? Mademoiselle Sherwood, Dr. Aktus is not a man of conviction, except where he himself is concerned. He is an opportunist and a tool of the highest bidder. The only thing he ever wishes to protect is his neutral standing. I am worth more to the communists but apparently it is only bad luck I fall into their hands. He has it both ways. The money, and if you call it that, his reputation. Do you understand? Oh, I'm not sure. If you really are a prisoner, how could you come and visit me? Number one. Because I am not supposed to know that I am a prisoner. And number two. Because among a certain class of men... Money is the magic key to anything. Oh, with a diamond ring, which is worth more than I care to think of, I bribed Sergei. What is suspicious about why you want to talk to me? Not since he was half drunk from drinking with me. And because of the reason I gave him. Uh, you are beautiful enough for any Russian to understand that. I see. Well, now that you have seen me, what purpose has been served? I want you to trust me. But I do not trust you. I have no time to try to convince you. I have little time left. But I have a plan for all of us. The only one I can devise which I believe 
which will give us a chance to escape with our lives. Will you at least listen to that? It was George Villiers, the first Duke of Buckingham, who coined the phrase, the plot thickens. His actual quote was, I now the plot thickens very much upon us, which indeed it does and has, to a point where I'm afraid we must wait to see what happens until I return shortly with Act Three. Estimable Duke of Buckingham, whose thoughts we borrowed so shortly ago, had one other remark that history had recorded. The world is made up for the most part of fools and knaves. Now, while I don't share his pessimism, the world in which we have become engaged here may be a lot nearer to his than yours and mine. Let's return to it and find out just what it is that Comrade Serpiakov wishes Diana Sherwood to listen to. Very well, Mr. Serpiakov. I'm listening. If I can pass as Mr. Hart with the head covered with bandages, then so can he pass as me. It is only a matter of changing places. How can you do that? Ah, Is that to me. What is important is that he must be ready when the moment comes. Here. Here are bandages. You must get them to him. How? Ah, I must leave that up to you. (laughs) How can I trust you? Look, look. You are a woman of the world. And you know that between the grindstones of power, individuals become dust and are lost in the wind. I know that if I follow the doctor's plan, I am doomed. But if you don't... I'm ready to take my chances. I have been ready to do that since I walked away from a lifetime spent in a cause in which I no longer believe... All right. How how will the change be made? Just before they take me down to the ambulance... Stop, Ah, Sir Yakov! Ah, the devil. There is no time. You must let me know if you get this to Mr. Hart. I am coming in. The doctor is returning. Well, I'll do my best. You must get word to me if he has them and will be ready. We can't wait, comrade. But how... Hurry, think. Put your arms about me quickly. Think. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll drop my club by your, your door. Good. You will have to leave your love dreams for another time. The doctor is just returning. I don't care about the doctor. But I do. Come. Your glove. My glove before your door. And I trust you slept well, Mademoiselle Sherwood. I wouldn't put much trust in that, Dr. Octus. Or in me? Such a pity. Now... I am allowing you to see, Mr. Hart, on your promise that you will try nothing foolish. Well, I can promise you that, at least. After all, everything is arranged. I have reassured your network people that you are, well, as well as can be expected. You have been checked out of your hotel. The accident has been reported. The car paid for. And my private ambulance is waiting to take us all to the ferry across the Bosphorus and onto the train. Oh, With the exception of Mr. Hart, of course. Uh, His room is just around this corner here. Now, remember to be careful what you say. I only want to tell him I love him. And please to follow orders. (gasps) Hamid, be careful with that gun. And open the door. I apologize for that fool. He is gun happy. Must he be the one to guard, Bob? Unfortunately, my resources are not unlimited. But your intended husband will be quite safe if he is careful. Wait, open the door, Hamid. May I see him alone? Where a beautiful woman is concerned, I am a sentimentalist, but not a fool. After you, mademoiselle. But I will stay back by the door with Hamid. Diana. Oh, darling, how are you? Tolerable. Hmm. The room's okay, but up until now, the room service was lousy. (laughs) Oh, honey, you all right? Oh, yes. Everything is all right. What'd you just stuff in my pocket? Oh, see. 
I said uh, everything's all right. Dr. Octus has given me every assurance that you'll be all right. In 36 hours, as soon as we reach Paris, you'll be set free to join me there. You trust this bird? What else can we do? I, uh, I only have a minute, darling. Just hold me. Hold me close. Closer. Before I go, ask for your tobacco pouch. Kiss me goodbye. Oh, do I have to be asked? <laughs> What's in it? A note. Au revoir, darling. Uh, it won't be long. Long enough. Uh, I just wish I had a smoke. I am afraid I must break up this tender farewell. However, at least in exchange, I can offer you some cigarettes. Yeah, thanks. But uh, coming from you, they'd probably be poison. No, I'd prefer my pipe. Oh, I guess I lost my tobacco pouch in the accident. Oh, for heaven's sake, I almost forgot. I was just bringing you that. What are you doing with it? I don't know. I must have picked it up after the accident or something. I, I found it in my sling bag. I, I think it's still here. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, glad to get rid of it. Smelling up my whole bag. Here. Just. One moment, please. I will take that. This would not be a gun by any chance, would it? Well, why don't you open it and see? One can't be too careful. Ah, of course. A briar pipe and the beauty. And unlike the lady, I like the aroma of your tobacco mix. You must let me try it when we have more time. Ah, your pouch, Mr. Hart. Mm. And now, mademoiselle, we really must go. I mean, the door. Oh, I will, darling. You sure you understand? Don't worry. I'll follow instructions. Don't leave this door until you are relieved, Hamid. Khalud Kemar will be here early in the afternoon with some men. Uh, come, mademoiselle. We will go down and have some coffee while we are waiting for Sergei to bring the ambulance. Uh, but first, I must see Ser Pyakov for a moment. Uh, this is his door here. Excuse me. Sir Pyakov? It's Dr. Agduz. Open up. Oh, you dropped your glove, mademoiselle. Ah, what's the matter? Something wrong? Oh, nothing. I just dropped my glove. Ah, allow me. I will please. get it, you drunken fool. You can hardly stand up. Didn't you drink any of that coffee I sent up? Don't want coffee. You'd better get hold of yourself. We're leaving within the hour. Do you understand? I understand the lady dropped her glove. All right, all right. I said I would get it. Here. Oh, very well. Get as drunk as you want. It will save me using the anesthetic. But try to stay awake a few more minutes. I will be right up with the bandages. I'll be waiting. Got everything ready. Is, uh, mademoiselle... You need uh, have no worries about her. She sees things our way now. Am I right, Mademoiselle Sherwood? Oh, yes, indeed. Comrade uh, Sapriakov can be sure I intend to do my part. <laughs> Dr. Octus, what's wrong? Ah, uh, Sapriakov, the drunken fool, passed out. I had to bring Hamid down with me. Sergei! Yes, Doctor. You and Hamid get the stretcher and go upstairs to fetch him. We will have to carry him down. Mr. Hart. It's not the invisible man, though I may look like it. I am Sir Pyakov. Oh, so I gather from the headdress. Come. It is time to change places. We must hurry. Hey, how did you get past my guard? He has gone downstairs to bring up the stretcher for me. Leaving the door unlocked? A fortunate oversight. Come, you must get to my room and stretch out on the bed. Remember, you are dead to the world. And what about you? I will take care of myself. When that fool with the gun who is supposed to guard you comes back, I will break his neck and escape. I still have other friends and other ways. It is the best way. Now hurry. I'll hurry. But I'm not sure it's the best. Look out behind you. What? Ah. Hurry it up, Sergei. Get him in the ambulance. What's wrong with him? Sir Pyakov, dead to the world, drunk. Hurry, Sergei. Come on, Hamid. Lift your end of the stretcher higher. No, no, no. Watch his hand. His hand? Yes. What is it, mademoiselle? His Left hand, the fourth finger. Oh, yes, it is missing. That is an old accent. Ah. You are very observant. Thank you. I will take care of bandaging that on the way to the station. 
If someone had noticed that, Comrade Serpyakov would never have passed for Mr. Ha, would he? <clears throat> All right, Sergey. Hold it a moment. I'll see if that fool has sobered up enough to get him into the wheelchair. Halt! Stand ready. Dr. Bulen, Tagnus? Uh, yes? Lieutenant Ertan, Istanbul Police. Can you identify yourself? Well, certainly. Here are my papers and the passport. Quite correct. These are in order. The lady? Oh, my name is uh, Diana Sherwood. Oh, yes. Your television crew is expecting you on the train, mademoiselle. But uh, where is Mr. Hart? Uh, if you will come with me, Lieutenant, I will show you. Mr. Hart has met with an unfortunate accident in his car, from which Mademoiselle Sherwood managed to escape without serious injury. As you see, Mr. Hart was not so fortunate. He was quite severely injured. You are quite sure that man under those bandages is Mr. Hart, Dr. Hartus? Of course. Mademoiselle Sherwood can verify that. I am not asking the Mademoiselle. I'm asking you. Very well. I am his doctor. Who would know better? Of course, this is Mr. Robert Hart. I think that will do, Dr. Rakdus. You are under arrest. On what charge? For the moment, falsifying a passport will do. I do not believe this man to be Mr. Hart. I believe him to be Commissar Lavrenti Serpiakov. You must be crazy. Mademoiselle Cher will tell this idiot that we cannot be held up. That it is imperative for you oh, to... Lieutenant, he's right. I can't tell you how vital it is to Mr. Hart that, that we make this train. Have no fear, mademoiselle. I think if we hurry, we can get to the police station, straighten things out, pick up the real Mr. Hart, and still make the Orient Express on time. The real Mr. Hart? Certainly. It was his telephone call that brought us here. And I'm sure by now he has reached the police station in safety. Oh, goodbye, Istanbul, Paris, here we come. Bob Hart. Yes, Diana Sherwood. Will you stop being cool, collected, possessed, and pompous and explain to me just what happened? <laughs> Elementary, my dear Sherwood. Bob, didn't you get my note in the tobacco pouch? I did, and the bandages you stuffed in my pocket. Well? Well... When Serpiakov came to make the switch, I got to thinking, so uh, I just cold cocked it. You what? Yeah. Listen, up until your try, I figured my chances were zero. You know, Akdus was going to have me killed the moment his gun so came back. So, I was all ready with my little weapon. What weapon? Bar of soap in my sock. Makes a perfect sandbag. Yeah, you know, I saw it somewhere on the big glass tube. So I conked Serpiakov with it, and I lugged him back to his room before the muscle boys realized anything was wrong. And when the guard came back? Well, I was pretty expert by then. I left the door open, and when Hamid poked his knucklehead in, pow, pow. <laughs> yeah, well, then I called the police, and, and darling, here we are. Oh, but why, Bob? Why? Why take all that risk from the other way? Because my love, Serpiakov, would never have turned himself in. This boy wasn't reformed. He was running for his life. Anyway, I've always wanted to uh, sandbag a real live communist. But most of all, because... Because? Because I didn't want to lose you. I knew the moment Octo's handed Serpiakov over to his fellow commissars, he'd have to waste you as well as me. And that's one way. I wasn't going to let this production end. Oh, darling. I owe you my life. As long as you feel that way, I'm taking it over from now on. That, as they say in the film business, is a wrap, which means the story is told. The last shot is taken. The film is in the can. The actors go home, the studio sets disappear, the lights go out, and the Orient Express fades out of reality and into the pages of history. I'll be back shortly.
as it happens, Serpyakov did find temporary sanctuary in Turkey and eventually made it to America and a kind of freedom he had never known. Dr. Akduz lost his freedom, of course, on multiple charges, including abduction and forcible detention against a person's will. And Mr. and Mrs. Hart, as Diana Sherwood very shortly became, got an exciting and dramatic ending for their documentary on Turkey. Our cast included Anne Williams, Earl Hammond, Robert Dryden, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Impossible to see anything. Heavy overcast below. Losing altitude fast. How about if I hold the button down on radio and leave it open to... Hey, hold it a minute. Cloud break. Huh. Yes, I'm over land. I... Holy Toledo, I'm right on top of you. Hold your hats and stand by. I remember the plane landing and then shearing sideways before I had time to cut the engines. I could feel the want a nose slip and was fighting desperately to keep my control. I remember it slithering sideways straight for the control tower and resting her somehow out of the skid. And then she was tipping forward. There was a tremendous ripping crash. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Marshall. Some years ago, a famous American general observed that old soldiers never die. They just fade away. Throughout all history, there has been an unending line of those who may have died, but who gave the appearance of disappearing from life, of just fading away. Those we call missing persons. If indeed they did fade away, by what means... Were they able to do this? Where did they go? And what happened once they got there? Terry, what's happening? Do you see what I do? None of them are moving. They're, they're just standing there, hundreds of them, saying nothing, grinning at us with those little lines of theirs. Can't. Look, their faces, their bodies, they're changing. What do we do? We get out of here as fast as our legs will take us. Our mystery drama, Land of the Living Dead, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss and stars Don Scardino and Russell Horton. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. There are a few places left in the world that have hardly been touched by the hand of what we call civilization, where man still lives almost as primitively as at the beginning of time. Such a place can be found in South America on the western plateau of Brazil. It's called the Mato Grosso. Jungles, rainforests, and oppressive swamps cover the land. Two Americans, a young man and his older colleague, are poring over timetables in a small New England town. Maps and charts that lie spread on the floor before them. As it stands, Terry, the morning flight from New York to Rio de Janeiro will just about make the plane connection. Uh, huh. Now, 
Even if we take the commercial flight from Rio to Cuyaba, what kind of transportation can we get into the interior? And I mean transportation that we can depend on, Kent. Well, the answer is probably none. Mm. Not unless we want to go the way of Professor Schneider. <laughs> no thanks. No mules, no native dugouts and snake-infested swamps for me. Right, so we stick to our original plan. We reserve our own airplane in advance in Rio. Mm -hmm. The best and safest in Brazil. And a grant from the foundation is generous. It'll cover all those expenses. <laughs> Besides, it's not as if we didn't know what we're doing. We're both experienced pilots. Right, so we fly ourselves from Rio to Cuyaba, spend whatever time we need there for supplies. Uh -huh. Let's uh, take another look at the charts. Uh, uh, nearly 2,000 kilometers. Uh, it's a good 1,200 miles. Uh, where do we refuel? Right here. Ribeirão Preto. Uh -huh. I think that's how you say it. It's big enough to have an airport. The chart says so. Good. And from there, Kent, it should be clear sailing to Cuyaba. <laughs> we hope. Yeah. After that... Well, once we get past the heaviest jungles and the tropical forests, we shouldn't have any trouble finding places to land, right? If we can avoid the swamps and the quicksands. You know, I have an idea that's what may have happened to Schneider on his last trip. What, quicksand? Mm, how else could he have disappeared so quickly and so completely? Never heard from again. Either that, or... The Indians? No, I don't think so, Kent. Why not? I just don't think so. True, we know almost zero about this strange tribe of Indians we're looking for, but one of the things we do know of, from Schneider's report of his first trip is that they're relatively peaceful, unwarlike. Mm, relatively? Well, what have they got to be warlike about? There's no one near them for almost a hundred miles. They're vegetarians. The products of the forest are their principal diet. But, Terry... We also know that they're descended from the Hivaros, the, the headhunters of Ecuador. The pleasant chaps who would just as soon cut off an enemy's head, your head, Terry, or mine, and shrink it down to the size of a baseball. Mm, but you're forgetting that in the two, three hundred years since some of the Hivaros migrated from Ecuador, something happened to them. They changed. Maybe. Well, that's why we're going there. To find out how they changed. And maybe even why. Mm. You know, that's what makes life so fascinating for anthropologists. The study of the whole human family of man, his mind, his body, his culture. And particularly the study of primitive groups like this one. For me, Terry, there are three things about this expedition of ours that get me excited. Which are? First, the prospect of seeing with my own eyes a whole tribe of white Indians. Just as Professor Schneider described them. A whole community of albino Indians... And to try and find out how that came about. Hmm. And second? The possibility of finding some trace, even the slightest, of the missing Professor Schneider. Yeah. I'm with you on that. Uh, how about the third and last? Well, it would be awfully nice if the both of us get back to civilization alive. When do we leave? Terry, welcome to beautiful downtown Cuyaba. Will you take a look at that sign over the control tower? <laughs> International Airport of Cuyaba. <laughs> Are they kidding? They probably have a plane that flies over into Bolivia. Or even Paraguay. Every second Thursday. <laughs> Only if there's a full moon. <laughs> oh, who's the little fellow out there waving at us? Oh, welcoming committee, no doubt. Probably his honor, the mayor. No less. Let's find out. Senores, welcome to Cuyaba, the flower of all Brazil. Didn't I tell you? I present myself, senores. I am Joao Cavallo Figueredo, the third assistant to the mayor of our so beautiful city. Third assistant? Hmm, I guess we don't rate very high, do we? Well, uh, thank you, senor. We uh, certainly appreciate your meeting us. Oh, don't mention it. They have sent to us a radio message from Rio that we were to expect you. How can my city be of service to you? Well, we're headed for the interior, Senor Cavallo. Uh, we'll need a couple of days here to lay in a supply of food and equipment. Oh, of course. You will find that Cuyaba has the best of everything you might possibly need. If, uh, if I may be bold, senores, may I ask where in the interior? Due north. Uh, northwest, maybe. Uh, how far, senor? Oh, not too far. Ah. Uh, Ah, you do not wish to say. <laughs> it's much easier to see by your replies what equipment 
you will need. Shovels, peak axes, mining pans, dynamite. A mining pan? Dynamite? The Mato Grosso is very rich. Not only for all minerals, but for diamonds, silver, even platinum. Hmm, is that uh, so? I know what you look for, and I will help. That's very kind of your Senor Cavallo, but... One small word of caution. It's most unlikely you will come upon them, but if you do, do everything possible to avoid them. Avoid who? What? A uh, certain rare tribe of Indians. They live in the rainforests, stark naked, like prehistoric creatures. They, they have in them some strange kind of powerful magic that is able to make a person see most unusual, sometimes most horrible things. And the persons believe that what they are seeing is in truth real. Well, what do they do to work this, uh, this thing? Uh, no one has ever found out is a magic that, that floats in the air wherever these Indians are. Uh, well, we'll certainly do our best to avoid them, senor. For your own good. But how will we know them if we do come upon them? Well, these are white Indians. Everyone in the tribe, we are told, is an albino. White skin, pink eyes. I must wish that you will never meet them. That's very kind of you, senor. Don't mention it. Your airplane, of course, is in most safe hands, so if you will be so good to follow me, I will drive you to the hotel. In the morning, we start the purchases of supplies for your expedition to this land of most astonishing riches. with all that mining stuff we bought. Oh, give it away, throw it away. But I think we did the right thing, Kent. You mean by not giving away the real purpose of our mission? Yeah, somebody might have tried to stop us. And probably would have for our own good. Then where would we be? Uh, is anything wrong, Kent? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't like the sound of that engine. Neither do I. Uh, look at your navigation charts, Terry. Just about where are we? Uh... Well, there isn't very much on the charts to go by. Well, it, it can't be much further. Well, at this point, with that engine doing tricks, it might be just as well. Uh, uh, what, what's wrong? What, what on earth? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. We're, we're falling, Terry. Much too fast. I'm, I'm doing my best to get her up. Hey, I think you got it, Kent. Here we go. Up, up, up. We're all right? Oh, probably. Oh, funny thing. For a, a second or two back there, I had the uncomfortable feeling that I'd blacked out. Cold. Yeah, so did I. It's odd. Well, what do you suppose that was? It sounded like an airplane crash. Well, there can't be a plane near us for hundreds of miles. Oh, well, we better start looking for an opening to land in. Whatever it was. Wherever we are. It's beginning to clear down there. We've left the most tangled part of the jungle behind. Hmm. Oh, that's grass down there. Tall grass. Miles and miles of it. Take her down a little bit more, Kent. Here we go. Uh, you look around, too. For a good spot. Yeah, I am, Kent. I, I think if we... Wait a minute. We just want beautiful minute, Kent. Did... Do you see what I see? What? Down there. Uh, over to the left. The left? Oh, no. No, I don't believe it. It's not possible. I think I'm looking at one of the largest, most modern landing fields I've ever seen in my life. That runway is going to be seven, eight thousand feet long, minimum. All those modern buildings and the equipment. What are they doing here in the middle of nowhere? Where the devil are we? Well, there's only one way to find out, Kent. Switch on your radio. CM-5406. We're coming in for landing. Kindly instruct. Hmm. Well, that's nothing. Well, try it in Portuguese. Okay. Uh, CM-5406. 
approximando a requer permissao para puso. Favor insturme. Still nothing. There's only one other thing to do. Uh, start for your landing, Kent. If, if what we think we're looking at is real, no problem. You're thinking of what Carvalho told us. If we only think the landing field is there, still no problem. The landing will be a bit bumpy, and uh, like Professor Schneider, we'll be known as those two brilliant, those two inspiring, those two missing American anthropologists. Hmm. Fasten your seatbelt, Terry. Real tight. We know that travelers on the desert will sometimes see a lake stretched out before them where no water exists. Or a seaman will discover the inverted image of a ship in the middle of the ocean. These are what we call mirages. Scientists have explanations. Optical illusions. But for some of us, they seem to take on a cold basis in reality, like the airport Terry and Kent have just discovered. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Two American scientists are searching for an isolated tribe of South American Indians said to possess a unique power of creating a frightening atmosphere of magic and enchantment. In their small plane, flying over a virtually unexplored area of the Brazilian jungle, Kent and Terry suddenly find themselves headed toward a completely modern airport. They prepare for landing. Be sure your seatbelt is fastened tight, Terry. Beautiful landing, Kent. Real proud of you. I'll taxi up to that building over there on the right. Terry, you, you notice anything else uh, a little peculiar about this place? Other than the fact that it's here at all? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Huge, modern airport in the middle of the Brazilian jungle. One o'clock in the afternoon and not a soul, not a single solitary soul in sight. Could it be that this is the time for their siesta? Siesta? An airport? Can't even down here. There'd be somebody in the control tower, a mechanic on the field or near the runway, a baggage loader, somebody. This place is absolutely deserted. I don't get it, Terry. What do we do? <sighs> Only one thing to do. Get out of the airplane, investigate. There's got to be an explanation. Well, the main lobby must be through that gate over there. Well, then that is where we're headed, Kent. How many do you... Everything's so quiet. I don't hear a thing. Mm. Neither do I. Except our own footsteps. On a, a big airport like this, you'd expect to hear something. An occasional airplane, or in the jungle, certainly the cries of a tropical bird. Monkeys. Something. Absolutely nothing. That's not a sound. It's as if we... Like we were... Go ahead, Ken. Say it. Never mind. Through here to the lobby. Will you take a look at this? It makes every other airport in the world look sick. The ceiling must be ten stories high. One, two, three restaurants. A fancy bar? Oh, and that must be the main gate for arriving passengers. Uh, where? There. Don't you see? Oh. It's marked arrivals in over a dozen languages. Chigada, Arives, Ankumt, Iyigada. Uh, Kent, what's the word for departures in any language? I see what you mean. There is no departure gate. Hmm. It's quite a place. There's just about everything here that you could possibly ask for, except... Except people. No one. Absolutely no one. Hey... Here's something interesting. A kind of picture gallery. Yeah. Hundreds and hundreds of blown-up photographs, all neatly framed, covering the whole wall from ceiling to floor. Just heads. Who do you suppose they are? No idea. Oh, wait a minute. Here's a familiar face. Oh, I know him. That's, uh, that's an actor. A famous British actor, Matinee Idol. I see him every once in a while in an old movie on The Late Show. Yeah, he played Romeo in the first 
film they ever shot of Romeo and Juliet. Right. Disappeared over the Atlantic at the beginning of World War II. <laughs> You're too young to recognize this man. What, the old fellow? Yeah, a very well-known judge in New York City. Supreme Court, I think. Got mixed up in some kind of scandal. Disappeared overnight. Complete mystery. Oh, now, there's a familiar personality. I heard about her at flying school. Isn't that the uh, great lady aviator? Yeah, the one who was flying solo over the Pacific just before World War II. And who just seemed to vanish into the drink, plane and all? Never heard from again? That's the one. I am beginning to get a very strange message, Kent. Yeah, so am I. Look up there. All those pictures of people who must have lived years and years ago. In clothes of other times, other places. Every race on earth. All those people. They all have one thing in common. All of them are people who disappeared off the face of the earth. Mysteriously, without any credible explanation. But why are there pictures here? Spread out over the walls of this crazy airport. An airport at the end of the world. Don't you know, Kent? <gasps> Don't you know, Terry? Who, who's that? Whose voice is that? Oh, come now. An old friend of both of you. Who, where are you? I don't see anyone. No, of course not. Not yet. I I know that voice. I should hope so. It's Schneider. Professor Schneider. How could that be? Hans Schneider at your service, gentlemen. We hear you, but where are you? Oh, we talk about that later. What are you doing here? Better to ask what we are all doing here. Meanwhile, if you will please both to follow me this way, just follow the sound of my voice. Where are you taking us? Oh, trust me, please. Ah, forgive me. I am always still so absent-minded. I'm supposed to give you a message. Message? From Lilith. Who? Lilith. I am supposed to say, welcome to you both. We are delighted to have you with us. Us? Who is us? Just follow my voice. You shall soon see. We've been on this godforsaken bus for almost 20 minutes. It keeps on going without even a driver. And we're still no place. Now, you got to calm down, can't you? got to take it easy. There's never been anything like this. That voice, Schneider, or whoever it was, told us to get in. We did. Just the two of us into a waiting, empty bus. The bus takes off. Look, look, look over to the right. You see that? We've come to what seems to be some kind of city, a large settlement of some kind. Oh, so we have. All of it built around that, that tall building with the funny kind of double spire. Looks almost like a cathedral. We're slowing down. Last stop. Everybody out, I guess. I think that's what they're trying to tell us. What do you suppose that is? Well, we're about to find out. Look at that mob of people pouring out of the tall building. Hundreds and hundreds of them. Dressed in every conceivable fashion, every period of time. Like a gigantic fancy dress ball. They're all headed toward us. And none of them seems to be speaking. They're all of them absolutely silent. What do we do? I just stand where we are and see what happens. Can't. Look. Right in front. Leading the rest of them. Hans Schneider. Our Hans Schneider. But what's that immediately behind him? I don't know. Some sort of sedan chair. A closed-in platform carried by four men. What or who are they carrying? We are about to find out. Gentlemen, once again, I welcome you to our home. Home? What home? We're in Brazil, Professor Schneider, aren't we? We started out, same as you did, Professor, on a search for albino Indians. Indians of the Mato Grosso. I know, I know. But where are we? I mean, who are these people, and why are they all so silent? Oh, you Americans always so impatient. Oh, we thought you were dead. Well, obviously, as you can see, I am not. And these people, these people who say nothing... And well, here is one who speaks. She wishes to speak to you. They've raised the curtains on the sedan chair. Can you can you see who's sitting in it? Uh, looks like an old man. A very old man. I think it's a very old lady. Oh, you're right, Terry. 
She looks like one of those ancient Egyptian mummies. Her skin is like wrinkled parchment. She also looks very important. Terry, her lips are moving, but I don't hear anything. Quiet, Kent, please. Kent Floyd. She knows my name. Terry Bridgewater. And mine. We are honored by your presence, Snyder. You will please leave us. Oh, yes, 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 of course. We will do everything to make you comfortable. That's very kind of you. May we be permitted a few questions? Of course. Uh, we started out on an expedition to locate and study a rare tribe of South American Indians. And uh, instead you discover us. What happened? Where are we? Who are all of you? So many questions, all at once. This place to which you have come is the land of the missing, the land of the living dead. What? We are those who vanished into the thinnest air from the beginning of creation. We are the missing persons of all time. And this is where you all disappeared too? Yes, all of us. Well, in, in what part of the world are we? In all parts of the world. Every city, every town, every village... In the sky, on mountain tops, in flooded rivers, in the bowels of the earth, at the bottom of the sea. But how long do you all go on living? Forever. Forever? To the end of time. Perpetually. Infinitely. For all... Eternity? You think that is impossible. Not so. But how... Once a day, everyone here enters the temple. And silently we contemplate eternal values. Eternal life. And what do you do there? Conquer death. For us, you see, there is no death. We remain at the same age at which we vanished from the earth. Except for me, since I was the first. The first? I am Lilith. I was the first wife of Adam before there ever was an Eve. When Adam created Eve, there was no place for me. And so I somehow disappeared in a cloud of mystery. I see. Lilith, may I ask what the meaning is of that curious ornament you wear about your neck? This, this rough little figure of gold? Yes, it looks like a small figure eight, about half an inch long, lying on its side. It's very beautiful. Everyone here seems to have one. That is our mark, our symbol of eternity, of infinity... Of the endlessness of time. Gentlemen, I have grown tired. If you will excuse me, I must rest now. Terry, we've got to get out of this place, but fast. We've got to find our way back to our airplane. Well, how do we do that? I'm not sure, but we've got to try. I couldn't agree with you more. We've wandered into some kind of madhouse. I can't explain what's happening. Missing persons, people who have become immortal. Professor Schneider? Schneider is dead. He's got to be. Slowly, Kent. We've got to find our way out of here before we both become as crazy as they are. Oh, I am with you. Terry, Kent, you are not thinking of leaving. Uh, Professor Schneider... Well, Lilith asked me to give one of these to each of you. The little gold ornament. The horizontal figure eight. Our symbol of infinity, of eternity. Well, that's very kind of Lilith. But no thanks. We wouldn't have any use for them. Oh, but we all wear them. Now that you both have become part of us, so must you. Over 800 years ago, a Persian poet and mathematician, Omar Khayyam, wrote... There was the door, to which I found no key. There was the veil, through which I might not see. 
two anthropologists, in their effort to probe into some of the most ancient secrets of mankind, have come to a door to which, at the moment, they find no key. To a drawn curtain beyond which they cannot see. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. missing can be a terrifying word. Missing in action, for example, is a sad and all too familiar phrase. Almost every large city in the world has a bureau of missing persons whose task it is to try to unravel the often bewildering mystery of a human's disappearance. Kent Floyd and Terry Bridgewater are, at the moment, doing everything possible to find their way back into a world they know. We can stop running, Kent. Please, I, I... I don't think I can go much further. We've got to keep going, Terry. But nobody's following us. Nobody's even tried to prevent us from leaving. And did you stop to think why? Why they didn't try to stop us? Oh, at this point, does that matter? If only we could be sure we were headed in the right direction. I have a feeling that once we get past that clump of trees over there... Oh, yeah, Kent, you're right. There it is, the airport. Hey, I'm sitting right there. It's TM-5406. Our airplane. Oh, the place is just like when we landed. Not a soul in sight. Absolutely deserted. Now, let's get into that plane and fast. Uh, and out of this place forever. Oh, isn't that one of the most beautiful things you've ever seen in your life? Uh, here we are. In you go, Terry. Uh, right. Uh, and here we go. Well, nothing's been touched. Isn't that wonderful? Looks okay. Get her started, Kent. Well, I'll try it again. All right, let me let me check everything. Let's see now. Well, what's wrong? Why does that catch? They've done something with the engine. Oh, but what? That's what I'm trying to find out. Why doesn't this damn thing turn over? Oh, there we go. Thank heavens. Maybe we're both overreacting. Oh, maybe. And away we go. Away we go. <laughs> but where to? Any place. As long as it's away from here. Now, how's our supply of fuel? And what's our course? Oh, we've more than enough fuel to... What's the matter? The fuel gauge. It, it's not working. Well, what about the rest of the panel? Nothing. No, everything's dead. But even my watch has stopped. Yeah, mine too. What do we do? We keep going. As long as we can. Yeah, on what course? What direction? Well, we'll have to depend on our memory. And our good sense. I hope. Of navigation. And maybe, uh, pray a little? Oh, well, it can't hurt. But I have a feeling that tells me we're on course. Or very close to it. And if we're not? If we're not, Terry... Praying a little won't be quite enough. Not quite. Any sign yet of anything? My guess is we've been flying about an hour. We've got to come to something soon. Brazil's a big country. Hmm. Isn't that the truth? Terry, have you any explanation? Of what's been happening to us? My friend, it's beyond me. A modern airport in the middle of nothing. A strange city, stranger people, thousands of them. The missing persons of the entire world of all time. Calling themselves immortal. Where we were expecting to find Indians. What I can't understand is what's been happening to us. Our instruments not functioning. Our watches stopped. How? Why? You don't suppose that... Suppose what? Remember what Carvalho told us back in Cuyaba about the Broncos Indians? You mean about their strange power of enchantment that makes people see things that aren't really there? That's exactly what I mean. Wait, this is the 20th century. The idea of that kind of, of witchcraft or voodoo, call it what you like, was exploded years ago. We're educated men, and there just ain't no such thing. Uh, Still can't put what Schneider told us out of my mind. 
when he gave us those little gold figure eights to wear around our necks. Now that you both have become part of us, he said. So? Could it be possible that... That we... That we what? That we have become... A part of them? How could that be? Uh, uh, Kent. Look. Straight ahead. An airport. We're coming to an airport. It looks familiar. Are, are the instruments working? Not yet. But that could be uh, uh, Ribero uh, Preto or whatever it was called. Where we refueled on our way to Cuyaba. You're right. Oh, Kent, I don't know how you did it. You're some kind of genius. Whoa, get ready for landing. Oh, the way. Wait just a minute. What? What is it? That's not Ribero Preto down there. Look again. No. Oh, no. How on earth did we ever get here? We've been flying in a circle. We're back where we started from. That's their airport. Turn back, Kent. Turn the plane around. Don't trouble to try. <gasps> Professor Schneider. Of course. He's right. I can't turn it around. Gentlemen, gentlemen, where have you been? We all missed you. Again, only your voice. Just your voice. We can't see you. Does it matter? What do you want of us? I? I want nothing. But she would like to have a word with you. Both of you. She? Lilith. Our Lilith. Prepare to land. Lilith is not the kind of person you make wait. Why should you want to leave us? Tell Lilith why. Because we don't belong here. That's why. You don't? We have our lives to live. And if you don't mind, we prefer not to live them here. We're scientists. We have important work to do. Ah, the exact words I said when I first arrived. You must try to understand. Both of you. You remember when you were flying here... On your way from Cuyaba. Yes? You heard a strange sound. Like an explosion, like an airplane splintering, crashing into bits. What you heard was your own airplane plummeting to earth into the wilds of the jungles of Brazil. What? Neither it nor either of you will ever be heard from again. So relax, both of you. Don't waste your time trying to leave us. Your life is here forever. We can't accept that. You will, my friend. Gentlemen, the time has come. Time for what? For your first experience in contemplation. Contemplation of eternal values, of eternal life. Now, if you will both breathe deeply, deeply, and try to believe, believe. Terry, what's happening? Look at those mobs of people coming out of the temple. Hundreds of them. And once they come out and take their places, none of them moves. They just stand there like so many stone statues, grinning at us with faces that look like masks. And look, Terry, their clothes. Their, their clothes are starting to disappear. They're almost all of them naked. And their bodies, they're changing too. They're becoming Indians. Albino Indians. The Broncos we started out to find. And Schneider. Look at Schneider. He's trying to get our attention. He's holding something in either hand. They look like... Uh, no. What are they? They're... Dead human heads, Terry. Shrunk down to the size of an apple. He's holding them by the hair. How horrible. What their ancestors... The Hivaros did to unfriendly neighbors. 
Look at those two faces, Terry. One of those heads is mine. And the other is mine. We've got to get out of here. Snyder, get us out of here. Get us out! Oh, I never thought we'd make it. Why do you suppose Schneider let us escape? Maybe he felt sorry for us. Maybe he knew that our lives and our sanity depended on it. Who knows? But something did give us that extra boost of adrenaline we needed. The main thing now, Terry, is that... Terry. What? What is it? How long would you guess we've been in the air? Well, let's see. It's a uh, uh, quarter past... Kent. My watch is going again. So is mine. And look at the instrument panel. Yeah. Everything's working. I'm going to try the radio. CM 5406 calling. Calling anyone, anywhere. Radio and instruments have not been functioning. Come in, anyone. We request our position. Over. PM 5406. PM 5406. Oh, isn't that beautiful? You are 12.6 nautical miles south of west of Cayo Airport. Cayo. That's the control tower in Rio de Janeiro. We're approaching Rio. Runway 4 is clear. Please use runway 4. Thank you. Roger. Terry, look. There's Sugarloaf over on our left. And Guanabara Bay. And there's the Christ of the Andes. Terry, we're back. Back in Rio. Alive. And in one piece. <laughs> That tall, rangy-looking gal, the, the one with the close-cropped sandy hair, she's coming toward us. The one with the slacks and a white open-neck shirt? Hmm. She looks familiar. What is she one of us? Well, I guess we're about to find out. Terry Bridgewater? Uh, yes. Kent Floyd? That's me. I was sent here to the airport to meet you. Well, how do you do? Hello. Uh, may we know who sent you? We were beginning to worry about you. You were? Uh, why is that? Who are we? Yeah, who are you, miss? Um... And how do you know us? Why should you meet our airplane? Oh, so many questions all at once. I'm glad to see you're both wearing that little gold figure eight. How do you know about that? I've been wearing mine for a long time. See? I... I know your face. Just who are you? Haven't I seen your picture someplace before? That's quite possible. Who are you? My name is Amelia. Amelia? Not the one who disappeared over the South Pacific in her own plane? In 1937. Great mystery. No one's ever explained it. Well, then what are you doing here? Isn't this Rio? It's any place you want it to be. Rio, Hong Kong, Cairo, the middle of the Brazilian jungle, Detroit. Any place. We're all of us. Among the missing. We're all of us in the land of the living dead. Please, follow me. So, like many another scientist who sacrificed his own life in the attempt to increase knowledge, Kent Floyd and Terry Bridgewater seem to have passed into the strange world of missing persons. The world which William Shakespeare in Hamlet described as the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. I, however, shall be back shortly. When someone mysteriously disappears from the earth with no explanation, where have they disappeared to? One thing we can be sure of, at least two people, Terry and Kent, know without question what happened to Amelia when her plane vanished over the South Pacific back in 1937. And, of course, Amelia knows what really happened to Terry and Kent as they disappeared over the jungles of Brazil. Our cast included Don Scardino, Russell Horton, Arnold Moss, and Carol Titel. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. <laughs> And now, a preview of our next tale. I don't understand, Mother. Do it the way these things are done ordinarily, everywhere. The expected way. 
the usual way. Are you saying I should subject these men to torture? I'm saying you have to find the thief. That is not the kind of justice my people have come to expect from me. Who's to know how it was done? Let me suggest a way. Let us conveniently discover a sack. It will contain Joseph's hundred gold pieces, Abiel's two hundred silver coins, and Benjamin's ten diamonds. Mother. Choose the one who pleases you least. He will be the thief. Punish him as you see fit. The other two will be satisfied. The mob will have its judgment. The throne will be safe again. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The New International Dictionary has this to say under the heading of cat. The cat is a carnivorous mammal which has long been kept by man in a domestic state. It appears to have originated in Egypt and is probably derived from one of the wild species of North Africa known as the Kaffir cat. So much for the bare and basic facts about the cat. But before this hour has passed, you are destined to learn more. Much more. I promise you. You... You ever felt like you were, you were about to go crazy? I can't say I have, Dad. Uh, what's it like? It's uh, it's like standing in front of a closed door and not knowing what's on the other side and wanting to know and 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 being scared to find out be, because what's on the other side can save you or or kill you. <laughs> mystery drama, The Therapeutic Cat, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Perrick and stars Fred Gwynn. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The dictionary goes on to say about the cat, most of the breeds, as the Maltese, the tortoiseshell, the tabby, etc., differ from each other only in color or other characteristics of slight importance. So says the dictionary. But you are about to encounter a cat who differs in a most significant way. And that difference gives our play its title, The Therapeutic Cat. Let me tell you about myself. My name is Henry Joyce. I'm 59 and a half years old. I have a lot of money, which I accumulated by my own efforts. I live in a big old house on the edge of town. The very house I moved into after I married the mayor's daughter. The, the same house where our son Jack was born. Now, Jack grew into a splendid boy. We sent him to the same college I'd attended. Then, uh, when he was through college, he came back and went into business. My business. He did very well. And now he's president of the company. Came up the hard way. 
learned the ropes, and is doing a fine job. So it was only natural that the first person I should think of was Jack. Sit down, Dad. Yeah, right there. Yeah, that's it. A cigar? Uh, no, uh, uh, giving them up? Uh, they don't taste good anymore. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, uh, f- uh, food doesn't taste good and good anymore either. Daddy, are you all right? I mean, you're not sick or something, are you? Uh, I'm not uh, sick, but I'm something. Like what? Uh, like something. Huh. Well, what does the doctor say? Uh, he says I'm tense. <laughs> I I could have told him that. Well, what did he say to do about it? Golf. Hey, now, that's a good idea. Golf's a good game. Uh, I tried it. No good, huh? Terrible. Made me tenser than I was before. Uh, Jack, you ever feel like you're going crazy? Crazy? You mean like insane, that kind of crazy? <laughs> no, I can't say I have. Well, that's how I feel. Oh, do you think... You think maybe it's mom, huh? Maybe you still miss her? Oh, no. no. Uh, well, your mother died five years ago. Well, you ever think of getting married again? Uh, that, uh, Jack, I'm not going to try. It was all right when I was young, and and then you came along, and I and I had the business to run. It was, it was good being married then, but no, no, not now. Jack, uh, uh, could you? See your way to taking me back in here. Here? In, in the office? Or, or, or at the plant. Uh, uh, any place. Dad, you're chairman of the board. So? So what's that? Chairman of the board? No, no, Jack. I mean a job. Something to do. Something to put my mind to. So I'll stop thinking about myself. Jack, I... I, I I'm going to jump out of my skin. That's how I feel. I, I'm, I'm, I'm all wrought up. I, 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 I can't sleep or, or anything. Dad, do you ever think of joining a gym? Yeah. You, you can't give me a job here. Is, is that what you're trying to tell me? I'll, I'll give it a lot of thought, Dad. I, I really will. Uh, maybe I'll come up with something. Mrs. Bingham. Oh, yes, Mr. Joyce. Well, what's the trouble? Uh, Mrs. Bingham, these eggs are not four minutes. Oh, yes, they are, Mr. Joyce. I timed them. Uh, uh, look at that. The white's all runny. I timed them. I, I can't stand a runny white. Take them away. You, you want me to make you some new ones? Never mind. Never mind. I, I couldn't taste them anyway. Oh. Uh, now, uh, Mrs. Bingham, uh, don't cry. Please. It's nothing to cry about. Well, I know how you like your eggs, and I thought I thought I timed them. I always time them. I, I don't know what went wrong. It's all right, it's all right, it's all right. Don't cry about it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to lose my temper. Oh. For Pete's sake, Mrs. Bingham, don't cry. That that just makes things worse. Don't you understand that? Oh, Mr. Joyce, I, I know you've been unhappy lately. After all, living in the same house with you, I, I noticed these things. Uh, well, it's not exactly that I'm unhappy. Well, it's something. Uh, well, <laughs> that's what I told my Jack, uh, my son. It's it's something, I told him. I try to read books or even the newspaper, and the, the words all run together. They all get jumbled up, and the words go spinning around in my head. Oh, Mr. Joyce. Oh, Mrs. Bingham, I'm finished. I'm I'm all washed up. Uh, Mr. Joyce, I, I I have to tell you something. I, I even asked Jack for a job. <laughs> that was two weeks ago. He said he'd try to think of something, but but I knew he wouldn't. He couldn't. And he has Well, that's what I wanted to tell you. Jack's coming over here to see you. He is? Uh, he's stopping by on his way to the office. How do you know that? I... I called him. I was so worried, Mr. Joyce. If you... Uh, if you called him, that, 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 that doesn't mean he's found something for me to do. Well, it might. No, 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 no. No, no, if that was it, he'd have called me. Well, he did say on the phone that he had something he wanted to talk to you about. He did? Yes, yes, he did, Mr. Joyce. Said he hoped you'd be interested. Oh, there he is now. Now, you finish your coffee, and I'll let him in. Head of sales. That could be it. Or, 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 or labor relations. I, oh, I'd be good at that. Oh, heck, I'd be good at anything. I mean, it's my business. I started it. I build it up. Merchandising, market research. I know more. 
Backwards and forwards. Hello, Dad. Oh. Uh, ah. Dear. Uh, sorry. Uh, coffee cup jumped right out of my hand. Oh, did, did you burn yourself? Uh, that's all right. Hey, I startled you. Uh, that's it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. I'll get a rag and clean it up. And I'll, I'll bring you some fresh. Uh, uh, Jack, uh, sit down. Sit down. Are you sure you're all right, Dad? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. I'm always dropping things. <laughs> uh, sit down. Uh, now, Jack, uh, tell me, uh, M- Mrs. Bingham said you'd come up with something. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what was it? Merchandising, market research? No, stuff? no, uh, not those. Uh, uh, labor relations. I could, oh, I could do a job there. Dad, it's not with the firm. Not with the firm. Uh, Jack, what else do I know? Oh, oh. Uh, if, if it's not with the firm, come on, Jack. What do I know? Dad, I, I was talking with a friend of mine, and we got to discussing, you know, things in general, problems, and uh, turns out his father found himself in the same position as you. A retired widower, very uptight. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, go on. Well, he went to his doctor, uh, this guy's father did, and the doctor came up with something. What? And it worked. Inside a month, it worked. Uh, uh, what worked? A cat. What? A cat. Uh, you trying to be funny, Jack? No, honestly, Daddy says it worked for his father, and he thinks it would work for you. Uh, a cat. I, I should, I should get a cat. No, 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 Dad. Not just get a cat. I mean, after you got the cat, you have to spend time with it, and... Spend time with a cat. Uh, uh, Jack... What the devil for? Well, you have to follow the cat around, observe it. Whatever the cat does, uh, you do. Now, the point is, Dad, the cat is the most relaxed animal in the world. And if you imitate the cat and get the hang of it, why then... Jack, Jack, uh, Jack, get out of my house. And uh, Dad, Jack, don't I, get... I thought you came here to offer me a job, a, 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 a good, respectable job. Dad, I'm sorry. It's if... something I could sink my teeth there in. There isn't anything. And you tell me to get a cat and follow it around. Jack, get out of here. Dad, I only meant that... Get out of here. Get out of here. You and your crummy uh, Yeah, I'll, I'll call you, Dad. Don't bother, Jack. Don't call. Don't come back. Don't do anything. Just, just, just stay away and don't have any more ideas. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dad. A cat. <laughs> A cat. Holy Moses. My own son. A blithering idiot. I I began to worry about the business and if he could run it. I I waited for the business to go on the rocks and and I added that to all the other terrible things I expected to happen. I I started to worry about money, though I knew perfectly well I had plenty. I worried about getting to sleep, so I didn't get to sleep. I I worried about eating, so I didn't eat. I worried about going mad, and the more I worried, the more convinced I was that I was not long for this world. Hello? This is Henry Joyce. Yes? What about it? Really? Uh, you mean it? Yeah. Well, yeah, 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 send it back. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm really very sorry. Oh, you got the phone, did you, Mr. Joyce? Yeah, it was the butcher. I, uh, I forgot to sign his check. Oh, well, that's easily mended. Uh, before him, the grocer phoned. I forgot to sign his check, too. And before that, the phone company and the... And the gas and electric. The insurance company, too. Oh, did they call him? Well, you sent them the check for the mortgage payment, and the mortgage company called and said... They got the insurance check. Uh, did I sign either of them? Uh, no, sir. And you got the date wrong. Uh, month or year? Both. I see. Uh, Mrs. Bingham. Yes? Uh, do, uh, do you know where I could get a cat? You, you said a, a cat? Yes, a a cat. Oh, well, yeah. I, I suppose you could go to a store, a, a, a pet shop, and, and buy a cat. Yeah, yeah, I suppose I could. Oh, there are lots of strays. You you could adopt one. Yeah, adopt one, yeah. Or, yes, uh, oh, 
I tell you what, my daughter Denise, she has cats. She does? Oh, lots of them. She takes them in when people don't want them anymore. She picks them up on the street and tries to find homes for them. You... You think she'd let me have one? Oh, she'd let you have a dozen. Oh, no, 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 no. Just one will be enough. Uh, one cat. You know the old adage, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. I'm sure it's true. But when it comes to cats, do you think they can be flattered? I don't. For everything about a cat suggests such utter indifference that flattery seems not only superfluous, but positively silly. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Henry Joyce, 59 and a half years old, widowered and retired found himself on the dizzy verge of a nervous breakdown. His son, Jack, suggested that his father procure a cat to study the cat and ape its movements. Henry turned to his housekeeper, Jane Bingham, and asked if she could get a cat. Jane told him that her daughter, Denise, had a number of cats and would be happy to supply him with one. Uh, About a week later, the cat arrived. It was a black and white cat. A rather large cat with greenish-yellow eyes and a calculating look. The cat was here to be studied and imitated. That I proceeded to do. It took me two weeks to master the stretch. On all fours, watching the cat closely, I would push backwards on my haunches, digging my hands in the carpet and stretching my arms to their fullest extent. Then, rhythmically forward, the legs extended backwards from the hip sockets. Uh, uh, Lovely feeling. Marvelous sensation. Uh, Out in the garden, when the cat sharpened her claws on a tree or a post, I arched my back to its fullest the way she did, and drew my nails heavily down the wood, putting my full weight into the effort. I felt my ribs expand and the muscles of my belly Titan. Oh, wonderful feeling. Delicious sensation. I started to feel superb. Mr. Joyce? Yes, Miss Bingham. Oh, you've been out already? I took the cat for a walk in the garden. Oh. You know what she did, Miss Bingham. She she reached for a flower, uh, a gladiolus, it was. It, 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 it was just a little too high for her, but she stretched and she stretched. And, well, she never did get it, but she touched it. So, I started reaching for the lowest branch on that fir tree. Uh, You know the one. Mm -hmm. And I reached, and I reached, and I never quite touched it. But, oh, Mrs. Bingham, what it does for the muscles down your side, uh, 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 right next to your ribs. It feels good, does it? Perfectly marvelous. (laughs) Uh, You know, the cat was talking of butterfly. Day, and I was right behind her, and I watched the way she picked up her front feet. Absolutely amazing. She holds each foot up before she puts it down on the ground. She lets it hang limp from the elbow. Then, when she puts it down, it's so cautious, so deliberate. Uh, uh, no hurry, no rush, just care and all concentration. Well, we stalked that butterfly for 20 minutes. <laughs> You know something, Mr. Joyce. You're starting to feel better. You you notice that. Uh, Miss Bingham, I took off a few pounds and I started to tighten up. Oh. Uh, around the waist and other places. Miss Bingham, I am going to have to get all new suits. I ordered six of them. Was my tailor ever surprised? I, <laughs> I had all new measurements. I was actually taller. Can you imagine that? All because of that cat. I was sleeping now the whole night through and cat naps during the day. <laughs> That's right. Cat naps. You know, you want to feel really super. 
you take a lot of cat naps. Just lie down and think of something pleasant. You know, you wake up feeling ten years younger. I kid you not. Miss Bingham. Uh, yes, Mr. Joyce. Uh, will you come in here, please? I'd like to speak with you. Oh, is something wrong with dinner, Mr. Joyce? Uh, <laughs> the uh, cat doesn't care too much for the pot roast, Miss Bingham. Uh, 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 she'll eat it, of course, if I leave off the gravy. Uh, Mr. Joyce, I... I give her proper cat food in the kitchen. I don't think she should eat in the kitchen anymore, Miss Bingham. I think she should eat in here with me. And uh, here's what we'll have to eat. Uh, lobster, crab, sardines, white meat of chicken, filet of sole, and caviar. Caviar? Well, she's never had it, but I, I think she'll like it. Mr. Joyce, you're, you're spoiling that cat. Uh, Mrs. Bingham... <laughs> That cat is my guru. Uh, that cat is my priest, my psychiatrist. She's my idol, my goddess. Oh, all, all that I am or hope to be, I owe to this sainted cat. Are, are you falling in love with that animal? Uh, it's possible. It's, it's perfectly possible. Oh. You see, she's made me young again, handsome again, happy again. No woman ever did that for me, Miss Bingham. So why shouldn't I be in love with her? Well, uh, does your son know about this? No, I haven't had time to tell him. But I shall. After all, if it weren't for Jack, none of this would have happened. It was all his idea, and I would like to tell him how grateful I am. Also, I want to talk to him about changing my will. Come in. Dad, long time no see. Hey, you look wonderful, Dad. Hey, is that a new suit? Yep. Good looking. Uh, what's, what's that you, you got around your neck? Uh, my cat. Y your, your cat? Good Lord, it is a cat. Wow. Well, well, what do you know? <laughs> uh, you uh, always carry a cat around with you like that? Slung around your shoulders? Uh, she likes it. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, I, I like it. Well, <laughs> sit down, Dad. Mm. So, you took my advice, eh? Uh, bought a cat. Jane Bingham's, uh, daughter sent it over. Seems she has a house full of them. Well, looks like the prescription worked. Oh, Jack, it did. It did. And I'm eternally grateful to you, son. Oh, I know how I poo-poo the idea at first, but, well, as you can see... <laughs> It worked. I've never seen you looking so well. Jack, I've never felt so well. All due to my little, my little friend here. <coughs> now, uh, now, Jack, I want to see that she's provided for, uh, in case anything should happen to me. Oh, nothing's going to happen to you, Dad. Oh, you never know. So, uh, Jack, I would like you to set up a trust fund for her. Well, uh, what, what size trust fund did you have in mind? Uh, substantial, Jack. Substantial. She's accustomed to the best of everything. Uh, yes, I, uh, I can see that. <laughs> she, she looks great. Uh, well, what's her name? I, uh, never gave her a name. Oh. It didn't seem necessary. We, uh, we communicate by other means. Oh, what do you mean by that? Well, there's a, uh, spiritual affinity, uh, between my cat and me. Uh, Jack, uh, I would like you to sign an ironclad agreement uh, to care for this cat so long as she shall live. Uh, will you do that? I, uh, I, I don't know, Dad. Uh, otherwise, Jack... Uh, maybe I'm allergic to cats. How do I know? Maybe one of the kids is allergic. Who can tell? Uh, allergy or no, this cat's got to be taken care of. And I mean well taken care of. Uh, will you do it? Well, I ought to talk it over with Mark. Otherwise, Jack. All right, Dad. All right, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. Wow. It's mackerel, darling. Wow. Don't you care for it? Oh, I know it's not Dover soap, but we had that last night. Trouble with you is you ate too much of that pate de foie gras before dinner, didn't you now? Yes, you did. 
Miss Bingham, you can clear the table. Are you all finished? Both of you? Yes. Uh, what have you got there, Miss Bingham? Uh, it's the pillow you wanted. Uh, for her. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, I think she'll like satin, don't you? Uh, Maybe linen would have been better, but the pink satin is very nice. Uh, what do you think, my love? Oh, uh, well, we can always change it. Uh, just take it upstairs and put it on my bed, will you, Miss Bingham? Uh, whereabouts, sir? Head or foot? Well, she's used to sleeping on my pillow, but uh, when I turn over during the night, it disturbs her, so uh, put it alongside mine. Ah. Uh, the side away from the window, I don't want her sleeping in a draft. Yes, Mr. Joyce. Oh, oh, that's Jack. He's, he said he stopped by. Well, I'll let him in. On my way upstairs. Thank you. Now, now, love, how about finishing the cream in the cream pitcher, huh? Ah. You want me to pour it into the saucer for you, darling? Hey, maybe that would be better. Hey, evening, Dad. Oh, hello, Jack. How's the cat? Uh, she's hardly touched her dinner, but uh, generally speaking, she's fi just just fine. Uh, Dad, I, I brought over your copy of the agreement. Oh, fine, fine. Just put it down there, will you? Until uh, she finishes her cream. Everything's set, Mr. Joyce. I, I put the pillow on the right-hand side of the bed next to yours. Oh, thank you, Miss Bingham. <laughs> Uh, Jack, would you excuse me for a minute? I'm going to take this sleepy little thing up to bed. <laughs> uh, be back in a minute. As I carried my wonderful cat upstairs, I could hear Miss Bingham and Jack talking in horrified low tones. <gasps> pillow? What pillow? For that animal, pink satin, on his bed, next to his pillow. That is incredible. Mrs. Bingham, hmm? do you know what this piece of paper is? It's an agreement I've signed to take care of that cat in case anything happens to him. I smiled to myself. <laughs> Poor ignorant people. To them, a cat was just a cat. To me, a cat was... Well, well at least this cat was the sun and the moon and the stars. The breath of life. The joy of living. My heart was beating fast. I dared not switch on the light for fear of disturbing my sleeping angel. I I felt my way to the bed and quietly put my darling down on her new pillow. Carefully, I lay down beside her. My voice was gentle when I spoke. Sleeping, my love? Ah, oh, is that you? Henry? What? What? Oh, I've been waiting for you. Who are you? What are you doing here? Mm, I love my pink pillow. How, 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 how did you get in here? You put me here yourself, my dear. I, I never... What, what kind of a game are you trying to pull on me? It's not a game. Or if it is, it's the best game of all. Listen, oh, 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 where, where's my cat? What have you done with my cat? Mm, I'm your cat. You're nothing of the sort. You, who, who are you? My name's Denise. But you may call me Denny if you like. Denny? Denise? Denise, why, why you're Mrs. Bickham's daughter. Yes, I am. Oh, she let you in here. When she brought the pillow upstairs, she let you in. Oh, I was here a long time before that. Well, I never saw you. Hmm. You hardly saw anyone but me. Oh, you learned how to stretch so beautifully, my sweet. And to reach. And your walk is improving a lot. And I know how hard it is on only two legs. What are you talking about? What are you saying? If... If... If, if you are my cat, if you were my cat, then, then, then what do you know? What I always was, dear Henry, a witch. Margaret Elmore, Mother Shipton, Rachel Pinder, the Duchess of Bedford. 
What do all these ladies have in common? All were thought to be witches. Oh, yes. Add to that list frizzle hair, finger of white John's daughter, and great blue eye from Moy. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Henry Joyce thought that his every dream of love had come true when a piebald cat came into his life. But in his bedroom, when he prepared to lie down beside his unlikely paramour, he was welcomed not by the familiar meow, but by a distinctly human female voice. The voice said to him that she was Denise, daughter of his housekeeper, and that she had been all along his beloved cat. If, uh, if you were my cat, if, if you're no longer my cat, then what are you? What I have always been, a witch. Stay right where you are. I, I'm going to turn on the light. Good Lord. Good. Good Lord. What did you expect? A toothless old hag. You're so young, so beautiful. You don't know much about witches, do you, Henry? Uh, I don't believe in witches, and 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 even if I did, I, w- I wouldn't believe a witch could turn herself into a cat and, and 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 back again. Oh, what about the mackerel for dinner? Uh, what about the pate de foie gras before dinner? Well, well, you you must have been in the kitchen with your mother. You. You heard me talking to the cat. I was the cat. I am the cat. I can be the cat again any time I feel like it. No, 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 no. No, uh, uh, Your mother must have told you about the uh, the cat and me. My mother doesn't even know I'm here. Your mother doesn't know you can be a cat? There. See? You're beginning to believe me. Then... Then your mother's not a... Uh... Not a... A witch... Mother is a white witch. White witches only do good things. I'm a black witch. You do uh, bad things. If I wanted to, I, I could be a gray witch. Then sometimes I'd do good things and sometimes I'd do bad things. Depending on how I felt at the time. I'd be a gray witch for you, Henry. Would you like that? I don't uh, know. I I just wish. What do you wish, Henry? No, I, I I I I wish I had my cat back, just the way she was. Oh, I couldn't stand being a cat any longer. I loved you too much. Why did you have to change us now? Because it's time. Time. Time for what? Listen. Be quiet and listen. Hear it? I hear the wind. Must must be a storm coming up. The wind is from the east. Does that mean something special? Oh, when it blows like that, it means tonight is the night of the Sabbath general. What's the Sabbath general? Rest your sweet head on my shoulder, and I'll tell you all about it. Comfy? On a desolate mountaintop in the center of France. Witches from all over the world will meet tonight. They'll fly in from South America, from Africa, from the Orient, from Siberia, from Melamasia. They, 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 they fly to France? To the Cévennes Mountains, my love. Vast, cold, deserted. You fly there? On broomsticks, Mostly? Mostly. For every witch, there is a mortal man. For the dancing, you know. And after Monsieur arrives... Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, 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 who is Monsieur? The devil, darling. Then what? Then we all tell our tale. <gasps> One at a time, we tell everything we've accomplished since the last Sabbath, General. Oh, I'll have a fine old time. Telling them how I moved in here and made you fall in love with me. 
Oh, the devil will be so pleased. You will? I don't think I'll tell him that I fell in love with you. Oh, I don't think that would please him at all. I think it would make him very angry. After you've uh, told your tales, then you dance. Oh, but first comes the ceremony. But I can't tell you about it. Would you like to see it for yourself, Henry? Me? It's no trouble at all. For every witch, there is one mortal man. Well, I don't... I don't... I don't know. This has all been quite a shock. I I have to think. I, I, uh, I need to be alone, Denny. All right. I'll go downstairs. <laughs> and talk to Mother. But don't take too long to decide. The wind is rising. I lay there and stared at the ceiling. I was in a sweat. Everything had changed. So suddenly, so drastically, so peculiarly. I arose from the bed and started down the stairs. But at the foot, I, I paused. I heard voices. You and your filthy, dirty tricks. How could I ever have brought you into this house if I had known? Mother, I love him. Love. What do you know about love? True. I didn't love him at first. You wanted his money. Yes, I wanted his money. And I thought what a good, dirty trick it would be to tell the devil at the Sabbath general. Oh, how he'd laugh. I told you a thousand times to stay away from those places. But when I got here, he was so good. So kind, so sweet. What do you know about goodness and kindness and sweetness? I learned from him, Mother. You think only white witches can understand things like that? And besides, oh, he's so attractive. You don't know the meaning of love, Denise. I do. I do now, Mother. I even offered to become a gray witch for him. What do you think of that? You couldn't be a gray witch. There isn't an ounce of goodness in you. There could be. I tried so hard for him I could change. For him I could do anything. Denise, I forbid you. Stay away from that man. I can't. I love him too much. You'll ruin him. My mother... Mother, you're in love with him yourself. Oh, you're an impertinent young woman. Of course. Why didn't I see it before? The way you look at him. The way you wait on oh, him. Oh, that's my job. Oh, you must have been jealous of me all these weeks. Jealous of a poor little piebald cat mewing around the house. You had to cook fish for me, didn't you? And you hate fish. Stop it. Stop it, Denise. Oh, how you must have hated me, Mother. You must have wanted to scratch my eyes out. If only I had. You do love him. Yes. Yes, I love him. I love him with all my heart. You should have seen him when I told him about the Sabbath general. I could turn into a gray witch. If you can do it, I can do it. You'd do anything, wouldn't you? Any dirty trick in the book. Anything to get your claws into him. Yes. Yes, I would. Anything. But you can't have him. He's mine. No, he's not. He's mine. He's not. He's mine. I was appalled. Well, absolutely appalled. Standing there in the, the hallway, clutching the pink pillow on my arm, I, I, I thought of rushing in and trying to stop them, for I was afraid they might harm each other. But I, I'd never heard such ferocity before. But... Then, of course, I, I'd never heard two witches talking before, and frankly, I was not sure of what they might do to me. In, in my confusion and my bewilderment, I reached for the telephone and called my son at, at his home. I told him it was imperative that I see him right away, and he said to come right over. Oh, come in, Dad. Oh, thank you, son. Where's your cat? What? You always wear your cat around your neck. Uh, there's no more cat, Jack. Something happened to the cat? Uh, the, Jack, the, the cat is Mrs. Bingham's daughter. How's that? She's a witch. <laughs> uh, come on into the living room, Dad. I'll get you a brandy. Uh, now, you just sit down there. Well, you, uh, you know... When you were at the house, you 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 brought that paper over. Uh, yeah. And I went up uh, upstairs. Well, Jack, there was a woman in my bed. Uh, 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 no cat. 
a, a young woman. Here's your brandy, Dan. I, I, I guess you're surprised uh, to hear this. I, I, I know I was surprised. I can imagine. Jack, it seems that all along, my cat was Denise Bingham. Uh, 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 Denny for short. Jack, you remember I told you the cat came from Mrs. Bingham's daughter's house originally. Drink your brandy, Dad. Well, at first, I didn't believe her when she said she was a witch and could turn herself into a cat and back again. But, you know, then I... I started to listen to her, and oh, she she has a lovely voice, uh, and, and it all started to sound somehow credible. Mm-hmm. Uh, Denny, uh, uh, Denise says she could make me a wizard. You see, for every witch, there's a mortal man. She, she could take me, Jack, with her uh, to the Sabbath general. But uh, it has to be tonight. I don't think you should go anywhere tonight, Dad. I told her I, 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 I would think about it. I think you should stay here with us tonight. But the, but the wind is rising. Come on, Dad. Let me take you upstairs. The guest room is empty. Wait a minute. Wait, Jack. I have to tell you what happened next. You mean there's more? Denise went downstairs to talk to her mother. Her mother's a white witch, uh, by the way. Uh-huh. And after a while, I went downstairs, too. Jack, I heard them talking, uh, arguing, uh, act, fighting. Act, actually, Jack, do you know what they were fighting about? Uh, no, I don't. Me. Me. They were fighting about me. Two women, both witches, fighting about who loved me the best. Jack, two beautiful women fighting over me. I couldn't believe it. That's that's why I called you. Well, I'm glad you did, Dad. Now, uh, let me take you upstairs and get you into bed. But, Jack, Jack, you... Listen to me. What should I do about them? The, the, the two women? I think you should get rid of them both. You do? Uh, both of them? Both of them. Well, you could be right. Sure I am. Now let's go upstairs. I lay in bed and I wondered. It would have been nice to go to the Sabbath General, but just before I dropped off to sleep, I remember thinking, maybe I'll get married again. But then I thought, before I do anything, I'll get me another cat. The witch was born at the same point in time as the imagination of man. The Christian witch descended from the Jewish witch. And before that, there were the great witch families of ancient Greece and Rome. Consider these. Hecate, Circe, Medea, and Pyramid of the Golden Hair. Really? By this time, we should be used to them. I'll be back shortly. Can your cat shed her feline shape at will? And become a witch? There's no use asking her. She won't tell you. But if I were you, I'd watch her very, very carefully. Particularly on nights when the wind is rising in the east. Our cast included Fred Gwynn, Paul Hecht, Bryna Rayburn, and Jada Rowland. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant
The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. This is a story about a phenomenon of our times about a world which Hamlet seemed to describe to the players, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold, as twere, the mirror up to nature. This is a story about a world as mad and ridiculous, as sad and as untidy as the one that most of us have to live in. A story of confusion of identities in which fancy becomes reality and vice versa. You must judge where truth begins and illusion ends. You cheap, conniving crook. You killed my dad. Timmy! Stay out of this, Marsha. No, brother. You asked for this, Timmy? No, stop it. Both of you, stop it. Not on a bet, mother. I've just been waiting for a chance to knock his head off. You're not old enough yet to manage that boy. No! Oh. 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 Brock. What have you done? Our mystery drama, A Tale of Two Worlds, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Bob Caliban. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Exlax. I'll be back shortly with Act One. How far have we come from the jungle? Not so very far when you consider all the unreasoning things most of us are prey to. Fear of heights, of crowded places, superstitions, envy and her darker sister, jealousy. Most of all, anger. For when rage suddenly explodes inside any of us, no matter how secure our worlds, if the fire burns strong enough, It can hurtle us out of the safe orbit of our own world and back to the savage jungle. For example... I just don't think I can believe my ears, Marsha. Oh, Brock, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. What can I say? He's... he's, After all, he's my son. And what am I? You know what you are to me, Brock. Well, I thought I did. All I'm asking for is, is, is time before... Oh, Brock, is it too much to ask? Time is too precious to me. I'm not going to let this little twerp of a boy still wet behind the ears stand in my way, in our way. Please, Brock. You've got to understand Timmy's point of view. Why? Because he has some rights. A 20-year-old boy? Whose father has only been dead a little over a year. A father he would worship. A man who would have ended up in jail for going to the public truck once too often. (sighs) And the last time without sufficient legal excuse. Well, you represented him. I was his lawyer because... Because I was in love with you, and I I didn't want you to be hurt. But he was convicted just the same. Because he was guilty. Well, Timmy doesn't think so. Oh, Timmy. Brock, please. Timmy, that wishy-washy, childish, diminutive of a name. It's the whole trouble. Why not Tim? Or even Timothy. It's his name. And I think of what that sniveling little toady is doing to bar us from the happiness we both have missed all our lives. I tell you, Marsha, son of yours or not, I could kill him with my bare hands. I... I Marsha, I tell you, I... Oh, I, I'm sorry. Timmy, I didn't expect you home so soon. You know I don't dig the country club scene, Mom. <laughs> well, don't I even get a hello kiss? And what about Mr. Chalmers? Am I supposed to kiss him now, too? Oh. Now, what's that supposed to mean? Oh, Brock, Tim, now, then, please. You can stay out of this, Mother. Don't talk to me that way. No, no, I'd advise you to listen, Marsha. Why? Because you're planning to make her a September bride? Oh. Why, you insufferable No, Brock, please, please. Go ahead, Mom. Let him take a swing at me. I can handle him. Did I ask you to? I don't care if you did. Someone's got to, for Dad's sake. Doesn't anyone care about him anymore? Why should we? He ruined your mother's life as a common criminal, and the only decent thing he did was to take his life. Brock! I'll never believe that. 
Just as I know, Dad never did one dishonest thing in his life. You know who really stole all that money. You. Me? Sure. The wheel within the wheel. The big high mucky muck. Dad was the only honest mayor this town ever had. And the rest of you crooks had to crucify him to cover yourself. I don't know what you're trying to say. I'm not trying. I said it. I don't know how my mother can even look at you. Because you killed my father. All right, that's as much as I'll take. The only way you'll ever stop me is to murder me, too. Timmy. No, leave him alone. It's time we had this out. You killed my dad. Timmy. That's the last time you're going to try to hang that accusation on me, young sir, and get away with it. Oh, that's great. Just what I've been looking for. An excuse to knock your head off. Stop it, stop it, both of you. Stop it. Not on a bet. Time you learned a lesson. Maybe this will teach you. Uh, uh, come on, come on, get up. Rocky, keep away from him. Don't you see he's hurt? Oh, it'll take more than a couple of whacks to make up for all the pain he's caused me and us. Timmy? Timmy? You all right? Oh, no, he's not hurt. He's only shamming. Rock, please. I don't think so. The andiron, I, I think he hit his head. Oh, no. You must have what? fallen on him. Oh, here, here. Wait a minute. Let's see. I don't want you to touch him. Don't be silly. The boy's hurt us. What is it, Brock? Is he bleeding badly? He. He's not bleeding anymore, my dear. Then he's all right? No, I. I don't think so. What do you mean? I don't know what I. I. He's not. Breathing. Timmy? Rocky. He is... He can't be. It... It was an accident, Marcia. But I... Oh, God, forgive me. I think he's dead. Cut! Beautiful. That's it. It's a wrap. I'll be right out. <laughs> Marcia... Sorry I blew that cue on you. Oh, couldn't matter less. I think today's show went beautifully. Yeah, yeah, it felt pretty good. Say, Timmy, you were great. Mm -hmm. I mean, you really had me going, huh? <laughs> Timmy? Timmy? Fun and games are over. Come on back to the really real. <laughs> Timmy. What's the matter, the kid all right? Hey, friends, you really zinged it. Brock, Marsha, you're never better. You too, man. Uh, what's wrong with him? You all right? Yes, sure. I'm great, Mr. Davis. Just great. Uh, pardon me if I just lay here and make believe. <laughs> Suit yourself, Eddie. Me, I got to make tracks. Got a commercial edition in half an hour. See you, folks. You on tomorrow? No, next call is Thursday. Uh -huh. Henny, can I skip the pre rehearsal this afternoon? Oh, uh, well, uh... Oh, come on now. I only have one scene. Well, you know, I don't mind. It's just Sandy. He'll holler blue murder. Oh, he gives me a pain. He runs so scared all the time, I'm afraid he'll blow the job. <laughs> Uneasy lies ahead that wears the producer's hat, huh? <laughs> you, uh, know the ratings are off? <laughs> so? Uneasy lies all our heads. Oh, you should worry, Angel. Don't you know they always fire the writer first? Not this time around. I had to go and pick on... Watch it. What? The kid. Hey, Eddie, you okay? No. And don't call me Eddie. Well, why not? It's your name. My name is Timmy. I don't want to change it. <laughs> What's in the name? Like the bard said, huh? You know how it is around this squirrel cage anyways. Half the time I can't remember which are real names and which are the made-up ones. My name is Timmy around here. I'm not going to change it. What's my next call, Mr. Davis? You sound funny, dear. What do you mean, funny, Mother? Well, I'm... I mean, you didn't knock yourself out for real when you fell, did you? I guess that's what I'm trying to find out. What's my next call, Mr. Davis? Uh, I, uh, I guess next week's call sheets aren't posted yet. They're kind of late, aren't they? Well, you know, there's been a lot of rewriting going on. Well, I mean, the scripts are late, and... Uh, Why are they rewriting? 
Well, you know how it is. The ratings down, the panic button's been hit, plot changes and what? all that. Plot changes, sir? Don't call me sir. You make me feel like I'm over the hill. Well, I'm afraid of... That I'm the one who's over the... Am I? Is that what it is? I, uh... uh, Have you seen Sandy? Sure. I've seen Mr. Strzok. And didn't he say anything? Anything about what? You mean the kid doesn't... Didn't know? Doesn't know what, Mother? Oh, don't call me that. You know my name. The only name I ever knew you as is Mother. Please, tell me. Tell me I'm not dead. I'm not really dead. Well, that's the way it is. I was sure it's a rough deal, but what are you going to do? That show business. But I can't be dead. I won't be dead. My... My, my my contract has eight weeks to run. Wow, that's the beauty part. You see, you got a free ride. Take the money and run. I don't uh, want the money. I want my part back. I don't want to be dead. I don't want to be out of the show. Daddy, honey, honey, listen to me. No. No, oh, I'm not going to listen to any of you. You listen to me. You can't kill me off like this. Don't you see? What? I've been on... For all seasons since it began. Twelve, no, no, thirteen years ago. Don't you see, I... I grew up as Timmy Bryce. I've never been anyone else. I was seven years old when it began. I, I'm not even twenty yet. I've always been Timmy. And you've always been my mother. You're how she's got to be. No, you have your own mother. You have your own life. Eddie, this is just another job, a make-believe existence. Oh, sure, we all get caught up in it, but but once we walk out of the studio, we leave it there. I don't. I never have. Now, that's being childish. If I don't have here to come to, if I don't live here anymore, I don't have anywhere left to go. Honey, nobody could blame you for being upset the crummy way this was done. It's only a job. There'll be another one. I don't want another job. And it isn't a job. It was my life. If I can't be Timmy Bryce anymore, I might as well be dead. I don't want to live. I don't want to live anymore. You don't understand. You just... All of you don't understand. Couldn't have had the decency, any of you, to let him down easy. You had to let him find out like this. Well, Sandy put the freeze on us. How? Why? Well, you know, the kid is a little kooky, and he was afraid if he knew, he... He what? He wouldn't give a performance? He would throw some kind of a monkey wrench into our plastic, predictable, phony little world? Then suddenly he might just do something plain real... In the middle of all the planned hysteria. Well, maybe that's the way Sandy figured. It's his neck on the block now. Oh, come on, Marsha. Let's sling a tourniquet on the bleeding heart bit. He got let down easy. In eight weeks, while he sits back getting paid, he'll latch on to another soap. Maybe. If he holds out long enough. What does that mean? I don't know. He's a... He's an oddball. And this hit him awfully hard. I, I just hope he... Hope he what? I'm almost afraid to say it. It's as if he... It's as if Timmy... Oh, it's funny. It is hard to think of him as anything but that. As, as if Timmy's real life were here in the studio... And the other was just a dream. You know what I mean? Uh, maybe that's why none of us had the guts to face him with the truth. Marsha, what's wrong? I don't know. I'm I'm scared. Scared? Well, I don't understand. Scared of the way it came out. The way it hit him. 
Well, you don't think Timmy would do anything foolish, do you? Like what? Well, we all, one way or another, made him dead in this world. You don't think he'd go ahead in the in the in the outside one and make it for real? Actors are highly emotional people. They'd have to be to simulate all the characters they are asked to represent. But how real can any particular character become? How closely can the actor identify himself with that character? Could an actor die or want to die once that character ceased to be? I shall return shortly with Act Two. has passed in both the worlds we are following in this story. In the real world of our actors, it has been relatively uneventful. In the realm of the soap opera, for all seasons, it has been about the same. Time moves in slow motion in that world, and Timmy Bryce has yet to be declared medically dead. The audience must believe, for dramatic suspense, that some thread of life still remains. As ardently, Eddie Smith fights to keep his alter ego alive. Don't you see, Mr. Strzok? It isn't too late. Look, kid, do me a favor. Will you quit bugging me? Come on, it's a week already. The decision is made and you're dead. Please, give me a chance. I don't have to die. Didn't you hear me? You're dead. Finished. And the script we're taping tomorrow. And the funeral is next Monday. See? It isn't too late. Mr. Strzok, I've been talking to everybody, and they all think it's a mistake to kill off someone who's been with this show from the beginning. Come on, come on. What's the sense going over and over it? The axe fell. I know it doesn't mean anything to you. This isn't even your show. What do you mean it isn't my show? You've been producer less than a year. Some of us have been here over 12. Why don't you just grow up and accept the fact you don't live here anymore? It's the only place I ever have lived. Come Andy. off it. You know better than that. It's just another job. Nobody's indispensable. And listen, kid. And listen good. To hike that rating, I'd cut my mother's throat. What do you mean? Nobody's indispensable. What I said. Even the old lady herself. The old lady? Betty Lang. You mean my mother? Marsha Bryce? All right, if you want to stick to stage names. She's just another actress to me and an aging one at that. You take that back. What? What you said about my mother. Oh, let go of me, kid. What are you trying to do? Kill me. I don't know. Uh, um, I'm sorry. Uh, look, you better... You better go find yourself a good shrink. Uh, While the money's still coming in, you better try to get your head screwed on tight. I, I don't mean to bother you. I, I I don't mean to bother anyone. Well, you do bother me. And I want you out of my hair. I don't want you around here anymore. I, I can't come to the studio anymore? From now on, I'm giving orders. This is a closed set. You can't keep me away from here. You can I? You try showing up here again. I'll have you thrown out in your ear. You better not try it. Why? You try to keep me away from where I belong and... And what? How... How kill you? Well, you... You crazy little nut. I, I think you mean that. Hello, Timmy. Danny. Well, what's the trouble? Oh, just this oddball coming around making waves. I want you and all the rest of the cast to know this set is close to him for good. Right now, I'm going for security to get him off it. Oh, now, simmer down, Sandy. Let me handle Timmy. You've got other problems. Yeah? yeah? What? Well, how to keep this show on the air, for one. Come on, Eddie. Uh, Timmy, let's go back to my dressing room, hmm? I know I'm acting like a first-class lunkhead, but... I can't help myself. Of course you can. The thing to do for you is to get another job. I don't want another job. It won't be that easy anyway. Oh, why not? You're a good actor, Eddie Smith. 
Nobody thinks of me as him anymore. Not even me. I'm Timmy Bryce. And that's all I want to be. I, I just want to be Timmy. And you to be my mother. <laughs> even if I marry Brock Stevens? If I was around, I'd never let you make that mistake. Well, now that would be up to the writer, wouldn't it? The writer? Well, he is the one who dreams up the plot, isn't he? Yeah. No. I, I mean, sort of. But only out of the, the characters. I mean, us. What we're like and all. He just can't have us do anything. I... I mean, anything he feels like, or or the producer, you know that. Do I? Well, sure you do. The people, the audience, they won't let him. There are things we can do and things we can't. Otherwise, we're not real. We're not real anyway. Oh, yes, we are. To millions and millions of people every day, and, and to ourselves. Some of us. Like... You, you take me. This is more real to me. You're more real to me than anything else in my life. Timmy. You see, you even think of me as Timmy. The way I think of you as the only mother I've got. Oh, now, come on. This is sick. Only romantic, Daddy. So you'd throw me out, too, huh? I'm not throwing you out. You've got one mother. That's enough. Her? She walked out on Dad and me for another man. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry. I, I'd forgotten what happened. But, but surely that wasn't a rejection of you. Any rejection is on my side. The character she married doesn't want any part of me. Or me of him. It doesn't matter. That other world outside... I don't have anyone anymore. I don't belong there. What about your father? Didn't you know? He's dead. No. No, I didn't know that. I... What... We were lucky to keep it out of the papers. One advantage, I guess, is having a name like Smith. You can sink without leaving a ripple. He... He died? He figured he hadn't anything left to live for when he lost her. Sort of like me. He... He killed himself. Just like I'm going to do. Oh, no. Not, not, don't talk like that. <laughs> you wouldn't do anything like that? Oh, wouldn't I? Why not? I'm dead already. Thanks to Mr. Sandy Struck. If it wasn't for him, I... You know something, Mother? He's the one who ought to be dead. Timmy! Eddie, I... I What's I'm... the trouble, baby? Uh, it's just a crazy kid, Timmy. Henley, see if you can stop him. Never mind. He's gone. Eddie Smith again? Yep. Something's going to have to be done about him. I really think Sandy's right. He's flipped his lid. Well, if he has, Sandy's to blame. And the rest of you, too. Oh, come on in. Close the door. I want to talk to you. Will do. I, uh, got a few bones to chew over with you. The way it was done is what knocked Eddie off the rails. That was a mistake. He could have been forewarned. Sandy could have had the decency to tell him straight out, the best way, when the decision was first taken. Maybe. No maybes about it. I still say maybe. Uh, no way this kid was ever going to accept getting bumped off this show. All right, then let's face it. That was the big mistake. Now you pegged it. It's uh, why I came by to see you. Here, have a look at these. What? The broadcast where Timmy met his death was aired day before yesterday. And this is the phone count and the early mail reaction. Oh, murder. Why didn't you let me know? What? I didn't think we had this many viewers. Yeah, we got them. And they're angry. And they don't want any part of this plot. All the letters and all the phone calls? Against it? <laughs> Why else were they writing or calling? Oh, I don't know why I ever went along with it. Sandy sold me a bill of goods that a murder trial was just what we needed to hike the ratings. Oh, that no nothing. How we uh, ever got stuck with him. He knifed his way in. The only way he's ever been able to get a job. I'll never know how he undercut Dorian. She was the best producer we ever had. Till the share of the audience slumped. Well, Sandy's great plot line isn't going to save our necks. 
Not with this audience reaction. Now, this is only the beginning. Wait till they have to stomach you being married to the guy who killed off your son. Isn't this our chance to get Timmy back? I mean, I mean it's not too late. We're not committed on the air yet. Well, he's still in the coma, but, but on, I... On, on any of the shows in the can, so far, he still isn't dead, hmm? No. Oh, come on. Emmett is at least three weeks ahead on scripts. What do you want him to do, throw all those out? Well, it's better than losing the show, going off the air. How would you like to do three weeks of acting and then be told you have to do it all over again without getting paid? Oh, come on, Henley. For all seasons, it's in the big leagues. Now, money could be found to pay for mistakes. This happened before. You do think it's all a mistake, don't you? Sure. Well, but I have to admit, at the same time, I'm old and battle-scarred. I'd rather roll with the punches than take a chance of ducking into one. <sighs> you won't back me up? I try to go upstairs over Sandy's head? The older I get, the less adventurous I get. This whole problem of Eddie Smith and whether Timmy Bryce, my son on the show, is going to be alive or dead has, has got to be solved the right way. Or we're going to have a hell of a lot more of a disaster than just another soap opera disappearing from the tube. Marsha, I've never seen you so geared up. What are you talking about? That boy who just charged out of here, he's, well, he's an explosion looking for a location. An accident to happen. I honestly think that that if we don't get him back on this show, not only is the show going to be dead, but Eddie Smith is. Or, or else Sandy struck. Sandy? That boy is desperate enough to kill. Either himself or the man he thinks drove him to the edge. Now, look, Betty, no, don't you... No, now, listen, you look, Henley. You've been our director for quite a few years, but... I've been with Eddie Smith playing my son, Timmy, for 13 years, and I know him as well as, or perhaps better than my own real-life sons. And I'm frightened because he, he's, he, he's, well, he's out of contact. There's no telling what that boy might do. Where is he? Where is that stupid little jerk? Now, Sandy, take it easy. Easy? You, you know he just tried to kill me? Who? Eddie Smith. Who else? Oh, no. Close the door, Henry. Yeah, sure thing. How, Sandy? How? How did he try to kill you? Oh, I... I was... I was standing near the number two camera. Lucky he, he had to crab sideways suddenly to, to get a one-over-one shot, and I followed with him. Because a split second later, one of the big scoops hit the floor right where I've been standing. You mean a floodlight broke loose? How? There's only one way, Henny. Somebody had to unbolt it off the pipe and kick it loose. And you think it was Eddie? I know it was. You saw him? Oh, it could have been an accident. How can you be so sure it was Eddie? I'm sure, all right. Come on, come on. Are you hiding him in here? No, no. He left here 10 or 15 minutes ago. Give the kid a break, Sandy. At least until you have some proof. I got all the proof I need. What? When I booted him off the set for good, he told me he was going to kill me. Okay. One chance is enough. I'm turning this over to the police. Because I sure ain't about to give him another chance. Was it accident or design? Could you believe that Eddie Smith, alias Timmy Bryce, is actually unbalanced enough to carry out his threat against the producer who ended one of his lives, the make-believe life that seems more important than his actual one? Well, we shall find out, along with some other chilling surprises, the real truth when I return shortly with Act Three. return once again to our tale of two worlds and the special breed of people who live in both of them. A group of people who are about to have a further shock as one of them, cast out from the imaginary world, suddenly appears from still another world to haunt the consciences of Marcia, the leading lady, Henley, the director, and particularly Sandy Struck, the producer. A fantasy homicide has been committed. Is a real-life one about to take place? Certainly Sandy Struck intends to make sure that he isn't the victim of one. Well, you can see for yourself, Detective Matthews, where the light hit the floor. Well, well, that doesn't prove that this kid, uh, uh, Eddie Smith, 
was responsible for the light falling, Mr. Strzok. Yeah, but I already told you, and a couple of the stagehands have confirmed it, that he threatened to kill me. That's another matter. What do you mean? If you want to come down to the precinct house and make a formal charge against the boy for that, we can arrest him. And lock him up? No. It's a misdemeanor. The worst you could get is a fine. Well, more likely a warning from the judge. Wait a minute. You mean I'm not going to get any police protection? Uh, look, mister, we do the best we can. A uh, kid got excited and made a threat. If all the threats people made got took serious, we'd need more cops in the Russian army. Uh, why not give us a break and ride it off? No, sir. I want my rights. Okay. Anytime it suits you, come down to the precinct house, like I said, and swear out the complaint. If you want to go right now, I'll give you a ride. No, no, I can't. Good Lord, man, I got a show to get on the air. Oh, yeah. That's show business, huh? All right, so it wasn't funny. I'm on today, 8 to 4. Tomorrow... Never mind tomorrow. Okay, today. Be there by 3. Like I say, you want to make a charge, I'll follow through. Don't worry. For once, maybe I'll get something for the taxes I pay. You're not going to go through with this, Sandy. You're damn right. Look, Marsh, it's my neck. I'm going to make sure nobody cuts it off. Well, if you hadn't been in such a hurry to drop the axe on Timmy, you wouldn't have to worry. See, even you think he's out to get me. I didn't say that. You didn't have to. It's still what you think. Come on, let's get this turkey on tape. You don't ask much, Marsha. I know what I'm asking, Emmett. It's a terrible thing to do to a writer. Twenty-five to thirty scripts down the drain? Oh, damn it, Marsha. Timmy is dead to all intents and purposes. He's a vegetable that only modern science is keeping alive. How do I revive him? You'll think of a way. And right at the moment, I can't think of one to save my soul. Well, if you don't, Emmett, there'll be no way to save the show. Now, the fans have been screaming by, by phone and by letter, some even in person. And the new ratings back them up. Uh, if Timmy dies, so does for all seasons. You don't know that. Oh, yes, I do. You think we can really turn it around? Well, it's been done before. It would be nice to save our necks. Yeah, and I'm not thinking only of us or the show, Emmett. I'm thinking of Timmy. I mean, Eddie. He got such a raw deal, it, it, it tore my heart out the way it hit him. He doesn't have much life, I guess, outside the studio. How come? He's a nice youngster. Yeah, he's also a child actor. Unless he's got a mother and father to root him solidly into real life. A, a child like that's in real trouble. Child? He's 20. Yeah, young 20. Trying to hold on to the past, just as hard as his future, through the show. Emmett, can we swing it? Well, you'll have to give me a couple of days to think about it. Please don't wait too long. It's a matter of... Oh, spare me that old clinker. Life and death. <laughs> well, in this case, more ways than one. position my son is in. Lying in a coma in the hospital, holding on to life only because of modern science and, and all the machines that maintain it for him. And if he should die, I... If... If he Is that for me, Sandy? Yeah, Henry, you sure did. Die. Do you what are you trying to pull me? off? Uh, pull off? Offense. You heard me. Even Look, I'm just sitting here monitoring today's show, the one I had to miss. And... Wait a minute, hold on. My son died. Tabram? This is Sandy Struck. Roll back to the beginning of Act Three and start again. What's the trouble? The trouble is I smell a large double O. First off, how come Timmy is still alive in the script when he's supposed to be dead? Now, Sandy, uh, we have a good thing going here, so we're just milking it. Sure, behind my back because of that little nut. Well, no way. I know you're all out to knife me. I mean, for real. You'd probably like to see that psychopathic little crybaby get back at me. Well, you overreach yourself. Because I got the real proof there's a plot against me. And it's right here on tape. You must have been cracked to think you'd get away with it. 
get away with what? I don't have to tell you. I'll show you. Okay, tape center. Roll that tape for all seasons again. All I can think of, Brock, is the position my son is in. Now watch this, Henley. And don't tell me a director like you couldn't spot it. Watch. Just watch. And all the machines that maintain it for him. What? There you are. Right there. When you cut to Marsha and Brock and camera three, the window behind, you see who's peering in? No, I don't see what you mean. There's nobody. What do you mean? No... Wait a minute. Even homicide. He was there. I mean, Timmy was there looking in. He... Oh, wait. Well, wait a minute till the next cut. I still don't see anything. But he was there. He was looking in. He was white and begging and the tears running down his face. And he was he was asking him to come back and... And he, 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 tape center, rewind and roll that tape again. No, no, you, you, you can't broadcast it like that, Henley. Not with that boy on it. Why was he let onto the set? You realize he was looking for me. He, he was looking to kill me. Sandy, come on. There was no one there. Eddie Smith wasn't on that tape. But I saw him. My dear man, I don't know what you're smoking these days or what you're on, but there were only two actors in that scene, Marsha and Brian. But I saw him, I tell you. I saw him. I, I ran it and I saw him looking in that window, accusing me and uh, threatening me if I, if I didn't give him back his part. Sandy, you were hallucinating. There was no one there. I tell you, there was. There... Oh, wait a minute. Control room four. Mr. Strzok. Yes, who wants to talk to? This is Detective Matthews, 37th Precinct. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, uh, this is Mr. Strzok. I just thought maybe you'd like to know the kid Smith, the one you swore out the complaint against. Yeah? We just come up against a cross-reference in the files from out of state. Seems he's a missing person. Missing? What does that mean? The day after you swore out the complaint, the Illinois State Police fished his motorbike out of Lake Sikorgan. Took this long to trace out whose it was through the bike serial number. Main point is, it looks as if your boy wanted to kill anyone. It must have been himself. What? You mean to say he, he couldn't have been back in our studios like... During the last day or so? That's right. Then he... He's dead? You mean what, what I saw was a ghost? Yeah, Mr. Strzok, uh, listen, I didn't say he was dead. Huh? What's that? I didn't say the kid was dead. He's been in a Sikorgan hospital, unidentified, since last Friday. I don't understand. Why didn't he just say who he was? Because he's just like my wife tells me you got him on that soap opera of yours. He's in a coma. Oh. Oh, what are his chances? What are Timmy's chances on the show? My wife keeps asking. What can I say? I don't know. You guys who make up them stories, you're the only ones who know. As for the real-life kid, that's up to the docs. I don't know that either. <laughs> Struck. What are you doing here? Well, I could ask you the same question, Detective Matthews. Oh, excuse me. Uh, this is Mrs. Elizabeth Lang, who plays Marsha on the show. Oh, yeah, yeah. I recognize her from seeing her on TV. Well, I recognize you from seeing you at the studio. And uh, this is our director, Mr. Davis. Hi. But uh, what are you doing here? Is, is Timmy... I, I mean, it's Eddie. Did he... Did he... Now, take it easy, Mrs. Lang. It's good news all around. Oh. The kid came out of a coma all of a sudden six hours ago. Doctors say it's a miracle. That it's a complete reversal, and he's out of danger. You said about six hours ago he came to you. You wouldn't remember the exact time, would you? Ah, uh, yes, I do. The doctor called me, and I left immediately. What time? Twenty-five minutes past five this evening. And they'd given him up for dead up to then. Is what the doctors told me. Oh, then it is a miracle. <laughs> you better believe it. What are you two talking about? It was exactly 25 after 5 that Ted Goldman gave the word to Henley, me, and Emmett that he'd overrule you. That Timmy was back on the show. He wasn't going to die. 
I didn't try to commit suicide, Mother. Honest, I didn't. I mean, sure, I was kind of blowing my mind, and maybe I got careless when the car coming the other way came barreling around the curve, and I swerved to avoid him, went into a skid, and that was the last thing I know, till I woke up here. All right, Eddie. And you're going to be all right. Oh, I sure am. I'm going to be back where I belong, on the show, with all of you, in my own world. Only, do me one favor, huh? Uh-huh, if I can. Don't call me Eddie. Call me Timmy. Honey, on the show, it'll be Timmy. That's the world where Timmy belongs. And off camera, it's Eddie Smith, and don't you forget it. There's another world where he belongs that you are going to have to start living in from now on. There you have it. Two worlds that some of your favorite people inhabit every day. Well, every weekday. Watch them long enough, and it's hard not to believe that they are real. If watching them makes them seem so, how about the people who play-act them? No wonder it might be possible for any one of them to forget just where fantasy ends and reality begins. I'll be back shortly. It was Shakespeare who said it also. All the world's a stage, and each man in his time plays many parts. Eddie Smith's mistake was locking himself into only one. A mistake, by the way, which he no longer makes. As it happened, For All Seasons did not weather the rating war and went off the air. You see Eddie now in other shows and commercials, but his main role is as a husband. And now, a new father in the world of the really real at last. Our cast included Bob Caliban, Ian Martin, Augusta Dabney, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Well, how do you feel about it? How do I feel about it? Do you think this man, this Jeff Parker, is guilty? Honey, a woman was murdered. Now, we know a man was in her apartment at the time of her death. The doorman and a resident of the building who were in the lobby gave us a description of this guy. Now, it was my job to find him. I did. That's all. That's all? Yeah, that's all. I asked you if you thought he was guilty. Well, now, that's for a jury to decide. But what do you think? Well, I I think he's guilty. And why do you keep pressing me on it? Is there a chance? I mean, just a chance that he could be innocent. Honey, this isn't my first homicide investigation, and this Parker guy isn't the first one I ever brought in. But you know, this is the first time that I have ever seen you so upset about it. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. How many times have you heard it said, Off with the old love? On with the new. 
Does this mean that love is like a cloak to be donned and discarded at one's pleasure or whim or fancy? Is it that easy or even that simple? Can one ever really be finished with an old love? Whatever became of that statement people used to make, till death do us part. But I didn't kill her, Anne. You were in the apartment. Yes. Your fingerprints are all over the place. I admit that. You were seen running away just after the shot was heard. I don't deny that. But you've got to believe me. I'm innocent. Our mystery drama, We Meet Again, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Terry Keene. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It is said that woman loves only her very first sweetheart. When she falls in love again, she falls in love with love itself. That's the marvelous thing about love, isn't it? Everyone's an authority on the subject. And why not? Is there anyone within the sound of my voice who has not been in love at least once? Well, if you haven't, what are you waiting for? But before you do, listen first to our tale of love. And death. Dan? Dan? Mm. Oh. Hi, I must have dozed off. I was listening to the radio. I dozed guess. off? You were sawing wood pretty good there. Mm. Yeah, I guess I was. Let me turn that thing off. What time is it? Quarter after twelve. You mean it's past midnight? Mm-hmm. Oh, are you hungry? I'm starved. Where'd you have dinner? I didn't. Harry. Listen, I know it's late, but could I have a steak? A steak? Mm. Oh, all right. Let's go in the kitchen. Okay. And we cracked it. You did? Yep, it's over. Oh, Harry, that's wonderful. <laughs> Finally. Oh, <laughs> I'm wide awake now. Tell me, I want to hear everything. Well, we got him. We? Who's we? Who brought him in? I did. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, Harry, it's poetic justice. You've been on this thing night and day for almost three months. Yeah, well, so have a lot of other men in the department. We haven't gone anywhere, done anything, all on account of this, this, this killer. So, so how did you do it? What magic clue? What great flash of insight? Well, you know, the only way I ever get results, wear out the shoe leather, talk to a thousand people. Well, I was running down a routine lead. I walked into this place... And there he was. Just like that? Just like that. And what time was this? Exactly 7 p.m. And you didn't call me? Oh, honey, there wasn't a minute. I had to book him, and I had to write up the report. The commissioner came running down to say, fine job, Detective Kovacs. <laughs> then the mayor, the DA, the reporters, the TV cameraman. It was on TV? Yeah, I guess it must have been on the 11 o'clock news. Every night I always watch it. This one time I fall asleep and I miss it. <laughs> oh. Boy, am I glad this is over. Hey, what are you making there? A cheese sandwich. You want a glass of milk, too? What happened to my steak? It will keep you awake. Yeah, you know, you're right. I'm dead on my feet. I don't even think I can make it through the sandwich. All right, don't even try. Just drink some of the milk. You know, I've been getting by with maybe three, four hours sleep a night. I can hardly keep my eyes open. I, I'm, I'm going to just fall into bed. Yeah, you can tell me all about it in the morning. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Night. I'll be right in. I just want to put these few things away. Who can this be? Just a minute. Dick. Hi, Annie. Hey, is Harry home? Uh, come on in. He just got in. I think he's dead to the world. Oh, that, that's good. Uh, are you sure Harry's asleep? Uh, Dick, what's all this about? Just make sure Harry's asleep, will you? But what are you... Do doing? it. Uh. All right, he's asleep. He didn't even take off his clothes, just threw himself on the bed. Now, Dick, what are you doing here? Well, I figured maybe you wanted to talk about what happened tonight. What happened tonight? 
Yeah, maybe I'm a little tired. I just don't seem to understand. What... You, well, hey, you mean you don't know that Harry cracked what can only be considered the murder case of the year? He said something about it, but... You haven't seen the TV? You haven't heard the radio? No. Then you don't know who the killer is? Should I know who the killer is? Would you get to the point? I, uh, I got the morning paper here. It hit the streets about ten minutes ago. You'd better look at it. That headline, arrest made in movie star murder. It keep reading. District attorney praises brilliant investigative action by Detective Harry Kovacs. Oh, Dick, he never had his name in the papers like this before. Uh, get on to the next paragraph. All right. Jeffrey Parker Jr. was arrested early last evening for the murder of Carrie Drake, the internationally famous... Jeffrey Parker? Yes, ma'am. Jeff. No. It couldn't be Jeffrey. Why do you say that? Because... Because... Turn to page four and look at the picture. He hasn't changed a bit. Ten years, has he? It's impossible. Jeff, a murderer? I refuse to believe it. Well, read the article. They got him. They really got him nailed. I don't care what it says. I just can't believe well, it. Well, whether you believe it or not isn't your problem. My problem? I came here because I figured you might... Well, you, you might want to have a little talk with your uh, big brother. Oh, Dick. What am I going to do? Does Harry know that you were once engaged to Jeff? Hmm? No. I never even mentioned his name. That was all over when I met Harry. Well, that raises the question. Do you think you should tell Harry? Should I? Uh, all right. All right, I know you. You've already figured out what you think I should do. I don't think you should tell him. Suppose he finds out. How is he going to find out? Harry's name is in the paper, and so is Jeff's. There could be people who might remember that I once dated Jeff. That was ten years ago. Who remembers? I don't know. I've been a policeman's wife for eight years now. I've learned there are many weird, offbeat people in this world. People who seemingly have nothing else to do but remember the most remote, trivial details. Somebody always comes up with something. Well, suppose somebody does. I... I think the best thing is to tell the truth. Oh, it sounds right. But the truth is not the best thing in every situation. Dick, how can you... Especially if the truth is unpleasant. But, Lonnie, suppose you tell Harry the truth. He'll accept it. But beneath that very quiet exterior, what is he going to be thinking? She was engaged to him, and that means she once loved him, and does she still love him? I don't, I don't think Harry would... He might. So what's to be gained by telling him? Huh? Now, Harry is happy and secure in the knowledge of your love for him. Now you just... Well, I guess you could say uh, you just poisoned the well. Now, now of course, there is another problem. What are you saying? Are, uh, are you still in love with Jeffrey? Dick! That's not an answer. Are you? No! Well, that's a quick answer. But remember, I was around the house when that love affair was on fire. But it came to an end. I walked out on him. Well, you say that so calmly now, but I remember how it was. It's over, Dick. Over. It's dead. Then keep quiet. Don't bring it back to life. Now, you shouldn't have let me sleep so long, Anne. I was due downtown three hours ago. Well, I didn't have the heart to wake you. But you should have. I called Lieutenant Jordan at the precinct. He said it's all right. But it's not all right. We're shorthanded. We got two men on vacation, three out sick. You haven't even told me how it happened. <sighs> Am I going to be the last to know? Now, honey, you know most of it already. There she was, Carrie Drake, the beautiful, sexy dream girl herself. Well, the doorman noticed this fellow hanging around the apartment building. Later on, a shot was heard. They noticed the very same guy come out. You're sure about this? Oh, yeah, yeah. He got into a foreign car parked up the block and took off. What does that mean? He killed her just because he was hanging around the building? How can you be sure he was in her apartment? Honey, we know that. They even had a drink together. His fingerprints were on the glass. He left a cigarette lighter behind with the initial J on it. Now, those were the clues. 
A cigarette lighter with the initial J and a foreign car, no license number, no idea what car, just it looked like a foreign sports car. But Harry... Uh... Yeah. Oh, nothing. Nothing. So, what did I do? I made the rounds of every foreign car dealer in the area. Do you remember selling a car to a guy who looks like, and I gave him the description, see? He has a first or a last name beginning with a J. Finally, I walk into this dealership way uptown, you see, and there he is. He's working there as a salesman. Talk about luck. It's the kind of luck you make, Harry. In my spare time, ha-ha, I'd been checking registrations at the Motor Vehicle Bureau. Now, I started calling on every foreign car owner I had an initial J. There were thousands. Now, I had this feeling I'd be spending the rest of my life on this case. I just wish I could be like those brilliant detectives you see on the screen. You know, they generally get a bright idea, bag their man inside of an hour. How do they do that? Harry, isn't that all circumstantial evidence? I mean, most evidence is circumstantial. In a sense that in most murders, there are no eyewitnesses to the actual killing. Well, how do you feel about it? How do I feel about it? Do you think this man, this Jeff Parker, is guilty? Oh. Honey, a woman was murdered. Now, we know a man was in her apartment at the time of her death. The doorman and a resident of the building who were in the lobby gave us a description of this guy. Now, it was my job to find him. I did. That's all. That's all? Yeah, that's all. I asked you if you thought he was guilty. Well, now, that's for a jury but to decide. what do you think? Well, I think he's guilty. And why do you keep pressing me on it? Is there a chance? I mean, just a chance that he could be innocent. And this isn't my first homicide investigation. And this Parker guy isn't the first one I ever brought in. But this is the first time I've ever seen you so upset about it. And I only have an hour for lunch, and you haven't even started the talk. I, I can't help feeling responsible for Jeff Parker. Responsible? That is ridiculous. When I broke our engagement, it was a terrible setback for him. So maybe I helped push him down the road that ended where it did. Uh, he was always unstable, so that's why you broke it off with him, remember? I remember. But murder, I can't believe murder. Maybe you... Maybe you just don't want to believe it. Jeff couldn't kill anyone. He's not that kind. I have this feeling. Don't ask me what it is. Uh, I hope you're not still in love with him. I am in love with Harry. That's why I married him. When you met Harry, who certainly wasn't your type, plain plotting Harry, I asked you if you didn't marry him on the rebound. Oh, please, Jack. I really... You have to straighten it out in your mind. You have to know where you stand. I've been reading the papers all week. All kinds of experts and psychologists have an opinion about Jeff. But you know what I don't see? Well? I don't see anyone on Jeff's side. How alone he is. If he had any friends, I mean, they, they, they've all abandoned him. And what's the use of all this? I know he's innocent. How do you know? It is just a feeling. And I have to do something about it. Now, please don't ask me what... I just know I have to do something. Anne seems to be a woman who has finally made up her mind to do something. Even if she isn't quite sure what that something is. But the larger question, which at this point remains unanswered, is... Is she still in love with her ex-fiancé? And is any love affair ever really completely over? These will form the complications of Act Two. Is it true that the first love will last, in some way at least, forever? And when it's gone, are we convinced that it's dead? But is it only asleep? Who knows? And why do we bring it up here? Well, psychologists tell us that love, or the lack of it, is the motivating force for all human action. Are we about to witness an example of that right now? Oh, come in, Anne. Good morning, Lieutenant Jordan. Now, sit down. I hope I'm not disturbing you. Oh, how often do I get a chance to talk with a pretty woman here at headquarters? Oh, Harry's out. He's off and running on another murder. Well, I haven't come here to see Harry. I want to see you. 
Uh, uh, you're going to chew me out for working Harry so hard. Uh, but, Anne, it's the nature of the man. He loves his job. Could... Could you arrange for me to see Jeffrey Parker? I... I beg your pardon. Could you arrange for me to... I heard you. I just don't understand. Can I tell you something in confidence? I don't want Harry to know. Then, Anne, I'm not sure I should... Ten years ago, Jeffrey Parker and I were engaged. Well, I'm not going to ask the obvious question. I am very sure I am no longer in love with him, but I believe that he's innocent. I'm very much afraid he's guilty. I know how it looks. It's just that I want to tell him that I still believe in him. Lieutenant, he is so alone. I just want him to hear one voice say, I believe you. Let him know that one other human being is on his side. Now, can you arrange it for me, Lieutenant? Well, well, I can arrange it for you. Hello, Jeff. Anne. Anne, you shouldn't be here. Why not? Well, if the reporters find out, they won't let you alone. No one's going to find out. Well, you shouldn't have come anyhow. Why run the risk of getting mixed up in this? I I hear you're married. Is it true? It's true. I'll bet he's a wonderful guy. Yes, he is. His name is Harry Kovacs. Well, that, that's the name of the detective who brought me in. He's my husband. Oh, Anne, get out of here. Can you imagine what the newspapers would do with this? Yes, I want to help you. Oh, no one can help me. Answer one question. Did you kill Carrie Drake? No. How did you get into it? How did they get this case against you? You know me. If there's trouble anywhere within half a million miles, it'll find me. Well, could the description be wrong? Another man, maybe? And I was there. I was in the apartment. Well, well what were you doing there? I was... Uh, I was trying to sell her a car. I'm a car salesman now. What happened to the plans to go back to school and get the engineering degree? Hmm? Yeah. What happened to the painting and the writing? And Well, I must have held down 20 jobs in the last 10 years. But, Anne, this one, this one finally looked like my big chance. It's a new British car, the, the, the Stanhope Royal. It's absolutely fantastic. There's nothing like it on wheels. I figured it would be terrific publicity if Carrie Drake would drive one. And? Problem. How to get to see her? Oh, these stars, celebrities, they're surrounded by managers and agents. Well, you can't get near them. But evidently you did get to her. Well, I wasn't going to let anything stop me. I, I went to her apartment. The doorman was tough, but and I waited for my chance, and I sneaked in. All right, you got past the doorman, but how did you think you could get into her apartment? Well, I, I figured I'd talk fast. Turn on the patented Jeff Parker charm and, well, just take it from there. And it worked. I knocked on the door. She opened it and said, Hello. I want to sell you a car. My manager buys all my cars. A, a, a car is too intimate a thing. You can't trust it to your manager... Or any other man, for that matter. Why is that? A car is a covering. It surrounds you and supports you. It holds you and caresses you with its softness and luxury. You have a wonderful line. Buy me a drink inside, and you can hear the rest of it. And what happened? She offered me a drink, which is how my fingerprints got on the glass. And she as good as bought the car. What do you mean... As good as. Well, she only had to check with her manager to see if maybe there was a conflict with any of her TV sponsors. And I was to call the next day. We well, spent a little more time together and... And I left. Oh. I did something that I thought was very clever, except, like all my bright ideas, it turned out to be a disaster. I deliberately left my cigarette lighter there. Why? Well, the idea was I would have an excuse to call her. Later. Now, how's that for putting my head in the noose, huh? But when you left her, she was alive. I swear. Well, I didn't want to tangle with that doorman, so I... I used the fire stairway. You know, I think I heard a noise. What kind of noise? Well, I thought it was a car backfiring down the street. Anyhow, the doorman spotted me coming out the service entrance. 
I got out of there fast. My car was parked up the street. I took off. You probably heard the shot that killed her. Yeah, someone must have come in right after I left. Anne, I'm impulsive. I'm I'm kind of crazy, but come on, kill somebody? I know, I know. Things might have been so different if I'd listened to you years ago. But I didn't. Anne, you've got to believe me. I'm innocent. I believe it, Jeff. I believe it. Harry? Hmm? Some more sauce? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's very good, thanks. Harry? Hmm? How did Jeff Parker kill Carrie Drake? He shot her with a twenty-five caliber pistol. But they didn't find the gun in Parker's possession, did they? No, well, he probably dumped it off somewhere. But why should he have killed her? He claims he went there to sell a car. Now, honey, that may have been his original intention, but she must have caught him stealing. Stealing what? Well, there was a very valuable diamond bracelet on the sideboard. The maid remembers it was there when she left, which was just before Jeff Parker arrived. Now the bracelet is gone. What happened, he probably tried to slip it in his pocket. She caught him, and he had to kill it to get out of there. Was the bracelet found in his possession? Oh, no, no. That's probably well hidden. Well, it seems to me only a criminal would steal her jewelry. Oh, and he's got a police record. He has? Oh, yeah, yeah. Eight, nine years ago, he was up on assault. Now, true, the guy tried to cheat him out of some money, but it shows you his temper. And there was a bad check charge, but it never got anywhere. And he was in on a phony stock swindle, but that got hushed up. Well, none of that proves he's a murderer. I mean, what do you say we take in a movie tonight, huh? Is there anyone who had a motive for killing Carrie Drake? And show me any prominent person, and there are no end of people who could have motives. Well, who, for instance, would have a motive for killing Carrie Drake? Oh, you don't know how I've been through this whole thing. Number one, mm. Mrs. Wendy Halstead, wife of a prominent filmmaker who fell for Carrie. Now, Mrs. Halstead was heard making threats to Ed Riney, the producer sunk a fortune into a Broadway play for her. She walked out on him. He went bankrupt. Number three, her fiancé, Paul Jennings. The word was out she was ready to give him the air. So there are other people. Yeah, yeah, sure. But none of them were seen coming out of the apartment building. And what do you say we go to that movie, huh? Harry? What? I believe Jeff Parker is innocent. You do? Yes. Well, I don't want to talk about it anymore. He'll have his day in court. Harry, I know he's innocent. Is that a fact? How do you know? I know because he told me. He told you? How could he tell you? I spoke with him this morning. I paid him a visit in his cell. Now, the reason I did was because... Because long before you and I met, Jeff Parker and I were engaged. We were in love. I guess we thought we were, but... I realized it could never work because the very last thing Jeff wanted was a home and stability, and that was the very first thing that I wanted. I see. And you believe him? Yes, I do. Huh? Has he, uh, told you anything he hasn't told us? No. Huh? Well, he needs a better story than the one he has now. But it's a true story. Harry, will you help him? Yeah. How? Well, I'll just assume we don't have the killer and start looking all over again on my spare time. I'm off tomorrow. I'll go see him first thing in the morning. Thank you, Harry. No, no, that's not the way to do it. I'll get down there right now. Harry? Yeah, I've got the coffee pot on the stove. Did you speak to him? Yeah. And? And he keeps repeating the same story. He's not going to be much help. I'll just have to dig into some of the other people who may have had motive. How about her fiancé, Paul Jennings? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll see about him in the morning. Harry? What? Won't you have some coffee with me? No, I'm tired. I think I'll turn in. <laughs> Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Okay, I'll be there. 
Suppose Lieutenant Jordan may need help on the Leggett murder. I have to report to Inspector Dolan. Oh. Yeah, Jordan's let me loose for the Jeff Parker thing for three whole days, but now he has to justify it officially. That means you won't be able to do anything more for Jeff. Well, uh, honey, I've gone as far as I could. The Solstead woman, the producer, the fiancé, I can't get a thing on them. Well, maybe the killer was somebody she didn't know. A thief. No, I, I went through that, too, even though it wasn't likely. Why wasn't it? She was wearing a diamond ring, honey. Why didn't the thief take that, too? Why just the bracelet? And there was cash in the house and an expensive watch. Just doesn't make sense. But I stayed with it. I checked the pawn shops. Now, if a thief had done it, what did he do with the bracelet? I got nowhere. Harry, I know it looks bad for Jeff. Honey, I'm afraid the time has come for you to face the facts. Jeff Parker is guilty. Anne, I told you the story, and I told your husband the story, and... Oh, what's the use? Tell it to me again. When you walked into my cell, I thought, Oh, Lord, she does love me. After all these years, she still loves me. But you don't. You never really did. And I understand it now. What's the difference? None. But you don't have to feel guilty either. I don't feel guilty. Yes, you do. You think if we'd been married, you'd... You'd have given me a sense of responsibility. But it wouldn't have worked. Jeff, I believe you're innocent. Give it up, Anne. You can't help me. You'll only hurt yourself. Besides, Harry doesn't like it. He he thinks you're still in love with me. You didn't kill her, but someone else did. Someone who came just as you left. Now, did you see anyone? No. Did you hear anyone? Oh, what's the use? We've been through it over and over again. We have to keep going over it. Anne, I'm tired. I can't even think. You always did give up easily, didn't you? Now, come on. Let's go through it from the beginning again. You knocked on the door. She opened it. And she said, come on, go ahead. Tell me what she said. I told you a thousand times what she said. Tell it again. Okay. Okay. She said... Hello, darling. Oh. Well, how are you, darling? May I come in? Whatever for? I want to sell you a car. Wait. Wait, that's not the way you told me the story before. Well, it is. If we had a tape recorder, you'd see. It's word for word. You opened the door and she said, Hello, darling. That's what I keep telling you. But you didn't say she said it with a tone of surprise in her voice, as if... as if she were expecting somebody else. She was waiting for somebody else. And when she heard you at the door, she thought you were that somebody. And there's only one person that somebody else can be. I see it now. What does she see? So far, she doesn't have any fact which isn't also in your possession. Well, check back over the facts and inferences that have been made so far, and we'll compare notes when I return with Act Three. According to Thoreau, any man who is more right than his neighbors constitutes a majority of one. Well, that's fine, uplifting theory. Unfortunately, it has nothing to do with the realities of life. In actuality, those who usually constitute a majority of one generally are in for some very tough sledding. Suppose she was expecting someone to call on her. And? Jeff tells me she opened the door and said, Hello, darling, as if she were expecting someone else. And I know who it was. Yeah, who? Her fiancé, Paul Jennings. Why? Because she said darling. Oh, Anne, look, theatrical people call everybody darling. That doesn't mean a thing. It's a lead. She was waiting for someone. You admit Paul Jennings had a motive. She was about to leave him. Well, we really can't prove it. The basis for the thing is in the gossip column. But she was expecting him. You know, you keep saying that. Because Jeff says she seemed surprised when she opened the door. It makes sense to me. Well, I don't see that as a startling new development. So, in other words, you're satisfied with the way things are now. Satisfied? It's all wrapped up in a neat little package, and since everybody's on board, why rock the boat, huh? And do you know what you're saying? I say you've got the wrong man. 
And I'm going to solve it. Solve what? This murder. And I'm going to do what you say you always do. I'm going to wear out some shoe leather. Hi, sister. Uh, Dick, you caught me as I was leaving. Well, aren't you going to ask me in? I've got a tremendous lead. Well, I'll come in anyway. Dick, I really don't have the time. I know, I know. Well, you don't have the time for anybody. Now, get off it, Anne. I ran into Harry downtown yesterday. He isn't very happy. Well, I- I'm sorry. Look, I believe Jeff is innocent. I am not in love with him any longer. Just seeing him again was all I needed to convince me. Well, you'll have to let events or nature or whatever take their course. But he is not guilty. You have no way to prove it. And you lose Harry. Now, he is a very patient guy. But don't push him too far. I have learned a great deal about Carrie Drake. I think I could write a book on her life and loves. Did you learn anything that could take Jeff off the hook? Nothing just got one more place to go. Yes? Where's that? The maid. Her name is Lottie Jackson. Some questions I'd like to ask her. What do you mean you'd like to ask her? Why should she talk to you? Who are you? I'll, I'll tell her some kind of story. But she has already spoken to the police. I know. And end it. Now. Before you get hurt. Only I could prove. Somehow prove. That Carrie Drake was expecting someone when Jeff rang that bell. Yes? Oh, uh, are you Mrs. Lottie Jackson? That's me. Uh, I'm a reporter. Could I talk to you? Well, I don't know. The man from the Daily Express bought my life story. And he said I couldn't say a word to any other reporters. I signed some kind of paper or something. Oh, well, naturally, I would respect that agreement. I cleaned for Ms. Drake for 20 years. I come to work for her when she got her first Broadway job. Mm. Only 18 she was. I got so much publicity when she got killed. I even went on the TV. I know, I saw you. Like I said, I got this contract with this other paper, so I can't sell you a story. Well, I'm thinking of uh, uh, writing a book. You're going to offer me some money? Why don't we talk for a few minutes and see what you know? I know everything. Come on in. Now, the day she was killed, and this was just after you left, was she expecting anybody? The cops kept asking me that. Not that I know of. You sure? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Look, you going to write a book? I got an angle for you. You have? Yeah. There's something I'd like to see written about her, so I'll give you this for nothing. Well, I'm sure that's very... Guys funny. used to load her down with jewels. I remember reading about it. But that stuff didn't really mean a thing to her. No? She was rich. I mean, she was born rich. Her old man owned half the oil in Texas. She said to me one day, Lottie, what are diamonds? Rocks that come out of the ground. And so when she broke off with a guy, she always gave him back the jewels he'd given her. Well, I never read about that. You said that... When you left, she had a diamond bracelet on the sideboard. That's the one that must have cost 20 grand at least. Had she planned to wear it? As far as I know, she never wore it. She hardly ever wore any jewels. That was the big joke. She had all these rocks, and she kept them in a vault. All of them? Every single one of them. Well, then for this bracelet to have been out on the sideboard, she would have had to take it out of the vault. Is that right? Uh Uh-huh. Tell me, uh, there were rumors that she was going to uh, break up with her fiancé, Paul Jennings. I heard about that. Would you know if it was true? Wait a minute. Of course she was. Sure he was through. He was all through. I should have known. Well, how should you have known? The bracelet. Why would it be there? Why would she have gotten it out of the vault? She was planning to give it back to him and say, bye-bye, Paul. Take your bracelet and... Hey, hey, lady, where are you going? What got into her? Harry, did you ever ask yourself what an expensive bracelet was doing on the sideboard? 
it was ready to be given back to Paul Jennings. And, and we don't know that. It's an inference. Paul Jennings was angry. He didn't intend to be brushed off. She had sent for him. She heard the doorbell, and she assumed it was Paul Jennings when she said, Hello, darling. And you're right about one thing. Mm. She could say darling without meaning it. Mm. Well, he killed her, and he took the bracelet. It belonged to him. And, and, none of this is evidence. It makes sense to me. I'll tell you what makes sense. You're determined to have someone else face the final music for Carrie Drake's murder. Who that doesn't bother you as long as it isn't Jeff Park. I believe Jeff is innocent. The only reason you can believe that is because you're still in love with him. I never was in love with you him. You were engaged, That Paul. was a mistake. Yeah, as long as you're admitting to mistakes, you married me. Was that a mistake? Oh, Harry. I married you because I love you. Oh, come on now. Lie to me, but don't lie to yourself. I have no illusions about myself. I'm just a plain, ordinary detective. Harry, I love you. I don't love Jeff. Before this, I hadn't thought about him in years. Then why are you doing this to both of us? What is he to He's you? He's a loose end in my life, and I've got to tie it off somehow. And I won't rest until I can prove he's innocent. Yeah, but how? There's proof that Paul Jennings is guilty. And I know where to get it. Uh, hello, is this the Royal Arms Hotel? Uh, I'm calling from the Princess Theater, uh, where Mr. Paul Jennings is in rehearsal. He left a copy of some script revisions in his apartment. We're sending a lady over to get them. Would you let her in, please? Thank you. Well, hello. What are you doing here at my apartment? I, uh, I was just leaving, Mr. Jennings. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't look like a burglar. <laughs> well, I'm not, really. You've been ransacking the place. You find anything valuable? Hmm? If you did, I'll split it with you. Well, I, uh, I made a mistake, obviously, so why don't I just leave? Uh, I am afraid not. We have a very permissive society, but I won't be part of it. Now, you'll have to tell your story to the police. Look, I was never in any kind of trouble. Well, this then will be good for you. The lesson. Uh, this is Paul Jennings in apartment 11A. Have the police come here at once. Time we put our foot down on all this crime. I see now why she threw you over. No, oh, who threw me over? Carrie Drake. How could she put up with you? What, what are you talking about? Why do you say she threw me over? How do you know? I read about it in one of the columns. Wait. You were looking for some... Open your bag. I really didn't find any... Open your bag. That gun. It's the gun you used to kill Carrie Drake. And the bracelet you took from her apartment. Give me that bag. Oh, no. I have got the gun. If you take one step toward me, I'll... You'll what? I'll shoot. And I'm not joking. Go ahead. I'm warning you. Oh, it doesn't work. It's empty, you idiot. Now give me the no, gun. No, no. The bag. Let go of me. No. Let You're go finished. Of me. You were visiting me. Oh. You were leaning out the window. No. And... And you can't do it. You see, it's the police. You sent the police yourself. Help! Help up here! He's trying to kill me! Well, at least we kept it in the family. Harry, mm. I'm sorry. Fortunately, the patrolman walked in and I had the evidence. Nah, it's all right. What I wanted to do was phone you and have you get over there so it could be your arrest. Oh, it's all right, I tell you. Is it, Harry? Is it really all right? Well, of course, down at the squad room, the guys are going to say, ah, uh -huh, so that's who breaks all your cases. Well, I learned it from you. The absolute attention to detail. Right. Well, Jeff will be free now. Yes, Oh, Harry. You know, I told you I never thought about Jeff, and that wasn't true. I used to think about him once in a while, but, you know, I don't think about him anymore. You don't? Nope. He's gone, 
And he's forgotten. Let's go to the movies. All's well that ends well, as Mr. Shakespeare tells us. But the problem is, when and what is the end? Do we sometimes confuse the end with just a hiatus, a pause? Out of sight may mean out of mind. But out of which part of the mind? Perhaps only the conscious. Who knows what still stirs underneath? I shall return with a partial answer shortly. loves, warm loves, cold loves, loves of all kinds. Is it true that we may love many times? Or is love, like its companion death, something we may only know once? Of course, there are people who will deny that, too. They will say that love and death can come more than just once. If you listen to us seven times each week, you can hear all about it. Our cast included Terry Keene, Larry Haynes, Earl Hammond, Catherine Byers, and Lloyd Batista. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. You are all fortunate today, and I am indeed glad for you. For today's story was written by the genius who gave us Tiny Tim, Scrooge, David Copperfield, Oliver Twist, literally a world of unforgettable characters. Very rarely did Charles Dickens spin out for us a mystery, but today we will untangle the web of just such a story. Mr. Sampson, I came here this evening to tell you of the peculiar circumstances of the girl's death. She was very young. Too young to die. I don't know how or where to begin. It's difficult because you loved the girl. I know. No, you don't know. I loved her as I have never loved anyone. But if the whole truth were known, I led her to her death. I murdered her. Our mystery drama, Hunted Down, written by Charles Dickens was adapted especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Gordon Heath. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Dickens spent quite a bit of time in the United States. He toured the country reading his stories. He even wrote some here. This story, Hunted Down, appeared serially in the New York Ledger in August 1850. But this account of deception and murder could have happened today, over 125 years later. 
The same idea has been copied by modern authors, but no one has ever told it as vividly as Charles Dickens. This is the way it begins. My name is Edgar Sampson. I am the chief manager of London Life, one of England's oldest life insurance companies. To deal in insurance, one must know how to judge a man. If you can't do that, chances are you will be deceived and your company could lose a fortune to the unscrupulous. Which brings me to the first time I met up with Julius Slington. Adams, who was that man dressed in black who just left the office? Uh, just now, uh, th- 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 that was Mr. Julius Slington. One of our clients. No, 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 he's not insured with us, not as far as I know. He has an air about him, I say, like a warning. A warning? As if he was saying, not in so many words, take me just as I show myself. Come along, follow the gravel path, keep off the grass. I permit no trespassing. Oh, I see what you mean, Mr. Sampson. Mr. Slington is all business. Nothing wrong with that, but this gentleman wants to be sure you know it. Well, if that's it, he put on a very big act for the little he wanted. Which was? A few application forms for a friend of his who wants to take out life insurance. Why did he come to London Life, did he say? Yes, he did. Said he was recommended by a friend of yours. Of mine, Adams? Did he know my name? Uh, Yes, sir. He looked over here and said, Ah, there's Mr. Sampson. Not that I've had the pleasure, so I shan't trouble him. Huh. Well, that'll be all, Adams. You may go back to your desk. No, I didn't like the looks of this Slington. He had smiled too much at Adams. was too agreeable. A week later, I went to see an old friend for dinner. And who should be there but Julius Slington? Edgar Sampson. Well, the work seems to agree with you. Oh, I must admit, Tom, I enjoyed it. It was nice of you to ask me over for a meal. Do you know that fellow over there, standing by the mantelpiece? Well, of course I know him. I'm not in the habit of inviting strangers to eat with me. Then, since we are both under the same roof, introduce me. Certainly. Uh, Julius, I want you to meet Edgar Sampson. Julius Slington. How do you do? How do you do? Well, you know, I thought you two had met. Uh, Julius was thinking about some life insurance. I told him to look you up. I did look in at Mr. Sampson's office on your recommendation, Tom, but since all I wanted was a few insurance forms, I didn't want to trouble him. I would have been glad to help you. I'm sure of that, and I'm very much obliged. Another time, perhaps. You're thinking of insuring your life? No, dear, no. I'm afraid I'm not so prudent as all that. I was inquiring for a friend. I hear that London life has recently suffered a great loss. In money? (laughs) No, in talent and vigor. I was not aware of it. I speak of your Mr. Meltham. Oh, to be sure. He is a great loss. A young man so energetic. Yes, it is a shame. You uh, knew Meltham? Only by reputation. Very young, wasn't he? About 30. To suddenly become incapable of business at that young age. Any reason for his sudden, uh, what should I call it? Oh, my dear Slington, I I see Tom is telling us dinner is served. Will you excuse me? What can I tell you? I simply could not bear the fellow. I thought him prying, insincere. And I'm sure he must have realized I was having second thoughts about him. But my reactions didn't stop Slington. He even sat himself next to me. And after dinner, as we were lighting up cigars, there he was again at my elbow. I didn't want to go into this at the table. As we were saying before, this young chap, Meltham, who used to work for you, whatever happened, do you suppose, that he should suffer, uh, suffer... Suffer what, Mr. Slington? I was going to say... A nervous breakdown. Is that what you've heard? In a way. I understand he was actually, how can I put it, broken-hearted. Something about a girl. Although it didn't seem probable to me, Meltham being a young man so distinguished and attractive. Attractions and distinctions are no armor against death. Ah? Uh, 
The lady died. Pardon me, I did not know that. That does make it very sad. Poor Mr. Meltham. She died. Ah, dear me. Lamentable. Lamentable. Do you think this Slington is genuine? Neither did I. Why this commiseration for Nelson, whom he couldn't have known very well, if at all? What was Slington up to? Mr. Sampson, you're surprised to see me so moved about a man I have never known. But I am not so disinterested as you suppose. I have suffered, and recently too, from death myself. I have lost one of two charming nieces who were my constant companions. She died barely 23, and her remaining sister is far from strong. Ah, my dear Mr. Sampson, the world is a grave. Well, now, if you'll excuse me, I'll have a word with the ambassador. Well, dear Edgar, you seem to have spent a good part of the evening talking to Slington. He's not a bad chap, really. For some reason, Tom, heaven knows why, he's followed me from my first glass of wine to my last cigar. How long have you known him, Tom? Oh, a few months. I met him at Busoni's, uh, the painter. He knew Slington in Italy, where he'd been on holiday with his two nieces. One of them died, and he returned to London. He, uh, wasn't annoying you, was he? Not really. There are some people who travel from house to house visiting acquaintance to acquaintance, and in that way acquire ready-made friends. Oh, come now, Edgar. Julius Slington is not that much of an opportunist. My dear Tom, when your very livelihood and the success of your company depends upon knowing whom you are dealing with, it... you saying, Edgar, that some inner voice in you is warning you all may not be what it seems with dear Julius? Precisely. With regard to that gentleman, I should be extremely surprised... If all were what it seems. Good morning, Mr. Sampson. That gentleman is here again. He's been waiting to see you. Slinkton? Yes. Ah, Mr. Sampson. Good day to you. It's the matter of the insurance policy. Oh, yes. The forms you brought to your friend. Yes. The fact is, I'm no little taken by surprise by what my friend has done by way of life insurance. Has he filled out the application? He told me so. What is his name, Mr. Stinkton? Beckwith. Adams, if you have a life application there from a Mr. Beckwith, would you bring it in? You see, Beckwith and I live in the same digs in Middle Temple, top of the same staircase. His door is opposite mine. Here it is, Mr. Sampson. The Mr. Alfred Beckwith applies for £2,000 life insurance. Thank you, Adams. Mm. Yes, seems to be an order. Oh. He names you as beneficiary, Mr. Slinkton. I never thought he would. I suppose he has no other relative. No, it's done all the time. The naming of friends as beneficiaries. Now, you, for your part, must also fill out one of our forms. That night, I was at home when I had a visit from a young man I had not seen in several months. John Milton. Yes. It's been a long time, Mr. Sampson. Too long, dear John. My boy, you look terrible. What have you been doing with yourself? Well, I'm, I'm not up to sorts. John, I don't think you should have quit the company. When a sad event happens through an accident of fate... Uh, may I interrupt you, Mr. Sampson? This was no mere sad event, but a tragedy. A great tragedy. Nor, believe me, was it a simple accident of fate. My point is, no matter how tragic, one's days must go on. To do that, the best medicine is to fill your hours with work. Come back to London life, John. We'll welcome you like a shot. I can't do the work. I've lost faith in my ability to judge or understand motives. I would be worthless to you. All because a girl we insured dies. No, let, let, let's not talk about it. At any rate, I've decided on another line of work. Something I'd rather do. I hope it pays you well. And I hope you are as good at it as you were in insurance. All of us thought you were a marvelous agent. And your commissions proved it, didn't they? Mr. Sampson, 
All they proved is I put money ahead of humanity. And that's what... That's why I... I can't say it. It's why Marguerite is dead. I'm sorry the pain is still with you. I loved her, Mr. Sampson. Oh, how I loved her. Death is a part of life, you know. Yes, I can accept that. But not the reason for her death. I came this evening to tell you of the peculiar circumstances surrounding her death. She was very young. Too young to die. Please, please, please. Say nothing. As you wish. I shall sit here and listen. This is very difficult for me to talk about. I'm sure it is. I know. No, you don't. I killed Marguerite. I did. Yet I love that girl as I have never loved anyone before or ever shall again. But if the whole truth were known, I and I alone led her to her death. I murdered her. What have we here? Quite a turn of events, huh? Our man Edgar Sampson, who manages London life, meets, dislikes, and suspects the sincerity of one Julius Swinkton. Then his former employee, John Meltham, confesses to a murder. Is there a link between these three men? If there are answers, let us hope they are forthcoming when I return shortly with Act Two. Charles Dickens came to his interest in mystery, murder, and the work of detection late in his creative life. Not that social injustice, which he constantly assailed, was foreign to him, but specific chicanery like that in this story was a new subject for Dickens. Certainly none of his characters before John Meltham had ever confessed to murder. I killed that sweet girl just as certainly as if I had put a bullet through her head. John... John, I want you to calm down. It's been too much for me to bear alone. Uh, Let me, in my own way, tell you how it happened. I was sitting at my desk at London Life. Uh, You you were away, I believe. Mr. Meltham, there's a young lady come to inquire about insurance. Do you think you can see her? Yes, why, certainly, Adams. What is her name? Oh, I don't need to be announced. I'm not royalty. Marguerite Niner. And you, sir? Uh, John Meltham. Uh, pray, sit down. Mr. Melton, London Life has been recommended to me as trustworthy. I wish to deal with a company that will make good on its promises to pay. I sincerely hope, Miss Niner, that day is in the very distant future. We all hope that, Mr. Melton. But death does not always consult our wishes. Yes, sir. How old are you? Twenty-three. You are smiling, Mr. Melton. <laughs> yes, of course we will insure you. But may I say, for one so young and beautiful... It seems to me that you're... I appreciate the compliment. May I have the forms to... Uh... Oh, please. May I... I... Could I have a glass of water? I I don't feel at all well. Uh, Miss... Miss Niner. Uh, Miss... Miss Niner. Oh, good Lord. She's fainted. Adams, come here, quickly. In a matter of moments, she had come to of her own accord. Adams and I lifted this beautiful creature and carried her to the couch in your office, Mr. Sampson. I had heard she'd some slight indisposition, but I had no idea the poor girl had fainted. Well, she insisted we immediately begin to process her policy. When I asked her if she was under doctor's care, she actually implied they had all given her up. Well, right there, I should have said, my dear young lady, if indeed you have a history of illness, London life cannot insure you. But she was so intense about taking it out as she lay there, looking at me deeply with her lavender eyes, reaching and touching my heart. I, well, how could I refuse her? I, I could not. I understand. Extenuating circumstances. I loved her. There could be no other reason. I'm 30 years old, and for the first time in my life, I knew love. John, perhaps ensuring Miss Niner without medical approval was foolhardy. But I would hardly call that an act of murder. Why, she was abroad in Italy when it happened. I know now. Marguerite did not die a natural death. You have proof? Not yet. But one must have proof. Let us say I have enough. 
But whether at this moment I have adequate proof or not, I shall follow the person I believe directly responsible until the ends of the earth. Sorry, the police. Oh, no. Now, they may have this person later. For now, it is my satisfaction to avenge the deed. John, I believe the death of this young lady is something you should completely erase from your mind. It is unhealthy to dwell upon it, and it could wreck your life. And supposing you were wrong, that hers was a natural death. I cannot forget the day she passed away. It was only one month to the day her life policy went into effect. It was also the day I had purchased a wedding ring. It was quite late when John Melton left my house. We kept in touch, and in September, I went down to Eastbourne for a breath of sea air. Who should be walking the beach that very late afternoon but Julius Slinkton with a beautiful girl on his arm. A very delicate, very pale and melancholy young lady dressed in mourning. Mr. Sampson, as I live and breathe. Hi, Mr. Slinkton. This is a coincidence. How so? I was thinking of you just the other day. In a kindly fashion, I hope. Ah, uh, Mr. Sampson, this is Miss Nina, my niece. Marjorie, this is Mr. Sampson. Delighted, I'm sure. How do you do? Are you strolling, Mr. Sampson? Shall we stroll together? With pleasure. Marjorie and I are about to take this rather steep climb to the top of Beachy Head. Ah, look there. The mark of wheels and sand. The wheels of a hand carriage. Marjorie, my love, your shadow, no doubt. Miss Niner's shadow. <laughs> uh, not a sun shadow. Uh, Marjorie, my dear, tell Mr. Sampson. There is nothing to tell except that uh, I constantly see the same invalid old gentleman at all times, wherever I go. When I'm strolling the beach or, uh, as we are now, mounting the path to the cliffs. Oh, there he is within sight, being wheeled about in a bath chair. Strange. Does he live in Eastbourne? He is staying here. Do you live in Eastbourne? Uh, no. Also merely staying. <laughs> Dear Uncle Julius is concerned over my health, so he has me staying with the family. And your shadow? My shadow, I fear, is like myself. Not very robust. <laughs> He's always bundled up. You can hardly see his face. I don't think I should know him if I were to meet him. I think I see his bath chair down there coming towards us. I've not seen him for days. But it does happen. Wherever I go, this gentleman goes. Oh, <laughs> I'm quite out of breath from the climb. Uncle, can we rest a bit? Certainly, my dear. We're practically at the top. Isn't that your shadow now? At the foot of our path? Yes. Ah, oh, there he is. And notice, he's always having his bath chair pushed by the same grey-haired gentleman. Will you both excuse me for a moment? I think I know the gentleman. Good evening, Mr. Sampson. I'm glad you arrived before it got dark. John, I must congratulate you upon your disguise. You make an admirable elderly bundled-up gent. Thank you. Uh, your manservant does well as a porter. I knew he would. I came as soon as I got your message. Sir, Marjorie Niner is in danger of her life. I quite understand. We must get her away from him. I shall do my best. No, not like dear Marguerite, her sister. We must see. I have every intention. Keep us inside, John. And I shall do my best to effect a rescue. He must not know that we know. Have no fear. Oh, bless you, sir. Good Lord. They're gone. I can't see them up there. I must start back. Hurry, hurry. <laughs> I ran up the steep path at Beachy Head, filled with frightening thoughts of what the area is known for. As I got to the top, I saw Marjorie Niner at the very edge, struggling with Slinkton. Uh, stop! Stop! Uh, uh, oh, 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 it's you, Samson. Oh, thank heaven. I thought we'd lost her. Miss Niner, what is it? Uh, I don't... No, right now, I, I, I don't... I, I was just looking down there at the... Oh! Sharp jacket rocks, and I must have lost my balance or something. It, it felt like I was being pushed. Or, or, now and then I heard you cry, stop, and then 
Uncle Julius reached out and... And he caught me. He caught me before I fell. Oh, my dear Marjorie, I think this climb was too much for you. But it was your idea, Uncle. Are you all right, Miss Niner? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Sampson. Well, Mr. Sampson, who was he? I beg your pardon. Marjorie is dying to know who her shadow is. Oh, yes, the old gentleman. He is an intimate friend of our mutual friend, Tom, at whose house we first met. A certain Major Banks, an old East India director. You have heard of him. Banks? Never. Very rich, Miss Niner, but very old and very crippled. He has been much interested in you, even at the long range. He was telling me of the affection he observed between you and your uncle. Our affection is always a strong one, for we had but few near ties. There are but two of us. Samson, would you be a good fellow and sit here with my niece while I run back and fetch her medicine? I shall be glad to. Oh, Uncle, I'm putting you to such trouble. It's hateful tasting stuff. I shall be as quick as I can. Please be careful. It's almost dark now and the path is steep. Don't worry, my dear. Half an hour, sir, and I shall be back. He is such a good man. Miss Snyder, tell me more about your uncle. Oh, you have no idea. He cared for my sister. His untiring devotion to her strange illness. Strange? What? She just wasted away. No one could ever explain it satisfactorily. Your sister passed away in Italy. Yes. How did you know? We were taking a journey, mostly for her health, and in this little town high in the Dolomites, where there was no doctor, no help whatsoever, she passed away. They had her buried there. You have no family? No one to wish her remains back in England? Marguerite and I are orphans. We have no money, no one, nothing. Oh, I signed a little insurance over to Uncle Julius, as did Marguerite. Otherwise, we were quite alone in the world. Until he came into our lives. He made us call him uncle, but we're, we're not related, really. May I call you Marjorie? Certainly. I ask that because someone very dear to your sister is very dear to me. And he is much concerned over your well-being. He has a right to be so. I have a feeling that my life is drawn to an end, even as did Marguerite's. It must be in our blood... Marjorie, do you have any idea why Mr. Slington brought you to Eastbourne? Ah, uh, yes. For the restorative powers of the sea air. This very place where we now sit, this cliff, is called Beachy Head. Do you know what it is famous for? In all of England, what Beachy Head is known for? No. Suicides. What? You heard me right. Suicides. When I came up the cliff path just now and saw you in your uncle's arms, suicide is what flashed to my mind. If you had dropped over the edge, would it have looked like suicide? But, but I, I, I thought I, I tripped. Or... And you thought he caught you, perhaps. What are you saying, Mr. Sampson? And the medicine you find distasteful, does it not make you feel worse rather than better? Uh, Uncle Julius said one must expect that. Why must one? Marjorie, time presses. Heed my warning. Collect your strength, your resolve. Had you been alone up here, one misstep, and this moment you would be lying shattered on those rocks below. Believe me, the next time your life will not be spared. I cannot believe you. You must. As your friend, as your sister's friend... I entreat you, Marjorie, without one moment's loss of time, come with me, and I shall bring you to the man you call your shadow. He can tell you better than I of the danger to your life. I had barely the time to run with her to the bath chair where Melton was waiting. As the evening star rose into the heavens over Beachy Head, I saw them disappear and the tall, familiar form of Julius Slinton make his way up the cliff to my side. The tall man with his hair parted in the middle had an air about him that said to Edgar Sampson, keep off the grass. Now, as he approaches Sampson, 
The sign seems to read, Look out. Danger. We have a devious and cunning man, possibly a murderer, pitted against a clever and just man. What happens will be revealed when I return in a few moments with Act Three. Night has fallen on the English seacoast town of Eastbourne. The waves are high and signal an impending storm. But in the air is not only a storm at sea, but a storm of anger, which might break at any moment. The young lady, fortunately, has been spirited away to safety. Edgar Sampson sits on a rock high on the beachhead cliffs and waits. Ha, ah, Mr. Sampson. My niece is not here. Miss Snyder felt the growing chill and has gone home. Indeed. I persuaded her. Ah, she's easily persuaded for her own good. Thank you, Mr. Sampson. She's better within doors. Safer. I thought so, too. I shall have to take her medicine down to her, then. She is very delicate. Very. Since the unfortunate death of her sister, Marjorie has not fared well. But we must hope. Do you stay here in Eastbourne long, Mr. Sampson? I know. I'm going away tonight. Oh, so soon. Has the sea air restored you so quickly? Events, Mr. Slinkton. Events have quite restored me, thank you. I'm going back. To London? To London. And I'd better start down. That storm is overtaking us. Ah, Mr. Sampson, may I ask? A poor... Tom Meltham, whom we spoke of. Uh, he has been stricken, you are telling me? Indeed, yes. Fatally. Ah. Uh, is he dead yet? Not when I last heard of him, but too broken a man to live long, and hopelessly lost to us at London Life. Were he even to live, which I doubt, he will never be the man he was. Oh, dear, dear. Sad. The world is a grave. A few days later, I arranged to see Marjorie Niner in London. I selected the safest place possible. An address where I was certain we could meet in broad daylight and not be observed. In front of the statue of Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens. Mr. Sampson, my head is still in a whirl. I honestly don't know what to make of all this. That is exactly the reason, Marjorie. Honesty. You mean... I mean that most of us take at face value the actions of others. We begin by trusting them. We expect them, in return, to treat us honestly. The man you call your uncle exploited you. And your sister, shamefully, criminally... And it is only a matter of time before he is caught in his own web. Uncle Julius. Ah, it's so hard for me to believe. He seemed so devoted to us. We often remarked at our extraordinary good fortune to have been befriended two girls working in a factory we were by this charming, lovely, thoughtful person who never made an untoward move in any way. His only interest, Marjorie, is money. It seems a shame to be talking about such a man in this beautiful place. <laughs> Do you know, I haven't been to Kensington Gardens since I was a little girl. And did you know, another little girl was born right over there in Kensington Palace. And she always played in these gardens. Queen Victoria. <laughs> Marguerite and I would roll our hoops right along this path. I miss her so, Mr. Sampson. I wish we had never met, Mr. Slinkton. I wish it with all my heart. Just try to believe all that has happened is perhaps a dream. You wake up, Marjorie, and the world will be beautiful again. I just thought that nice man, Mr... Uh, or the one who helped me get away from Beachy Head, my shadow... Peter Pan could never get his shadow to stick on. That's better. You're smiling. Good things can happen tomorrow. Remember that. Even little Peter Pan believed that. I must be going now. 
I shall watch over you even more closely than your shadow at Beachy Head. How long must I remain with Mr. Malcolm's sister? Until we are certain Mr. Slinkton no longer roams the streets. When will that be? Soon, I hope. Very soon. The final thread of the web led me to the building where Julius Slinkton lived. The top floor. He on one side of the stairs, and on the other, the gentleman whose life he had insured with us, Mr. Beckwith. Uh, uh, who is that? Oh, uh, is it welcome? Enter, uh, my good man. Excuse me, I noticed the name on the door. Alfred Beckwith. Uh, that is me. Do you know me? By name only. I'm with London Life. Ah, yes, you are looking for my dear friend. Slinkton, no doubt. He is uh, it's across the hall. I'll call him. Uh, Julius? Julius Caesar! You have a visitor. Uh, oh, uh, what did you uh, say your name was? Samson. Ah, uh, Julius Caesar! The sun is over the yard arm! Alfred, what is the matter with you? Oh, oh, Mr. Samson, what brings you here? Mr. Beckwith, will you excuse us a moment? Uh, where can we talk, Mr. Slinkton? Right outside, on the landing. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, you, you are excused, uh, but I shall expect you back. Is this your friend, Beckwith, who you insured with us? I'm afraid it is. I'm exceedingly sorry to say. But surely you could be of some help. He is your friend, you said. His rooms are in such disorder. How can anyone live like that? By the way he looks, I'd say he's in the last stages of delirium tremens. I'm as saddened as you. Yes, he's a very great friend. He must have been very ill, even before I knew him. Now I can do nothing with him. Nothing at all. <clears throat> How is your niece, Mr. Slinkton? My niece? Marjorie Niner. The one I met with you at Beecher Head. I'm sorry to say, Mr. Samson, that my niece has proved treacherous and ungrateful. She left me without a word of notice or explanation. Simply disappeared. No doubt she was misled by some designing rascal. You may have heard of it. I did hear she was misled by some designing rascal. In fact, I have proof of it. Are you sure of that? Quite. Are you both standing out there on the landing forever? A company to breakfast. Julius, boil the brandy. My dear Mr. Beckwith, I see no food about. Nothing to eat but these salted herrings. Uh, yes, uh, Julius believes in keeping up my thirst. Uh, uh, you will forgive me, Mr. Uh, uh, says, uh, Samson, uh, the way I am dressed. Uh, this whole dressing gown is all I seem to have. Uh, my clothes have all dis disappeared. Sorry, Mr. Slinkton. You could fetch him some food to eat. The man is ill. Mr. Samson, you're a man of the world. I'll be plain with you. Oh, no, you won't. I understand your object in visiting here. London Life wishes to save its funds and escape from its liabilities. These are old tricks of the trade with you insurance gentlemen. But you will not do it, sir. Uh, Julius, I f found some brandy. No, you will not be able to evade payment, sir, should anything happen to this dear man. You will not succeed, Mr. Sampson. You have not an easy adversary to play against when you play against me. When the time comes, and Mr. Beckwith is no more, we shall have to inquire when and how he fell into his present habits. Uh, uh, Julius, gentlemen, I drink to your health. Sir, Mr. Sampson, I put this incoherent poor creature aside and wish you a good morning. With that... Alfred Beckwith took his entire glass of brandy and threw it right into Slinkton's face and then the glass after it. As he mopped the blood and brandy away, Julius Slinkton saw before him a man no longer reeling and trembling but a changed, determined, forceful Alfred Beckwith. Slinkton, look at me, you villain. See me as I really am. I took these rooms to bait a trap for you. You thought me a poor drunkard, an imbecile. You insured my life, did you? I saw Mr. Sampson before you did. Your plot has been known to us all along. Having baited you with a prize of 2,000 pounds, you were going to kill me off with brandy. 
And since the brandy didn't seem to be working quickly enough, you were pouring poison into my glass. Oh, so I was not too far gone not to observe you. The man is mad. Obviously a drunkard and a fool. Murderer. Why do you suppose I was certain you would fall into the trap? Because you were no stranger to me, Julia Slinkton. I knew you, murderer, who for so much money had poisoned one innocent girl while she trusted you and was on the point of killing another. <laughs> Are we going to stand here, Mr. Sampson, and listen to the ravings of this lunatic? Uh, perhaps we had better. But while you may be able to deceive your young ladies, this old bird was not fooled. Do you think that I drank all the liquor you plied me with? I poured it away. And then when you were out, I let myself into your apartment, investigated your papers, took samples from your poison bottles, your packets of powder, changed the contents to harmless sugar, lest you be out trying to kill more innocents. Yeah, me, Mr. Sampson, don't you find all this a little repetitious and boring? Not half as repetitious as your private journal spelling out in detail page after page how long it took you to do away with your victim. The size of the doses, the, the, the signs of gradual decay upon the mind and body, the fancies produced, the pain inflicted. It's repetitious, but not boring. Mr. Sampson... I cannot remain in this poor, demented creature's presence any longer. I'm going back to my apartment. You won't find that journal in the secret drawer of your writing desk any longer. Then you are a thief. And I am also your niece Marjorie's shadow. I followed you to Eastbourne, made certain Mr. Samson was on hand when you tried to use Beachy Head as the scene of a suicide. And all the while plying Miss Nino with medicine, you said... Medicine, indeed. Ah, uh, who are you? Why have you pursued me like this? Are you the police? No, Mr. Slinkton. We are life insurers. We bank on the life, not the death of those we insure. I am not the police. Beckwith, who are you? When you sent the sweet Margaret Niner whom you murdered, to the office of John Meltham. It fell to his lot to see her, speak with her, give her the insurance forms naming you as beneficiary. But it did not fall to his lot to save her. Having lost her, he had but one object left in life, and that was to avenge her and destroy you. I am John Meltham. Julius Slington was apprehended, brought to trial, and condemned to pay for his crimes with his life. John Meltham, I am happy to say, is beginning to recover from the sadness of having lost his first love. At least, he no longer blames himself for her death. And it may very well be, if he and Marjorie Niner continue to see one another, they will both find a happiness long delayed. As for myself, Edgar Sampson, I look very carefully at the line marked beneficiary in your policy. I try to find out as much as I can before we ensure your life. Insurance files are filled with stories like the one you just heard. Recently, a man was insured for $50,000. He was thrown into an icy river left to catch pneumonia, poisoned with alcohol, set afire, run over by a car, and still the man would not die. Others have not fared so well. Is there a precaution, an answer? I'll try to give you one when I return shortly. Feel free that you free dance. It won't stick to most that'll work. Free dance gum. If you're like millions of Americans and you have a problem with gum sticking to your dental work, Freedent is for you. Freedent gum won't stick to most dental work. You can really enjoy chewing again. Enjoy the delicious flavor of Freedent with a freshness that makes your mouth and breath feel cool and clean. Even people without a sticking problem like the minty taste of Freedent. Freedent from Wrigley's. The gum that won't stick to most dental work. Feel free to chew free dent. It's fresh and delicious to chew. Free dent gum. Peppermint in the green pack. And spearmint in the pack that's blue. Feel free 
that you free dent. It won't stick to most dental work. Free dent gum. Feel free to chew free dent. Feel free to chew free dent. The 1978 century. A Buick like you've never seen before. A little science. The fastback design is pure function. Ah, but the execution is pure Buick. A little magic. It's trimmer than last year's, easy to park, fun to drive. A little science. Yet incredibly, there's more head and leg room inside. A little magic. The new Buick Century. Will wonders never cease? A little science. A little magic. A little It was over 125 years ago that Charles Dickens wrote this brilliant expose, especially for American readers, serialized in a New York newspaper. Have times and crimes changed that much in well over a century? Deceit for gain, murder for profit? I'm afraid not. The answer, then, is to be on one's guard. Ask, who stands to win if you lose your life? Find out. Be careful. And you may live longer. Our cast included Gordon Heath, Patricia Elliott, Robert Dryden, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.